Um, and Dao is wisdom. It's hikma. From the Prophet Wasallam, he did not go into Medina haphazardly. He sent emissaries before him, Musa'ad ibn Umayr. You know, you ask people, what was the first thing the Prophet Wasallam did in Mecca? People say he began a masjid. Well, that's not true. The first thing he did was take a census of the people of Medina. That's the first thing he did, because he wanted to know who was living there. Who are they? What kind of people are they? Well, these are the Aus and the Khazraj. This is Bani Qurayla. This is Bani Nadir. This is, these are their likes and dislikes. This is the kind of people they are. These are their temperaments. Why does he want to know that information? Because he wants to tailor the da'wah in a certain way. And you actually speak to people in their own lahja, in their own dialect. You know all the dialects of the Arabs. You to speak in their dialect. Da'wah is wisdom. So, this is the uh, this is the introduction, is that our intention is to call people to deen al haq right? The religion of truth. So you're not going to get any perennialist philosophy out of me. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that all oh, the religions are exactly the same. It doesn't matter. It's the same summit and things like that. That's not Islam. That's something that began in the 1920s, right? This perennialist philosophy. Um, we call people to be religion of truth. And it doesn't make sense anyway. It's what's known as a the fallacy of non-contradiction. So let's say, for example, that uh, there's a premise, and we'll call it P, and P entails Q and not Q. Right? What does that mean? That means the not P. For example, if our premise is Christianity and Islam are both true. Okay? This is what you hear a lot nowadays. You go to an interfaith dialogue. They're either talking about, you know, recipes for food, and, you know, I, I enjoy giving the fish and make bolani, or they're talking about movies and books they've read. There's no, there's no substance, right? Or they say, we're all, this, it's all the same religion. So Christianity and Islam are the same religion. This is a logical fallacy. Why? Because Christianity says, Isa alayhi salam, is God. It's very clear, that's the orthodox position, unless one is a quote-unquote, heterodox Christian. But that's the 99% of, of, of Christians believe that Isa is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can Isa if both religions are true, how can he be God and not God at the same time? Therefore, not P. The premise is untrue. Christianity and Islam are both not true. They can't be true. Either the light is on or off. It can't be both. Right? <clears throat> Now, that, that doesn't mean that we take this sort of supremacist stance on things and you know, we're better than you and so on and so forth. But we believe that Islam is a religion that best serves humanity. We have concern for humanity. The Prophet is a great concern for humanity. Um, the verse that says, Kuntum khayla umma linnas. You are the best ummah uh, that's ever been. So there's a harfa jaw here. There's a preposition, the lamb, for mankind. What does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just say kuntum kuntum khayr ummatin. No. Bit What does that mean? That means, according to the exegetes of Fasirin in the Quran, you're the best people, you're the best ummah for the service of humanity. If you serve humanity, then you're the best. We serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by serving humanity. Imam Qurtubi said, you can sum up Islam by saying, serve Allah and serve humanity. And this is true. Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Gamaliel, these great rabbis of the rabbinical period of Judaism, which we'll learn about, they said the entire Torah is Leviticus 19.18. Love God and love your neighbor. Everything else is commentary. That doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything else. They're telling you what is the essence of the Torah. What is the essence of Islam? Is serve God and serve humanity, according to Imam Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And Isa alayhi salam, in the Gospels, we'll learn about the Gospels, inshallah. He says, uh, love God and love your neighbor. This is the law and the prophets, meaning this is the essence of the Torah and the prophets who came after Musa alayhi salam. The essence of it. <clears throat> So in this class, we're going to learn about a myriad of topics. I've never taught this class to Muslims before. Uh, 
So um, we'll, we'll have to, you know, see how it goes. I don't know how quickly to go. I don't know your background. I don't know if you've taken biblical studies or anything like that. Or probably not Christian theology. We're going to learn about Israelite sacred history. And sort of to lay the foundation. Names and dates, right? When was the first temple built? When was it destroyed? Who destroyed it? Why did it destroy it? What are the ten tribes? Uh, what is the Babylonian captivity? What is the Greek period? What is the Roman period? The Persian period of Israelite history? What is rabbinical uh, Judaism? What is first and second temple Judaism? What does it have to do with anything? What is the Talmud? What is the Tanakh? Very important for us to know these types of things. We're going to learn about Christian theology. Um, and that's going to be very interesting for us. In other words, Christology. So Christology, this is a word. So, you know, you see that ology comes from logos in Greek, which means word, and kelima, but also means study. So the study of who? Christos. Christos is the Greek for Christ. So the study of Christ. So Christology, Orthodox Christian Christology. We're also going to, you know, quote unquote Orthodox Christian Christology. Uh, but also heterodox or different Christology. Christianity was uh, very vast in the first four centuries of the common era. And how did it end up to be as it is now? Is that there was an evolution of Christology. Right? So that's an important aspect. So we're going to learn terms like periphoresis and hamousias, heterousias, lagos, things like that. These are Greek and Latin terms uh, that I'll try to find an equivalent in Arabic. It definitely will define uh, the vast, vast majority of Christian laity have never even heard of these things. I read an article in Christianity Today. The article was called The Greatest Book Never Read. It was about the Bible. And according to this article, it said that 50% of church-going Christians, parishioners in the church, they're already going to church, identify themselves as Christians. 50% cannot name all four Gospels in the New Testament. They, they don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They can't name them. We talk about pedicoresis and homoousias. It's might as well be. I mean, it's, it's a complete mystery for most Christians. It's important for us to know these things. Most people continue to go to church, I think, because of the Christian ethic. The Christian ethic is very beautiful. It's very closely related to our uh, virtue theory, or ethical theory. And St. Thomas Aquinas, whom we're going to learn about, whose philosophy and theology is still standard in the Roman Catholic Church, was highly influenced by Ibn Sina and Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. So, and both of these men, Imam Ghazali and Thomas Aquinas, were heavily influenced by Aristotle. So the virtue of Christianity, the, the ethical aspect of Christianity is very, very beautiful. Love your neighbor, right? Um, pray for those who persecute you. Show mercy to people. Give charity. Um, have hope in God. Have fear in God. So that's that's why that's the reason I think that most people continue to go to church, um, and that's kind of um, that's, that's still I think being generous. Maybe people go because it's kind of a social, a social club or gathering or something. But the theological aspect of Christianity is very troubling for people. and They don't even want to deal with it. Nobody understands it. So we're going to attempt to try to understand what is the Trinity. What does that mean, the Trinity? Where does it come from? What are some of the, the ways of understanding it? Are there analogies that we can draw that are adequate? There's nothing adequate. What did the early theologians have to say about the Trinity? Is it biblical? Is it found in the Bible? That's a big question as well. Um, we're also going to do some textual criticism of the New Testament. So textual criticism deals with looking at different versions of the Bible in its original language, which is Greek, Koine Greek, so the New Testament. When I say New Testament, I'm talking about the Christian scriptures. New Testament, right? The New Testament, the Christian scriptures which are a collection of 27 books. The New Testament, Al-Ahdul Jadid, al that whoever believes in Jesus in some way or another will have eternal life. 
New Testament, 27 books. And we'll talk about those books individually. The most important of them are the first four books, which are called the Gospels. In Arabic, you say, Al-Anajil al-Arba'a, the four Gospels. So they're written in Koine Greek. Koine means common in Greek. So how do you say common in Arabic? You say Amiya. Al-Lughatul Amiya. Colloquial Arabic. So, like I was in a garden one time in Yemen, and I asked a man, Ain al Qibla? And he said, Ish? I said, Oh, Fain Qibla. I said, Oh, I get Ain al Qibla is classical. But Fain Qibla, that's Amiya. That's how the people speak. Right? They don't say, I mean, people obviously understand uh, classical Arabic, but that's not how they speak. They'll think you're a stranger or something. It's an interesting story. Two converts were in Egypt in the back of a taxi, and they're speaking fluent Arabic. Of course, they're speaking Fusha Arabic, right? And then the cab driver is going to listen in, and then when he drops them off, so the cab driver says, Sadaqallah with Abid. Such classical Arabic. <laughs> These guys must be a couple of Mubaz or something. But they were converts. Anyway, common. So, the New Testament, Christians believe, at least uh, traditionally, and so literalist Christians, fundamentalist Christians, I guess you could say, evangelical Christians, and many Catholics believe that the New Testament in the Greek is inspired by God, and that it's inerrant. It is perfect, inspired, with no contradiction. Okay? Not all Christians believe this. This is certainly not what's taught in the academy. You go to a Christian seminary, it's faith-shattering for many Christians. In fact, some seminaries have mandatory exit counseling. Sit down with the, the brother and, how is your faith doing after seminary? And many of them become agnostic, atheist. Gerald Dirks became Muslim after going to Harvard Seminary, learning about the Bible, made him Muslim. They're in a common Greek. It's not an Attic Greek. Attic is Fusha, Greek, classical Greek. This is the language of Aristotle and Platonic Socrates, 4th century before the Common Era in Athens. That was the height of their language. So the New Testament is in Amiya, Greek. It's not classical. So there was an atheist, very famous atheist, German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche, who used to quip, he used to joke, he was a big atheist, he didn't like Christianity, he hated Christians. He, he used to say, it was so nice of God to reveal the Bible in such a remedial form of Greek, whereas he's far outshined by the likes of Homer and Plato. In other words, this cannot be the word of God. Homer's Greek is much more eloquent than your God. You believe Homer is God. Right? So that's interesting because the Arabic of the Quran is been surpassed by the mission of non-Muslim scholars of Arabic. It's inimitable. It's impossible to imitate by far, even if you don't believe it's inimitable, there's no yeah, jazz. They say it's still the greatest work of Arabic prose ever written, even if they ascribe it to the Prophet. <clears throat> so you'll find that, you know, the Latin, we'll talk about the Latin Vulgate, Jerome's translation. Vulgate means vulgar. Again, common language. Right. So textual criticism. Textual criticism. Textual criticism, the purpose of textual criticism, is to identify what the actual author wrote. So there's an assumption that's being, being made here with textual criticism. What is the assumption? That the scripture has changed. Changes have been made. This is the claim of the Quran, is that the Bible, the Christian and Jewish scriptures, have gone through something called tahrif, from harrafa, you harrifu. Tahrif is the mustard on the second form. Tahrif means corruption. The scriptures have been adulterated, corrupted, fabricated. This is the claim of the Quran. Min al ladina hadu, you harrifu nan kalima am mawadir. And some of the Jewish elements are those who corrupt words or remove words from places, switch things around, things like that. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that, <clears throat> that woe to those who write the scripture, be a him with their hands, and say, Hada min indillah. This is from God. Wa ma huwa min indillah. But it is not from God. It is not from God. Wa yaquluna ala Allahi al-kadhiba wa hum ya'lamun. They utter a lie against God, and they know it, right? So they're, they're ulama, they spill all of the beans, basically, if you take, again, <coughs> take classes on higher criticism of the New Testament. Uh, it's very revealing. Um, so there's a story that's related about Imam al-Qurtubi. Presumably this, this was in Andalusia. So he says that there was an agnostic who, uh, in probably in Andalusia, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam were flourishing during this period. Muslim Spain, this agnostic wanted to know what is the word of God. So he somehow got a copy of the Torah in Hebrew, and he wrote some of it down, and he made a few intentional changes here and there, switching words around and changing the meaning a little bit. Right? So then he gave it to a group of rabbis. He said, what do you think of this? And they read it and said, yeah, mashallah, beautiful. This is the Torah. So he said, okay, this is not a religion for me. And then he uh, took one of the Gospels, I don't remember which Gospel, and he wrote down some of it, or had someone write it in Greek. He made some, a, a, little, a few changes intentionally here and there. And then he gave it to a Christian scholar. He said, what do you think about this? And he said, oh, mashallah, this is the, the gospel of John, you know, it's beautiful. He said, so it is not a religion for me. And then he took part of the mushaf, right, he copied it down in Arabic, made some intentional changes, switched some words, so on and so forth, skipped a verse and things like that. He gave it to a sheikh in the masjid. He said, what do you think of this? And the sheikh looked at it and said, where did you get this? And he said, uh, oh, I got it from, you know, one of my friends, and I found it. I said, you have to burn this. You have to burn it. Because this is, this is totally inaccurate. And he said, okay, this, this is, there's something more to this religion. Right? So Christians, especially neo-orientalists, they don't like the title neo-orientalists, but that's basically what they are. Starting in 1996, they start to really attack the hadith, but also the Quran sometimes. And they try to tell you there's textual variants in the Quran. There's variant readings in the Qur'an. This is their claim. Now there's multiple ways of qira'ah of the Qur'an. We admit that. Right? Maliki yawm din or Maliki yawm din Both meanings are found in the Qur'an anyway. And the basic skeletal structure of the Qur'an without the diacritical notations is basically the same. So that's not a variant reading. That's a multiple reading. That's the difference between a multiple reading and a variant reading. What is a variant reading? That means that this entire pericope, or this story, this parable, is missing. Or the word is completely different. Or it's, or it's been added, or something added. Or it's found in a different place in another gospel. Or in another letter. Okay, that's a variant reading. So, <clears throat> there's this man, Christopher L uh, Luxemburg. And that's a pseudonym. He's a German neo-orientalist. He wrote this book called The Syro-Aramaic Reading of the Quran. And, you know, he's, you know, when they interview him, he's behind a curtain, he's afraid he's going to get killed or something. You know, he's a highly dramatic type of guy. So, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's got this changed voice. So, you have to translate from his German. And he says that the Quran is one, he said his claim is one quarter of the Quran is utterly unintelligible without studying Syriac, without studying the language of Isa, they said, uh, you won't understand the Quran. One quarter of the Quran. So he said, give us an example. And he says, what Huru Naim, Huru Naim, that the Quran talks about, which is translated as big, wide-eyed maidens of paradise. Right? He says, if you put the dots in different places, and Irshad Manji actually mentions this in an interview, right? And she said it's actually from a hadith, but it's actually in the Quran. And then she quoted the Quran and said it's a hadith. So these are, these are people that are speaking for us. Anyway, um, so this guy, Luxembourg, he said, if you, put, if you change the time, the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Salam, 
when the Prophet وسلم, he comes into Medina from Manawara, you can find his hadith and uh, provisions for the seekers of Talibin. When he comes into Medina, he says, Araftu anna wajhahu laysa bi wajhi kathab. Araftu, right? He uses Arafa again. So I, I, know, I knew that his face was not the face of a liar. So, what does that mean? Does that mean that the Prophet وسلم, just had like, an honest face? Some would say yes, he had an honest looking face. Others say that he actually recognized the Prophet Araftu anna wajhahu. He recognized him, his physical description based on what was in his book. That's why he became Muslim thereafter. Oh. Who was Abdullah bin Salam? Who was he? Abdullah bin Salam was a Jewish rabbi. He was in Medina. He lived in Yathrib. Okay. He was a rabbi. Yeah. I believe he was from the Bani uh, Navir, if I'm not mistaken. Does the 7157 tie in relationships to 620? Because it also mentions that uh, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and in Jew. That's here, yeah, 7157. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this could be talking about the same idea. Yeah, the Torah they have if this is about the Prophet, <laughs> most commentators say is. In other words, Ahl al Kitab, they know the Prophet very well. It's a way of saying they know him very well. He's described very clearly. They know him like they know their own sons. How well do you know your son? Very well. You can describe a million things about your son or your daughter, right? That's how they know him. Yes? Uh, is this reference also the uh, Wami and the Mustaqbal? The Mustaqbal? Does it always, is it future tense also? Because are we talking about them today also? Yeah. These, these people, do they, they still recognize the Prophet or was it just at the time of... No, the descriptions are still there. The Bible... The Bible we have now is, is basically the same as it was at the time of the Prophet. So yeah. Most of the tahrif happened in the first four centuries. So when he says, do you know them? Yeah, talking about the present, yeah. the present scholars. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's in the Fiqh al that the end is not known. Okay. So even now, this verse is by now. It's, no, that's, that's, the verse is in the present tense. The present tense is not in the When the ayat, nihayatuhu la tu'alam. The end of it is not known. That's why it's called imperfect tense. Imperfect. The action is never completed. It's never perfect. So they continue. Ya'rif wa nahukuma ya'rif wa nahabinahum. Subtlety in the Arabic language. Remember we talked about if sisama verba, the Quran is the literal speech of God. God chose the words himself. If we go to a deeper level, we would say that the Quran is actually kalam lafdi, the articulated speech, whereas the personal, pre-eternal speech of God is in no language whatsoever. Right? God doesn't speak any language. He's above languages. But he chose Arabic, and he chose the wording of the Quran. <clears throat> so the wording of the Quran then becomes, you know, what's, what's known as syntactical exegesis, becomes significant when we do tafsir. What tense does Allah use? Have you ever notice, like, something, you know, well, can Allahu azizan hakima, innahu kana tawaba. Kana is past tense. So why is Allah saying, kana and Allah was the most forgiving. Why say kana? Why not? Wa inna Allah yakunu something like that. Yakunu Allahu azizan. The short time pre eternal. Yeah, because kana here, uh, the verb to be, denotes according to balagha, according to advanced Arabic rhetoric, um, the past, present, and the future. Anything annexed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be described with kana, if it's universal in its aspect. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Kana. It's not, the Messenger of, of God was a good example for you. That's a more literal, right? Kana, meaning he was, is, and always will be. Because he's been annexed to God. He's the Messenger of God. Right? That's one way of looking at it. Um, so, there's, no, there's numerous hadith. There's another hadith of a rabbi uh, who was uh, from Yemen who told who gave his son a Torah scroll and said, "Go to uh, Yathrib. There's a prophet there." And then he opened the scroll after he met the prophet. They said, mm-hmm. "He read the perfect description of the prophet." They said, "One of the things that mentioned in the scroll was he doesn't raise his voice in the marketplace." And that's Isaiah 42, which we'll talk about. That's, that's what he gave. That's what the rabbi gave his. Son. And Isaiah 42 does indeed talk about 
a Gentile prophet who is glorified by the Kedarites or the Arabs. And according to the Hadith, the sound Hadith, and according to the Hadith, uh, the, and Aisha describes the Prophet uh, he doesn't raise his voice in the marketplace. So the Prophet he heard, he said, translate it to me, and he translated Arabic to him, and he said, and he called Sahaba, and he said, tell them what you just told me, because it's something that increases their yaqeen. This is part of the proof it's permissible to quote from the Bible to Muslims in order to increase their yaqeen. And it, it does. I've seen people you know, convert to Islam. Or Muslims have this rejuvenated sense of, of their faith when you talk about these types of things. Mm-hmm. So the Sahaba heard it as well, and they were amazed by it. That there's a perfect description of him uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, which we'll talk about, inshallah. But we have to talk more about what the Torah actually is. I must take two guys. We talk about revelation. Revelation so, or book of revelation? No, revelation according to Judaism. So now we're talking about Judaism okay. in Jewish tradition. Yeah? Isaiah, which verse? Isaiah 42, 42. chapter 42, the whole chapter. There goes the diet. <laughs> So what is revelation according to Judaism? There's three types of revelation in the Hebrew Bible. Remember the Hebrew Bible? It's called the Old Testament. Right? Of course, Old Testament, again, is Christian jargon. It's, um, you know, you say Old Testament to rabbis, going to be offended by it. Because old means it's mansuch, and it is mansuch according to our perspective. But not totally in all of its ahkam. There are a few things that are still, don't eat pork and don't drink wine, so on and so forth. Uh, don't commit adultery. The ma'ruf, right? The Noahidic laws are mentioned. So on and so forth. Anyway, uh, Old Testament, uh, in Hebrew, this is called Tanakh. Remember? Yes. Tanakh. You have the Torah, Nabim, Kesedim. Very good. The Tau, the Nun, and the Kaf. This stands for Torah. This stands for Nabim, the Prophets, the Kaf, the Kesedim, the Writings. Okay? So, the first level of revelation is the Torah. And by Torah, we mean the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch are the first five books. The Pentateuch is a Greek word. Penta means what? Five. Pentagram. Five. Five. Pent- Pentagon. Five, right? Five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Tanakh are called the Pentateuch in Greek, or just the Torah, although Torah is ambiguous. We're called the Pentateuch, or Tuk. Is that the total Yes. So, this is the highest, according to, and I'm giving you Orthodox Judaism. Right? I'm not talking about, like, you know, so-called progressive or reformed Judaism. Orthodox Judaism, traditional Judaism, believes that the Torah is the ipsissima verba of God. Oh. The words of God. Like we believe, uh, like we believe about the Quran. So, Musa alayhi salam, he went to Mount Sinai. He was there for 40 days. He did not eat nor drink, according to Jewish tradition. He was up there, he was receiving spiritual madad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, many Jews, remember we talked about the, uh, the ulam haba, the world to come. Many Jews believe that this earth itself will be the hereafter in which people will not eat nor drink um, and will be spiritual, spiritually oriented, uh, pneumatic bodies. And they use that as a proof, what happened to Musa alayhi salam on Mount Sinai. So he received this Torah, these first five books. He either wrote them down immediately or soon thereafter he wrote them down, memorized it, wrote it down. Every single letter of these first five books was chosen by God, just like we believe about the Quran. It is chosen in every single letter by God. Okay, that's what it is. Do they believe that the, uh, the Torah as it is today is the Word of God too? Because I've heard that even the Torah has like what, sources like J-P-E-D and question mark or something. I mean, yeah. do, do they even think that even the Torah of today is the same one? They, the they, it depends. Is that the Masoretic? It's like Masoretic takes like 800 AD or something. It's like it is. really that far after. Yeah, so yeah, this is, uh, this is basically, what I'm, what I'm teaching you here is kind of medieval Judaism, rabbinical Judaism, um, and ultra-Orthodox 
contemporary Judaism. Now, he's talking about Julius Wellhausen's uh, documentary hypothesis, which actually identified the modern-day Torah comes from four different sources that were sort of conflated into one narrative, and each source was written at a different time. That's basically uh, the accepted theory, um, very much like Q is the accepted theory in New Testament studies. The documentary hypothesis is accepted. Uh, but leaving sort of the academic, like Western critical method aside, just from the faith tradition, right, just based on the faith tradition, um, this is what is traditional Jewish belief. In, in, in reality, it was like that, right? Because the tablets came down, right, from on high. I was like, with the tablets given to Musa, and were there a hadith also, like, like how, mm. how the new, you know, how the how the Injilians, like the saying of I, is, is the Torah also the same way? Or were they tablets that were sent the books and he broke one of the books, right? The tablets. Was that something he had written down, or was that something that came down and like? Well, the Ten Commandments were probably written on tablets on al Who wrote it? Is what I'm saying. He probably etched them into stone. Musa, I said. Yeah. It was like, give, here it is, there it is, take it, Musa, I said. Yeah. You know, that, that, they weren't written by the finger of God, the way the movie. Not, the not literally, no. no. Okay. Not by the finger of God. No, I'm just saying, was it just like, there it is, here, take it, Musa, and it was divine. You know how the supper, last no, supper came no, down, and there, no, here, no. take it, eat it? No, Jews like, believe that. Maybe. What do we maybe, believe? Maybe that was, I don't know what we believe. The, the Quran does mention al that, that he had tablets in his yeah, hands. So. Uh, Jewish belief says that he, he etched the Ten Commandments is the stone, but 613 commands were given to him on the mountain. The entire Torah was revealed to him, but these ten took precedence okay. in the immediate context okay. because of what the people were, were doing. The first three deal with a negation of all other deeds. <coughs> they deal with Tawheed, they worship in the golden calf, and so on and so forth, They're between adultery and things like that, so you're stealing. Hmm. So in other words, the ma'roof, uh, what is known through the intellect, if that's what the ma'roof means, uh, it has to be instituted immediately, and then the rest of the mitzvot or the commandments. The Jews have 613 commandments. All of them have to follow them. If you're a non-Jew, you only have to follow seven. We talked about that. Yeah, right? the basic ones. So, the Ipsissima Verba, the Torah, the Word of God. All right. So, for example, just like we do with the Quran, if you if you turn to Genesis 1 to 1, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim. Bereshit means in a beginning. There's no definite article. It didn't say in the beginning. That's how most translations do it. But there's no definite article in the Hebrew. So then this becomes an issue. What? Why did God not mention a definite article? What does in a beginning mean? Does it mean that there was something else? There was matter already on earth, but there was matter already in the universe, and then God sort of, and the, and the Neoplatonists like that idea. Because the Neoplatonists believe matter is pre-eternal. Stupid. Yes? Yeah. Um, Considering that we, we are students, do you, what, what do you recommend as a, which, which book do you recommend for us so that we can refer to the Old Testament or which is the best book for us as students to begin with? To begin have, studying uh, like Jewish theology? Yes, I mean <clears throat> the original uh, or, or something as close to the Old Testament Orthodox uh, Judaism. Yeah, that's the book. Um, I don't know if I showed this to you. A Jewish Theology. Did I show this to you? No. no. Oh, I this probably I showed it to you in class. A Jewish Theology by Lewis Jacobs. I'm going to be teaching this text next semester, inshallah, university. So he, it's an intermediate, you know, it's not, it's not easy reading. It's not very difficult, but I think it'll be good fine for you guys because you have some background. Um, but he deals with numerous subjects. Uh, different types of Jewish theology, um, rabbinical Judaism, the medieval systematic theologians, quotes a lot of like Maimonides, uh, also Reformed conservatives, Hasidic opinions as well. And he has really interesting chapters on the love of God, the messianic hope, creation, eternity, the via negativa, the unity of God, the chosen people, revelation, all of these types of things. Very comprehensive. Do you think we should be grounded in Islamic theology first before we yeah, get into stuff like that? Yeah. Some of this? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, read it with caution. I mean, it's not going to do anything to your iman, but it's just for the fact of what takes priority in your life is, you know, Islamic aqidah. But it's interesting read. So, like, the Old, uh, the Old Testament and the King James Version is not a good, dis not a good uh, source for Jewish theology. What's well, it's a Christian or, translation. Exactly. Yeah. It's a Christian perspective, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, Which kind of models it? the Italian maxim, maxim says the, the translator is, a, is treacherous. So 
So if a Christian is translating the Old Testament, it's going to be jaded. Yeah. That's just going to happen, just like the Orientalist translations of the Quran are so egregiously incorrect because they have a pre-existing presuppositionalist belief. If you're going to translate the Quran, then you should presuppose that it's the Word of God. Therefore, you have a correct translation. Okay. So I'm being objective. No one can ever be objective. That's a myth. I don't consider anyone objective. I'm just an independent scholar. I have no religious belief. No, you have a, you have some belief. You're doing something. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Even having no belief is some kind of a stand, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. I don't know. Okay, that's your you're translating through an agnostic slant or an an atheist type of slant, right? Um, so here we have the words of God. So this is the highest type of revelation. The highest type of revelation is what's found in the first five books. Okay. It's directly imparted unto Moses, Musa, Nisana. The rabbis ask how. They say, Bila kefiya. It's amodal. You can't understand mm -hmm. it very much like we would say. How did the Prophet say, see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Bila kefiya. You won't understand So this is a 613. The first five books, which contain the 613 mitzvot. Yes. Genesis. So this is Genesis. Genesis. Leviticus. Numbers. Numbers. Deuteronomy. Yes. These books. Genesis obviously means beginning, the creation of the universe, creation of Adam. It goes through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It ends with Joseph's death in Egypt. Exodus is the story of Musa alayhi salam. Leviticus, Numbers, is the Torah, the, the Ahkam of the Torah. Deuteronomy is sort of a, uh, it means second law. It's sort of a uh, rehashing, a retelling of the previous books and some other legal injunctions as well. Prophecies and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, brother made a good point. This is traditional Judaism. There's also a modern academic way of, of looking at the Torah, which is vastly different than what we're saying here. And then we have the prophets, right? The Nabim. Now, here's the thing. So, if you look in the Old Testament, right, you'll find books like the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Amos, Hosea, right? Books like that that are named after prophets. Okay. So those constitute a type of revelation, but it's not as direct as the first five books. So this is called, in Hebrew, it's called Nebua. Nebua. What this means is, that God, he inspired a prophet. He, he will sanctify the speech of a prophet. But the prophet will choose to articulate the inspiration. Okay. So what does that sound like? This is basically hadith. The difference between Quran and hadith. What is the difference? Both are considered revelation. They're both wahi, according to orthodox tradition. The Prophet does not speak from Hawa ever. That's not just talking about the Quran. Anything he says is revelation. Right? The Prophet says, one of his, his vocations, according to the Quran, is to give bayan of the Quran. That means whatever he says is basically a tafsir, if you will, of the Quran. But it's not the Quran, because the Quran is what? God choosing the words, right? The ipsisima verba of God. God chose the Arabic of the Quran. The hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, is articulating the inspiration guided by God. And some would say, well, that's just semantics. It's the same thing. Maybe it is the same thing. But nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did choose himself the, the actual syntax of the Quran. So the Prophet says, is simply repeating what, he, what he's hearing. Okay? And there's two types of ways in which he would receive the Quran. This is what Montgomery Watt says, and I agree with it. Exterior locution is one way. Exterior locution. Meaning that Jibril salam would come to him in the form of a man and say, Qul, say this. And he's just going to repeat. 
because no one else can see Jibreel alayhi salam. Right? Although some, if he took it on the form, some form, maybe he could be seen. But. So he would repeat it. It's called exterior locution. L-O-C-U-T-I-O-N? Yes. Like what happened later to Qadr in the, in the cave. Exterior locution. Sometimes it's interior. Interior locution. Locution. I think it's like that. Interior locution is like what he describes in the hadith. The revelation comes to me like the rever- 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 uh, reverberations of a bell, right? Or like he says, like um, like uh, chains being dragged that form sounds. You know, and the the, the the what's it called? The vocal cords are just you know vibrations, right? So possibly this is one of the functions of the korufu. Uh, what are they called? The disjointed letters at the beginning of some of the surahs, like ha mim, alif la mim. That initially it's you know ha, and he's listening to it and it's to get his attention before the actual verses will come. Because you can imagine he's busy with his daily life, and then there needs to be something to get his attention. So ha mim. So he would you know he'd stop for a minute, get something to have to come to him, and then the actual text of the Quran. Review. Okay, uh, so so the difference here then is like this is you can think of this as like Quran. This is like Hadith. Right. So you know the Muslim will not put Hadith in the Quran though. He he, he very strictly separates the two. They're very different, right? One could have the legal ruling or creedal standing of the other if it's mutawatir. When we talked about that, if a hadith is mutawatir, it has the legal and or creedal standing of a Quranic ayah, but the hadith are mutawatir are less than 1,000, and they're never going to be put into the mushaf, regardless. They're separate always. Okay? But here we have the Prophet's inspired word of God. So basically, when you read the Torah, it just sound like the same speaker. That's basically what they're saying here. It should. It's the same style all throughout. Under closer scrutiny, it's that's not true at all. There's actually four different speakers, right? <laughs> that's called the documentary hypothesis. It's basically a fact, uh, and many Jews will accept that. But traditionally, it wasn't accepted. Um, but here in the prophets, then you'll find a different tone. Isaiah has a certain tone, he uses a certain vocabulary. If you conduct a textual analysis, it's different than Jeremiah. That doesn't mean that neither is the Word of God. Right? They're both the Word of God, but it's inspired through prophecy. Right? So the prophet is picking the words himself. That's why it's going to be subjective. Okay? Here we have one voice, we have many voices. And then we have the writings. The writings are not as exalted as the prophets. Kind of a third level of revelation. The highest and most direct Torah. The next, the prophets, Nevim. The next, Ketubim. And the writings uh, are given by the Ruach Kadosh in Hebrew, which is Ruach al Qudus. And this is a Ruach that God gives to certain individuals that are non-prophets, like saints or poets, what? sanctified human beings, that he'll inspire. So it means inspire souls, Ruch Kadush? This means Holy Spirit. Oh. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So for example, in the Quran, usually the Ruh is Jibreel alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about a ruh at the end of Surah Al-Mujadila, I believe, that those who are beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are strengthened with a ruh minhu, a spirit from Allah, right? Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them some sort of created sanctifying spirit in which their actions become guided and they attain something called wilaya, sainthood, not prophecy, sainthood, below prophecy. There's no more prophecy. The door of Nabuwa is closed. Is that Waliya Nas? That's what you call it? Awliya, yes. Awliya is Waliya Nas? Yes, Waliya Allah is a singular. Awliya Allah is the plural. Okay. 
Yeah, and the Quran does mention the awliya many times. But wali in the Quran has different meanings. Has many different meanings. Friend, protector, supporter, beloved. Right? Um, but we believe in the awliya. So these are the writings of the awliya, if you will. In Hebrew, they're called the fatiqim, or sitiqim in Hebrew, uh, in Arabic. The writings of the saints, uh, inspired by a ruach kadosh, a holy spirit. So Hassan ibn Thabit, who was a poet laureate of the Prophet ﷺ, one time he, he got up inside the masjid, there was a minbar in the masjid for the poet, the munshid, which if you try that today in many masjid, you'll be declared a kafir. This is reciting poetry in the mosque. So the Prophet made him stand up and he recited a beautiful poem of the Prophet ﷺ, a litany describing the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, In Allah you ayyidu Hassan bi ruhi al-Qudus. That indeed Hassan has been helped by the Holy Spirit. So he's not talking about, you know, Jibreel alayhi salam coming to Hassan, because Jibreel alayhi salam, the angel of revelation, comes to prophets. Mm-hmm. So this is a this is probably the type of thing that he had in mind, Allahu Alam. A sanctifying spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send to a believer to guide his actions or speech. But it's not prophecy. Now we talked about the Shatriya uh, last time. Theopathic utterances of the saints. An al haq Subhani, ma a'adha sha'ni Bayazid al-Bistami said, Glory be to me, how great is my affair. And he said, you can't say that. So why not? God spoke through me. God is saying that through me. So you're not a prophet. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a prophet. God inspired me to say that. God speaks through me, inspired. It's not revelation. I'm not a prophet. If God can speak to a bush, he can speak to a human being. But I'm not claiming prophecy. That's what the Jews believe here, the writing. It's also revelation. It's revelation. They call it revelation. But it's not prophecy, and it's not ipsism of verba of God. This is the highest, the Torah. Sometimes you'll see some of the Sufis go into a state and they'll start reciting poetry and it's just off the cuff. You know, it's not like a, it's not like they've memorized something or repeating it. It's just poetry that comes extemporaneously, if that's the word. Right? Yeah. What you, what's the other word for it? Um, extemporaneous was right. Improv- in, yeah, in, impromptu. Yeah, impromptu. Oh. Impromptu. And you say, how is he getting this? And you can see that it goes into a hal, it goes into a state. This could be ilham, right? So the word in Arabic for this type of revelation is ilham. Ilham. Ilham, inspiration that comes to a non-profit. It's certainly possible. Anyone can get this. Even today, the Jews believe this is possible. But the, the, the canon has been closed, so you're not going to add books to the Bible anymore. It's closed. But this is the, the, the book of El Ham is still open, even in our tradition. So over what period was this compiled? Good question. So basically... <clears throat> and then canonized, closed. Mm-hmm. It was, but all of it was basically closed around the second century of the Common Era. <coughs> Why so long? From well, Hazrat Musa's time till yeah, that's a long that's time. fifteen, seventeen hundred years. It is. It's uh, about fifteen hundred years. Seventeen hundred. Yeah, fifteen to seventeen hundred years. That's when the because you know <coughs> they didn't feel a need to close the canon until the temple was destroyed. Well, destroyed twice, though, right? Destroyed. Yeah, destroyed twice, but definitively by the Romans, and then there was a diaspora. Mm-hmm. Um, so they held, the Jews held councils, different types of councils. Now, before we get into that, there's one more thing we have to talk So this is called the written Torah. All three of this, the Old Testament, is called the written Torah. Right? So the word Torah is ambiguous. It could refer to just these five books or all of this, the written Torah. Okay? Okay. Does El Ham have any association with Elohim? Um, Elohim? Maybe. <laughs> Sounds like it does. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. <coughs> There's an opinion that the word Allah comes from uh, 
a similar root system first. Uh, I don't I don't know. Maybe. There's a book on that. Yeah. What you know, some say it's Ilam with Aleph Lam Al Ma'arifa. Yeah. Aleph Lam is Ma'arifa. That's, That's the final reason. Yeah. yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a book about there yeah, there's there's the big question is does the word Allah have an etymology? Right? Yeah. Is is there ishtiqaq? Mm-hmm. Is it mushtaq? Is it derived from something? Or is it jamida? It has no etymology. The dominant opinion is that it does not have an etymology. Mm-hmm. And that the al in Allah is not an alif lam. Mm-hmm. Because you can't say ya Allah. You can't say ya and then al. You don't say ya al walad. It's incorrect in Arabic. So ya walad, ya rajul, ya Muhammad. You can't say ya al walad. Mm-hmm. So ya, al, ya Allah would be incorrect if the alif lam was a definite article. Mm-hmm. That's one of the proofs that they give. Because that's what the Orientalists would say that's all it is. It was Al Ilah, the God, and then the middle Hamza was was apocopated. So you have Allah. Um, but looking at it a little closer, does it make sense a whole lot? Anyway, so you have this. Now, here's something interesting. Jews also believe that when Musa alayhi salam was on the mountain, he received Another Torah. There's two Torahs. This was the oral Torah, not meant to be written, mm. but to be transmitted orally whenever the written Torah was taught. There's a wisdom behind oral transmission. If you look at it, for example, the, the guide of Imam Ibn Asher, it's 314 lines long. It's very comprehensive. And that work is really a muhtasar, it's a distillation. It's a shortened version of a greater work, which was a, sh- which was a shortened version of a greater work, which was a shortened version of Imam Malik's major text. So why is it easy to pare it down to 314 lines? It's because the Salaf wrote their books under the assumption that you as a student are going to take it from a teacher, not read it yourself. So he's going to give commentary. So you don't have to write this huge book all over again. You can just give the essence of the book, knowing in your mind that when a student reads this book, he's going to obviously study it with the sheikh. With the sharh. Mm. Right? With the sharh, exactly. So the oral Torah is the sharh of the written Torah. You ha- they have to go hand in hand, or it's going to make major mistakes. Sahih al-Bukhari was not written for awam. There's some Muslims who believe, just, you know, forget about you know, Abu Hanifa and these guys. Like this one uh, Khatib said one time, he said, uh, I don't need no sheikh with no honey dripping out his mouth. I got Imam Tirmidhi right here on the shelf. It's sure. good to pull up Sahih Tirmidhi. Do I have to pray if I'm on a, you know, if I'm traveling and I have socks on? And so You're going to go directly to hadith. It's very dangerous. Because these books were written by scholars for scholars, not for awam under the assumption that this scholar is going to take this book and is going to teach people with a shah, with an with a interpretation of the text. There are hadith books that are written for us. Riyadh al-Salihin and the Arba'in literature, right? The Shema'i literature, you can take from that. But even those books right, this, uh, require some commentary. Mm-hmm. So that's what's going on here. Like what Shaykh Hamza mentioned, uh, he, he read in the text one time, it says the Prophet وسلم, after he would eat, would lick his fingers, his three fingers, right? So uh, he said that he, 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 he like put his thumb into his mouth one time and he said, oh, right? And he said, no, no, that's aib. That's, that's not how he did it. That's actually not. He said, he said the Prophet would lick his fingers across like this with his tongue. So you can't see his tongue sticking out. He's not dipping, he's not sucking his fingers. Right? So he did it with discretion. He did it very quickly. As soon as he would hide it. Right? So if you read the love of the hadith, you know, you know suck your fingers. Just, Hold on. Right? But that's actually considered to be an aib, according to the Arab culture of the day. Even today, if you do that at a dinner table, it's like, ah. One time these people are sitting behind us eating popcorn. We're in the movies. And all we heard was... They're, they're licking and sucking their fingers. So that sound, 
That's an aid. <laughs> right? Aid means like a dislike, disgraceful, disgraceful, short dislike, short, short, shortcoming, oh. a Sheikh. fault. Okay. So yeah. Sheikh Mohammed did say. <laughs> I remember that. I was there. He did say. Like this. I was there, this yeah. is what he did. <laughs> he said that I heard about your shit saying that he only used to do. He said, no, no. He used to lick his fingers like this. Some of our our Giovanni brothers will break the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that's a, that's an example, right, of why of how the oral transmission is is equally important to the text. Like, how did he used to do that, right? How is this done? So what is this? This oral Torah is how many verses? Three hundred. No. So the oral Torah was not written down until the second century of the Common Era. Oh, whoa, whoa, this is problematic. It was called the Mishnah eventually. Oh. So the Mishnah is the oral Torah. Why did the Jews write it down? Because the temple is destroyed, the Jews are in diaspora, yeah. and, you know, the, the very identity of the Jewish nation was now being compromised. What does <laughs> Mishnah mean? Um, I don't know. Didn't you say that those three things were compiled also in the second century? Yeah. The canon was closed during this time. So, you know, second to fourth century, this is the beginning of what's known as rabbinical Judaism where they said, okay, we need a canon, we need to write down the oral law, because, you know, the very ethos of Judaism was changing. There's no more priesthood, there's no more, there are no more Pharisees. This is what I'm doing, but, uh, no, this is after the Christian era. This is after Islam. <laughs> so Mishnah, then, is the oral law reduced to writing finally and then from the fourth to the seventh century the rabbis they wrote commentaries on the mishnah and these commentaries were compiled and called the uh, gemara are those considered writings yeah the Mishnah and Gemara are also considered to be sacred writing, revelation. So, just just to clarify, it was written down after the destruction of the temple for the second time? No. The, the first, first destruction, the first time? The, oh, what, I mean, written down, what, what do you mean second time? Which, uh, what are you referring to? The I mean, after the, after the second time the temple was destructed? Oh, the temple, yes, after the second destruction, yeah. After the second destruction? Yeah, the second destruction was in 70. Okay. Yeah. Seventy of the Common Era. So during that during that time, uh, there were certain rabbinical academies, one in Babylon, one in Persia, uh, one in Palestine. Like these, like the, the purpose of these academies was to kind of codify Judaism, to kind of save it from corruption, and that's how the Madahib eventually, in our tradition, what's the point of a Madha? Right? Like, why can't you just follow Quran and Hadith? Right. Well, the Sahaba, they had the Prophet so send them right there, it's easy to follow. The Tabi'in, they followed the Sahaba. But what happens down the line? Who are you going to follow? It becomes difficult. So it becomes necessary to articulate creed and fiqh and these types of things into a school of thought. So that's what's going on here. So it's like preservation mode. Preservation, right. right. In order to um, preserve the identity, uh, of the, the integrity of the Jewish tradition. So, so, the, so there's like five levels now. You have one, two, three, the Mishnah, and the Gemara is a lower level than the original writings. The, yeah. the Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah, right? Yeah. But it's also part of the Torah? Yeah, so this is considered Torah, yeah. All five. Question yeah. comes now. And these two here are called collectively Talmud. Oh, Talmud, okay. So Mishnah and Gemara are Talmud, yes? Uh, now, the second century Mishnah and what's to say that there was, it's correct, what's to say that, I mean, who's to say, they all agreed upon, this is like their, this is their, uh, the consensus of their ulama, that they all agree yeah. that this is what it is. Right. So do they have a strict consensus? Well, I don't know if it's a strict consensus, but there was some sort of consensus. Is that around today? Yeah. As it is, as it was at that time? Yeah, basically. That is, it yeah. hasn't changed too much? Yeah, basically. 
So there's two different there's two different Gemaras there. There's a Babylonian and then there's Palestinian. And they were written at different times in different locations. Wow. But they're strikingly similar. They're very similar. Oh, that's cool. But all of so th this here is called the oral law or the oral Torah. And it's also considered scripture. Now these were written down by the Pharisees? By yeah, Pharisees, by rabbis during the Christian era, the early part of the Christian era. So, um, in, is it in the Gemara, the Mishnah, where they talk about Yisra? That's in the Babylonian Gemara. Yeah. Yeah, so Yisra Yisanam, he appears in this text, Babylonian Gemara. So, the Gemara discusses, you know, would-be messianic claimants. And he's mentioned there a few times. <clears throat> so, the written Torah, the oral Torah. So if you go to a Jewish children, they go to something called a yeshiva, which is a equivalent of like a, um, a madrasa. At the yeshiva, they would learn the Torah, which is all of this. So Torah could mean just that, or it could mean this, or it could mean this, or it means all of this. Hmm. So what did they learn? All, all of it? They learned all of it, yeah. How many volumes? It's several volumes. Wow. It's, it's basically a Quran, Bukhari Muslim, like that. Okay. Quran, it's not too bad. Well, where did this come from? Yeshiva? Yeshiva, yeshiva is a school. A school talk? Like a school of Judaism. Okay. Well, what about the Madrasa? You can call it a Madrasa? A Madrasa. This is like a Madrasa. Why do I school? Huh? Why do I? Why, why, why do I say in particular? Isn't there like a lot of them? Like, like, no, just a gener generic name for a Jewish school. Oh, okay. So okay. 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 That's where. Like, do, do they do hits just okay. like we do? They do, yeah. They do hits, and they'll rock back and forth. Just and like uh, the rocking, according to some of the theologians, uh, is something that is done instinctively, because when they're reciting, uh, the soul is supposed to, uh, like it's done, hmm? the blade of grass and the fire. It's going back and forth like that. So the soul is, is uh, Turing. being agitated Turing. Yeah. Yeah, by the I word of God. So it wants to come out of the body. Right. Yeah. What, like is the uh, the bar, the what is recited during the bar mitzvah? What is recited during the bar mitzvah? I know they, they recite the Torah for the bar mitzvah. As mm -hmm. part of like, what part of the Torah is recited? Is That's it? a good question. I have a book on that. I didn't bring it. There's a book on Jewish liturgy. I can, I can check that out. Usually it's one of the benedictions that are in the Torah. Something like, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the commandments. Probably one of those. Which is, I think is in uh, Exodus. You said that the Babylonian and the Palestinian, they were written at the same, around the same time also, but just in different places? Yeah. Okay. Well, during, during, this, during this. So this is like an okay, coming that's like into the Islamic true. era. Okay. Which is really interesting because the Quran says that... Um, that uh, uh, So they said about Mary a terrible thing, right? It's just really unlikely that, I mean, this was specialized knowledge. I mean, how could you have, how could you have known that? That's, that's written in, that's mentioned in the Babylonian Gemara okay. about Maryam, that she slandered in the Babylonian Gemara, which is written right around the time that this verse was probably revealed to the Prophet so said that word shortly before that. How did he know that was in the... Because many Jews at the time didn't know that was written. In the Prophet Yeah. So he knew in his revelation that they were yeah. slandering. But couldn't they have just slandered her at the time of Isa uh, Aysanam, or, you know, when he was born? Couldn't they, have been, couldn't they have been referring to Jews at that time as opposed to the... Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is Wahawulihim. It's something they say. That's another possibility. Yeah? Uh, well just, you know, because cause the Torah is supposed to be... So these are, when they, when they talk about Isa, like, when they talk about, you know, it was contemporary issues at their time, they're inculcating this in the tafsir of, of the Torah, which is supposed to be 1,700, 1,800, now 800, 900. Uh -huh. So... How do they go about doing that? I mean, what's, the, what's the justification for them sitting here talking about Maryam Alayhi Salam 
with, without, I mean, because they're supposed to make a tafsir of something old, not something new. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Yeah, so... The Torah is Musa a.s. revelation. Uh-huh. Okay, and now they're making tafsir of it, they're, they're trying to codify it so it doesn't get lost for whatever reason. Yeah. So why are they sitting here talking bad about present issues? Why are they even inculcating present issues unless they're making... Because they're giving certain examples. For example, the Gemara is talking, I don't know, in, the, in its context probably, it's talking about false messiahs or something, or false idols. It's saying just like this one who came... For example, this person who came from Nazareth who said he was a Messiah and so on. So forth. they're allowed to do that. It's commentary, and that's cons- it's commentary, but it's considered to be sacred writing. Yeah, but, that's, that's, but at that time, they're also saying. beating back the the rise of Christianity. They are, you know, yeah. the Nicaea is happening, all that stuff's happening. Yes, the so, three religions are almost coming together. Yeah, so there's a very, very clear polemic against Christianity, not Trinitarianism yeah, not so much, yeah. but more the incarnation yeah, of Christ. Yeah, so the rabbinical writings are considered to be inspired by God as well, that are in the Gemara. This is an exciting time. They're considered, considered <laughs> I know this is out of fear. But where's the Zabur? Is it before this? Or yeah, this? no, the Zabur is after. The Zabur was given to, if it's the Psalms of David, the Psalms of David is written around 100 before the common, 1,000 before the common era, so 500 years after the Torah. Yeah. Do we believe that's what it is? It seems to be a popular opinion. My, I asked my sheikh, he said, Allah, Allah. What do you think? Probably. My sheikh. I'm not sheikh. Yeah, probably. There's some things in the Psalms that are a little strange, but it, it seems like it. The whole Bible's strange. It? The Psalms, you know, many of the Psalms, they sound, they sound like uh, Meccan surahs. Same with the wisdom literature. Yes? Can you please repeat that again? That rabbinical writing is also considered to be inspired by Allah, yeah. by God? But yes, and that's what this is, the Gemara, the Gemara. Okay. The rabbinical commentaries upon the Mishnah are considered inspired writings. Really? Not at the level anywhere close to what we have like here. It's more like something here, even below that. So, oh. so there's, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of revelation. But still inspired by the Holy still, Spirit? This is still inspired, yeah. Because of the rabbis. Mm-hmm. Is all this is in that book or in the book um, uh, in its guide to, to Judaism or something? Or, I don't know. Or, that. Would you, where would you find this all this information so you could review it or repeat it? Or? Yeah, this is this is a good start. Did it sort of explain kind of something? It's the mentioned stuff? there, yeah. I'm pretty sure. So, so, like the Torah that you have, is that also inclusive that the Talmud's in there too or no? No, no, the Talmud is not in the Bible. No Bible. So this is the, this right here is the written Torah, Torah and the beam with the two beam. That's this only. Okay. Christians call it the Old Testament. Tanakh. Yes. Tanakh. If you want to study this by yourself, a rabbi would say you you can't do that. You have to study this with this to understand it. You need oral tradition that's been reduced to writing, and you need to go to a yeshiva under a rabbi who has ijaza in order to understand this. So go into like the King James. I want to learn about Judaism. Let's go to a Christian translation of the King James Bible. Uh, That's a terrible methodology. Is there Mishnah and Gemara a chronological? Chronological. Like, is there like, is that like times or so every generation? Like, do they have it? So? Like, you know, you said Genesis and, you know, it comes in order. Right? No? I, I thought they were parallel threads, right? right? In yeah, different universities, right? Parallel threads in different universities, right? That, that's where it was, right? There what? They were parallel threads, right? Uh-huh. And they were like, right. is it historically, <coughs> is it like a historical chain of narration? Yeah, that's something like you get here. But the Mishnah was revealed at the same time the five books of Torah. Yeah, so the, the origin of this. On the top of the mount. The origin is, is this. It's 1500 years. Yeah. yeah. That's, then I mean the Gemara, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BCE. Yeah, that was right. eventually reduced to writing. Down. And even that, then it's... Oh, so they have that oral tradition. So people memorized it and kept it alive for 1,500 years. Yeah, for a while. Right. And yeah. how long was it, the Mishnah? The Mishnah is, you know, a few volumes. So All of this had, is like... So they had Hofa, like Hafiz. Was, yeah. Like, oral tradition was strong. Yeah, so they had these things called targums. Targums, at the time of Isa, the Jews would learn the Torah, the written Torah, and then targums, 
and targums were Aramaic translations of the oral law that were just passed through orality. They're called targums, uh, from Tarjuma. Right? These little sections of the oral law that were translated into Aramaic that were memorized. Eventually, the targums were written down and became the Mishnah in Hebrew. Mm. Does this look more, um, or rather, this looks much less confusing than <laughs> what the Bible is? I mean, at least it's very, it's very simplistic, is what I mean. With the Bible, what do you mean, Bible? I mean, I how the Bible evolved, right? There were so many authors who were not named, and then people looked at three different sources, tried yeah. to make it in one. <laughs> well, th again, this is body doctrine. And this is a, a very confessional way of presenting the Old Testament. This is what Jews believe traditionally. Okay. Modern day scholars, they don't believe this. At all? No. Well, mm -hmm. uh, so are they Jewish? It's like saying, some of them are Jewish. It's like saying, this is, this, this is like saying, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were two disciples of Jesus and two disciples of disciples who wrote down, who wrote down what they heard from Christ. Okay. Some Christians believe that. But then the academics will tell you, look, there's something called Q, Mark didn't have it, Matthew and Luke had it, Matthew and Luke redact Mark at some point, John comes, he has his own sources. We haven't done that to this yet. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. This is the traditional <laughs> devotional, confessional. Evangelical. Yes, orthodox, confessional approach, right? Confessional. You okay. see the difference between confessional and academic. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Okay. Um, yeah, you said it at the beginning. Yeah. We asked. So Talmud then comes from, you know, like Tim Mead, same mm -hmm. root. What is it, Tim Mead? Is a little student, a little, a little student. It's called Tilmi. So, like the little student of the Torah, of the written Torah, which is the Talmud. So, yeah, this is the most highly exalted revelation. Even so, more so than here, because here you still have translation, you have evolution. What, what little student you say? Yeah. So, Maktub and Endohum fit Torati wal Inji. He is Maktub, he is written in the Torah that is with them. So, probably Allahu Alam, the Prophet is mentioned somewhere in here, somewhere here, the written Torah, not necessarily here. What's interesting, wa qawlihim, wa bi kufrihim wa qawlihim ala Maryam. But they say this about Mary, that's in the oral Torah. Right. The Babylonian Gemara, yeah. but still was written down. وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلَّ الْمَسِيحَ إِسَى بْنَ مَنِمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And they say, we killed Christ, the Messenger of God, the Son of Mary. So the Qur'an seems to be familiar with what's considered written and oral. And that type of information back then is like insider information. The vast majority of Jews, they don't know what's written in the Talmud and the Mishnah even in the Torah, because 99% of people are illiterate and they just kind of do what their fathers are doing. Okay. So, let's give you one of the prophecies here. We can start with the most exalted revelation, which is here. Yeah. Deuteronomy 1818, which is claimed by many, Dr. Uh, Umar Baruch, contemporary historian, Sheikh, he says that this is the verse, uh, this is the verse that demonstrates the incumbency upon Ahlul Kitab to believe in the Prophet This is the verse. It says, I will raise them up a prophet from amongst their brethren, like you. I should put my words into his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy 1818. I shall raise them up a prophet from amongst their brethren, like you, or like unto thee, like Moses. I shall put my words into his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. 
The next verse says, Whomsoever, who and whomsoever shall not hearken unto the words that he shall speak in my name, I shall take vengeance of him. So you have to believe in this prophet. Okay. 18, 18 through 19. It's called the prophet like unto Moses. Prophet like Moses. The Hebrew says, Navi Atim Lahem. Which is very interesting construction. Remember, this is Ipsissima Verba. God chose the construction here, according to the, the traditional opinion. And instead of saying, uh, Akim Navi Lachem, which is more standard word order, Fi'il Maf'ul, and then Jar Majrur, Navi Akim Lahem. You have the object brought forward, Maf'ul Muqaddam, and it's Nakira, it's indefinite, which according to Rhetoric means undefined great prophet. A great prophet, I will. Be. So, what do the Jewish people say regarding this? So, the own opinion is that it's the prophet Samuel. Prophet Samuel is mentioned. He's a prophet contemporary with Dawood, according to the Old Testament. He may be mentioned in the Quran. There may be a reference to him in Surah Baqarah. It says, Nabiyun Ba'd Musa, mm-hmm. a prophet after Moses, which seems to be, according to some commentaries, Shamuel or Samuel. So they believe it's a reference to Samuel. Yes. Yeah. There was a rabbi in the Middle Ages named Samuel ben Yehuda. I'll put my word. And Mahari Can I tell you the story about him? I think I told you the story. Samuel, Samuel al-Maghribi, he's a rabbi. He has the same name as the prophet Samuel. He was in uh, Andalusia, in Muslim Spain. His father was from Maghrib. I told the story? No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no please. So what happened was, uh, he uh, was very conversant, liter- uh, literate with Muslim sources. He studied the tarikh of Imam al-Tabari and many other texts, Muslim texts. Uh, so what happened was, he went to sleep one night and he saw a man in his dream, an old man with a long white beard sitting under a tree, and he identified the man as the prophet Samuel, the mm-hmm. prophet Samuel. So he approached the prophet Samuel and he said, um, you know, he started kissing his hands and his feet and they greeted each other. They're speaking in Arabic, by the way, the whole time. And then the prophet Samuel, he says to him, says to Rabbi Samuel, so haven't you read in the Torah, Nabi Akim lahim nikarab achayim kumokha, to raise them a prophet from the brother and Lincoln to thee? And the prophet quoted 1818 back to the rabbi. The rabbi said, yes, that's you, right? And then he said, the prophet Samuel stood up and was very angry. And then he left. (laughs) And then he said he woke up. The rabbi woke up. This is in his autobiography. It's called Ifhamul Yahud. Mm -hmm. Ifhamul Yahud, the silencing of the Jews. Ifham, a ha. Ifhamul Yahud. He mentions this in his autobiography. He went back to sleep. And it was just before, like, Fajr time, like, Subur time. Astaqur ru'ya bil ashar, is a hadith. The truest of dreams are at Subur time. So he said, he woke up and he was in trepidation. Like, you know, it was a great dream, but he was angry with me. What happened? What did I do? What did I say? So eventually he went back to sleep. And then he had another dream. And in this dream, there's a long corridor. And he's walking down the corridor, and he passes a man. He says, Ati'a Rasulullah. Um, obey the messenger of God. Oh. So he said, well, okay, that's kind of strange. And he walks, he keeps walking, he comes out to a courtyard, and he sees the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet Sallallahu he's busy with a lot of things because he's preparing for a ghazwa. He's going on a military expedition. So he's giving a lot of orders, he's very busy. And then, so he, Samuel Maghrabi, he was, he was a little, you know, tentative about interrupting him. But he walks right up to him, and he... Uh, he says, uh, he says, wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka Rasulullah. Mm-hmm. And he made a point that he wanted to say annaka and that Muhammadur Rasulullah because he wanted to address him and get his attention. Right? <laughs> he said, annaka, he'll, he'll look at you, right? Because you're saying, ka, you. So he said that. When he said that, the Prophet some turned to him and, la- and smiled at him and they took his hand and he became Muslim in a dream. And then he said that uh, after that, he invited him to come on the Vazwa, 
And Rabbi Samuel said, immediately I was afraid. And then I said, what am I, what am I talking about? I have to go. <laughs> so he got ready to go, then he woke up. So this type of, this type of um, mystical experience. He said there was uh, some rabbi who wrote a letter that was open to death by his grandfather or something. Yeah, yeah. That was a contemporary, that was in 2008. Rabbi Yix, uh, what was his name? Rabbi um, Yixak Huduri. <coughs> that was about the Messiah, the name of the so, Messiah. So how did the Jews make this connection that 18, 18, and 19? Are so, attributed to Prophet Samuel and not Prophet Muhammad. That's, that's usually how they through this dream now. No, it's, it, that was just sort of their, their, their standard default sort of their standard right. sort of interpretation of the verse. Was it fiery law and all this other stuff? Right, that the same verse. I no, know. that's different. That's oh. different. Yeah, that's a good verse. Yes. Yeah. So what do we say to make it about the prophet? So there's a few things. Now, obviously, you know, if it's about him or not, it doesn't really matter. Right? I mean, none of our faith is based on the Bible. But I think there's good evidence. It says, a original prophet from their brethren, from the Ikhwa of Bani Israel, which could refer to other Israelites, yeah. or could refer to Arabs as well, because the Arabs of the Torah are also called brethren. So the word is ambiguous. Some translations in English say, from amongst themselves. They're Christian translations. To sort of limit it to Israelites. But the Hebrew says min, uh, min achayhem. And then it says kamocha. Kamocha looks like this in Hebrew, which is literally kama ka. Uh, like you. This prophet is like you. What, what was the great thing about Musa al What did he get that no other Hebrew prophet got? He got a sharia. He got a system of laws and ethics and jurisprudence revealed to him. A complete law code. Right? And the Prophet Sallam also was given that. No other Prophet, not Isa Salam, not Shamuel, not Dawood, nobody was given that except for the Prophet Sallam. And there's a correspondence in the Quran between Musa and the Prophet Sallam. Read the Quran closely, you'll notice in Surah al muzammil Indeed we said a, we, indeed, we sent a, uh, uh, we, indeed, we sent a prophet to you as a witness, just as we sent a prophet unto Pharaoh. Inna arsalna ilaykum rasulan shahidan alaykum kama, right? Kama arsalna ila Fir'auna rasula. They're they're similar. Musa and the, Musa the Prophet said them. There's a correspondence in the Quran. Uh, another verse. Verily, we gave the book to Musa. Don't be in doubt about it reaching you also. The book, Revelation Sharia, you're going to receive it too. Warak ibn Nawfal, what did he say to the, the Prophet of Khadijah al-Kubra after the initial revelation? لَقَدْ جَاءَكَ أَنَّمُوسُ الْأَكْبَرُ كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَى مُوسَى كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَى مُوسَى There has come unto you the great law just as it came to Moses. So that's Surah Muzammil, and then this next one is Surah. I think it's in Qasaf. I have to check the reference. But there's many, many correspondences in the Quran. So this is the one that uh, Imam uh, Amidad argues about and uses his argument on, right? Who? Amidad. Amidad. Yeah. This is the Deuteronomy. This is the one he likes yeah. a lot, yeah. The one. And also the fact that uh, both of them went away, they had received revelation, yeah, in solitude, one on one with the spirit. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, came like, back with a law. The Christians say this is Isa al right? Okay. But from a Christian perspective, Isa al Islam is very different than Musa al Islam. Isa al Islam for Christians is God. He's the Son of God. He died for your sins. Uh, he was born from a virgin. He ascended into heaven. None of these apply to Moses. Right? How are they the same? Who became a leader of Islam? The messianic claims would that fit under that category? This is not a messianic prophecy. It's interpreted by Jews. No, no Jewish rabbi will say this is the Messiah. Okay. Yeah. The Christians will say that. So you look in John chapter one, right? Remember John one, one twenty-two to twenty-five. اللهم إني أستعينك وأسألك أن تجعلني من عبادك الصالحين اللهم وفقني لطاعتك وتداعي رسولك 
وبر بوالدي وحسن التلقي من مشايخي اللهم اجعلني من الحكماء المزودين بالعلم مع الاستقامة في عبادتك وحسن شكرك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله عليه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So this dua is dua of Imam al-Haddad that we recite before every class inshallah ta'ala I usually bring copies for everyone I forgot So uh, any questions regarding last week? Anything we talked about? Um, sort of an intro. This was the slide that we were on. Oh, so mm-hmm. actually, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> the one or the other one? The, um, the one we were, that was just on. Yeah. So here we talked about uh, the books of the New Testament. Now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth regarding these Gospels here, especially the Gospel of Mark. So we're going to talk about Mark, who, what, when, where, how, general themes. Uh, then we're actually going to go through the Gospel and look at sort of uh, key verses that we should know. So um, it's really important for us to have a really good understanding, not just like at surface level, really increase our literacy with these types of things. really makes the Dawah a lot more effective. So these Gospels are called synoptic, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And remember, although Matthew comes first, in the New Testament, uh, it is not the first to be written from the three. Mark is first, around 67 or 70 of the common era. We'll talk more about what was going on at the time. Synoptic means sin, like synonym, right? Being same word or similar word. Synoptic, or opto, um, referring to the eye. So synoptic means one eye. Does anyone know why they're called one-eyed gospels? Because they're the Dijalic. <laughs> no. They're a'wa. They're the a'wa. Why are they one-eyed? It's because they follow the basic, basically the same chronology of events. Okay, so you can, and obviously there's a lot of these, you can make a synopsis of these three Gospels. Synoptics, uh, uh, synopsis means that basically you line up all three of these Gospels in juxtaposition of one another. And you can sort of see where they, they copy from each other and where they sort of diverge. And we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, but they follow basically the same chronology, whereas John is vastly different uh, in its uh, content, in its chronology, and in its language. So we're going to begin by talking about Mark. And Mark is called... This is, this is Greek. Kata Markon. Kata Morkon means according to Mark. Remember, this book is anonymous. It wasn't named until about 180 or 200 by Irenaeus. We talked about him. He was a bishop uh, of Lyon. The author's name is John Mark. Um, and some scholars believe that in Mark chapter 14, there's the, we'll talk about this, during the garden scene. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives in a garden called Gethsemane. And this is where he's going to be arrested. And Mark mentions this, but none of the other Gospels mention this episode, that there's a young man there in a linen cloth. And the authorities, presumably Jewish temple authorities, they grab the disciples and they grab this young man and he slips away and he runs away naked. Kind of a weird type of uh, episode that happens. Of course, you'll never see this in the Jesus movie or anything, because... You know, someone streaking across the screen but looks uh, somewhat strange and kind of puts a damper on the, the somber uh, scene, yeah. But some scholars say that's Mark, by the way. But he's never identified. Okay. John Mark is actually a student of Peter. Peter is a disciple of Christ. Uh, he's also uh, the companion of Paul, and we'll talk about Paul. So John Mark, his first name is John, he goes by Mark, student of Peter, and student of Paul. So Mark uh, never met the historical Jesus. He was about 10 years old at the time Isa was preaching the Injil. He was not in the same country, <clears throat> but he inherited his teaching from a companion of Isa A.S. from the Hawarin, whose name was Peter, if that's his real name. These are according to Christian sources. 
Where was it written? The Gospel of Mark was probably written in Rome, around 67 to 70 of the Common Era, okay, in Rome. Uh, historical background, it's a wartime gospel. So at the time, like in the 60s, there were a lot of cataclysmic types of events in Pompeii and Naples and the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, many people, Jew and pagan, believe that these were portents of the end of time. Uh, the emperor, the, the Roman emperor at this time, was a man named Nero. And Nero was someone who hated Christians and was always finding excuses to persecute them. So what Nero did, and this is really interesting, is the first historical occurrence of this type of operation, is that he started a fire on purpose and then blamed it on the Christians. It's called a false flag operation. <coughs> false flag operation is when the government will do something and then blame it on a despised minority, hence opening the door for persecution. Sounds very familiar. Gulf of Tonkin is another example. And <coughs> <laughs> but don't get me started on that. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> don't mind. Give out of the So Josephus, who's really important, Josephus is a first-century Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. He writes about what happened during this time. Uh, he has two books. One's called. The Book of An uh, Antiquities, the Book of Antiquities, and also his book called The Jewish War. The Jewish War. And Josephus actually says that Nero, what he would do is that he would capture Christians and he would dip them into oil, dip their entire bodies into oil. And then uh, he would put them on these huge uh, pole, kind of tie them up there, and then he would light them on fire, and they would be the street lamps in Rome. So Nero did not like Christians at all. In fact, some of the early theologians identify the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about Revelation. They identify Nero as being the Antichrist, as having the mark of the beast, which is 666. So you see people going like this, like Lady Gaga does it, Madonna does it. This is the mark of the beast. 666. Yeah. So they have some satanic thing going on. Nicki Minaj, this crazy lady, does it all the time. I don't know. Um, these are supposed to be, these are, you know, Asnam. These are idols that the children look up to. Anyway, uh, so what happened now is that in 67, there was a Jewish insurrection against Roman authorities inside Jerusalem. An insurrection means what? A group of freedom fighters, right? They attack Roman authorities because that's their country. The Romans are occupying Palestine, right? So the Romans will say these, these people are terrorists. But Jewish authorities will say we're freedom fighters, Mujahideen, right? So, and there is difference of opinion as to what actually sparked this. Obviously in Galilee, one of the issues with Galilee, which is in northern Palestine, this is where Isa de Islam was born, uh, there was a very strong... Uh, um, feeling of Jewish zealotry, uh, of freedom fighting. So he grew up in this kind of environment. In 6, in six CE, 6 of the Common Era, uh, there was a man named Judas the Galilean who was captured by Roman authorities and crucified in public. Uh, so Risa said I might have actually seen that happen. But this happened quite commonly in Galilee. So Robert Eisenman, who is a scholar of New Testament, he postulates that this war, the impetus for this war, might have been the murder of James, who was the brother of Isa de Salaam. We'll, we'll come back to James, though. James is a very important figure in early Christianity, and kind of the missing link, if you will, of what actually happened to the original Injil of Isa de Salaam. But, Allahu alam. So what happens is, a group of Sikarai, this is what they call themselves, the Sikarai are the people of the Sikin, the people of the dagger, this is what they called themselves. These are Jewish zealots. Mujahideen fi sabilillah. Mujahideen, right? They're fighting the Romans. They go into the temple, on the temple mount, into the temple itself. So General Titus, 
from the Romans, he tells them to come out or he's going to burn the temple. <clears throat> and they refuse, so he burns the temple, never to be rebuilt, except one wall, which remains to this day. It's called the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall. Al-Ha'ik. General Titus. <laughs> General Titus. His father at this, at this time is actually the emperor, his name is Vespasian. And Titus, after his father, would be the Roman emperor. So they burn down the temple. Obviously, this is a major, major event in the history of Judaism. Uh, this war continues into the 70s. There was a place called Masada, which was a stronghold that Herod, King Herod had built. There was about a thousand or so Jews that were holed up in this fortress. The Romans attacked, and they found 953 bodies of men, women, and children that had uh, taken their own lives rather than <coughs> being taken by Roman authorities. Only a few people didn't do it, seven or eight of them. And most of them were children, but everyone else, uh, they entered into the suicide pact. Mm-hmm. Um, so during this time, huh? so when you say Jews, you mean Christians or Jews? Uh, Jews. Jews, yeah. yeah. Um, so this the insurrection was from Christians, right? Or no, the insurrection <laughs> was from Jewish elements. This was during the time. No, this is after. After. So 67. So Isa alayhi salam is ascension 33 CB. So it's a little over 30 years after. Now, there were a lot of Christians living in Palestine at the time, especially in Jerusalem. <clears throat> they're very much a minority. And they're not called Christians. They were also Jews. So at this point, to say Jew-Christian is sort of uh, anachronistic. It doesn't make sense. Because everyone's Jewish still. Now, the Medhab of the Christians is different. They're not Pharisees. They're not Sadducees. They're not Essenes. They're called Evionim. Evionim is their methodology. Right? It means the poor people, the spiritual paupers. That was the tariqah of the Hawariyu. So but everyone's Jewish. No one's Christian at this point. So Nero, he is neither Jewish nor... No, Nero's the Roman emperor. Okay. So he's a pagan. <laughs> he thinks he's God. So was he, when he was prosecuting, when he was killing these Christians, uh-huh. what did he mean by the Christians? Then? Like, yeah, this was in Rome. So Nero's in Rome. Oh, okay. He was... Yeah. Born. He's, he's in Rome. There's, there's a, a small group of Christians, a Christian contingency living in Rome, because, as legend says, Peter and Paul are both buried in Rome. The Vatican is right above the grave of Peter. That's the claim, at least. Right? Um, <clears throat> so there's a small group of Christians in Rome. Nero doesn't like them at all. He considers them a threat to his power, so he, he starts this fire and blames the Christians. And a while this is happening... Palestine, there's uh, the, the, the Sikhorai who are... Yeah, and then about, this is, you know, 60s or so, oh, okay. early 60s, and then this Jewish insurrection happens in Palestine okay. um, and goes into the, into the 70s. During this time, the Gospel of Mark is written in Rome as well, during Nero's persecution. This is also the, the beginning of what's known as Rabbinical Judaism. You have Temple Judaism, First Temple, Second Temple Judaism. And then when the temple was destroyed, now you have rabbinical Judaism. So they had to, the temple was central to their belief. So in rabbinical Judaism, they wrote down the Talmud, right? Um, That's also a primary source. We'll talk more about that when we actually talk about the Hebrew Bible, inshallah. Okay? So this... I must have missed it. Did you cover why you guys call those the synoptic gospels? Yeah. Why is that one eye? One eye meaning that they follow the basic same chronology of events. They're very similar in their chronology. So in their kulliyat, they're the same, but they have juziyat that are different. Rabbinical yeah. comes from rabbis? From it does, yeah. Okay. Yeah, rabbi or rabbi. Say rabbi, what does that mean? My lord or my master. Right. <clears throat> so the Gospel of Mark, I don't know if you guys have Bibles and if you've read oh, You should, you should get one and start reading it. Because this will make a lot more sense. Um, like I said, we have to really take up our our literacy in these things, take it seriously. Are we going to kind of cover the Gospel of Mark or questions? Yeah, we're doing right. So, in, in <clears throat> one seven and eight, where he says, "There cometh one mightier than I after me, 
the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stop down and unloose. Yeah, we'll talk about that. That's actually Yahya alayhi salam saying that. Yeah, we'll talk about that inshallah. Well, let's kind of go through the major themes of the gospel first. And then we'll actually go through the text itself in the original Greek and kind of look at translations and things like that. I also have an Arabic version of the Bible, which is really interesting. This is obviously done by missionaries uh, in order to convert uh, Muslims. It's done in Fusha Arabic. Uh, and there's a few things that... There's this uh, Italian max axiom that says, Traditore traditore, which means the translator is a traitor. All of translation is tafsir. Right? Anytime you translate anything. The Quran is not in English, the Quran is in Arabic. If you translate the Quran into any other, any other language, you're making tafsir because you're choosing words that Allah did not choose. Right? So why don't the Arabs have their own their Arab Christians? Why don't they have their own Arabic Bible? They do have it. So why are you using translation? Why not when it's, I mean, you see what I'm saying? You're saying it was, you said it was by, by who wrote it? Uh, this was by Christian missionaries. Missionaries. So yeah. why not the Christians that are from Arab lands and who are Arab why and Yeah, that's, what, that's who did this. Christian Arabs did this. Christian Arabs that are Christian, obviously, they translated the Bible into Quranic style Arabic for Muslims. So we'll look at that, inshallah. It's, it's, uh, and they use it themselves. That's yeah, of course, they use it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But this is specifically intended, this translation here is specifically intended for Muslims. Um, so, with Mark, there's really two, two periods. We can basically divide Mark into half. The first period is a Galilean ministry. Once again, I'm sorry, I know you already started this, but... So we're going to break down the four books. We're going to go to the New Testament. That's what we're messing with right now for yeah. a while. And then we're just going to break down Mark, and then yeah. we're going to break down what? Matthew, and then Luke, then John, and John. And then so we'll, we'll go to Paul. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. We're not going to touch the Old Testament during this. We haven't. We haven't yet. Are, are we going to the inshallah? Yeah, inshallah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the Galilean ministry is basically chapters one through eight. So there's 16 chapters in Mark's gospel, one through eight. Um, what's interesting about uh, the Galilean ministry is that there's no nativity. There's no molded of Isa Alaihissalam. There's no birth narrative. The gospel actually starts, Isa is 30 years old, and he's being baptized in the Jordan River. That's the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. There's no episode of the virgin birth, Mariam, the stable, following the star, the wise men. None of that is found in Mark's Gospel. The Gospel begins when Isa is an adult. Yes. Everything's in parables, from what I've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Shortly. So... In, uh, in this section here, 1 through 8, chapters 1 through 8, um, Jesus is the secret Messiah. There's something that William Reed coined called the Messianic Secret. We'll talk more about this when we come to it. The Messianic Secret is that Isa salam, he doesn't want to tell anybody that he's the actual Messiah. When he exercises demons and they fall down and they quote-unquote worship him and they say, you are the son of David, the son of God, he says, be quiet, and he rebukes them. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, theme that scholars have wrestled with. Why is Jesus keeping this a secret? We'll come back to that in a minute. The Galilean, Galilean ministry is about one year long. <clears throat> about one year. Okay? And then you have the second part, which is the Judean ministry, which is about a week long. The Galilean ministry, right? So Isa salam was raised in Nazareth. That's in the province of Galilee. This is in northern Palestine. Nazareth is a city in Galilee. It's like if I say San Ramon is in Contra Costa. Right? It's the city of the province of Galilee. Judea is in southern Palestine. That's the province. The city is Jerusalem. So Isa salam, according to the Gospel of Mark, he goes to Jerusalem, my son is dying. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem for his final week. Now, he comes into Jerusalem on what's known as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. 
Why is it called Palm Sunday? So there's a prophecy in the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament that the Messiah will come into Zion. Zion means, you know, Zion. You know the word like Zionism? Zion is a word for Jerusalem. It literally means city. Okay? How do you so? Zion. Or Zion. Well, that's in Hebrew. Don't be honest. Okay. I don't think you want to write that down. I think it's like that. Zion. And that means Jerusalem? Yeah. So like, uh, you know, Medina to Manawara, its its real name is Yathrib, but it's called Al Medina, which just means the city. If I tell you right now I'm going to the city tonight, where am I going? Frisco. San Francisco, right? But its name is San Francisco. So Jerusalem is its name. It's, it's also referred to as Sion. Um, so there's a prophecy in the book of Zechariah that says, Messiah will come into Jerusalem seated on a donkey uh, in humility. So that's exactly what happens on Palm Sunday, Isa alayhi salam. He comes into the city and people take palm leaves and they put it before his donkey as a show of respect. And they're saying things like Hosanna, which is a praise of God in Hebrew. Blessed is the one who, came, who comes in the name of the Lord, things like that. So the city is rejoiced at his coming. Um, I don't know if you noticed yesterday was Ash Wednesday. So Mardi Gras. Yeah. It's mostly Catholics, but they'll take palm leaves and burn them and, and make a cross on the, or a dot on the forehead. Uh, and this is to commemorate the 40-day fast of Isa de Salaam, okay, which, is, which is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. He fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. Uh, so the ashes represents uh, human frailty, that you're going to be ashes one day. Mm-hmm. You're going to decompose and be ashes. Um, so he enters Jerusalem Palm Sunday. So, you know, he preaches Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, which is actually Friday night, according to the lunar calendar. Uh, and so he preaches for four days. Then on Thursday night, he's arrested. Um, then on Friday, the following day, according to the Gospel of Mark, he's crucified. This is called Good Friday. Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and then two days later you have what Sunday? Easter, Easter Sunday. So this is the this is the week he spends in Jerusalem. Enters on Palm Sunday. Seven days later he's resurrected on Easter Sunday, according to the Gospel of Mark. So you can see that the ministry is only about a year in Mark's Gospel. It's very short. <clears throat> Now, some of the... I'm sorry, what do you mean by ministry? Jesus, he saw the son's preaching? It's when preaching. You say one year, his, yeah. so Mark is taking from perspective of one year long. Yeah. So from point A to point B is one so we year, would, all this. We would say that, for example, from the birth of the prophet to the wafat. So 23 years is the ministry of the prophet, I said. Okay. Although there's irhas, right? There's miracles. Uh-huh. that predate the Bi'atha. Okay. And Isa al Islam had that, like the virgin birth. Okay. But his commissioning, or Bi'atha, his raising as a prophet, didn't happen until he was 30 years old. And according to Mark, it was only a year long. It was very short. Very, very short. Right? Um, so the Judean ministry also begins chapter 8 and goes through 16. So this is the division of the, of the book of Mark. Uh, if you have the Galilean ministry and then the Judean ministry. And the Judean ministry culminates with the final week, which is called the Passion Week. The Passion Week. Okay. Some major themes of Mark's Gospel is eschatology. Did we talk about this last time? Eschatology means the study of last things. Mark's Gospel is very eschatological, meaning that it's... Uh, it's believed to be in a setting where people believed it was the end of the world. Mark is writing under the assumption that the events that are happening, the persecution in Rome, the destruction of the temple, uh, natural disasters, these are portents of the end of time. So Mark is always using this word in Greek, euthos, which means immediately, this is an adverb, Immediately this, immediately that. We'll talk about other opinions as to why scholars believe he does that. But 
on the surface, it seems like he's doing that because he's telling you that it's going to end very, very soon. In fact, there's prophecies in Mark that are put into the mouth of Jesus that simply did not happen. He says, there are some standing here that will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in great power. Referring to his second coming, apparently, which did not happen. He says, the present generation will live to see all of it. That didn't happen. Right? So, these are false prophecies that are put into the mouth of Jesus because Mark, the evangelist, whoever wrote Mark, remember it's, we can conveniently call him Mark, is taking cue from Paul, who believed that the end of time was during his lifetime. Another interesting theme of the Gospel of Mark is that it's Nasibi and Rafibi at the same time. So it hates on Ahlul Bayt and Isa and also hates on his Sahaba. Nasibi, so the, the Nasibi in, 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 uh, in Islamic history, the Nasibis were primarily the Khawarij. The Khawarij did not like the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet. And many of the Bani Umayyah as well would actually hunt down Ahlul Bayt because, you know, it was like a, a Nero complex. They thought that power would be taken from them. So, the Gospel of Mark, it presents the disciples of Jesus as well as his family as just completely oblivious to who he is. Just completely inept. Right? Just totally out to lunch. Why are you cowards? Oh, ye of little faith. Where is your faith? His, his brothers, James, his mother Mary, they're just presented as not knowing who this man is. They don't have a clue. It's anti-disciples and anti-family. Mark is writing for a Gentile audience in Rome. He's writing for Christians living in the diaspora and Jews living in the diaspora. And basically Mark's message is clear that Judaism is completely done. It's over. It's over. It's a superseded um, completely. So it's, m many would say that Mark is anti-Jewish in his outlook. Jews just don't get it. They just don't get it. Not even his mother gets it. Not even Maryam Ali Salam gets it. Not even James, who's the first uh, successor of Isa, he doesn't get it. Nobody gets it, except a Roman centurion at the foot of the cross of Mark 15, who says, this was the Son of God. A Roman pagan. He gets it. This is who he's trying to go after. Romans that are pagans that he can convert to Christianity. This is his attended audience. Justin Martyr, origin of Alexandria, they say very clearly that the reason why the temple was destroyed is because of the Jews' rejection of Isa Isa. This is according to Christian historians. <clears throat> Divine wrath for, for their uh, uh, rejection of the Jewish Messiah. We're talking about the Temple of Solomon? The Temple of Solomon, yeah. So in 67, 70, when it was destroyed, many early Christian scholars, early church fathers, believed that was wrath from God for rejecting Isaiah. Well, what do they say that the, the Jews at the time say? The Jews at the time say that we were persecuted and the Romans are, you know, they, they attacked us and that's what happened. They, yeah, wouldn't that's what? they wouldn't necessarily say that's because of, not necessarily that it was divine wrath. Well, certainly they don't believe in the Israelites. So what are they trying to dig up right now? Then? Hmm? What are they digging up? Something destroyed or something that's rare? No, they're trying to have the uh, Al-Aqsa Al Mosque yeah. collapse so they can raise up a third temple. They're just going to raise it up? Yeah, but it's, there's, it's there's, already been seen. Dr. Hacken, yeah. you know, through the vents, you can see them down their building. He, he's, he mentioned this. So it's not like there's a building down there that's, that's, that's ready to be dug up. It's just they're reconstructing what was once a building there. Yeah, they can raise something very quickly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The blueprints are done, and construction has begun. Okay. So, and a lot of you know, a lot of Muslims don't even know what Masjid Al-Aqsa is. It's not the Masjid Qubat Al-Sahra. It's not the Dome of the Rock. It's not Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's with the Black Dome. That's where the Temple used to be. Although the whole Temple Mount is, is sacred, Beit al Maqdis. <coughs> Another thing we mentioned is that. Mark's gospel is secretive, right? The messianic secret. So some scholars believe that Jesus is doing that, or that Mark is doing that, um, <clears throat> because 
uh, or Jesus is rebuking people who are saying he's the Messiah because he wants to live long enough to get to Jerusalem so that he can be crucified in Jerusalem. That's one way of looking at that. Because again, Galilee is a hotbed of Jewish fundamentalism, of zealotry, right? And the Romans are very good at stamping out these types of insurrections. So he's keeping things on the DL, right? Because if it comes out in Galilee, he won't make it down to Jerusalem, and then he didn't complete his mission. Right? Other scholars believe the reason why Mark mentions that is because Mark is trying to explain why his ministry was so short and why aren't there many converts to Christianity? Why is this just a handful of, of Christians in the world at the time? You can imagine some Jewish elements in conversation with the, the author of the Gospel of Mark saying, why do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? There's only a few Christians. And then Mark would say, well, it was a messianic secret. He would rebuke people who would claim that he was the Son of God or the Messiah. Because all 12 Mark, not... That's in the first part of the Gospel, the Galilean ministry. Okay. Well, in in Jerusalem, he goes public. Okay. And Christians would say, because now he's in Jerusalem, and now he needs to fulfill his mission and die for the sins of humanity, so he goes public. <clears throat> Another uh, major theme is the cross. <clears throat> Basically, Mark's Gospel is an extended passion narrative. It's all about the cross, the crucifixion. That's where the focus is. Okay. So again, the focus of all four of these Gospels is the cross and its significance. Now Paul is going to talk about its significance, but the, the teaching of Isa al -Islam, the sunnah, if you will, of Isa al -Islam, is totally dwarfed in light of what happens on the cross. That's the most important thing. So even if you look at the Gospel of Mark, the second half of the Gospel of Mark, um, the vast majority of the second half of the Gospel of Mark is in that one week, the Passion Week. Okay. That's, that's the whole point of the God, is leading up to this climax. <clears throat> the cross is very central. And of course, what's known as the Parousia, which is the second coming of Jesus. Oh, what's the wall? Play with his memory, right? And the Prophet cannot show this type of weakness. Even Ayub alayhi salam, he had boils on his body, but they were underneath his clothes, not on his face, not on his hands, because anything that will repel you from a Prophet is against Nabuwa. A Prophet cannot do that. It's impossible for a Prophet to have something that will, that will uh, compromise the strength of the Dawah. So many, many uh, ulama, they say that story is, is not true of Labid casting his phone off. Okay. I think they started me. Yeah, yeah, I guess he's doing something. With the mic. He's doing something. Mic What's interesting is a student of Justin Martyr named Tatian, you don't have to write this down, but Tatian, he, uh, he actually tried to harmonize all four Gospels because. The pagans at the time were saying, how do you believe this? There's so many contradictions. Because pagans and Christians used to have debates, you know, in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century. Why do you believe these books are all contradictory? So Tatian, he harmonized all of them. It's called the Dia Tesseron, through four. All four Gospels into a single narrative. And he was able to basically harmonize all the contradictions, except for the genealogy of Isa and Isabel. Matthew and Luke give two completely different genealogies. Yeah? You mentioned um, the Semitic and uh, James. Who is James in this? Oh, oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna cover it. You said James only? Yeah, so James represents Semitic Christianity. James is Yaqub Hat Sadiq, the brother of Isa alayhi Sada, the leader of the Fuqara, the Ibyunim in Jerusalem. He's the leader of the Christ, you know, Christians in quotes. Right? And there's no such thing as Christians at this time. Everyone's Jewish. Everyone's, and, you know, they all worship together. They pray together. They fast together. Um, James, is he sound like James' brother? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about why. Okay. Did, did Isa Islam ever meet Musa Islam? Musa? Yeah. No. 
Um, well, the reason why I bring that is because... In, in not during their ministries, that's, that's not possible, but during the Isra, they did meet. They did the Isra, and they prayed on the Temple Mount. Okay. The Prophet says, he met all of the Rusul, at least 313. Some say all of the Nabiyin were there as well. Allahu Alam. So, this is really interesting here. Around this time, there was a document written that we're going to call Q. This predates Mark and is independent from Paul. Q Okay? <clears throat> Scholars call it Q, which is German for Quelle, and in Greek it's called Logia. We can call it also the Sayings Gospel. The Q source document. The Q source document. The Sayings Gospel. Okay? There's a document written contemporary with Paul's ministry, so it has not been influenced by Paul, okay, that Mark summarily ignores. He either doesn't know about it, or he doesn't like it. Who knows? Maybe Q represented Semitic Christianity. And we actually know what Q contains, even though we don't have it, and I'll tell you why. Is because Matthew and Luke, they draw from it. They draw from Q. So let me put this up in a way that's more intelligible. I'm going <laughs> to just erase this part here. I'm just going to write Mark up here, and I'll show you how Matthew and Luke, what they do with Mark. That's really interesting. <clears throat> you have Mark here around 70. Then you have this document called Q, which is probably written around 45 to 50 maybe even earlier. So then you have Matthew's Gospel around 80 of the Common Era. And Matthew will copy verbatim 80% of Mark. Mark is his skeleton that he builds upon. Okay? Which, of course, is troubling because Mark is definitely not a disciple. But Christians believe Matthew is a disciple. Why would a disciple copy from a 10-year-old boy who wasn't even there? Right? Doesn't make any sense. If you're a companion of Isa, and you're an adult, and you were there the whole time, would you depend on the work of a 10-year-old boy? A, a person who wasn't even there? Nonetheless, 80% of Mark is copied verbatim into Matthew. Matthew at times also makes some editing. He redacts a few things. He doesn't like what Mark does. He doesn't like his grammar. Too much information. Sometimes he changes things. Because mm -hmm. in Mark, in a certain pericope, it says a, a, a person who's asking Jesus for help keeps begging him, and Jesus became angry. Matthew changed that to he was filled with compassion. That's not a slip of the pen. That's a completely different verb. Because an angry Jesus doesn't sound very good. He also uses Q. That means he had access to this document. He also has access to another document, or oral tradition, that we're going to call M. And M stands for Special Messian Material. We'll come back and explain that in Special what material? Oh, okay. So special I can't read spell. Methian. So Matt Ian. Matthew. Yeah. So this is special materials, which means that it's only found in Matthew. Okay? It's only it's called M. Uppercase M. Only found in Matthew. And there's no sanad for it or we don't know where, where he got it from. It's probably from oral tradition or maybe he had some sort of document, but nothing's been found. Special, so this is only in Matthew. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Matthew says that Isa alayhi salam said that uh, many will come to me in the day of judgment and say, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, in your name perform miracles? 
Then Jesus says, I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you, your deeds are evil. Right? So there's a saying on the Yom al Qiyama, right? Isa al Salam is talking to other Christians who do these things in his name. That's only found in Matthew, no other gospel, which means that Matthew either simply invented it, which is a possibility, right? Or he had another source that he took it from. It was an oral tradition that he knew, or he had an actual uh, document of some sort. But he made use of Q. We'll talk about Q more in a minute. Now, Luke writes, this is Luke, and he's writing around 85-90. Okay? So, let's, let's go back to Matthew for a minute. So you can imagine Matthew. He's sitting at his desk. You know, Matthew, whoever this person is. He's sitting at his desk. What does he have in front of him? He has Mark's gospel in front of him. Okay? He has Q in front of him. And something else, possibly, called this M that he's drawing from. So two, maybe three documents, and he's making his gospel. Does everyone understand? Yeah. Okay, that's what Matthew has in front of him. What does Mark have in front of him? Possibly nothing. Probably just oral tradition that he's writing down. Maybe there's a document, maybe not. Okay. So, so we don't know if it's coming from Q or anything like that? What is? Uh, Mark. Mark is definitely not using Q. Okay. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Luke now also incorporates Mark as a skeleton. That's why you have the synoptic gospel. This is called the synoptic problem. The synoptic problem is, why do they follow the same sequence of events? It's because they're interdependent on one another. This is why. So Luke actually takes 65% of Mark verbatim. So Luke is now sitting at his desk 10 years after Matthew, and he has Mark in front of him. He also has Q in front of him. And he also has something else that's called L. Lucan. Special Lucan material. That's only found in Luke. And no other gospel. Like the Good Samaritan. The Prodigal Son. Right? Some of the most celebrated pericopes of Isa a.s. of Jesus Christ, Allahu Adam, are in special Lucan material. Okay? So now the question is, what is Q? What are the contents of Q? Do you see how we can sort of reconstruct Q? How can we do it? What do they have in common that is not in Mark? Right? That's Q. Whatever they have in common that's missing from Mark, they took from Q. Yeah. So scholars say Q is about 235 verses. What does it contain? It contains nativity narrative. The Mawlid of Isa a.s. Q is the best source of the New Testament. It's the earliest and least corrupted. What does nativity mean? Mawlid, the birth narrative of Isa a.s. Native. Remember in the book, the story of Mary, when she withdrew to her people. The narrative, Molin. What else does it have? The ministry of John the Baptist in much more detail. The Baptist is mentioned in Mark, right? But Matthew and Luke have material that is missing from Mark, which means it originated from Q. Does anyone see what's going on here? I know it's difficult at the beginning. You have to sort of hang with it. Also, the celebrated Sermon on the Mount. Of course, Luke calls it the Sermon on the Plain, but it's the same thing. It's taken from Q. What does the Sermon on the Mount contain? It contains the Lord's Prayer. The so-called Lord's Prayer. Who knows how to recite the Lord's Prayer? What the hell? <laughs> that is the true Lord's Prayer. <laughs> right? walk in the of the death. No, that's a psalm. So, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Sounds very beautiful. It's in Rudy. Huh? It's in Rudy. It's in Rudy, yeah. So, yeah, before 
you know, the 49ers in the locker room before they actually recite the Lord's Prayer in English. But here's the thing about translation. Translation it just doesn't do justice. This Lord's Prayer actually rhymes in Syriac. Right? The language, the original language of Esau and Esau is Syriac. So, the oldest manuscripts, obviously, of Matthew and Luke are in Greek. However, they translate the Greek back into Syriac. Right? So, one time I was in a church, and I said, do you want to hear what the original Injil of Esau and Esau sounded like? He said, sure. And I said, what is that? He said, that's the Quran. I said, what do you mean? That's, that's what the Injil sounded like. So then I recited this. That's the Lord's Prayer in Syria. It sounds like Quran, right? That's because it's from Q. It's the least contaminated, and it's the earliest. However, it's still in Greek, not in Syria. So that was Syriac translated from Greek. Imagine the original now. It's like having Ikhlas, Surah Al-Ikhlas, and then losing the Arabic. It's like having Surah Al-Ikhlas, translating it into Chinese, losing the original Arabic, and then trying to translate the Chinese back into the original Arabic. You're not going to get it. It's not even close. Okay. There's such subtleties in, in language. People have to learn Arabic. People always say, it's too hard. It's too hard. Right. The Quran says that the, the, Arabic, the Quran is easy. We get it into our heads that Arabic is so hard. Right. Like Imam Suhaib one time, he said his brother came up to him and he said, I'm going to drop the Arabic class. He said, why? It's too hard. He said, where did you go to school? Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> It's too hard. If I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, it's not too hard. You should try to learn it. You lose so much. I mean, it's just, uh, but they said the meaning of the Lord's Prayer is kind of like Fatah. It's similar, yeah. That's what it's, it's Fatah. Yeah, our Lord who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There, there, there's some certain parallels. There's certain parallels. But there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that says that Jibreel Alayhi Salam descended upon him and said, there's two things given to you, the like of which is given to no other prophet. No. The Khatim of Al-Baqarah, the end of Baqarah, and Al-Fatiha. Al-Fatiha is revealed twice. This is the dominant opinion. It is revealed twice to the Prophet Sallallahu Once in Mecca, and once in Medina. And what is the wisdom behind it? It's because Allah says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Which is a very interesting construction. that I can't... You just have to learn Arabic. Yeah. <laughs> Allah didn't say, نَعْبُدُكَ وَنَسْتَعِينُكَ We worship you... We ask you for help. It's called maf'ul muqaddam. Maf'ul muqaddam, which denotes exclusivity. If I say na'buduka to Allah, that means I worship you, but I might worship other things. But iyaka na'budu, only you, we worship. So, ibadah and isti'ana in Mecca, right? Which is basically, what are the ahkam in Mecca? There's no fasting, there's no prayer, there's no hajj. It's belief in Allah and have good character. Now in Medina, there's ahkam, right? And so it was revealed again. Meaning that there's no conflict between the exoteric and the esoteric. Between the zahin and the batin. That both are equally important. <clears throat> so the dominant opinion is that it's revealed twice. It's really interesting. Um, so, this idea, um, oh, I also want to say something. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You said the Bible was written in Greek. Uh-huh. The language that you said was in Syria. Syria. But then it was translated back to Syria. Yeah, in the 4th century. And that's equivalent of having the Arabic Quran, translating into Chinese, losing the original, and trying to reconstruct the Arabic Quran. And you would make mistakes. Like you would say, okay, the Chinese says, you we worship, you we ask for help. But that's not what it says. Major difference. There's many examples. Anyway, um, so on the Sermon on the Mount, there's things called the Beatitudes. A series of blessings that Jesus makes. You probably heard these. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Uh, blessed are the poor, they shall see God. Blessed, 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 right? 
There's eight or nine or ten of them or something. These are Beatitudes. That's in the Q. Yeah, this is from Q. There's also the antitheses. Can I write this? I'm going to write this before. Antithesis of Jesus, which are also during the Sermon on the Mount. This is when he says something like, you have heard it say from the Torah that if you commit adultery, you have sinned. But I say unto you, if you look at a woman with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. You have heard it say this, but I say this. You have heard it say that, but I say this. Right? This type of um, antithesis, this juxtaposition of two different opinions. Right? This is also very reminiscent of Semitic revelation. It's called Tibaq in Arabic. Or Shamsi, or Duha, or Qamari, right? This opposite uh, idea that's being presented. So with Rahman, the dualism, for example. It sounds like Semitic revelation. Whether it is or not, Allah wa Allah. Is that very similar to Mar the, the pericopes and Mark? Or would that be two different things for the antithesis and Q synoptic? Uh, I don't think I understand the question. Well, like the parables in Mark, mm -hmm. what would that be? Uh, something? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, no, there's the parables in Mark um, are from oral tradition. So um, there is a little bit of that as well. There is a little bit of Tibak in Mark as well. We'll, we'll get to the more of so How long was the, the Sermon on the Mount? Is that one so event that, in, in, in history, or is it a series of sayings that are all cobbled together as the Sermon on the Mount? The and Sermon on the Mount was, was one day um, in, in Galilee, where Isa alayhi salam climbed a mountain and gave the Sermon. So it includes the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and these antitheses. Really it's true. also the day of the, the bread and the story where the bread went around. Right. There's, I think there's a, yeah, there's a miracle at the end there, too, a food miracle. So this is what Q contains. Okay. You said it's the least corrupted or least contaminated. Uh-huh. So it's the least contaminated because it doesn't have Pauline influence. It was written contemporary with Paul. So Paul's out doing his missionary journeys, saying God knows what, right? basically corrupting the gospel from our perspective. But Q originates from that period. Like Mark is heavily influenced by Pauline thinking and ideology. And so are the rest of the gospels, basically the entire New Testament, except for this Q here in Matthew and Q here in Luke. Yeah. Who know, uh, like when we talk about Q-source documents and all this breakdown and everything, yeah. the M and the L, do Christian uh, scholars or priests, or who, who knows this? Or is this just from our perspective, or is this is their perspective? That we no, should, this, is, this, is this, standard. Standard. this is standard. Uh, you learned this in seminary. If you're a graduate student in a Christian seminary, okay. Jewish seminary, this is what they teach you. This, this, this is a theory, uh -huh. but it's the most widely held theory in that of, of Q. This is called the two-source theory. Mm -hmm. Two source theory. Two source meaning what? Matthew and Luke. Yes. That's it. Is something Matthew? The two source theory meaning that Matthew and Luke had Mark and Q. That's called the two source theory. There's another theory called the two gospel theory, which is not popular at all anymore. It's also known as the Farmer Greisbach theory, which means that Matthew was written first. Okay, then Luke, then Mark sort of drew from them, but nobody really believes that. Because why would Mark leave out so much beautiful information about the teaching of Isa alayhi yeah. Unless Matthew believed that Q was not authentic, because possibly Q represents that Semitic strain of Christianity that Mark didn't like necessarily. The dominant opinion is the two source theory the existence of Q. What I'm trying to say is, this is probably very close to the Injil of Isa That's the whole point of Q. That's why Muslims talk about it. If we can find this, there's probably a written document. How do we know it's written, not just oral? 
because there's so much correspondence between Luke and Matthew when it comes to Q, that unless they just had phenomenal memories, which is a possibility, right? Unless they had phenomenal memories, they actually had a physical codex or something in front of them that is Q that they're taking from their writing. Yes? Is, is Mark and Luke uh, heavily influenced with the Hellenistic tradition? Or can you say also that it's yeah, yeah, from the from synoptic? Them. Or, All of them are, especially John. All of them. Now, Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience, but still there's a lot of Hellenistic um, influence. God, it was a good question. <laughs> Can you repeat the two-source theory? Do what? What is the two-source theory? The two-source theory theory assumes Markin priority. Assumes Markin priority. What does that mean? That means Mark wrote first, then Matthew and Luke, and Matthew and Luke each had two sources, Mark and Q. That's the theory. That's the most widely held theory in New Testament studies to this day. Just to clarify, Q doesn't exist as Mark exists. Like, we have the book of Mark, but yeah. we don't have this. It's a theory. It's a the hypothetical theory. document. Okay. But we don't have an actual text that says Q. Okay. But most scholars believe it did exist because Matthew and Luke are quoting from it almost exactly in verbatim. There's so much literal correspondence between the two, right, that they conclude it must have been a book, because how can they remember so much information verbatim so perfectly? Yeah. Now, when, when you say that, that the Christian scholars, they agree that this and that and the other thing, or anything that the Christian scholars, are, who exactly are this, the, 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 you know, the scholars of Christendom, is it the Catholic, the Catholic Church? Is it, you know, who, who exactly are we talking about when we say Christians believe this or Christians believe that? Christian academics. And are they the Catholics? Or who, they're Catholics, Catholic? they're Protestants. And they all agree they're on atheists. this. They're scholars of the New Testament. Okay. Yes. You go to a GTU, this is what they teach you. You go to Harvard Seminary, go to Yale Seminary, that's what they teach you. And in the Vatican also, that's what they teach you? you yeah, this is a standard okay, theory. This is standard. It's okay. a standard all around the world. Okay. All around the world. This is the standard theory. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to say. The the dates between Mark and Matthew and Luke it's it's almost like injunction with one another. I mean, yes. so do you think that there was a heavy influence as a collaboration with Matthew and Luke? Most scholars don't believe that. Most scholars don't believe that Matthew knew Luke. That would certainly explain why they have certain material in common. The vast majority of scholars don't believe that. They they're writing independent of one another. But they're both dependent on this Q sort of document. Because they're just in different locales. Right? They're writing for different audiences. <clears throat> so that's the thing. If we can find Q, as in the discovered. So you said that we have the original manuscripts that they wrote? No, we don't. We don't have anything. We don't have what's known as the autograph copy. Like, imagine again, Matthew's sitting down with his papyrus. Got his pen. Here's Mark. Here's Q. And here's oh, here's Mark. Here's Q. And here's um, M. Right. And Q and M may not exist in book form, by the way. Yeah. So he's writing. He's writing. He's writing. What he wrote is called the autograph gospel. Yeah. So we have that. We don't have that. Oh, we don't. We don't have a copy of 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 that. Of, <laughs> of, of any, any, of, any, any book of the New Testament. The earliest complete book of any book is is dated to 200 of the Common Era. That's uh, 200. The earliest complete New Testament codex of all 27 books is dated to the fourth century. It's called the Codex Sinaiticus. We'll talk some more about that. So, what gives um, these books, I guess, so much credibility that they are the original? They're, they're like a replica of the autograph copy. That's the whole study of textual criticism. The purpose of this book is to actually reconstruct the autograph of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, I mean, is it, is it kind of like a faith? Like, they have to believe it by faith? Yeah. The originals are lost. So this is an eclectic text, which means you have hundreds, thousands of manuscripts. You do certain tests on them to see which one is the best. 
and then you include them into your gospel. That's the Greek New Testament. And are the gospels currently being modified? As, I mean, yeah, yeah, all the scholars. Time. Yeah. They so can, they can, they have the freedom to add and deduct things as yeah. they wish. Yeah, we'll get into some of that. That's textual criticism. The point of textual criticism is to establish the autograph text of the gospel, which we don't have, but to re-establish it. What, what, what was the original language for uh, Matthew and Luke? Everything's in Greek. Everything's in Greek. The original is in Greek. That's by consensus. Um, so I want to just take you just a few minutes here uh, through some of Mark's gospel. So again, I highly encourage you to buy a Bible, get a Bible, because this is going to go in one ear and out the other. But they vary, though. Like, I might buy a Bible that will vary from your Bible, right? Just get any English translation. Any English, because I have the Greek here, so we'll, we'll compare the Greek with the uh, with your English translation. And, sorry, one more question. The Greek Bible that you have is like the, like you're giving the example of the Ikhlas. It was in Arabic, translated mm -hmm. to Chinese, lost the Arabic, and then retranslated into Arabic. Is that the same idea with the Greek Bible? No, this is this is Greek. This is the language that the that the Gospel of Mark was originally written in. We just don't have the original okay. autograph or the copy of the autograph or the copy of the copy of the autograph or the copy of the copy of that. And it's because the scribes at the time were literate were Greek. Literate people were writing. In it was a lingua franca. Yeah, Paul wrote his letters in Greek, not That's in Syriac, cool. because everyone understood Greek. At least the the, the people living around the Mediterranean. Pagans understood Greek. You want to read from this? So let's go to Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the very beginning of the Gospel. I just want to show you one thing here, and then we'll Mark says, read in the Bible. Mm -hmm. okay. so people always tell me, yeah, this is too hard, and Mark, I can't do this. And Mark, what? If you go to a class, you know, if you go to, if you take a economics or something at Stanford, would you ever go to the teacher? This is too hard. So you make an adjustment. You rise to the occasion. Why can't we be like that with religious studies? Why do we have to dumb everything down? You guys aren't dumb. Every single one of you is a lot smarter than me. I had a C plus average in high school. Yeah. I'm not very smart. Trust me. If I can do this, you can do this very easily. So we have to rise to the occasion. We need to buy textbooks. We do do extra research on this, right? Look up, look up some, look up beatitudes. Look up, look at the examples. Go and Google things, Wikipedia things. Although be careful, but do some more research. Right? So there's several books that I recommend. Stephen L. Harris. This is written for undergrad, the New Testament. Stephen L. Harris. This is written for graduate students, but it's still an introduction. It's called the, An Introduction to the New Testament by Raymond Brown. This is like, this is gold. Yeah. Raymond Brown? Raymond, Raymond Brown? What a D? Yeah. Are these like, well, unquote, the series on the, the test, the, the books? Or? Yeah. Introduction. The, uh, an introduction to the New Testament by Raymond Brown and the New Testament. By let's put the title here. All right. By uh, Stephen L. Harris. Which will help you in film that time. We have to be serious when we want to study these things. You can get a King James Version, yeah. Try to get a new King James Version or a NIV, New International Version, or a New Jer Jerusalem Version, Revised Standard Version, Gideon's Translation. Don't get a New World Translation. Don't get a uh, Jehovah's Witness Translation. And definitely don't get a Book of Mormon. Why not the Jehovah's Witness? Jehovah's Witness don't believe in the deity of Christ. So their translation uh, is very unique, and it's not going to really help you understand Orthodox Christianity. 
I mean, it's good for entertainment, but I actually agree with a lot of their translations. I just want to look at this first verse of Mark, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the Gospel. In Greek it says, Arche tu evangeliu Iesu Christu. What does your translation say? Which one? Anyone. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Number one you're talking about? Uh, all right. Yeah. You have uh, two translations? I got something here. What does the other one say? This is Dictionary, Holy Bible. Better edition, King James. What King, about this one there? King James. This what, is that new. I. What does it say? Read it. International one. Note. Read one one. Read one one says the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written. I in a That's the first verse. It is. Why would yeah. you say that? Okay. So you notice? Well, you can't. You don't understand Greek. But I read the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. About Jesus Christ, the Son what of God. The, the Son of God. God. Right. Also so that phrase yeah. is disputed. In my Greek edition, done by scholars, the phrase theu, son of God, is in brackets. Brackets means that it's disputed. Now, George, uh, Bruce Metzger, who is foremost in textual criticism in the New Testament, he says the son of God here is a scribal expansion. That's how they say it. What does that mean? That it's a forgery. It's completely fabricated. A scribal, right? A scribal expansion. Yeah. Uh, the version that I read, it was the New Oxford Standard Edition. Mm. They said that in the, um, in the commentary on the bottom, they said uh, it wasn't present in the earlier manuscripts. Edition. Yes. So, edition of the I want you to write this down. Scribal expansion. Right? This is called an alif in Hebrew. It's been a day Aleph O one. Aleph O one. So New Testament manuscripts all have numbers assigned to them. Okay? Aleph O one is the Codex Sinai Ticus. This is the oldest complete New Testament codex ever discovered. It's dated 375 CE. This is the, in other words, this is the oldest New Testament on earth. The oldest, most ancient, complete New Testament. Because huh? there's fragments that date before this. Fragments. There's a fragment of John from the year 125, which is a type of credit card. But that's very small. The oldest, complete New Testament is called the Codex Sinaiticus, also known as Aleph 01. That's his catalog number. Aleph 01, it's a codex, meaning a book, a mushaf. Codex means mushaf, it's not a scroll. It's written on animal skin, on vellum. If you read the Codex Sinaiticus, Mark 1 1, it says, Arche tu Evangelio Iesu Christo, period. Beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. No Son of God. And usually, New Testament textual critics go by the rule, the earlier the better. That's a good standard rule. That's not necessarily always true, but generally, the earlier the better. Why was Son of God added then? Well, because it's in the beginning. It's because the Gospel of Mark is, is Christologically anemic. What does anemic mean? To have like no blood. blood. Yeah, it's weak. It's, it's, it's theologically weak. If you read John, very high Christology. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word made flesh. The Father and I are one, right? In John, very high Christology. In Mark, the only person who calls Jesus the Son of God, that believes in him, is a Roman pagan. In, in Mark chapter 15. So, Scribes of the New Testament, scribes of Mark, who are copying Mark, they said to themselves, this gospel is so weak in its theology, we need to buff it up a little bit. We need to put some theology on it. Like we put ornaments on a tree, we have to make it look nicer. So they said, let's put something at the beginning of the gospel that lets people know this is a gospel that has a high Christology. So right after, in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they put Son of God. 
And he leaves it here. The UBS, United Bible Society, they leave it here, but they put it in brackets, which tells you they're disputed. But most ancient authorities, all ancient authorities, do not contain the verse. But this is what people are saying, so we're going to include it. This is what they're saying, right? وقالت النصارى المسيح ابن الله ذلك قولهم بأفواههم. That the Christians say, Isa is ibn Allah. This is what they're saying. That's what the Quran says. But that's not the reality. Now, let's look at the Arabic. Mark 1 1. So it says, Zuhuru Yuhanna al Ma'midan. So, Zuhur is like the manifestation of John the Baptist. That's how the title is. But it says, Hadihi Bidaya to Injili Yasur al Masih ibn Allah. This is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Is that in brackets also? Is not. Not in brackets. Mm. Right? So this is Majazi. Ibn Allah. So Majazi means it's figurative. Right? You can say Ibn for something uh, out of endearment. If I'm teaching a class of little children and I say, Ya Buna Ya, you have to try harder. It means Ya Ibn means. And somebody might overhear me and say, he's white, he's, you're brown, what are you talking about? Is he your son? Is he a white wife? Say, no. You know, for example, what that is. Say, Abu Nayyam means, you know, my, it's a term of endearment. Right? Like the Quran says, Ibn Sabil. Ibn Sabil, son of the road. What is Ibn Sabil? It's a street, Ibn Sabil. What a mess I can. Huh? Like, yeah, the guy on the street. The son of the road. The guy who lives on the street. Right? The homeless guy. Right? So it's figured in Majazi. So this is how it's used in the Old Testament. It's used like this. It's used figuratively. The Christians take it literally. That Jesus is the Son of God, literally, which means he shares an essence with God. Okay. So, Walada, like I can call my uncle Abi. Right? Abi. He's not my he's not the father who begot me. But you know, it's he has the status of a father. It's a respectful title. But I can't say walidi. That comes from walada awlada yulidu. That's only for my father who begot me. Okay? So both of these ideas are condemned in the Quran. That Isa is Ibn Allah, even though it was a figurative expression of the Old Testament, the Christians corrupted it. And this idea that Allah has walad, a literal son, is also condemned in the Quran. Yes? Um, is there an opinion that says, um, well, according to the Christians, that say that um, Jesus wasn't actually the son of God because um, I went to the seminar in NCC and there was a reverend that came there and he said, um, he said it kind of like what you said, that it was more figuratively and they took it literally. So are there a group of Christians that believe this and are they separate? <laughs> Um, that's not Orthodox Christianity. I mean, it seems like every Christian you talk to these days has their own opinion. I mean, I've come across Methodist pastors that don't believe in the divinity of Christ, but that's not Orthodox Christianity. And I, I applaud them for having that position. Right? Because to say that Isa is the literal son of God and he shares an essence is pure shirk. Right? So they say it's figurative, and that's fine. But since the concept was so corrupted by the time of the Quran, the Quran does not say that. The Quran says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَ بَلْ عِبَادُ مُكْرَمُونَ They say Allah has most gracious has taken a son. بَلْ عِبَادُ مُكْرَمُونَ No, they're, they're servants raised in honor. They're honorable servants. Right? Meaning it's, it's they're, they're calling them, you know, it's a title that means, it's an honorific title that they're taking literally. So that's an example of it. Uh, so I think we'll stop there, inshallah. We'll entertain maybe a couple of questions. Yes, sir. I came across in the online it says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's Matthew. That's um, not Mark. Yeah. That's Matthew 1 1. So Matthew begins with the genealogy and then he goes through the nativity. Mark does not give a genealogy, doesn't feel the need. 
I mean, it does not get the nativity narrative, the birth narrative. Yes? But, 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 but when you look at the different, like, the different versions of the, the Bibles you have, different languages, are there any, of, like, for example, like Orthodox Greek or the Coptic Christian, any of their Bibles that you would consider more authentic than others? Or are they all because they've been translated and they've kind of morphed, they're all kind of the same for the state? Um, they all basically use the same canon of scripture. There are subtle differences in some translations, uh, but the Greek is the Greek, and the, the best, if you want to stay on the cutting edge of what is considered New Testament, you really have to go with, like, eclectic, critical editions, like the UBS 4th edition, or I have, you know, the Nestle Allen 27th edition. Uh, but basically, every New Testament on earth that is used by Christian congregations is basically the same in any translation except for, like, Jehovah's Witness. But the Greek is really interesting because there's nuances there. And sometimes there, is, there are some differences between them, and sometimes they're major between translations. Yes? The Isaris Salam with the Angel, was it meant for only the time of its people, not support, the message wasn't supposed to go beyond or outside of its borders, region? Well, that's the way we understand it. That he was a messenger sent to the children of Israel. So his message was to prepare them for the coming of the Prophet and to reinvigorate um, or to reestablish the spiritual aspect of the Torah right, that had been lost over time. Uh, so when we'll talk about this in later, but when Constantine becomes the emperor and he endorses the other side, Hellenistic Christianity, then retaining your Semitic Christianity is very dangerous and it costs you your life. So slowly but surely, the Ivionim, the Jewish Christianity, Hellenistic uh, Semitic Christianity was marginalized into oblivion. It did not survive the Church synod and councils. So, so this perspective with re respect to uh, Mark, um, let's see, Mark thirteen ten before the end of the gospel must be proclaimed to all nation. Mm -hmm. That could be like, what's what's with respect to that? That could be a, a, an example of Mansukh in the New Testament. <clears throat> so Isa alayhi salam. Yeah, there's something similar at the end of Matthew called the Great Commission. The gospel itself makes, uh, abrogates other parts of the gospel, just like the Quran abrogates other verses of the Quran in the Ahkam. So initially, the gospels, the disciples were told to go only to Bani Israel, but at the end of the gospel, when their teaching is complete, they can go and evangelize other Jews in the Mediterranean, and that's exactly what they did. But when they did that, they came into conflict with Pauline elements that had a different understanding of the gospel, because Paul had gotten there first. And we'll talk more about that. Paul actually talks about these things in the Galatians and Philippians, that there's different Christians saying different things. Don't believe them. They're, they're dogs and they're, they're enemies of the cross and things like that. Yes? I think, uh, I think Bart Ehrman was here discussing the separation between gospel writers and Jesus. It's a problem that he was saying, like, yeah, you know, Jesus spoke like Syriac and then the gospel writers. Not only did they speak Greek, which is a different language, they also did read, which means they were educated. Yeah, he probably knew some Greek, definitely. He probably knew some Latin. Very, uh, it's a very eclectic uh, environment. Um, he probably uh, obviously knew Hebrew and, and Syriac. Um, but the general populace, they spoke Syriac. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, we don't send a messenger except in the language of his qawm. Right? So most likely, he, the Injil is revealed in the Syriac language. I mean, that's the, the dominant opinion that Jesus spoke Syriac. Another thing that's interesting is if Matthew is a disciple, which is, you know, church tradition, and he's writing in AD of the common era, how old does that make him? This is why nobody believes Matthew, the disciple, actually wrote Matthew. 
because he'd be around 80 years old. Let's say he's the same age as Isa alayhi and he was born in the year zero. So when Isa alayhi is 33, he's also 33. And then he waits till 80 to write. John wait, waits until, um, born and born. John waits in, until the year 100. That means he's 100 years old. And the book of Acts says that John was illiterate in the year uh, 35. He was illiterate. So this man who's illiterate at 35, he suddenly, when he's 100, he writes this gospel talking about the logos. And his Greek is like amazing. and It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Why would he wait so long to write something down? He probably didn't write it. Yes. Actually, I also have another question about, about Mark, because it says that, like, in Mark, in the beginning, like, it says that, uh, like, Jesus went into, like, synagogues and started preaching and stuff, and when well, I was reading, I was thinking, like, well, why would the Jews at that time, in the synagogue, just do this kind of younger guy that comes in and starts, they don't even know him to be, like, a rabbi, or whatever, why would they even believe, you know, you know what I'm saying, like, why would they even just think, like, who's this guy, what is he even doing here talking to us, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of like, uh, because I think, because, you know, Jews, they have, like, a tradition and everything they have, and they have rules and laws, like, like we do, and I just think it's kind of weird that they would just have this, let this guy come in and start preaching for everybody like a, like a rabbi, you know, maybe he was kind of young. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is primarily why he was rejected, according to Mark, by the people of Galilee. And his, you know, like we said, his own family members thought he was insane, uh, which is a slight, obviously, against Mariam, salam, but that's what the gospel actually says. Of course, Luke says something very different, because Luke really raises the status of Mary, but... Uh, and also the fact that he's single, which is, you know, a Christian belief. And some Muslims believe that as well. Nothing wrong with believing that. But a 30-year-old man in that environment who's single is very, very highly, highly unorthodox. Very unusual. Life expectancy back then is about 40 years old. By the time you're 38 or 39, you're a grandfather. Uh, usually boys will get married at 16 and girls at 12. So a 30-year-old man who's a rabbi and not married, well, that's just... It doesn't sound Semitic at all. It's something, it's something different. What is Hosanna? Hosanna is Hebrew, um, which is like a Tadbir type of thing. It's like a, it's a praise of God. We'll talk more about that. Yeah. <laughs> And Matthew of Luke with the Jews. Mm-hmm. Is it fair to assume that from from Muslim's perspective, uh, Injil is closer, closer to Mark and uh, Luke and Matthew, not to Mark? Uh, with respect to Q, yeah. With respect to Q, there's nothing in Q, from to my opinion, there's nothing in Q that contradicts the Quran or Sunnah or Hadith. There's nothing in Q. There are no passion predictions in Q. There's no passion material. There's no passion. This is really big. You know, you know, some would say, well, how do you know that? And, and, you know, it's an argument from absence and so on and so forth. But the fact that, you know, Matthew and Luke, their passion narratives either come from their own special material or from Mark, but it's not from Q, which means probably that Q did not contain a passion narrative, which may indicate that he wasn't crucified at all. And do the scholars identify that what part of Luke or Matthew Contains the two portions, the two documents. Yes, they can identify they can what they have in common that is missing from Mark. We can reconstruct Q. You can buy books right now. It says the saying gospel, Q source, and it's it's right there because they're just taking from Matthew and Luke what they have in common. There's probably a lot more to it. Maybe there's less. Maybe they embellished a few things, but you can pretty much reconstruct it. Oh, nice. <laughs> so next time, inshallah, we'll go through a little bit more of Mark, give some verses, some highlights. Let's just summarize quickly. The main thing about Paul that's important is knowing his theology and kind of his background. Uh, most of what he writes in his letters are is utterly intelligible anyway. It doesn't really make sense to anybody. Nobody knows what he's talking about most of the time. Um, but sometimes there is some clarity. We can derive some, some Christology from that. Uh, and then the book of Revelation, of course, is also very convoluted, but we can get a general sense of it. But these books are really important to understand. Really, really important before God. 
What's John 3.16? That's the one I see everywhere. That's a, for God so loved the world, he became his only begotten son. Whosoever shall believe in him shall not die, but live everlasting. That's their salvation. That's their basic core of their yeah. everything. That's, that's their John, Christianity John, in a nutshell. John 3.16. I always say 21.107 of Quran is our John 3.16. 21107. Which student? That's NBI 107. <coughs> we have to know this one. I always tell Christians that in that one because it really puts it in perspective for them. This is R316 of John. Okay. Well, that's your homework. <laughs> what is it? 21107. 21107. 21107. Oh, what about John what? John 316. <laughs> Sometimes you see that, you know, holding up in the football games is John 316. Yeah, people even paint it on their um, the stickers on their eye. Or wrestling. Oh, is that the one that's in and out? Yeah, it is. In and out as well. Yeah. I have a funny story about that, but I have to tell the men on it. So last time, any questions regarding the Gospel of Mark? Omar <laughs> Salat What's that? Ah, uh, illa uh, This is our John 316. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's more exalted than John 316. And obviously, a lot more true. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, is the order the same in all the New Testaments or the it order? Is. Yeah, it is. it'll be in this order. That's not the chronological order, though. But this is the yeah. order of the New Testament. Again, the wisdom behind putting Matthew first even though Mark was written first, is because it provides a smooth transition from Judaism, from the Old Testament, because Mark is a very Jewish gospel in the sense that it's targeting Jews, but at the same time, it's vehemently anti-Jewish. And Mark's gospel has been the impetus. That's why it was so popular in Christendom, which was Christian Europe. Really the impetus for a lot of the pogroms and book burnings and killing mass genocide of Jews all throughout Europe during that time is because of the Gospel of Matthew. In particular, one verse that's in Matthew, the Passion narrative, that is in the movie The Passion of the Christ, but was not translated for good reason. But you can hear Caiaphas in the back saying it in Aramaic, but they didn't translate it for you. But it's in that movie. So, so it's Matthew there. is the one which, which is more targeted to the Jewish audience? It's targeted towards Jews in the diaspora. <clears throat> so the purpose of Matthew, we'll talk about it, it's targeting Jews, to make them Christian, but it's also increasing the yakin of the Christians. Just like when, you know, we talk about the prophet says it in the Bible. Muslims attend it. They don't say, oh, that's the Bible. They attend because it increases their yakin, right? Their certitude of their own deed, but also the gadawa to the, the Christians. So, yes. And you said diaspora. Is that, is that the center of Rome? So, no, no, diaspora is Jews living outside of Palestine. Okay. That's a good... Thank you for pointing that out. Sometimes I throw these terms up. Diaspora is from the Greek meaning to be out of Palestine, away from their holy land. So when I say diaspora in this context, I'm talking about Jews living in the Mediterranean, in the Greco-Roman world, in the pagan world, the Greek-speaking Hellenized world. These are Jews in the diaspora in New Testament times. Okay. Any other question more about Mark's source or major themes of uh, Mark in Christology. Remember, Mark's gospel is is very dark. Uh, the passion narrative is um, extremely gut wrenching. Where Jesus, peace be upon him, doesn't defend himself. Well, we don't believe in the passion narrative anyway. This so-called Jesus, the Markin Jesus, we should say, doesn't defend himself. Uh, he's mocked by everyone. Uh, he doesn't speak to anyone while he's being led to crucifixion. His crossmates both mock him. Uh, he doesn't say anything on the cross except this cry of dereliction. That is the cry of dereliction. We're going to actually go through the gospel now a little bit because it's not enough just to be familiar with major themes and divisions and you know, Christology, things like that, but actually what is the content of the gospel actually say? What is the cry of dereliction? Does anyone know? Yeah, Ilahi, Ilahi, Lama Sabachthani. And that's in Aramaic. So he's actually quoting a psalm here. Yes? It's like, my Lord, why have you created something like that? Why, have you, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is there a different Aramaic? No, that's what it is. 
that's in three Gospels. It's called the Cry of Dereliction, which, of course, is very puzzling. Wow. <laughs> that's okay. It's an earthquake. It's puzzling from a, from a Christological standpoint, a Trinitarian standpoint. Because if Jesus said, for example, Abba, Abba, Lama Sabachthani, my Father, my Father, then the Trinity would still be intact. But for him to say, my God, my God, what does that imply? That Jesus has a God. That Jesus has a God, is he also God? Are there two gods? So this is very troubling for Christians. Because remember, the Trinity, we'll talk about Christian theology. It's, it's, you have to sort of, it's difficult to understand, right? Uh, but um, basically the Christians believe in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but one God. There's one God manifest in three persons, separate and distinct persons. Not the same person that's simply putting on three different masks. That's actually a Christian heresy uh, called patripassianism or sabellianism, right? That there's one person and that he's just putting on these three different masks. Uh, three distinct persons, but one God. So for Jesus to say, I have a God, and he cries out for this God, then either there's two gods, or there's something that's very wrong, irreconcilable in the Christology. Interestingly enough, uh, John does not quote Jesus, make this cry of dereliction. He finds it so troubling that he doesn't. John's, John's passion narrative is very, very different than Mark. Very, very different than Mark. In fact, Luke's passion narrative is very different than Mark. Now, if there are three different people, do they share the same essence? Is that considered? They share the same essence, yeah. They're considered one yeah. God, three people, three Yeah. Three. So the term that's used here is usia <coughs> in Greek, which is like, you can spell it like this. Usia is nature or essence. Nature, essence. In Arabic, we say that one. The that of Allah is a mystery. Al-Ajdu an idraki idraku wal ba'su fi zati kufrun wal ishraku. Abu Bakr al-Sadiq said, your inability to comprehend God is your comprehension of God. And entering into debate about his that, his essence, is kufrun wal ishraku, is infidelity, is belief, and in partnering with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't touch the that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not share his essence with anyone. He is wahid and ahad. And usually when they say ahad, it means that he's unique in his essence, and wahid means that he's unique in his attributes. Wallahu alam. The Christians in Greek, they call this usia. And they believe that three persons, which are called hypostases, <coughs> hypostases means persons, or hypostases in Greek, Three persons share this one essence. So there's a doctrine in Christianity called perichoresis, which looks like this in Greek. Perichoresis, which literally means to turn around like this, go in a circular fashion. What does that mean? That means that the three persons of the Trinity are inseparable in their action and in their essence. Action and essence, inseparable. And in their attributes. So, that, sifat, and af'al. That, essence, sifat, attributes, af'al, action. Our theology says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not share these things with anybody whatsoever. And this is tawheed. The Christians believe all three of these things. <coughs> Nature, usia, and uh, uh, action, <coughs> and attributes are all shared. And this is kind of Trinitarian theology in a nutshell. We're going to actually quote from the uh, Creed of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed the nicio constantinopolitan Creed, which is the most orthodox Christian creed. We'll look at it in Greek, and it's very short, but, of course, it requires a lot of explanation. You know, what does begotten, not made, mean? <coughs> right. um, so perichoresis means that they, you know, um, one of the early Christian fathers, he actually diagrammed it like this. 
If you have these three circles, <laughs> of course these are all inadequate, but they tried. Three circles that don't quite overlap, but there is some overlap. Venn diagram. Yeah. And some of the theologians said, well, it's like an egg because there's a yolk white in a shell. However, that's also inadequate because the yolk by itself is not fully God, whereas Jesus in and of himself is God fully. Jesus by himself as a person is 100% God, and so is the Holy Spirit, and so is the Father. Not parts of God. That's not Trinitarian doctrine. Ultimately, it's a mystery. So perichoresis means that whatever the Son is doing, it necessitates the participation of the Father and Holy Spirit. This is a perichoresis. This was a term that was coined in the 4th century by the Cappadocian Church Fathers. We'll talk about them. Uh, Gregory and Basil of Caesarea. Uh, so, whatever the Son is engaged in, it necessitates. <coughs> so you see how this is problematic. Whatever the Son is engaged in. Yes. If the Son is dying, it necessitates? Yes. If the Son is dead in a tomb for three days, it necessitates that the Father and Holy Spirit are engaged as well in that action. So this is extremely problematic. That's why Nietzsche said God is dead. <laughs> That's what he said? Yeah. Referring to them? And Freud said God is dad. Okay, Cody Um So one one nature, three persons, inseparable in nature, actions, and attributes. Of course, the whole question is, is this even biblical? That's a big question. So where does this come from? So let's go back to uh, Mark's Gospel, inshallah. Um, last time we talked about Mark 1.1, 1, 1, right? This is a, there's like eight or nine passages I actually want to look at and comment on. I'll show you kind of like how Mark uh, manipulates scripture to get his theological agenda across. The Gospels are basically combat writings. They're polemical tractates that are intended to convert people to a certain belief in the face of other types of tractates and Gospels. So it says, Arche tu evangelio Jesu Christus, right? The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and then in brackets, Hoyotheu, the Son of God, which are disputed verses. Now last time we talked about this is a really important manuscript that we all should know about. It's called Aleph 01. What's the other name for it? Codex Sinaiticus. Why is this important? It is the oldest complete New Testament on earth. The oldest complete New Testament. On, it's overly complete. What does that mean? There's actually extra books. There's a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, which is an apocalypse, eventually removed, extremely anti-Jewish. And there's the Epistle of Barnabas, which is also extremely anti-Jewish. That was removed. This is not the Gospel of Barnabas. I've seen Muslims make this mistake in public, in Christian settings. They say the Gospel of Barnabas is in the oldest Greek version of the New Testament. And then the, Mus and then the Christian guy gets up there and just completely embarrasses all the Muslims in the earth. So you don't even know what you're talking about. The Epistle of Barnabas and the Gospel of Barnabas are completely different, separated by centuries. Okay? Um, so the Codex Sinaiticus is interesting because the man who discovered this, well, you know, discovered by Columbus of discovered America, right? The man who discovered this is, was the inspiration for Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, an American professor who is kind of, you know, the, uh, the what, do you, what do you call it, the, the, the mighty whitey, right? You know, like the white guy who infiltrates and then actually can do things better than the people that actually, you know, like Kevin Costner and Dances of the Wolves or what's, what's uh, Tom Cruise. In The Last Samurai, the yeah. mighty whitey, right? So anyway, this, he's a German professor at Leipzig University. So he goes to St. Catherine's Monastery, which is at the base of Mount Sinai in 1844 on an expedition. Right? So he goes there, and it's interesting, St. Catherine's Monastery, which was built in the 6th century, it actually houses some of the oldest iconography of early Christian piety. Uh, there's a 4th century portrait of Jesus called the Pantocrator that's in remarkable condition because of the arid, uh, dry air there, that everything's preserved. They also have something called Octiname. Has anyone heard of the Octiname? 
It's also called the Sakrum uh, Testament of Muhammad, mm. the Holy Testament of Muhammad. Yeah. So they actually, I mean, I've seen pictures of this. This is a document written in Arabic with a handprint, like a hand that's traced <laughs> out like this on it. Uh, and the monks there, to this day, maintain that when the church was being built in the 6th century, the Prophet Sallallahu visited the church. There's no, there's no evidence of the Prophet going to Egypt, right? But this is their claim. And it might have been, it's probably forged. It's probably something they produced because they were afraid of, you know, Islamic invasion and so on and so forth in the 7th and 8th century. Islam came to Egypt. Nonetheless, they claim that it's a, I mean, today, they have no reason to be afraid of anything. Well, not really. But, but still, they maintain that it's an authentic uh, document where it actually says that this Christian church shall, shall forever stand and not be harassed by any Muslim army. So they actually revere this document. And you'll see them like, just like it was a picture of Christ, you know, have it in this, this cell and, and guard it and protect it, called the Akhtaname. Anyway, so this man, his name was Tischendorf. And I'm probably not spelling his name right. I think it's like Tischendorf. Constantine von... There's an interesting first name. Constantine von Tischendorf, professor at Leipzig University in Germany. He goes to St. Catherine's Monastery, and the only way to get into St. Catherine's is for them to lower a basket down to you, like three or four stories. And when you get into the basket and you open pray that the monks can pull you up. So he gets up there, and his claim is that he went to a garbage can, and he found these, uh, these manuscripts, this, or this part of this manuscript that's written on animal skin, on vellum, and he thought to himself, according to his own writing, they were going to throw it away anyway, so I made off with them. And then he came back two other times, 1844, 1853, 1859, and he kept, he kept taking from this manuscript. Of course, the monks to this day claim that he stole them. Nonetheless, uh, his patron was Tsar Alexander II from Russia. When Stalin took over, Stalin now had control of this Codex Sinaiticus. So then he sold them because Russia was in debt to England, and England was seen as a great shining star of the world because they saved the oldest New Testament. So most of the manuscript is in uh, a museum in London, the British Museum, most, like 347 out of 400-something pages of the Codex Sinaiticus. There is a few that pages that are still in Germany. There's some in Russia, and St. Catherine's also has a few pages that they managed to secure from the thief, Constantine von Tischendorf. And he will see... So see. this Codex Sinaiticus is the same Matthew Mark? That's interesting. So when this was discovered, this codex really uh, shook the New Testament world. Because in this codex, there is no Son of God in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, amongst many other things that we'll talk about. So the old is complete. And also, Codex B, which is called Vaticanus, it's in the Vatican, which, which is similar in date to the Sinaiticus. It's dated to the 4th century. In fact, there's actually a story that they were actually produced by the same project, by Eusebius, who is a historian who worked with Constantine. Uh, in 331, Constantine told Eusebius, I need you to produce 50 copies of the scriptures. And many scholars believe these are two copies of what was produced. So the oldest complete New Testament codices do not say Son of God in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Is a question. Okay. And amongst other things we'll talk about. Yes? So a couple of questions. What was the, the year? I forgot the year around this. 1844? When it was discovered? Yeah, when he was able to infiltrate the church. Is, is this um, complicated? The copies are available and you mentioned that you need to get to know this really well. How did yeah, yeah. This entire codex is online, by the way. This is really fantastic. Oh, okay. it's, if you go to codexsynoticus.com, it's called the Codex Sinaiticus Project. You can actually look at the actual codex itself in two different types of light, and the translation is there as well. <laughs> yes? Was it translated from Latin to Greek? No, it's in Greek. It's in Greek and translated into English. The original is in Greek. This is not in Latin. 
You said it's in its complete form, but then there's random pages in different countries. So are those? Yeah, if you put, if you put, I think most of the pages that are in, in different countries are Old Testament. But if you put them together, it would be the, the, the complete. But this one is totally complete, Vaticanus. It's totally complete, New Testament, all 27 books. And the, the order is slightly different, but these four Gospels are of the same order. It has the Barnabas and the other one. It does, yeah. You put it in the order. <laughs> um, we don't know. Does that mean that uh, even the older versions of Mark did not refer to Christ as a new God? Right. They didn't. This is the strongest opinion. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about, you know, biblical translations over time. But in 1881, two Cambridge scholars named Westcott and Hort, they used these two uh, codices primarily for a fresh new Greek translation or Greek version, and they did not include Son of God at the end of the verse. And also at the end of Mark, there's something really interesting that is missing from these two manuscripts. I don't know what's going on here. I'm trying to show you. So Mark was corrupted from the beginning, and somebody corrupted the corrupted version of Mark. <coughs> um, Mark is what do you mean corrupted from the beginning? I mean he he took it from John, right? Uh, Paul. He was influenced by Paul. Peter, yeah. Peter. And yeah. Paul. And, uh, yeah. Remember, so Mark's source is. Hellenistic oral tradition. Hellenistic oral tradition. <coughs> you know, probably some truth, probably not. Uh, and then over time it was corrupted when it was written down. Because again, why would they do that to Mark's gospel? What is it about Mark's gospel that is so kind of weak? Huh? Remember we said it's anemic in its Christology. It's very weak in its theological position about Christ. So they need to sort of put it on steroids, right? Like the Gospel of John is Christology on steroids. Luke is very bonds in 1990. This is bonds in like 2002. <laughs> and this is bonds as a 17-year-old high school student. So it's very, very weak. <laughs> so in order to bolster right, <clears throat> its Christology, certain fabrications were made to the Gospel. Um, if we go now to Mark 1.11, I'm going to show you this as well. <clears throat> this is very interesting here. So this is a baptism. Remember, there's no, there's no nativity of Jesus in Mark. There's no mention of Mary, the virgin birth, nothing like that. Joseph the carpenter is not mentioned at all. <coughs> right. um, in Mark 1.11, who can read that verse? And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Good. So this is an interesting thing here. We can sort of see how Mark pieces together scripture. <coughs> you are my son, my beloved. <coughs> in whom I am well please. So here's the scene. Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River by Yahya alayhi salam. And then the heavens open and there's a voice that says this statement. Now this is a combination of three verses from the Old Testament. This is Mark one eleven. Mark one eleven. Yeah. It's a combination of three verses from the Old Testament. Remember, you are my son. This is from Psalm 2-7. This is what God says to David. And this is not obviously meant in the literal sense. This is called majaz. This is metaphorical. Right? The Hebrew says, Bani atta anni hayom yalit dihi. That's the Hebrew. He says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Today I have, given, I have given birth to you. That's from the Psalms. That's figurative completely. The Jews do not believe that God has physical relations or God has children in the literal sense. This is figurative language. Okay? So, he quotes it fine at the beginning, you are my son. But then, this day I have begotten you, Mark does not use 
Why do you think that is? This day, Hayom, he says. Al Yom. In Hebrew, Hayom. I have begotten you. The reason is because there's a there was a Christian heresy called adoptionism at the time. Adoptionism. Christian adoptionist movement. These are Christians who denied that Jesus is the pre-eternal son. The Orthodox Christians today believe that Isa is the pre-eternal son of God. He was begotten outside of time. Right? Therefore, this is kind of a contradiction, if you have to sort of go with me a little bit. Although Jesus was caused by God, he is not inferior to God because there's no time that separates the two. There was no time at all. You see how it is? Yeah. Well, I think he's going to do so that. I'll, I'll work together. Yeah. Even though God caused Jesus, it was outside of time, therefore the Son has no ontological oh, precedent, no temporal precedent, what, oh, only causal precedent. What, Bert? Four, five, four, nine, <clears throat> Allah, Allah, The adoptionist Christians believe that on the day that Isa was baptized by John the Baptist, that was similar to like Elijah giving his mantle to Elisha and sort of passing the mantle. That now you're the prophet. This is the bi'ata. That's how the adoptionists would look at the baptism. 
the raising of Isa as a prophet now. Like the Prophet Sallallahu was made a messenger when he was 40 years old. Right? This is how they look at this event of the baptism. This is the birth of Isa a.s. So this language of this day I have begotten you is purely allegorical. It's not literal. The adoptionists or Ebionites, we've talked about them. These were Jewish Christians, right? Then you have a group um, called Arians who spoke Greek. They were adoptionists. This was the group that was opposed at the Council of Nicaea. We'll come back to this council. Then you have a group that speak Latin in Rome called the Theodosians. All three of these groups were adoptionists in their Christology. The Ebionites had a slogan. And I'll write it here. Okay. This is what it looked like. <coughs> you should memorize this. Um, we'll say it together. Is that integral? No. It says, <laughs> Ain, say Ain. Ain. Ain pate hate. Ain pate hate. Uk Ain. Uk Ain. Good. Ain pate hate uk So, there was once when he was not. Who is he talking about? Jesus Christ. Isa Adi Salaam. So, this was their, one of their, um, slogans or faith professions that they would write on their churches. They would write it on their, tag their church. Ein pate hate uk ein. This is actually quoted in the Nicio Constantinopolitan Creed. Says, Whoever says this is an infidel. Mm-hmm. Right? Because oh. what does this mean? This means Esai de Sanam did not exist at some point. He might have been the initial creation, but he's still creation. The Orthodox do not believe that Esai de Sanam is created He's caused by God. He's caused by God outside of time. Where are they getting these ideas from? This is Neoplatonism. You guys heard of Plato? There was a man in the 3rd century uh, named Plotinus who kind of revamped Plato's hierarchy of existence. So they believed in a hierarchy. So the Neoplatonist, we'll go, we'll go over this later, but he believed in God. He called them good. Ta'agafan. And then the good causes someone called the noose. The middle Platonist called him the Logos, which is what John calls Jesus. And then below that, the Logos produces something called Suke, or the Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the Neoplatonist always says that there's a hierarchy. At the top is God, who is necessarily, necessarily uh, um, uh, better than the other two. Right. Whereas Christianity, they say, no, they're all the same, essentially, because it was done outside of time. So the Ebionites would say that the causal priority of the Father demonstrates his essential superiority over the Son. Let's say it again. The causal priority of the Father, even though it was outside of time, the causal priority of the Father uh, is, is God essential, or the Father's essential superiority over the Son. But they don't believe that uh, this was outside of time. The Ebionites don't. The Ebionites don't believe, no. All three of these groups believe that Jesus is creation. They call him Ketisma Teleo, the best of creation, but nonetheless creation. Ketisma Teleo? Ketisma Teleo. You don't have to write that down. But if you want to memorize this, Ain Hate Hate Ain. So next time you're engaged in Dawa, you can ask your Christian friend, do you know Ain Pate Hate Uk Ain? I said, no. Have you heard of the Arian the Arians? No. Or the Ebionites? No, or the Theodosians? Ninety-nine point nine percent of Christian laity have never heard of these things in their life. Have no idea what to do with them. Um, it's so, P A. Is it P A or P O? P O. Thanks. It's interesting in Isaiah 63. Isaiah prays, "Ata Adonai Avinu, You are God, our Father." Right. So again, this is majaz. This is not literal. 
The Jews <laughs> refer to God as Father, not in a literal sense. It's very common in Judaism. So instead, what Mark does here, instead of saying, this day I have begotten you, because that reeks of adoptionism, mm -hmm. he goes to the Song of Songs and says, Jesus is my beloved. The Song of Songs describes someone called Dodi, my beloved. If you look, actually look at the uh, description of the Song of Songs, it actually fits the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Song of Songs, chapter 5, the beloved of God. And then, in whom I well please, is from Isaiah 42. Uh, Isaiah, I'm spelling it wrong. Let's put uh, Isaiah 42, which again, I believe is a reference to the prophet. So these are Old Testament Song of Songs. And it's yeah. So this verse is Mark 1:11. And Mark, he sort of sews together, stitches together three verses from the Old Testament. Right? This is how he manipulates the scripture to make his points to the audience. <clears throat> he quotes one halfway, he goes to another verse, and then quotes the other halfway. How do, how do, how do you know how to get all that? Get this here. It's where? It's in the Greek. And the Greek says that he did this? That's what the Greek says. This is what he's quoting from. Oh, that's okay. Okay, later. I guess. Isaiah chapter 42. Yeah. How does that We'll get to that, inshallah. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in Matthew, because Matthew actually makes that claim explicit. <clears throat> what else can we say here? Um, okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Let's go to the another one here. Let's go to... Uh, Mark 2.27 and 28. Mark 2.27? Yeah. Okay. Someone want to read that? So Isaiah, in my, um, sorry, it has book, chapter, and verse. Yeah, so book of Isaiah, chapter 2. Uh, chapter 42, verse 1. Oh, verse one. Okay. Yeah. 42, 1. So the Hebrew says, Hen abdi es Behold my abd, uh, in whom I am well pleased. Right? In whom I am well pleased is Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, that Mark sort of uses the complete, <coughs> quoting Psalm 2, 7. You can't say this day I have begotten you. Because he knows that other theologians might construe his writing as being adoptionist. Okay? Is that the Sabbath story? <coughs> Sabbath, yeah. Sabbath was made for man, and man not for the Sabbath? Yeah, keep going, one more verse. And so then, so then, uh, the son uh, of that is Lord, also mm -hmm. of the Sabbath. Yeah, so this is very interesting. So what happens is... <clears throat> is that Isa a.s. and the disciples are plucking grain on the Sabbath, Yom Sabbat, right? And so Jewish authorities, legal authorities, uh, they say this is haram. You can't do this. You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. So remember that Isa a.s. one of the jobs of Isa a.s. is to, uh, to make easy the law, ameliorate the law, right? And in some cases, because he is a Rasul, he can make aspects of the law know, which is called Nasr, right? So, for example, um, in the Quran, he's quoted as saying, <laughs> I confirm the Torah that came before me, but I also make lawful for you part of what was haram for you. I make halal what was haram because the context has changed. So obviously these Jewish legal authorities, uh, they don't believe that this is a messenger. So a rabbi plucking grain on the Sabbath has no authority to do that. The Christians will take the story as a proof that he's God, because only God can break his own law. But that's not true. He's not breaking the law, right? He's ameliorating the law. He's making it easier. And this is what a messenger can do. This is the affair of the Rasul. The Rasul can cancel the law, aspects of the ahkam. There's no problem. 
aspects of aqidah or creed cannot be canceled because those things are transcendent. You can't say, oh, we're going to cancel belief in angels because now we've, our brains have progressed. No, we live in a different context. No, angels are something that is metaphysical. They don't change. Creeds don't change. They are not supposed to, right? In, in, the major, uh, in the major aspects of it, there are mughayyarat, but you can take difference of opinion on certain creedal issues. But the, the asas of the creed never, the foundations of creed never change. So Isa alayhi salam here, he is explaining what you're allowed to do on the Sabbath. So he tells them that if one of your goats or chickens falls into a hole, don't you pull it out on the Sabbath? Because he was healing on the Sabbath as well, healing people. Mu'jizat. And they say yes. He says, well, that's what I'm doing. You're allowed to do good on the Sabbath. Right? So Isa alayhi salam is making a tafsir of something that's revealed in the Torah. This is a tafsir. That yes, there's a Sabbath, but you're allowed to do good. Okay? So he says here, the Sabbath is made for man. This is kind of a, uh, an idiom that's used nowadays, a figure of speech. The Sabbath was made for man. Literally, the Greek, it says, the Sabbath, because of the man, or the insan, was and not the human being because of the Sabbath. In other words, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most important thing. You don't worship the Sharia. The Sharia is literally a path to cold water. And if you're in the desert and you find the Sharia, what does that mean? You've found salvation because you're going to die of thirst. So Sharia is a path to salvation. Right? It's just a path, a methodology. We don't worship the law. Imam Ghazali, he talks about this in Ihya al Din, where he says so many Muslims today are formalists, that everything's superficial on the outside. He's not saying forget about the outside. No, no one is saying that. Right? But he's saying you have to taste your faith. You have to experience the, uh, the, the intrinsic um, aspect of the faith. So Imam Ghazali, he actually, he sets up a, he says that Jesus is on this side and Moses is on this side. And this is an inadequate diagram, but it's just to sort of get the point across. He says, then the Prophet says, is in the middle. If this is Sharia and this is Hatiqa, then of course that's inadequate because Musa is Kalimullah, right? So he's obviously an extremely spiritual person, but this is, he's just showing a diagram. Then the Prophet says, Sharia is in the middle and that's how it should be. Right. <clears throat> so what he's doing here is he's stressing <coughs> the inward dimension of the law, the true teaching of the law. That don't be so rigid, right? That if you see an old woman fall on the ground and she needs help, it's the Sabbath. You say, I can't tell you, haram, it's not for Let her break her hip. Right? Even in Islamic Sharia, because life takes precedence in this in this issue. That's what he's teaching them here. He's not completely abrogating the law. And he can change the law or ameliorate the law because he's a messenger of God. Messengers of God can do that. Okay? <clears throat> there's, there's a... For example, the, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he, he, he was constantly trying to find ways out for people when they would commit sin. Right? It's not because he doesn't care about the the hudud or, you know, the, the outward aspect of the <coughs> Like the man who was in the masjid, he came and the man was like totally broken hearted. And, <coughs> and the prophet said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I did this and this. He said, I don't want to hear it. Just come here. Just come here. So he, so he came to the prophet and said, he said, put your hands up. And he said, repeat after me. Allahumma maghfiratuk awsa min gurubi. Oh Allah, your uh, forgiveness is much more expansive than my sin. Then he said, Qum, Stand up, your sin is forgiven. Isa salam, in the Synoptic Gospels, he tells people, your sin is forgiven. Right? And Christians say, that's because he's God. Only God forgives sins. That's true. Only God can forgive sins. But the messengers speak with the authority of God. And whoever obeys a messenger obeys God. Right? There's a verse in the Quran. Ajib, we, we, we sort of look over these things because we don't know Arabic. But... Allah says, Wallahu wa rasuluhu, this happens a few times in the Quran. Wallahu wa rasuluhu, ahaku an yurduhu. That Allah and His Messenger, it is more fitting that you please Him. 
Allah and his messenger are two entities, aren't they? <coughs> it is more fitting that you please who? Him, <coughs> instead of whom <coughs> Why? Is it grammatical error? No, because <coughs> it's demonstrating this intimate relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That there's no difference. If you obey the messenger, you are, you are obeying Allah. You cannot obey Allah and disobey the messenger, nor vice versa. It's impossible. Like the people who were clinging to the kiswa of the Kaaba when the Prophet came into Mecca, they said, we're going to go directly to Allah. And the Prophet said, if you don't obey me, you're not obeying Allah. How can you obey Allah and not me when I'm sent by God? Right? So this intimate relationship, Allah uses a singular pronoun. This damir is singular, mufrad al ghaib singular third person. Right. This happens a few times in the Quran. It's not a grammatical error. He could have said huma, but he says who, meaning that you follow the messenger. Rasul, Allah. Whoever obeys it, this is in the Quran. Whoever obeys Rasul obeys Allah. Allah. This is, huh? In the Huh? It's revelation. Where he says, to Yes. So, Whatever the Prophet says, Salam says is, re- is revelation, either in the form of tanzil or wahi. Everything he says. <clears throat> do, do you know which verse that is? Which one? The one you quote is the who? It's in Surah. Uh, yeah, it's in Tawbah. In Tawbah. Let me give you the verse number. Uh, verse uh, 62 of Tawbah. <laughs> And this happens again in Surah Al-Anfal and a few other times. Very interesting. So Isa, for example, we get the Gospel of John. He says, Ego kai pater heis esmen. The Father and I are one. And the Christians say, Ah, oh, hallelujah. He's claiming to be God. Is he claiming to be God? One in what? They don't even read the context. Read the context and it actually reveals what is the nature of this tawheed, right? this oneness, this annihilation in God's love and character. That's the tawheed he's talking about. Not oneness in the sense of hulul or, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> divine incarnation, right? But in the sense of oneness, in the sense that your limbs are guided by God. There's hadith about this. Ul Qasim al Junaid. It's hadith Qudsi, sound hadith. My beloved draws close to me with his fara'id and continues to draw close with his nawafil until I become the eye by which he sees. God becomes your eye? The hand by which he strikes, the foot by which he walks. <coughs> what does that mean? God, astaghfirullah, becomes your body? No, you missed the point. This is subjective tawheed. It's stirraq. This is immersion in God's guidance, that God guides your limbs so that you're not even disobeying God anymore. Highly spiritual teaching that, unfortunately, people who did not have the Sharia, Greco-Roman Gentiles who don't have the Torah, are making grave mistakes. When Isa says something, he says, "Oh, he's claiming to be God," because that's part of their culture. We have man gods. We worship Dionysus. We worship Zeus. We worship Poseidon. We worship Aphrodite. We worship Jesus. It's another god, right? <clears throat> oh. Um. Uh. Yeah, there's other hadith as well. Man anzara mu'asiran aw wada' anhu adhallahu Allahu fi dhilli In Muslim, whoever defers the debt of a poor person or remits it, Allah will shade him with his shade. Right? So don't be so rigid. This is his point here. You know, there's, there's a law called uh, lex, lex, Talianus. Have you heard of this? Lex Talianus is, is Latin. Does anyone know Latin? Lex Talianus means the law of retaliation. Like Allah says in the Quran, وَكَتَبْدَ عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا Meaning Bani Israel. أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِالنَّفْسِ وَالْعَيْنَ بِالْعَيْنِ وَالْأَنْفَ بِالْأَنْفِ وَالْأُدُنَ بِالْأُدُنِ وَالْسِنَّ بِالسِنِّ وَالْجُرُوحَ قِصَاصِ We, that's Lex Talianus, that we Prescribe for Bani Israel, a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth, and wounds un- un- equal unto one another. 
فمن تصدق به فهو كفارة الله but whoever forgives is an act of atonement for them yes right so this is the, the there's a spirit of the law there's a letter of the law then there's the spirit of the law Isa alayhi salam does not abrogate the letter of the law it's a Christian claim Paul actually does that Isa alayhi salam he, he holds, upholds the law right but he gives them the true interpretation the, the, the letter the, the spirit of the law <clears throat> and what's interesting here the next verse you know what does the English translation say verse 28 I'll show you deceptive so then the son of a man yeah. is lord also of the Sabbath yeah so you hear that word lord you think oh Jesus is lord right how do we deal with this issue so it's interesting the Arabic it says فَإِبْنُ الْإِنسَانِ هُوَ رَبُّ السَّبْتْ أَيْضًا The Son of Man literally is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Rabb here is definite by position because it's mudaf, it's a construct noun. Definite by its position. And Lord in your translation, is it capitalized? Yes. It's capitalized. Which, which means what? That it's definite. Yeah. Yeah. There must be a definite article. So the, the Greek does not have a definite article. So the Greek says, so that the son of man, even of the Sabbath, is master. Master. Or is Lord with a lowercase l. What is the difference between the two? This is Rabbul Bayt, or Rabbatul Bayt, you know, the master of the house. This is Rabbul Alameen. Do you see the difference? Big difference. One definite article makes a big difference. The Greek does not have a definite article. But every translation I've ever seen in English put the capital L, or sometimes the Lord. Even in the Arabic, Rabbu Sabt, definite by its position, the Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus is a Lord. But the Greek doesn't say that. Kurios. In Greek, the, Greek uh, the word is kurios, which applies to both God and man according to context, just like the word Rabb. So, in your conversations with Christians, if a Christian says, look, it says Lord. Say, look, when this King James was written, right, well, maybe not back then, but today in England, there's a house of lords and a house of commons. Therefore, they're all God. Right? So what is the context of that? The context is very Semitic. Do you think other Jews would call another Jew God and consider himself to be a Torah-abiding Jew? Of course not. When Jesus says this, they don't take action against his usage of the word Kurios. It's his action of plucking grain that they're concerned about. They don't say, how dare you claim to be Lord God? Don't say that. Say, why are you picking grain on the Sabbath? Yeah. So in the Greek, since there's no uh, definite and definite... There is. There is a definite article, but it's missing in this verse. Like where it says, son of man, ha huyas, ha, it looks like this in Greek. The rough breathing, it's a guttural, ha, that's a definite article. But here for kurios, it's not there. So that makes a difference. Okay. They're doing the apomino. <laughs> not meant the Sabbath. <laughs> right? You see the context in which you would use it? Someone is being too rigid, too formal. Right? Relax. Take it easy. To forgive is better, right? It's, you know, it's 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 really uh, something that we can take a lesson from ourselves as Muslims, especially in light of uh, all of the diversity in the Sharia. Right? And sometimes we make uh, judgments about other Muslims about things where there's permissibility, there's leeway. Oh, dare you? <laughs> okay, so is that is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it's too low, but I can do the window. So the next one I want to go to here is is, it is uh, Mark 334. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes. These verses that you're mentioning, uh -huh. I'm looking at the codex, uh, that's exactly what 
And the other Bible is supposed to say, what is so significant of a codex? Which codex Sinaiticus? Yeah. Well, these verses are the same, yeah. These, these verses that I'm quoting are for a different reason. Oh. Codex Sinaiticus was when we looked at Mark 1 1, and when we get to the end of Mark, the, the ending of Mark is very different than the Codex Sinaiticus. But these verses are sort of trying to give you a, a general familiarity with what Mark is actually saying, what, what is the content of the Gospel of Mark. So this is an interesting one here, is that Jesus says here, um, but he looked around, and he said, Behold, uh, so people come to him and say, Your mother and your brothers are waiting outside. Mm -hmm. He says, Who are my mothers and brothers? Whoever does the will of God, this is my brother and my uh, sister and my mother. Right? Remember I said that in Mark there's a tinge of Nasibi, sort of anti Eilid Beit, and the Isa de Saddam. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of one way of looking at this verse is that there's probably a conflict at the time between the Judaizers or Semitic Christians and the Hellenistic Christians. Because remember, the authority of the Semitic strand of Christianity was firmly vested with James, who's in Jerusalem, the brother of Jesus. Right? So it almost seems like this verse is a polemic against the family of Isa. Like, who is my mother? My, like, mother is met Mariam, she has high status yet. James is his brother, who is the first Khalifa of Isa <laughs> So I think the, pur the purpose here for Mark, who is representing the Semitic strain of Christianity, is to sort of downplay the importance of uh, the Semitic line, or the, the, uh, the family of Isa Salam who are invested. We sort of see some of this with Islamic history, and the Bani Umayyah, and their struggles against Ahl al-Bayt, their clashes, and, and things like that. <clears throat> it's very interesting. <clears throat> What's interesting also here, he, he says the Greek word here for will is thelema, to theu, thelema. This looks like this. And have you guys heard of this movement, thelema? Have you ever heard of that? So this is a very popular movement amongst people in the West. Basically, it's Satanism. And it comes from this Greek word, based on this verse, right, it's called Thelema. So there was an Englishman named Alistair Crowley uh, who started uh, the Church of Satan. And he had a couple of books that he wrote. One is called Magic in Theory and Practice. Uh, and in this book, very clearly, he says that one of the ways in which to get demonic power is to kill children. Um, very interesting. Uh, he had another book which is more popular called Liber Legis. Again, his name is Crowley. You can look this up. This is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is real stuff. <laughs> Liber Legis. Who knows what that means? No, no, no Latin speakers? Book of, book of the Law. Lex is the genitive. Book of the Law. Lex. Right? Like Lex Luthor. You know what that means, Lex Luthor? The Law of Martin Luther. But it's Luthor, so it's sort of hide the anti-Christian undertone. It's the founders of the the inventors of what do you say, the inventors of Superman, or what Schuster and the creators. Right? They were two Jewish men. Uh, so the arch nemesis is Lex Luthor, right? <laughs> of course, Martin Luther was anti was vehemently anti-Jewish. He hated the Jews, and used to actually call for the violence against Jews. And then you have his father, whose name is Jorel, which is a Hebrew name. And then Kalel, which is another Superman's name, which is a Hebrew name. And God sending his son, which again is Messianism. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's Christian also, but it also has roots in, in Judaism. Anyway, um, that was just something interesting to throw in there. Only I think about these things. Sometimes I think that. Is anyone else thinking about this? Anyway, so in this book here, Liber Legis, by Alistair Crowley, who started the Church of Satan, and this movie <laughs> called Thelema, they're called Thelemites. His uh, golden law, I guess you could say, is do what thou wilt. <laughs> this is the whole of the law. Do what thou wilt. So this is the article of faith that these people live by. When, when is this? 
He was in the uh, early 20th century. So there's a musician called Jay-Z mm -hmm. who has a sweater. Yeah. That it, and quite often he wears it. Do what thou wilt is what Aleister Crowley, a man who advocates the killing of children, said. <coughs> right, so these people are enemies. Yeah, there's something wrong with these people. So do what thou wilt, right? What does that mean? So like someone like Marilyn Manson, who is an open Satanist, right? He says, they asked him, how do you worship Satan? He says, you know, we don't have an effigy, we don't like make dua, we put our hands up, although some people actually do that. He says, we just do what we want. That's how we worship Satan. You say, what, how? You say, well, we live a life of what? Disobedience to God, right? marahan. It's a verse in the Quran. Marahan means exactly that. To, to, to walk the earth without accountability. To do whatever you want to do. Right? Do what thou wilt. Why would someone do that? Because that's, that's what they want to do. They, it's a, a rebellion against God. They say, some of them say, you know, like, they say, follow your heart. That's what it means. Just follow your heart. <coughs> as long as you don't hurt anybody. But the, the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that if you don't follow his commandments, you are hurting people. If you say, I'm just going to get high or get drunk, I'm not going to hurt anyone, then you get in your car to kill somebody. Well, then you're hurting people, aren't you? And there's many examples of that. So the only one that can truly say, I do what I will, is who? Wallahu yaf'alu ma yurid. Allah is the only one who does what he wills. So when they say, we do what we want, they're imitating Satan and the fact that he says, ana khayru minhu. I am better than him. I am putting myself. Nafs first. Nafsi, nafsi. Okay? This is a very big movement. So the Salamites, huh? We're still active. Yeah. Very active, very popular, especially amongst like it's it's you know amongst like Hollywood elite and things like that. Starting to be areas. There's a lot of I mean there's you know, people talk about the Illuminati and things like that. I don't really get into that stuff, but you know it's thought provoking. You know there's a lot of hand gestures that people make, celebrities make, they wear these things on their shirts, and people don't know what they mean. And a lot of it is just Satanism uh, and has symbolic and has roots in Crowley's. If you read his book, he does Ajib and all these types of things to get power from demons and things like that. He literally says in his book that kill kids. Yeah, he says it's better to kill male children. Um, what some people say, for example, at the a halftime show, huh? right? You have you have Beyonce making the Masonic triangle, and then you have a 33-minute power outage, 33 degrees of the Freemason Lodge. I mean, there's people who get into this stuff like really at a deep level. But you know, if you if you if we concentrate on these things too much, we become cynical, and it's just a waste of time. But these things are out there. It's not fake. It's real stuff. Magic is real. Satan is real. So it comes from this Greek word phanema, which means will, but the will of God, right? Anyway. <laughs> There's a book I'm reading right now called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Very famous book by a Brazilian theologian or Brazilian um, activist and scholar, his name is Freire, who says that one of the things the oppressor does to keep people at bay and to keep them in a state of non-thinking is to give them bread and circus, like the Romans used to give people. Bread and circus, food and entertainment, which is a Super Bowl, right? Here's a bunch of food, get drunk, watch this big game and entertain yourselves, or, you know, fast, fast food and pornography. Bread and circus. These things keep people busy, they stop thinking. And all of these things are happening, and they don't even notice. Uh, this word, the Salema, does it does it have any relation to Suleiman al -Islam? No, it doesn't have any. Because relation. it's magic or something. No, no, no. No, that's actually a good word. Salema means like irada. That's what. That's how you would translate that in Arabic. Irada, irada to Allah. Salema to Fayu, the will of God. Right. So they take this word, which has a good connotation in the New Testament, and. Crowley uses it in the sense of do what you want, right? Don't worry about what God says. So open rebellion against God. So you see them wearing it on their shirts all the time. Jay-Z wears it all the time. Of course, he's married to the girl that did the halftime show. <laughs> the word like religious, uh, you said it's the library of what? It's law? Library of law? Liber the, the, the book of the law. The book of the law. Yeah. Which is Crowley's book? Crowley's book, yeah. That's what it's called? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, do some research on it. It's really interesting. Very interesting. It's really big in America, by the way. Very, very big. The Thelemites. 
Yeah, it's legal. Yeah, it's not breaking any law. Yeah. Oh, God. So as long as they don't institute human sacrifice. Though. And Yanni, a lot of I know what they do on Halloween. The kids go missing and things like that. Yeah. This stuff really happens. <clears throat> Just the other day, the 10-month-old baby, right, was kidnapped and killed and thrown in a field of for what, what was happening. And you notice these things happen around October, November, December. You have a lot of child abductions and, and murder of children. People do these things. <clears throat> uh, where can we go next? Um... Hmm. Uh, this is a good one here. So this is Mark 10, 17 to 22. It's still there. <coughs> Mark 10, 17 to 22. Oh, well, that's correct. Yeah, so this is about the rich man. So, <clears throat> this is an interesting story. This is to be a rich man comes to Isa Alayhi Salam, and he says, I'm good master, how do I go to heaven? He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except one that is God. It's a very clear denial of deity by Isa Alayhi Salam. And, again, if you look at the construction in the Greek, there's a maf'ul muqaddam for stress. Why me are you calling good? No one good except one, that is God. What's interesting here is that the part where it says no one is good, where it says no one except one, that is God, is not in Matthew. So Matthew says, why are you calling me good? No one is good. He doesn't say except one, that is God. Matthew didn't include that part. <laughs> Isn't this a very strong foundation for the, the, the theology perspective for Mark? It is, yeah. This is usually what um, opponents of Trinitarian theology will quote. Mark 10, 18. This is Mark 10, 18. <clears throat> and then he says to him, which is really interesting, if you ask any Christian today, basically, find a Christian at random and say, ask the same question this man asked Jesus. What was his question? He says, Ti po eso hina zo ein ionion. What do I do to go to heaven? This is what he says. What do you think a Christian today would say? Please, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Brother. Jesus died for your sins, and he was resurrected from the dead, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. This is what you have to believe when you go to heaven. Is this what Jesus said? No. Listen to what he says. He says, Taf and tolas oidas. You know the Sharia. You know the commandments. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, uh, honor your mother and your father, so on and so forth. And he says, I've done all of these. And Jesus looked at him, and it says, he loved him. This is also missing in Matthew. Remember what Matthew does with Mark. Matthew will redact Mark, and I have more examples of this. We'll talk about it next time we actually focus on Matthew. What does Matthew, Matthew's edits to Mark's gospel are very interesting. Matthew did not like that Jesus loved a Jew before believing in him. Right? It says, I've kept all of the commandments. It says, Jesus loved him for that. He or, that made him love him. Right? Matthew said, no, that's too early. Let's see what he does first. Is he going to follow him or not? Right? <laughs> so then he says, he says, go sell all, you own, all that you own and follow me. And the man said, I can't, I'm rich. And then he went away with a heavy heart. Right? So he couldn't be a disciple. That doesn't mean he's a disbeliever. That means he just can't be my disciple. Right? He probably believed in Esau, they said. You know, so this is, you know, it's a spiritual path. <clears throat> oh, why did you say you take up the cross? <clears throat> yeah, so this is... Probably an a, a allegory he's using because the Jews at the time were being crucified by Roman authorities left and right. So take up the cross, meaning you have to struggle under threat of death. 
Yeah, that could be. It could mean like, Be could die. Obviously, I mean, the Gospel of Mark uh, endorses the crucifixion. There's no doubt about that. You're not saying there's some foreshadowing of God. Maybe it is. It probably is. Because remember, the, the heart of the Gospel is a crucifixion. Uh, That's why the Gospel is in the New Testament. It's an extended passion narrative. But we have to look at the differences in the, in the passion narrative, which, which are really interesting. Yeah? But there are so many contradictions, I mean, mm-hmm. which, which actually tell you that, you know, for example, to verse number 18, what you call me good, no one is good except one God. With these beings in the New Testament itself, yeah. don't the Christians read the Bible as much as we read the Quran? Right? Yeah. At least for the, so, if you don't think of it, it's just that, yeah. you, know, you know what Christians say about this? The Christians say, Christian scholars who believe in the Trinity, they say Jesus here is asking a rhetorical question. So he's basically saying something like, "Do you, why are you calling me God? Do you think I'm God? Like, do you know? Like, like that. That's how they have to take the, mm. <laughs> they take the verse. Okay. Right? So yeah, he answers for everything. But interest, but the, the construction is, you know, why me are you calling? He's almost offended by that. Right. The Greek is, is very powerful that you don't get in the translation. I was talking to a Christian guy at my work and mm-hmm. I he was telling that they believed in all these things but he said after crucifixion mm-hmm. all these things were null and void and he do, doesn't have to do anything else now. Yeah, so that's... that's so they Paul. know they read but they think that it's an old version before yeah, he sacrificed. So Paul, when we get to Paul's letters, Paul's... Christology is basically exactly that, is what does the crucifixion mean? Because it's very foreign for the Jew. The Jew is like, he's not the Messiah, he was killed. He's obviously not the Messiah, right? And then Paul says, no, he was. And they say, what are you talking about? Well, you see, he had to die for your sins. And they're like, but that's completely against what the Old Testament says. But you see, God changed his mind. So God doesn't change. No, this is... This, this is God's new plan, his new covenant. So it just, for the Jew, it was a stumbling block, as Paul says. Right? This idea that God could come down in human form by itself is total sacrilege, according to Jewish theology. It's very clear, God is not a man. It says it very clearly in two places in the Hebrew Bible. God is not a man. Right? So, you know, our belief is that... Um, you know, Hazrat Isa came and reformed the, the Jews, so, mm-hmm. and eventually Hazrat Muhammad also came and reformed. <clears throat> but the you know the, the true believers at that time were the followers of Jesus, you know Hazrat Isa. Mm-hmm. So who were they? I mean, if it wasn't Paul and you know, these people, like, who were they? Who were the true Christians? Yeah, they were Unitarian Christians, but they were so marginalized because of. The, the power dynamics of their era. Uh, but they were around, but they were a, a minority that was being marginalized by Trinitarian authorities. Um, there is obviously a lot of truth in Semitic Christianity and Hellenistic Christianity. Many of our ulama, they quote from the New Testament. Right? Imam Ghazali quotes from the New Testament. Um, Modern day scholars quote from the New Testament. Uh, so whatever doesn't contradict our aqidah, we can say, Allahu alam, it might be a valid part of, you can use it for nasiha, it's like a weak hadith, right? Basically the entire New Testament is like hadith, all of it is weak. But, so they'll use it in that way. But who are the actual Christians? Um, you know, they've been marginalized by this, by this time, even by the 4th century. The authorities in Rome are Trinitarian Christians. So even amongst the Trinitarian Christians, there's massive difference of opinion. But forget about the Ebionite outside the door. He's not going to get past the hallway. Even in the ballroom where people are arguing, those are all people who believe that Jesus is in some way divine. But they have, even within that theology, they have massive difference of opinion. You know, like Surah um, Bayana. لم يكن الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب والمشركين والمنفقين حتى تأتيهم البينة البينة. Who is البينة? They exited to say the Prophet said them. 
the Ahl Kitab and Mushrikeen are not going to break away from their kufr until Al Bayyina comes. Rasulun min Allah, the indefinite article, not Rasulullah, Yatu Suhafa Mutahara. Rasulun min Allah, meaning unrestricted, it's Nakira, meaning a great messenger, an exalted messenger from God. وَمَا تَفَرَّكَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ And then, I don't, what is the rest of the verse? جَاءَكُمْ الْبَيِّنَا Again, الْبَيِّنَا Who is الْبَيِّنَا now? The Mushrikeen are not mentioned. This is Isa alayhi salam, according to the exegetes. That Isa alayhi salam, he caused these, the Ahl al-Kitab to have a lot of difference of opinion because they couldn't agree about who they were, about who he was. Because he didn't stick to his teaching, they didn't follow the Sharia. And some of his so called disciples went into places they shouldn't have gone. Right? <coughs> but this time we don't know much about. I mean, you know, what the two Christians would be. Right? Yeah, some of the, um, some scholars surmise that many of the Ebionites fleeing from Roman persecution came down into the Hejaz. And that's how they explain the Christology of the Quran. Uh, this is why the Quran, for example, denies the sonship of Christ and his divinity because the Prophet Sallallahu was influenced by Ibyanite elements. But there really is no evidence for it. There are no Christian tribes living in Mecca at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a Christian here and there. Waraka bin Nofa is a Christian. Was he Ibyanite? We don't know that. We don't know his Christology. He's probably not. But certainly there were no Christian tribes. There were no Jewish tribes living in Mecca either. In Yathrib, yeah, there's... Jewish tribes in the north in the Khaybar. If you go out a little bit more, there's like Christian tribes. Bani Hanifa was a Christian tribe, but not in Mecca. Right? Um, and it's interesting, the dominant opinion is that the Ebionites did not believe in the virgin birth, but the Quran confirms it in two places. <coughs> anyway, any more questions? I just want to show you one more verse, inshallah. This is uh, 11, 12, chapter 11, verses 12 to 14. Now, this is very interesting, very troubling for Trinitarian Christians. The cursing of the fig tree. <coughs> so the next day, he went out from Bethany and he was hungry. And he saw a sukain, which is a fig tree, from a distance. Right? And there's a lot of figs and olives in Palestine. So Ibn Abbas says, Watini was a tun. Teen fig is a reference to Jebat Judi where the Ark of Noah docked. Zaytun fig is a reference to Jerusalem. The olive, right? The Mount of Olives is right next to the temple where Ibrahim lived. Maturi Sinin, Musa alayhi salam, Hanan Balad al Amin, Mecca. So Allah is taking an oath, a qasam, by all four of these things. And Ibn Abbas says, by the sharia of all four of these things. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ That the insan, and some say this is the Prophet them, is the best mold. Right? In other words, these four scriptures bear witness to the greatness of the Prophet them. That's how some of the exegetes. Anyway, so Jesus comes to this fig tree, and he sees that it's, he sees it from afar, so he goes to it to find fruit. He doesn't find anything. So then he curses it, for the time of fruit was not yet. So you see the problem here mm -hmm. from a theological standpoint? That Isa is supposed to be God, and of course we have qualitative attributes of God. The Christians have these. Sifat al ma'ani. What are the qualitative attributes of God? There's seven of them. In Islam, there's ilm. And, and this is ilm mutlaq, like omniscience, right? That means all-knowing, qudra, omnipotence, all-powerful, irada, divine will, basar and sama, kalam, and haya. So God has hearing and seeing, not like we hear and see, speaking ability, not like we speak, and life. God cannot die. So the fact that Isa alayhi salam does not know something, seeing a fig tree from afar, thinking there's fruit, and then seeing that it's out of season, it's not the right season, demonstrates that he doesn't know something. There's a nux, there's a deficiency in intellect, or in aql, or in knowledge. 
So he's disqualified as being God. Yes? There was a part in Mark where the woman who has the, I guess, the hemorrhaging problem, she grabs his cloak. Yeah. And then he says, wait, who is, who is a, you know, I can pull my cloak, and he's like, here on the book. And when I read it, I mean, it seemed pretty obvious that he had no idea who pulled his cloak, and he was looking around. That seemed like it almost meant like he didn't know something to do. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. That's, that's also troubling. So he's talking about a, a parable or a pericope where a, a woman who's been hemorrhaging uh, for years and years, uh, she has istihaba. Um, she touches the thobe of Isa, and then she immediately becomes healed. And then he turns around and says, who was that? And he says, I felt some power leave me. Right? It's, again, it's very troubling. He doesn't know who did it, and then he apparently has a power supply of some sort. Right? Very troubling. Isa, alayhi salam, the Christian will say about this, this here, and say, look, he's still a man, right? But the problem here is, <clears throat> because according to the Council of Chalcedon, he's 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Yes, he's a man in the sense that he has to eat and drink and do these types of things. But when it comes to qualitative attributes like knowledge, his knowledge has to be perfect. The Christian sort of <coughs> speaks out of the other side of his mouth. Because in other times he'll say, Jesus knew what people were thinking because he's God. Right? Yeah. But then here he says, oh, he's just a man. And there's verses there that indicate that. But he doesn't know something. Right? So, that's what qualitative attribute means. It means this is the quality of God. God has this quality of all knowledge. If, he, if a person claiming to be God does not have this quality, he's disqualified. He cannot be God. That's what that means. <clears throat> right? The fact, let's just say, for instance, we entertain the Christian. Okay, we'll humor you for now. He's God. Stop it along. So he created this fig tree. Certainly he knows everything about the fig tree. The fact that, first of all, he sees the fig tree from a distance and makes an error of judgment, thinking that there's figs. And then he approaches the fig tree that he created and he knows everything about. And he discovers, oh, it's the wrong season. And then he becomes angry and curses the fig tree for doing something that he commanded it to do in a certain season. So it's just very, very problematic for Christians. But isn't it troubling that, uh, you know, uh, a prophet or a messenger of Allah SWT would actually curse a tree for not bearing food <coughs> until the time? It's, yeah, I don't think it's problematic. It does show impetuousness, but that's would be considered in, in, in patience. Uh, al arab al-Bashariya, they say Musa alayhi salam had a short yeah, temper. Yeah. <coughs> so that doesn't, uh, it's, it's, it's yajus, it's, it's mumkin, it's uh, conceivable awesome. for a prophet to have that issue, yeah. Although, you know, it's kind of, it would be considered like a sin in the rank, in the maqam of a prophet. Correct. A sin in the maqam of a prophet is a good act, according to us, or a mundane act, but to a prophet it's a sin. Um, what are you going to say? And some of the Christians say this is a parable. It didn't actually happen. The cursing of the fig tree is a parable for Israel. And Jesus is cursing Israel. And that opens up another bag of goodies. So some Christians, they, and some Christians say it's both. So there's a, there's a vahir and there's a batin meaning. There's an apparent and a non-apparent or exoteric and esoteric meaning. The exoteric meaning is, yes, this in fact did happen. Jesus approached a fig tree. He saw it was out of season. He cursed it. But what that means is he's cursing Israel because they're just believing in him. And so the tree is done. Yeah. Remember in our previous class, so we went over definition, the so-called definition of who Allah is. Yeah. So what is their definition of who God is? Just so we can we can have something there. You, you see what I'm saying? So if we say for one second he's all knowing and all of a sudden he's not knowing he's human, he's hundred percent human. So what's their definition? So we can know what's their definition so we can know when to say that hey, look, you guys define it like this and now you guys are saying Well we'll get to well that's in their creed. We'll get to it. Because every person in the Trinity has a different definition. Every person in the creed. <laughs> but the thing is it still doesn't make sense because they say, oh, the Father is omnipotent and all-knowing, right? <clears throat> and Isa alayhi salam, here they say, he doesn't know because he's still a man, but he shares an essence with the Father, which necessitates him to know as well. And they say, oh, it's ultimately a mystery. 
So they don't have a... It's a big figure. Into it or it's just blah, blah, blah. It's a big code under okay. No one can explain it. I mean, you can't explain God's nature anyway, but at least it should make some sort of rational yeah. sense. Consistency. Yeah, sometimes. consistency, exactly. Okay. There's actually, we'll finish with this. There's a verse in Matthew we'll look at as well. Matthew 24, 36, where Jesus says, Of that day nobody knows, meaning the day of judgment. Of that day nobody knows. Uh, no, not the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father. Mm. Right? Mm. There's some manuscripts of Matthew where that verse, nor the Son, has been removed from the gospel because Christian scribes copying it down said, oh my God, Jesus doesn't know the day of judgment. He's not God. Right? Let's move this out of the gospel. So sometimes when I read here, it, it, capital S, that's, that's referring to Jesus al Islam? Yeah. <coughs> so again, this is, this is important that we understand the context. So the Son of God, right? In a Hellenistic world, right, Greco-Roman world, this is a divine person. This is the Roman emperor. Like it says, Kaiser Augustus, uh, what does it say? Filius Dewey, on, the, on an ancient Roman coin that was minted at the time of Caesar Augustus. The Caesar Augustus, the son of God. Mm. Right? Filius Dewey, the son of God. And then it says, Pater Patriae, mm. father of the country. He's son and father at the same time. Right? So, the expression Lord and Savior is taken straight out of the emperor cult. Lord and Savior, Kurias Kai Soto. That's exactly what they call the Roman emperor. But this phrase in a Semitic Jewish context means a pious Jew. Yeah. Okay? If you read the Old Testament, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. To David. You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Right? To, <clears throat> to Moses, he says, You will be as God unto Pharaoh and Aaron as your prophet. You are like God because of your Elohim. You're God. Right? Not literally. In the Psalms 80, Psalm 86, it says, You are God, all sons of the Most High. <clears throat> I mean, you are <clears throat> not God as in a big G, but divine, not deity, you're divine. You're God-like. You're holy people. You're, you're sacrosanct people. That's what it means. So when you say the Son of God, so there's sons of God mentioned in the Old Testament, but the Son of God in a Jewish context means the Messiah. That's a messianic title. Okay? Just like when we say... Let's say there's a group of prophets here from different people. And then we say, where is the prophet? Who are you talking about? You're talking about the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even though they're prophets, right? They're other prophets. But you know, everyone knows, if you say, where is the prophet? You're talking about the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you have sons of God. You have awliya. The Jews have a concept of awliya, righteous people. They're called satipim, you know, righteous people. And then you have the Son of God, who is the Messiah, is a definite article. That's what it means. It's a messianic title. But this Jewish concept was Hellenized by Christians that were evangelized by Paul into paganism. Basically. Two quick questions. Yeah. One last, last time we went over uh, Hellenistic Christianity, but we didn't really go over Semitic Christianity during Jesus Christ alive. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a big okay. one. Okay. And another one. What what from Mark should we like really memorize for our Dawa? The verses we go Just over. Just these ones right here? Yeah, and, every, and anything else that you read. <coughs> anything else that you really have a question about, you should bring it up in class. Okay. Okay. Uh, is your book cover this, like the Kings of the Song? Sometimes. Like some of these in Mark's, and not in this order, of course, because um, Yeah, a little bit. I don't think it goes specifically into Gospels, but yeah, it's for for refutation. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Regarding the Codex, X, uh, codex that, you, uh, uh -huh. that we just learned, uh -huh. in the last class you had mentioned about the Q documents. Uh -huh. Do they have any relationship with each other? They are quite separate documents. 
Well, the Codex Sinaiticus <coughs> is a fourth century document. So, yeah, I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are included in the Codex Sinaiticus, and their source was Q. Luke and Matthew's source is Q. But Q was written very early, around 40 or 50. That's, that's what's so great about Q source document, is that it's not tainted by Paul's Christology. It's written concurrently with Paul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are influenced by Paul. That's why the passion, the cross, is so central. Whereas Q, there's no trace of any passion narrative. We'll get to more to Q when we look at Matthew and Luke. There's a question over here on the right. Oh, uh, there's Mark, which uh, they're talking about hero basically. It seems like at first they were saying like uh, the hero of Dia, I think, or the hero of Dia, like his wife, and then like the next line it says it was his daughter. Is there like a like, Oh, Herod. Uh, yeah, Herod. It just, first it says that like hero of Dia, so whatever, like, I forgot the name. Salome? Her name is Salome. <laughs> and then what I was reading it said, uh, it said, uh, oh, hero of Dia. What verse was that? I don't know. I think it was in Mark 7 or Mark 6. I forgot. But, but it said, like, uh, but it said, Herod Dias, and it said, it's when they talk about when John the Baptist was killed. Yeah. And it says something like, you know, it said, like, Herod Dias uh, was the wife of Philippa, and then Herod wanted to marry her, you know? Mm-hmm. And there's another hadith that says, Ussisat as-samawatu as-sab'u wal-ardu wa as-sab'a ala hul huwa Allahu ahad aw kama ta'ala alayhi salatu wa salam. The seven heavens and the seven earths are built upon, or you can say are suspended by, Allahu Allahu Ahad. So what does this mean? The ulama say this means that as long as people believe that God is Ahad, the heavens and the earth stay intact. As long as people believe in Allahu Allahu Ahad, the heavens and the earth stay intact. So Allah says in the Quran, Surah Maryam, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِدًّا They say Allah has begotten a son, the most gracious has begotten a son. This is a terrible thing they're saying. كَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ يَتَفَتَّرْنَ مِنْهُ وَتَنْشَقُ الْأَرْضُ وَتَخِرُ جِبَالُ هَدًّا أَنْ دَعُوا لِلرَّحْمَانِ وَلَدًا It is as if the skies are going to burst uh, and the earth is going to split and the mountains are going to be leveled because they ascribe a sun. As if, takadu means almost. It's almost going to happen because people are saying this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are still people who believe that Allah is ahad. What is the difference between wahid and ahad? Why not qudhu Allah wahid? Does anyone know the difference? So if I say, for example, I say, ana, I say, uh, aliyun rajulun wahid. Ali is one man. What does that mean? It could be two men. There could be other men. Yeah. It could be other one. Right. There could be more, but I'm just saying I'm one of them. I'm one man. That doesn't negate the existence of other rajul, of rijal. But if I say Aliyun, rajulun, ahadun. Now I'm saying that there isn't in the rest of creation, it does not exist in the rest of creation, any other human being, any other person who has the qualities of rajul, except for me. I'm the only rajul. That's what that means. Okay? So when I say wahid, that's not good enough. It means one. Christians say God is wahid. But they also say what? That he's manifested in three persons. Right? That's not absolute uniqueness. Ahad. Like when Bilal radiallahu anhu is being uh, tortured and they're putting hubal, the statue in his face, and saying hubal is God, isn't he? And he's not saying Allah, Allah, because they believe in Allah. They said, yeah, Allah is God, that's great. He's one God, but this is another God. And he's not saying, wahid, wahid, wahid. Right? He said, okay, great, Allah is wahid. But that doesn't mean that there is another God. And he's one of many gods. He's an ahadun ahad. Right? This is, this is an affront for them. He's the only God. Allah ahad means he's one of a kind. Wahid is one. Ahad, one of a kind. Okay? So, Isa alayhi salam, he says, Echad, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohinu, Adonai Echad. He's quoting the Torah. Musaddi Qalima Bayna Yadayya. In a Torah, he confirms the theology of the Torah. He's not bringing new theology. <coughs> okay. So that's, that's the last thing. And one more thing for Matt, uh, Mark, I'm sorry. But the end of Mark, 
the end of Mark, there are four endings to Mark's gospel. Four different endings. This is really interesting. When you say four different endings, within the same gospel or, or within the same or No, in different Greek manuscripts. Oh. There are four different attested endings in different Greek manuscripts. Remember, there's 5,500 or so Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. None of them are identical. No two are identical. And if you look at these 5,500 different manuscripts, there are four endings of Mark's gospel. There's kind of the traditional ending, which is what we have in like the authorized King James Version of the Bible. This is called the Authorized Version, A.V., or King James Version. This is the most popular translation in English. First done in 1611, under the auspices of His Majesty, King James of England. Uh, but this is called the New King James Version. Basically, they made it a little bit easier to understand. But if you read the end of Mark, uh, the longer ending is there, what's known as the longer ending of Mark. So, in this version, Mark ends at 1620. There's 20 verses in Mark. Okay? Now, in the Greek edition, that was done by the United Bible Society, this one here, the gospel actually ends at verse 8. And then they put 9 through 20 in double brackets. Which means that it's a later addition to the text. What they're telling you is, these scholars of the United Biblical Society, they're saying that these verses, 9 through 20, are additions, they're fabrications to Mark's gospel, later additions. Mark didn't actually write them. Okay? So the question is, why add these verses? Remember at the very beginning of Mark's gospel, there's an addition. Why? Because you don't like it. The, the, that Jesus is the son of God. Why, why did you want to do that? It likes Christology. It lacks Christology. Good. Remember, Mark's gospel is very thin on Christology. Right? He wants to pad it up a little bit. So right at Mark 1.1, 1, 1, right? he says, This is the gospel, our, uh, this is the gospel, the beginning, Arche, Evangelio, Jesu Christu, and then Hayu Theu, in brackets, the Son of God. Son of God does not appear in Aleph 01, in the Codex Sinaiticus, nor in the Codex Vaticanus. The most ancient Greek witnesses do not include Son of God. The most ancient Greek witnesses do not include 9 through 20 of chapter 16 either. The Codex Sinaiticus does not include 9 through 20 of chapter 16 of Mark. Very interestingly, how does the gospel end then? It's very interesting. So this is what happens. So, Isa is seemingly crucified. Then women, they go to uh, the sepulcher. Mary Magdala and Mary of Jacob and Salome. These three women, they go to the sepulcher. And they go there, and the stone has been rolled away. There's no one inside. And then it ends, Kai udeni uden eipan ephobanto gar. That's the Greek. That's how it ends. They said nothing to no one because they were afraid, period. Why is that problematic? Why do you think a scribe would read that and say, whoa, it needs to be more. Yeah, it's kind of a cliffhanger. No one sees a resurrected Christ. No one this is the greatest miracle, right? No one sees a resurrected Jesus. In other words, there's a feeling that we don't really know what happened. They go into what they think is a sepulcher. It's open. They run away afraid. Right? So it's a clip. They don't like it. They don't like this ending. It's too ambiguous. You can draw too many conclusions from it that are outside of quote-unquote Christian orthodoxy. So what happens is later scribes, they add these verses towards the end, these 12 verses. And what happens in these 12 verses? Okay, what happens is Mary goes and tells two disciples. What's significant about, what's significant about two men Two witnesses, two witnesses equal one woman in Jewish Sharia. So even if there's three women, their, their testimony is thrown out of court according to Jewish Sharia. There needs to be at least one or two men. right? So they tell two disciples. They go into the tomb. They see what's happening. Then Jesus, he commissions the disciples. And then he says to them, you can handle poisonous snakes. And you can drink poison. And nothing will ever happen to you. This is what he says in these verses, these fabricated verses. I debated a Christian one time. 
And he was saying the Bible is the word of God. And I said, okay, the Bible says, Jesus says at the end of Mark, that you can drink poison. So I gave him a bottle of whiteout, which may or may not kill him. Probably not, making him really sick, though. That's all I had at the time. <laughs> so then he looked at it and he said, well, you know, scholars believe that those verses are fabricated anyway. And there was a gasp from the audience. Like, what? Are you, you just said the word of the guy saying it's a fabrication. So I said, it's a fabrication. I want you to rip it out of your Bible. You have a fabrication in your Bible, right? Rip it out of your Bible. <laughs> Why not? So there's, there was a man recently named, named Mark Wolford. Have you heard this guy? An Appalachian snake handler. He was a pastor in the mm -hmm. South. I think he was in Alabama or, or Arkansas, I'm sorry. All right. And during the church services, they actually bring in poisonous snakes and they handle them. And he was bit and he died. And what's really interesting is his father died the same way. His father also died during church holding snakes. And I feel like calling this man's son and saying, that verse is a fabrication to the text. Please don't do that. Did, uh, so, wait, um, so after they run away, mm. Jesus comes back and tells in public to these men or these witnesses? He speaks to his disciples according to a longer ending. Yeah, he wow, feels like, like physically or... That's another, good, that's, that. that's another good question. Is how does Jesus appear to them? Does he appear as a ghost or as a human being, or is he is, like spiritualized? Is he glowing? Can he walk through walls? That's another issue we'll talk and, about. And so he says all. So when you say disciples, mm -hmm. does, do you mean like believers in Christianity, like, or no? The disciples that are mentioned in the, the gospel. So these snake handlers, they believe they're disciples. Uh, like, or is he saying to the general public, or just particularly these disciples? He's like, talking to disciples, but by extension to every Christian who believes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But why about snakes? Why not? He's saying that you're endowed with, with, uh, with powers uh, that are from heaven. That you have these, uh, these gifts, these charismatic gifts. That well, are now, charismata. He's, now he's a deity, right? I mean, he's come back, and so he's from giving some proofs out to people so they can. Yeah. So he, he's telling the disciples, since you've witnessed my resurrection, your faith is complete, basically. And now you're, you've been endowed with charismatic gifts, the karama. The word karama comes from charisma. The Arabic word comes from the Greek, which means some sort of power that's given that you can do something. Like karama, the saints can do miracles. Khalid ibn Walid, he drank poison, he didn't die. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinan, and he raised the man from the dead. These things are possible, they're conceivable for saints to do. So early Christians who were saints, they could do these things. But the thing is, nowadays, People believe they're saints and they get bit by snakes and they die. But they drink poison and they die. So, um, just kind of but it's a fabrication. So that's the whole point. That's besides the point. The point is that's not part of what Mark actually wrote. This is the 1952 Revised Standard Version. If I lived in America in 1955 and I took this out to church and I pointed it up like this, I'd probably get beaten at, at, at best. So this Bible was done by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christianity in 1952. And why is this Bible so controversial? Is because they went back to ancient Greek manuscripts and they took out the longer ending of Mark. They took out the phrase Son of God, or they put a footnote next to it, said this is spurious. They took out 1 John 5, 7, the only verse in the Bible that explicitly mentions the Trinity. Right? They, they took out the woman caught in the act of adultery at the beginning of John chapter 8, which is a beloved story. So Christians were literally rioting in the streets of America in the 1950s. They were buying these books from bookstores, and they were burning them in effigy in the streets. One of the uh, revisers of this Bible, Bruce Metzger, uh, he kept getting these pack I told you about the packages to his office, and he opened it as ashes, and he took that as a threat on his life. And he actually kept all these, these, these jars of ashes in his office. And I asked him, what do you think about this? And he said, at least they're burning translations now and not translators. We used to burn translators, okay? and now it's just translation. So it's a step up. They also said a congressman named Feenstra, you can look this up, Congre United States congressman. He stood up and he, he, he held up the 1952 Revised Standard Version. He said, you know why this is red? Because it's a communist conspiracy. <laughs> Interesting. 
You can read all about this 1952 Revised Standard Version. It's a red commie Bible that they said. <laughs> that's been stripped of our essential theology. And they said, no, no, no. And then poor Harry Orlinsky, there was a Jewish man, the only Jew on the board. Because, you know, he's, he's brought in because he's an expert on the Old Testament. And eventually they scapegoated him and said, oh, it's the Jew. It's the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's all I wanted to say about Mark. We're going to move on to Matthew now. We spent a lot of time on Mark. So the Gospel of Matthew is called Kata Matthean, according to Matthew. <clears throat> Who wrote it? Matthew, according to tradition. The scholars will tell you that it's pseudonymous. In fact, anonymous. No one identifies himself. The author does not identify himself. Matthew is called a Levi in Hebrew, disciple of Jesus. Where was it written? Probably in Antioch in Syria. In Syria, large Jewish population. What's the translation? The translation of the, this is called the Shema. It's called the Shema, or is that a part of it too? Oh, it's, it's, it's part of it, yeah. So the, the first word here is Shema. This is like this. Shema? No, it's Isma. Oh, it's Isma. Isma. Okay. <laughs> Which means listen. Right? Shema Yisrael, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So when Jews feel death approaching, they want their final words to be Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. That is, keep repeating this, just like you do the Shahab of Okay? Uh, is that okay? So there's one uh, name I want you to be familiar with before we move on, actually. William Tyndale, who, who was killed in 1525. The reason I bring it up is because his name is mentioned in the preface of the 1952 Revised Standard Version. He was the first man to actually translate the Bible from original languages into a different language. And he did it in English. He was from England. So he translated the Old Testament from Hebrew, New Testament from Greek, into English. So what happened to him? He mentioned, he mentioned here in the preface, he was betrayed into the hands of his enemies in October 1536, publicly executed and burned at the stake. And that's an understatement. Um, he was killed in a very, very horrific way. There was another man before him, uh, Wycliffe in 1384, who died. Uh, he didn't actually translate from original languages. He did it from Latin. Uh, but then 30 or so years after his death, he was declared a heretic at a church council, so his body was exhumed, his bones were crushed, and thrown into the Rhine River. Mm -hmm. Translation is serious business for the church. They don't want people, the laity, to know what the Bible has to say. They want to censor the Bible. Mm -hmm. yes. He translated trans from Greek or translated from... Uh, he translated from Hebrew and Greek, original languages. He was Hebrew. the first. But Wycliffe did it from Latin. That's not an original language. That's a translation of a translation. Interestingly here, this is what he says, this is what they say, Tyndale's work became the foundation of subsequent English translations. So this man who was burned at the stake as a heretic, his translation into English is almost 80% reproduced in the authorized version of the New Testament. So what happened was there was a Protestant Reformation. Now you can actually translate the Bible. But he was born a few years too early. If he was about 50 years later, he would have been a hero. But... He's a heretic, and he was burned. He was actually tied to a stake, then he was strangled. He was still alive, though. They impaled him, uh, then they burned him, and then they uh, dismembered him. Yes. When the church declares you a heretic, how does that then, along the lines, that the, the, the eyes of a martyr, I guess, like Makam of the like, where's the transition? Is there a, a transition within the church history of someone that's yeah, I mean, the, the church will change its view on certain people. Joan of Arc is a perfect example. Joan of Arc was killed by the Catholic Church as a heretic. She was a cross-dresser. So she wasn't an apostate. This Tyndale was not, you know, he didn't leave Christianity. He didn't apostate. He just did a translation. Joan of Arc, she just dressed, used to dress like a man. And they, and they said, this is a violation of Deuteronomy, where it says that it cursed is the man who dresses like a woman and vice versa, right? Which is kind of strange because Christians believe the Old Testament has been abrogated in the more come out, but you know, whatever suits them for any purpose, I guess. That's the Catholic Church, I guess, I don't know. But they said you're a heretic that burned her at the stake. A few years later, the same institution that killed her canonized her as a saint. So this tends to happen as well. 
But the thing about Tyndale was he was declared a heretic by the Catholic Church or the Church of England, but then after the Reformation, the Protestants, they really loved his translation. I mean, wasn't she not, not cross-testing the way we refer to it, but she was inspired to lead an army, so she dressed as a man right. to, to, to lead, a, to lead right. an army, and she was, what, 17 years old? Yeah, so, <laughs> right. So she had a, 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 she had a, a, a vision and awakened state of, of Jesus or Mary that told her to lead the army. But I just wanted to bring that name up, because he says here, the King James Version has grave defects, right? So the most popular English translation, according to the scholars of the 1952 Revised Standard Version, who say this has grave defects. And these defects are so serious as to call for revision. Now, it's interesting here. Look how the committee actually did this. The committee required that all changes be agreed upon by a two-thirds vote of total membership of the committee. So they have different versions of the Bible, they have to choose one, they have to, and they vote on it. Two-thirds will, I mean, they vote to make something the Word of God, very much like at Nicaea, they voted to make Jesus equal with the Father. At Constantinople, they voted to make the Holy Spirit God as well. And then he says here, <clears throat> where a more probable or convincing reading can be obtained by assuming different vowels, this has been done. So they give themselves a lot of license to move vowels around, and they admit all of this. Very interesting. The King James Version of the New Testament, based on a Greek text, was marred by mistakes. I'll let you, if you want to get one of these 1952 Revised Standard Versions. Can you find that? Yeah, you can probably, yeah, you can find them on, probably on uh, Amazon. Or I think they still have some laying around. This was a little hard for me to find, but anyway, um, back to Matthew. So Antioch and Syria, so Jews living in the diaspora outside of the Holy Land. Uh, it was written around 80 to 95 of the Common Era, around there, 80, 85, 90, 95, something like that. Remember at this time, there's major turmoil happening in the world of the Jews. In 70 of the Common Era, the temple was burned down by General Titus. The Jews, uh, uh, they, many of them fled from Palestine. Uh, in 120, uh, 132 of the Common Era, there was another insurrection in Palestine, the final Jewish try to free their homeland of these pagan Romans, right? In 132 of the Common Era, this is called the Kar uh, Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba was a man, Simon Bar Kokhba. What does Bar mean in Aramaic? Does anyone know? Son of. Right. Son of. So that's like Ibnu, right? Um, uh, and then Kokhba, Kokhub. He's a star, the son of the star. So this was not his actual name. There's a verse in Numbers 24:17 that most Jews believe to be a messianic prophecy that says a star shall arise out of Jacob. A star shall arise, a star, a Kokhub. So he made the claim of messiahship. He was endorsed by big rabbis at the time, in the early second century. Uh, so they gave him the name Bar Kokhba. The son of the star. This is called a this is called a patronymic. Right? Yes. The reference that you give is from which book? The 3470. Numbers. This is uh, in the Torah. Let me write oh, that book. The fourth book: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. So what happened here is the emperor, the Roman emperor at the time, was a man named Hadrian, who hated Jews. That's what they call him, Hadrian, I guess. Really hated the Jews, right? So he sent an army into Palestine, and they completely crushed the Jewish rebellion. Over 50,000 Jews were killed. Simon Bar Kokhba's head was removed from his body, put on a stake on the Temple Mount. An idol was put on the Temple Mount, which is the greatest insult to leave. The abomination of desolation, something that Antiochus did to the Jews in the second century before the Common Era. Anyway, he, he was renamed by Jewish rabbis. It's Simon Bar Koziba. <laughs> what is Koziba? Kebaba, Kebaba, Kebaba. The son of the liar. So Bar Kokhba might be offensive for Jews to hear. Just call him Simon the Zealot or something. Because many of them refer to him as Bar Koziba. The son of the liar. Uh, 
So Hadrian, he renames Jerusalem from Yerushalayim to Aelia Capitolina. It has a new name, Aelia Capitolina. And he expelled every Jew from Jerusalem. He said, you come back, we kill you on the spot. So the Jews really have a true diaspora now. In the middle of these two insurrections, you have the Gospel of Matthew written. Between 70 and 132, all four Gospels actually, although Mark was concurrent with the first rebellion. And Mark, remember, believed that that first rebellion meant it was the end of the world. All right. So, who is this Gospel for? It's for Jews in the diaspora. It's da'wah to them, calling them towards the truth of Christ. It's also for Christians living in that area, in the diaspora, to increase their certitude and to use as a po polemical tractate against their Jewish opponents. Right? Because Matthew, obviously, is very familiar with the Old Testament. This is one of his major themes, we'll get into that, is that he quotes from the Old Testament, alludes to it over a hundred times. Right? So the average Christian living in Antioch is illiterate, he doesn't really know how to, you know, he gets into a debate with a Jew, why do you believe Jesus is God? Um, because he was a miracle worker. Well, so what? Where, where's your Dada is? Now Matthew comes. Matthew has all of these scriptural evidences, right? So that's how it was used. <clears throat> the structure of the gospel. The structure of the gospel is the first part is the genealogy, which is missing from Mark, right? Mark does not give a genealogy. And infancy narrative, also missing from Mark. So Matthew, he begins by giving a genealogy, going back to Abraham. Abraham, who begot Isaac. Isaac, who begot Jacob. Jacob, who begot uh, Judah and his brethren. Judah, who begot Zerah and Phares through Tamar. Who's Tamar? Tamar is a very interesting story. We'll talk about it later, but some of these names in the ancestry of Esau de Sanatmar. Very strange people, if you read about what they actually did in the Old Testament. Anyway, there's a genealogy. Well, what's the point of a genealogy? Yeah, so this is considered a delil, right? Because what were the Jews saying at the time? Who is this Esau? Who is this Jesus? Where does he come from? Isn't he just a carpenter from a backwater town? What are you talking about? Who is he? The uh, Messiah is from David. Right? That's what they believe. The Messiah must descend from David, the house of David. So Matthew, he actually produces a genealogy of Jesus that goes back to Abraham and actually goes through David. Okay? That's the point of the genealogy, is to convince people that Jesus is a descendant of David. However, what's really interesting is, there's no way Jesus can be a descendant of David. Why? Because there's a virgin birth. Yeah. Right? And Mary is not from David. Mary is a Levite. Luke tells us that. Mary is a cousin of Elizabeth, one of the daughters of Aaron. Right? Aaron is a Levite, he's not a Judite. Different tribe. So Matthew, how does Matthew deal with this issue? He introduces to us a character named Joseph the Carpenter. Right? Joseph the Carpenter. So this is a new character. He's not in Mark. Joseph the Carpenter. Yusuf and Najjar. Joseph the carpenter is a descendant of David. Okay? So he's betrothed to Mary. But how does this solve the issue still? How does this make Jesus a descendant of, of David? But does it work like that? It doesn't work like that. So this doesn't solve anything. Unless he is the actual biological father of Jesus, then, he, then he's the son of David. But... Matthew certainly believes in the virgin birth. He writes about it, right? So how does Matthew sort of reconcile the virgin birth with the Messiah being a son of David is a mystery. It's a mystery. That's, he's still not a descendant of, of David. But what was the relationship between Joseph and Mary? They're engaged to be married. Um, they're engaged. Mary's a Levite. She, cannot, she is not allowed to marry outside of her tribe. The Levite is a, there's, there's a special speciality about the, uh, <laughs> the speciality about the, uh, the tribe of Levi. Right? They don't participate in military, they're exempt from military expeditions. Right? Um, they're not allowed to 
marry more than one wife. Uh, they are not allowed to drink alcohol, and they're not allowed to marry outside the tribe, which is a priestly tribe. The priesthood has to remain intact. It has to be pure. These are sons of Aaron, the first high priest. So Mary is a Levite. She is the daughter of Aaron, uh, one of the descendants of Aaron. Right? Ya'uch da Harun, right? Like the Quran says, O oh, oh sister of Aaron, meaning descendant of Aaron, the brother of Musa, alayhi salam. So Joseph the carpenter is invented to sort of connect Jesus somehow, metaphysically, to the line of David, because the Jews believe this was their strongest evidence against Jesus before Matthew. Why do you believe he's the Messiah? He comes from nowhere. Where is his lineage? His mother is a Levite, and his father is uh, God knows who. They didn't believe in the virgin birth. They would slander Isa, they said, uh, right? And to this day, if you look at the Babylonian Talmud, Jesus is referred to as Ben Pandera. And Pandera is a Roman uh, centurion who apparently raped Maryam, alayhi salam, so that's what they refer to him in the Jewish Talmud, Babylonian Talmud. <clears throat> we'll get more into that later, inshallah. So genealogy, then you have an infancy narrative, which is the Molid of Isa, you have an infancy virgin birth, so on and so forth. Um, then you have what's known as the five major discourses. Okay. You have the five major discourses. So the five major discourses, number one, Sermon on the Mount. Number two, instruction to his disciples. Sorry. Number three, parables of the kingdom of God. Number four, instructions to the church, which is called ecclesia, which is translated church, but really means a gathering of believers. Is that right? Instructions to the church. So Sermon on the Mount, instructions to the disciples. Parable of the kingdom. Number four is instructions to the church. Number five, warnings of the final judgment. Why is this important for Matthew? Why five major discourses? You don't have any idea? Why is this number significant to Matthew? Think in terms of Old Testament. Every trying to prove that Jesus. What? Five books of the Torah. Very good. There's five books in the Torah. In Greek, the Torah is called Pentateuch. Pentateuch and five scrolls. Okay? So Matthew is constructing his gospel to sort of mimic the Torah in this sense. Okay? Yes. So here are the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the five books. These are the five scrolls. Okay? And these are um, of Greek names. These are not the Hebrew names. Um, but Matthew then because he's trying to prove that Jesus is the true Messiah. He mimics that aspect of it. So, Matthew says, Jesus, as an infant, went to Egypt. Right? No other gospel mentions it. Not even Luke, who has a birth narrative. What's significant about Egypt? What is significant about Egypt? That's where Moses came out of. Right? So, Musa, alayhi salam, came out of Egypt, therefore Jesus is also coming out of Egypt, because Jesus is like Moses, according to Matthew. Jesus for, fulfills the prophecy of 1818 in Deuteronomy. So this is a prophecy of a prophet to come who is similar to Moses. Okay, Deuteronomy 1818. That's the Masuba, right? Yeah. It's just, Nabi Akim Lahem Bikarav Achehim So raise a prophet from amongst their brethren, like unto you. And he shall, I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Okay? So, although Matthew never quotes 1818 Deuteronomy, which is very strange, because he quotes over 80 or 100 verses of the, of the Old Testament, his entire structure is built upon this verse, 1818, that Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of this long-awaited prophecy. Okay? This is why you have Jesus going to Egypt, because Moses went to Egypt. This is why another character introduced in Matthew, which is not in Mark, is Herod, King Herod. King Herod is the puppet ruler of Judea, 
at the time of the birth of Isa he is succeeded by Herod Antipas, the man who interrogates Jesus as an adult. But King Herod, he learns from these magi. This is also in Matthew. The magi. Who are the magi? Astrologers. Good. They're Persian astrologers. They're Zoroastrian. Majus. The Quran talks about Majus in Surah Hajj. Zoroastrian astrologers from Persia. They're able to follow a star, right? The star of the Messiah. And some Christian commentators say it's not literally a star. It's an angel that was guiding them. But they perceived it to be a star. So they follow the star all the way into Bethlehem. And they see it hovering over a manger. So Herod learns of the Magi. And he interrogates them. And what brings you here? He says, well, the king of Judah is about to be born. The king of Israel is about to be born. Um, so Herod, he says, I'm going to institute a slaughter of the innocents. Just like who? Um, just like Pharaoh, right? Again, there's a similarity between Jesus and Moses. When Moses was born, Pharaoh, he uh, carried out this slaughter of the firstborn sons of Israel. They were thrown, mostly thrown into the river Nile. And Musa alayhi salam, he was saved because his mother received wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was put into the Nahrun Nil, and then she was, he was picked up by Asya alayhi salam. So, when Herod is going to slaughter all the kids of Bethlehem, the newborn sons, Joseph has a dream. Joseph the carpenter, very much like, like uh, the mother of Moses had a dream. Joseph has a dream that says, go to Egypt immediately. Right? So he takes his wife Mary, who was very pregnant at the time, and they go into Egypt for some time, and then they come back uh, actually into Nazareth. They avoid Judah. They go into Galilee, northern Palestine, because um, uh, Herod had little control of what's going on there. He was the king of Judea, southern Palestine. So um, in Matthew, he mentions uh, Jesus being going to Egypt mm -hmm. after he was born. Um, yes. Okay, but then also yes, I think I, I think that's just that she was pregnant. That's not true. He, he was already born. Okay. Yeah. And King Herod. So he also he also introduces King Herod mm -hmm. as a way to uh, to relate Herod to Pharaoh. Yeah. So he's a Pharaonic archetype. You have these archetypes in the New Testament. He's repeating themes to tie. Right. He's, this is what he's doing. He, he crafts it very well. He's trying to prove to Jews in the diaspora, Jesus is the Messiah and he's the prophet like in the Moses. So you have all of these reoccurring archetypes right? in, the New, in, in Matthew's Gospel. The Sermon on the Mount is like what? Moses on the mountain. Luke doesn't call it the Sermon on the Mount. He calls it the Sermon on the Plain. A mount and a plain are very different. But Jesus again, Matthew again, wants to show you that this is the Messiah, the prophet like in the Moses. What's the, the how did the, the Jews view astrology or when they were introduced to the Nagis? Uh, did you accept them? Is it part of the No, the astrologer is it, it, the, the Torah says that the astrologer must be put to death. But Herod, he's not a very good Jew. He's like a, a, the George Bush of Christians. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the All this analogy I can make. Yeah, I'm insulting Herod. Um, but uh so yeah, he's a puppet ruler. He was placed by the Romans because he can just sort of do whatever the Romans want. And here's some money and wealth, and you can be the king, and you know, we'll do whatever you want to your people as long as you do whatever we tell you to do, right? So he takes these things a little seriously, I guess. Probably the story is invented anyway. It probably didn't happen. There's no historical evidence of this ever happening, of the slaughter of the children of Bethlehem. There's zero historical evidence. And we have a lot of evidence historically from that period. You'd be surprised. Roman sources, Jewish sources, Christian sources, nothing. Only this source, which is a Christian source, Matthew mentions the slaughter of the innocents. Yes. So um, when Jesus was uh, put to the cross, was it by the Romans or the Jews? Or Jews who were Romans? Well, that's a very good question because we're going to get to that in Matthew. Definitely, according to Matthew, it was all the Jews. Pilate brings out so a basin of water and he washes his hands in front of the crowd. He says, I am innocent. And Pilate, the Roman governor, is canonized as a saint by the Ethiopian church. He's a saint in that, in that, in that church. 
Why? Because he has Felix culpa. He has good blame. He, he was instrumental in the cru crucifixion, but then he washed his hands at the end of it. But still he has blame, but it's good. Using the same kind of logic that Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, and made it possible for Jesus to die, he should also be a saint. Yes? Uh, we learned, I think, in a couple of classes ago that at that time there was no Christian Jews or anything. Everyone was Jew. Yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. At this point, there are no Christians. There's, there's just Jews with different total. They have different met methodologies. Yeah. Method is total things like that. Right. But the word Christian is not around at this time at all. Okay. Was there the Catholic Church that introduced the term Christian? Or? No, the Book of Acts says it was used as a derogatory term by, by Jews when they were expelling Christians from the from the temple, saying, you're not real Jews, you worship Christ, get out of here, you Christian. The term Christian is very interesting, too, because Christ is from the Hebrew word Mashiach, but it's a Greek translation, the suffix is Latin. For my people Israel. So, very clearly then, according to a Jewish interpretation of the text, is that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem is Beit Lechem, Beit Lechem, right, the house of meat, the house of bread. So this is a city that's just a few miles away from Jerusalem, where Isa salam was born. According to our sources, he was born there on the night, night of Laylatul al Isra al Mi'raj. The Prophet وسلم, he dismounted from the Burak and prayed the Rak'atain in different places. One of the places where he dismounted and prayed, and he asked Jibreel alayhi salam, where are we? He said, this is Beit Lehem, Beit Lehem, where Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ was born. Uh, so, Micah 5.2 says clearly, the Messiah, the King of Israel, is going to come from Bethlehem. It does not say that the king of Israel will be a descendant of, da of David. Okay? Small as you are from the towns of Judah, from you there shall arise a king who shall shepherd my people Israel. David was born in Bethlehem also. Okay? So that's where I think the error happens. How is the Messiah connected to, to David? Is that they're born in the same city. They're not necessarily from the same tribe. Okay? Um... They say Jesus is Nazareth. Isn't that also? Nazareth is in Galilee. So what happened here, so to take you through the theoretical chronology. So Isa alayhi salam, uh, he is born in Bethlehem, which is in southern Palestine. The province is called Judea, just a few miles away from Jerusalem. And then, according to Matthew, right, the Magi come into town. Herod sort of interrogates them. They tell him there's going to be a king. He's going to dethrone you, so on and so forth. So he says, okay, slaughter all of the newborn children in Bethlehem, thus mimicking the Pharaoh of Egypt. So Joseph has a dream, and the dream says, go to Egypt, flee to Egypt. So he takes Maryam and the baby Isa, alayhi salam, and they live in Egypt for some time. And they sort of were able to escape the, just like Moses being in the Nile, Jesus is in Egypt. And then eventually, the Holy Family, they relocate into northern Palestine, in the province of Galilee, northern Palestine. The province is called Galilee, the city is called Nazareth. So Isa alayhi salam, Jesus was, was raised in Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. Okay? Hence Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> now, um, also, Satan, a new, a new character. <laughs> Satan is mentioned in Mark, but now he has a speaking role. So, Satan, the devil, yeah. So in Mark, he's, you know, he's in the Charlie Chaplin movie. There's no, he doesn't have a speaking role. But now it's Avatar. <laughs> the greedy now. So what happens is Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. It's mentioned in Mark, but very briefly. Now he's tempted in the wilderness, and he has his conversation with Satan. They discuss scripture. Satan takes him to an exceedingly high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth, which implies that the earth is flat. The higher you go, the more kingdoms you can apparently see. Anyway, just not talk about that for right now. Uh, so then he says, fall down and worship me. I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And he says, you know, you shall worship the Lord, your God alone. He quotes from the Torah over and over again. He said, he said I'm during the temptation. It's quoting from the Torah, right? And this is, this is very troubling. If we were to concede that Jesus is a divine incarnation or that he's God, because the book of James says very clearly, 
that God cannot be tempted. God cannot be tempted. The book of James. The epistle of James. James is who? The brother of Jesus. His letter, James, he's called Yaakov in Hebrew, is almost like you're reading a tafsir of, of the Quran by a Muslim. It's very, very Islamic, the book of James. Right? And if you compare it to, for example, the book of Corinthians or Romans, compare, compare Romans with James, it's like, it's literally two different religions. But it's in the New Testament. Because, again, you see that sort of conflict between Jamesonian and Semitic Christianity and Pauline, Hellenistic Christianity. Um, so I remember one time I was in a debate and a Christian guy said, how come your prophet Labid was able to put a spell on him? Remember Labid, a sorcerer in Medina? So first of all, we talked about this before. That, huh? is, is it a strong hadith? No, it's found in Syria. It's not a strong hadith. Remember, we talked about Jam'ah, right, in Tarjir. This is what the ulama do. Scholars of Islam, they look at two stories that are conflicting, and they try to harmonize. And oftentimes, they can't harmonize. But if they can't harmonize it, they have to pick one that's stronger. For many ulama, they reject the story of Labid casting a spell on the Prophet and it affected his memory, right? So the Christian will say, how can you believe he's the Prophet of God when somebody successfully cast a spell on him and it played with his memory. Well, you believe that Isa alayhi salam is God and he was successfully lured to the top of a high mountain. The Prophet is still a human being. He's not God, right? So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a false, that's a fallacious, fallacious argument right, to make. Um, so, anyway. So it's called the temptation, right? The whole yeah. Thing. And that's, and, uh, Part two of the five minute discussions? The, the passion. What's that? The, the shape you put over the next major discussion. No, no, these are the, these are the three yeah. themes genealogy, um, and infancy, uh -huh. major discourse, and passion narrative. Shape is where? The passion narrative? No, he's just one of the new characters. So we, okay. we have new characters Joseph the Carpenter, Herod the Great, the Magi, and Satan. These are new characters, more as well. These are four major new players. Um, now, major themes of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is the true Messiah, the supreme teacher, the open teacher. Right? It's no longer a secret. Remember the messianic secret of Mark? What's the purpose of the messianic secret again? Why is it when in Mark, when Jesus is in Galilee, and he extracts a demon, the demon falls down and says, you are the son of David. He says, shh, don't tell him you're Why is it a secret? So, some scholars believe that Mark employed the messianic secret in order to explain why Jesus had such a small following. Why are there just a few Christians if he's the Messiah? Because he was telling people to be quiet. Another explanation is that Jesus, he wanted to survive long enough to get to Jerusalem. Because if he's the open Messiah in Galilee, the Romans would have killed him on the spot. Mm -hmm. Because the saying of the Messiah has a political implication to it. It's not just, I'm a spiritual teacher, I can walk on water. Messiah means I'm the king of this land. And your king is not the king. I'm the king. So that's an affront to Roman authority. So it's quiet in Galilee. But in Matthew, it's not quiet. The open Messiah. He's the open Messiah, the supreme teacher, the true interpreter, the Mufasir of the Torah. Speaking with authority. That's one theme. Another theme, very prevalent in Matthew, are Christological typologies. You guys ever heard this word typology? Yeah, typology. <laughs> a typology is a foreshadowing of a future person found in a text. So, in, in other words, Matthew will quote from the Old Testament very much like we did during the uh, birth narrative, and he'll say that Herod is a typology, that Pharaoh is a typology of Herod, okay? That Moses' exodus is a typology of Jesus leaving Egypt. That the slaughter of the innocents in uh, Bethlehem uh, reflects the typology of what Pharaoh did. These are called typologies, okay? Okay. 
right, foreshadowing the future events. So he'll quote, Matthew will quote, or allude to the Old Testament over 100 times. Greater than 100 times. But remember, he's quoting from the Septuagint. The LXX is called the Septuagint. This is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. He's not quoting directly from Hebrew, translating into the Greek, Koine Greek of his era. He's translating from a translation, or he's quoting from a translation. He's not quoting from the original Hebrew. And all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's what they'll do. And we'll talk more about the Septuagint. Matthew also performs what's known as Midrashim. Have you guys ever heard of Midrash? So Midrash is interpretation of the Torah. So Midrash comes from Daras, Darash, which is Darasa in Arabic. Midrash, so interpretation, interpretation, commentary on the Old Testament. He does this quite uh, often. There's two types of commentary that he makes. I try to stay with the vocab here. It's very important. There's halakha, and then there's haggadah. I'll explain these. Halakha is tafsir. We can translate this. Tafsir. And I'm using tafsir here in the sense of commentary on verses that deal with ahkam. Commentary that deal with verses that deal with physical laws, ritual laws. For example, kutiba alaykum siyam the Quran says, it is prescribed upon you to fast. Now, some of you will read that and say, well, how do I fast? Now you have to read a tafsir. Tafsir is based on the sunnah of the Prophet you cannot understand the Quran without Sunnah. It's a new trend these days, right? That separate Allah from His Messenger. This is what they used to do in Medina at his time, at the time of the Prophet. Why do people want to do that? Because if you remove the Prophet, you can interpret the Quran however you want, right? Remove the Prophet, then you can interpret the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladina amnu, la tuqaddimu bayna yadihi Allahi wa rasulihi. The beginning of Hujurah. All you who believe, don't put yourself in the middle of Allah and His Messenger. Don't divorce Allah from His Messenger. Don't separate Allah from His Messenger. Right? ma amr Allahu As he says in Baqarah, they sever what Allah has jo- has ordered to be joined. Right? So that's called the tafsir. I'm using tafsir here not in the, not in the broad sense of exegesis or interpretation in general. I'm using it in the sense of interpreting verses of the Qur'an that deal with ahkam, legal rulings. Okay? So, kutiba alaykum siyam. The tafsir says, well, you wake up, you know, you, you do your suhoor, then you pray fajr, and then when the sun looks like the sky looks like this, you begin to fast, and so on and so forth, and you, these are things that revoke your fast, these are, these are mustahabat and makruhat and all those things, right, about the fast. That's... Uh, Halakha. Okay? So, exegesis of legal rulings. Matthew does that, like on the Sermon on the Mount. Right? He'll have Jesus give these interpretations of physical aspects of the Torah. Also, Haggadah. We would call this in Arabic, Ta'wil. Ta'wil, the root here is awwala, to find the origin of something. This is spiritual exegesis. This is esoteric interpretation. A, a spiritual interpretation. So while tafsir, or halakha, deals with exoteric aspects of the law, hagada or ta'wil, deals with esoteric, internal, non-apparent aspects of the law. And this is where we get into typology. Right. Esoteric interpretation of the law. I'll give you an example. Um, this really deals with Aqidah. Yad Allahi Fawqa Aidihim. Yad Allahi Fawqa Aidihim. The Yad of Allah is above their hands. Yad means hand. 
but I translate yet. So, what do you do with this verse? What does that mean? The hand of God? So these are verses, these are, uh, Tatwil is an interpretation of verses that seem to indicate some sort of anthropomorphism in the Quranic text. Right? So while the tafsir deals with muhkamat, ta'wil deals with mutashabihat. Okay, so the Quran says in the beginning of the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, He revealed the book to you. In it are verses fundamentally established in meaning, one-dimensional. And other verses that are ambiguous, obscure. Right? And these require either tafweeb, which means you leave the verse, you don't interpret it, or you make tafweeb which means that you give it a spiritual interpretation. So, Yadullahi Fawqa Aidihim. Many of the Salaf will say, this simply means what Allah wills it to mean, and don't worry about it. Allah doesn't have a hand like you have a hand. There's nothing like Allah. Don't worry about it. This is what the Salaf used to do. The Khalaf, they used to make ta'wil and say, this just means the power of God. The power of God is with the mu'mineen. Yadullahi uh, Ma'al jama'ah is with the majority, for example, according to a hadith. It means power, the qudra, the protection of Allah. But then, Allahu alam. God knows. So, ta'wil of this type, typology, is very rare from Sunni exegetes. Sometimes the Prophet says, so makes ta'wil. Mathalu ahli bayti ka mathali safina tibur. This is ta'wil. The typology, the uh, similitude of my family, Ahl al-Bayt, is like the similitude of the Ark of Noah, right? So he's taking something, he's taking a story in the Qur'an. The apparent meaning is the story of Nuh al Noah, the Ark of Noah. He saved the animals and his family and so on and so forth. <clears throat> he's saying that is comparable to my family at the end of time. My family, Ahlul Bayt, is like the Ark of Noah. Whoever embarks is saved. Whoever does not is damned. Some Sunni exegetes also will take the Shajara Khaditha in Surah Ibrahim. There's a Shajara Tayyiba, a good tree, and a bad tree, Khaditha, a foul tree. They'll say Shajara uh, Tayyiba is Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, descendants of the Prophet. And Shajara Khaditha is Bani Umayya. This is also a Sunni exegesis. Almost all Shia say this, but some of the Sunni say it as well. The Shia exegesis typology is really interesting. There's a uh, tafsir called Al Mizan by Taba Tabari. He's a very famous uh, Shia um, exegist. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> it's really interesting, just uh, FYI. He says, uh, you know the story in, in Surah Safa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the sacrifice of Ismail alayhi salam, the would-be sacrifice. Allah says in that surah, فَدَيْنَاهُ وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ Okay? Oh. That we ransomed, we ransomed Ismail with a great sacrifice. We, ran, we saved him with a great sacrifice. So Imam Suyuti says, that Adim here, this Sigwatul Mubalaba, meaning something really great. But what is the bit A goat? Why is a goat so great? Right? Imam Sayyuti says that's because Jibril alayhi salam brought the goat from heaven. This is why it's great. And Taba Tabari, he agrees with this, a Shi'i exegesis. He says, I agree with that. That's on the apparent. But the esoteric is a typology of Imam Hussein. This is bit from Adim. Right? And it's interestingly, if you go to the previous verse, before this verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadha lahu al mubin This episode was a clear test. If you take that verse and label it number one, and then count ten more verses, like ordinal numbers, first, second, third, get the ten. It says about Musa and Harun, Again, Adim. This time, Karb. Separated from ten verses from Bala. 
Karbala, right? Karbala on the 10th of Muharram. It's actually, it's really interesting. You know, it's very interesting. So usually it's the Shia commentators that deal a lot with typology. Yeah. But that's just something I thought really interesting. <laughs> um, so this is what Matthew does. To give you an example, in Matthew chapter 1, this is an example of Haggadah. 123, Matthew 123. This is during the nativity of Esai, Esai, of Jesus Christ. He says, when Jesus was born, it fulfilled a prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah 7.14 which says, I have my Hebrew Bible here. It says, Hine Alma Hara, that a young girl will conceive. Bayonadef Bain, and she will give birth to a son. Vakarat Shmo Immanuel. And she will name him Immanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, literally, Allahu ma'ana, Emmanuel, Allahu ma'ana, but exactly the opposite. Emmanuel, God is last, Allahu ma'ana, Allah is first. So Matthew says, this is the fulfillment. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 7.14. Right, you see how he did that? So somebody will say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? If you keep reading Isaiah in chapter 8, it says that Emmanuel is born to King Ahaz. So you're just ignoring the context. Matthew will say, yes, that's the apparent context. That's the exoteric aspect of the scripture. But the esoteric aspect is a typology of Christ. Okay? So Justin Martyr, a church father in the second century, father of Logos theology, he wrote a book called Dialogue with Trippo the Jew. And Trippo is an interlocutor that he invented. He's having this debate between himself and a Jew. And he knows Judaism very well, apparently. So this is one of the points of their debate. Jesus is Emmanuel. What are you talking about? You take it out of context. Yes, but scripture has multiple levels of meaning. This is Haggadah. Right? And that's how he wins the argument. Of course, Jesus' name is not Emmanuel. His name is Jesus. But they say, well, because he's a divine incarnation, so therefore his, his reality is given. Not his name. You see, that's an example of Matthew doing how that. Uh, any questions about that? You know how to make it. Huh? Yeah, that's the that's the downside. Of, that's why Sunni exegetes sort of they're a little uh, tentative of doing things like that because you can sort of make the scripture say whatever you want. But there is definitely, you know, an Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. Literally in Arabic, it's Allahumma ana. A, a literal uh, translation. M, M in Hebrew is ma'a, but it's reversed. This is really interesting. So ma'a, mim, ain. But in Hebrew, it's reversed. Ain, mim. And then nu is na in the middle. And then ail is Allah. But then the whole statement is flipped. Immanuel, Allahumma ana. <laughs> it's very interesting. I don't know. I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys understood that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> huh? There's a language there. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Something that I just had before. I just had before. Yeah. If we said, said Ma'ana Allah, so Allah is only with us and nobody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can pray on it. Yeah, that's true. It, it gives emphasis. Yeah. Like, like, it's Balaam, exactly. Like, when uh, Musa alayhi salam is a priest edge of the Red Sea in the Quran. And they say, oh, we're going to be killed. He says, kalla, which means like, no way. In the ma'ya rabbi sayyidin. No way. With me is my Lord. He mentions ma'ya first. With me is my Lord. But when the Prophet is in the cave of Abu Bakr Siddiq, la tahsan, in Allah ma'ana. He didn't say, la tahsan, ma'ana Allah or something. First he says, Allah is with us. So this shows the, the, the Muhammad of the Prophet says that's one of the proofs of the, that Imam Isadim 
That the way the prophet speaks shows his view over the rest of the prophets. Anyway. Um, almost done. Yes? Is most of Matthew is Halakha or Halakha in terms? In other words, can you read it in the Muslim? <laughs> no, he, he, this is probably more prevalent because he's constantly connecting events in the life of Jesus to events that happen in the life of Hebrew prophets. So unless you're really familiar with the life of the Hebrew prophets, it's going to be difficult. Sometimes he misquotes things. We'll get we'll get to that. Does he also use astrology to reach the part of that? Like he no, he doesn't go with astrology. That was what the Majus did. So they were asking for that. Another theme, anti-Jewish, extremely anti-Jewish, the Gospel of Matthew. The Christian community is seen as the new Israel. Matthew chapter 23 is known as the seven woes. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, he says this seven times, chastising the Pharisee, the religious establishment. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. How can you escape the damnation of hell? You strain at the gnat and you swallow the camel. What does that mean? <laughs> you strain at the gnat, but you swallow the camel. That means you're emphasizing the wrong thing. That's wrong. Right. He says you put, your, you put your traditions over the law of God in another verse. I'm missing the big picture. Very good. You're missing the big picture. I like it. Yes? I remember you saying that uh, Matthew was put first, even though it's not first chronologically, because it kind of made a good transition from like the uh, Old Testament to the New Testament. It does. But then you said it was anti-Jewish. It's anti-Jewish, yeah. How does that work out? Well, it's anti-Jewish, but because it uses this idea of Haggadah and Halakha, it still provides a, a smooth transition, even though it's vehemently anti-Jewish. Yeah. But he's calling it the Jewish. He's calling it the Jewish. He's right? Right. You were okay, but now you gotta follow this right way. Yeah, right, exactly. So then he also says, You are whited sepulchers. On the outside you are clean, but on the inside you reek of death. In other words, you look good on the outside, but the internal is, is dead. This is what he says in Matthew 23. The seven woes. And this all comes to a head in Matthew 27 25. This is when Jesus is being tried by Pilate. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. And Pilate was notorious for crucifying Jews. So Pilate, he interrogates Jesus at least once, and John it's a few times, but then Matthew interrogates him, and he says, there's nothing, I don't find anything wrong with this, this guy, you know, it's okay, I'll let him go. And then the crowd is saying, no, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, and then they say, this man, Jesus, is telling us not to pay taxes to Caesar. Now they're bringing in politics. See, first they try to charge him with kufur, with blasphemy. Right? So they judged him in the Sanhedrin, the religious high court. But they can't get two witnesses to agree. Right? So they say, this is not working. We have to think of something else. They just want him, they want him dead. That's what they want. So then they take him to Pilate and say, he's uh, corrupting the nation. He's causing sedition. Right? He's an insurrectionist. He's saying, don't pay taxes to Caesar, which is a lie. Remember he said, whose picture is this? Caesar. He has to render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Render unto God what is God. Right? Mm -hmm. So he didn't see this. They don't pay, pay taxes to Caesar. But, so this is a lie. So then Pilate has no choice. So he says, you know, the crowd is, is in a frenzy, apparently, and he's afraid of his own because, you know, he has authorities over himself. And what are you doing in Judea? Why can't you control these people? And he would be executed very easily by Roman authorities himself, Pontius Pilate. So he takes, he says, bring a, a, a basin of water. He washes his hands. And he says, may his blood be... And he says, I am free of the blood of this innocent man. And then you hear Caiaphas in the background, according to the movie The Passion of the Christ, which, of course, is not translated. But you can hear him say this. May his blood be upon us and our descendants after us. Right? This, is what, this is what Caiaphas, the high priest of the Jews, says. May his blood be upon us. Romans are innocent, completely exonerated. This is all about the Jews. So, actually, in 1974, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, 
just a passion of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> they exonerated officially the Jews from deicide. <laughs> deicide, <laughs> killing God. 1974. The few dates I want, you, I want you to memorize. Valentine's Day, 1349. The Valentine's Day Massacre. So what was happening in Europe during this time? Does anyone know? All around Europe. Something terrible. Plague. Like, the plague, right? The plague, right? Black, Black Death. So a third of, a third of Europe was, was killed by the plague. And the Christians... They needed to eventually scapegoat someone, like they did to pull Harry Olinsky from the 1952 Revised Standard Version Committee, right? So what they noticed was, these Jews aren't dying like we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the reason is because they had tahara, they had, yeah. you know, they have you know, purification mm -hmm. laws, and they weren't dying as rapidly as the Christians. Uh, so they scapegoated the, the Jews. So in Strasbourg, Germany, Strasbourg, Germany, on Valentine's Day, 1349, a group of about 1,000 Jews were taken from their homes, and men, women, and children, and they were told to convert or die. They refused, and they were all burned alive. One thousand of them. Strasbourg, Germany. Strasbourg, Strasbourg, Germany. Strasbourg, Strasbourg Germany. Yeah. The Germans and uh, Christian, uh, the Christians in German, Germany, were very zealous during this time. They actually had this thing where they would go around um, whipping themselves. As a show of atonement for what was happening. Um, another date is September 12, 1553. This is when the Pope, Julius III, ordered all Talmudic literature in Christendom to be burned, to be destroyed. All of the Talmudic literature. So during this time, so you can imagine many rabbis refused, they were killed. During this time, many rabbis actually would go into the Talmud and censor things. But even so, what survives today from the Talmud about Jesus is, is very, very negative, to say the very least. This is the reason why this order was issued by the Pope, is because Jews would convert to Christianity, and they would go to churches and say, you know what they used to teach me? Right? You know what it says in our books? You guys have no idea. In the Babylonian Talmud, it says Jesus is blah, 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 blah. Mary is blah, 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 blah. So then these people get fired up. What? What? Jesus, what? So then just reach the Pope, right? And the Pope said, burn all of the Talmudic literature. Which Pope is this? Julius III. On September 12th, the auspicious date of September 12th, 1553. The Jews were... Um, what was the name of the Pope? Uh, Julius III? Yeah. They were oftentimes expelled from Christian majority countries. In 1290, they were completely expelled from England. Completely expelled from England. The entire country. 1290. Completely exiled. From France, 1315, and then in 1394. So write, write these dates down. So England, 1290. France, 1315, 1394. From Austria, 1421. Yeah, yeah. England, 1290. France, 1315, and 1394. Interesting, there's a law in France today that if you, if you give an academic lecture on the Holocaust that is against the so-called official version of the story, it will put you in jail for doing that sexual crime to talk about the Holocaust in a way that doesn't reflect what is whatever traditional history was in our country. Austria, 1421. Of course, we would never say anything negative about the Holocaust, but it's just interesting that law is in France right now compared to what they used to do to Jews. Yeah. So it's 1315 or 1315? 1315. 1315 and 1394. Austria, 1421. Spain, 1492. 1492, when Columbus saw the ocean blue and killed all the Muslims and the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> so this was during the Inquisition. Imam Portobi, you know Imam Portobi, right? Mm -hmm. Imam Portobi was born in Andalus, but he's buried where? In Iskandaria. He's buried in Egypt. And interestingly, Imam Portobi, he writes, he actually has this in his, in his books, he says that 
during he actually had to leave Andalus because the Christians were coming in and they were uh, causing a lot of problems. He said the Christians kept calling me Diablo. <laughs> and he said, I don't know what this means, but they named me Diablo. So everywhere I go, they point and laugh at me and say Diablo, Imam Kurtubi. So he had to leave, and he actually came down to Egypt, and he died in Egypt, in Alexandria, Iskandaria. <laughs> you mentioned two days for France, right? It happened twice. Did he came back? Did I go or something? Yeah. So there was one general, and then there was a more rigorous. So the Christological aim, we're finishing up in trouble. The Christological <coughs> aim of Matthew is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. This is his whole intention. He's going to prove Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfills all of the Old Testament prophecies. All of them. And sometimes, in his overzealousness, to prove a prophecy, he will misquote something, he'll miscite something, or he'll simply make something up out of full cloth. To give you an example. In Matthew 27, 9, we're told that Judas Iscariot, he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew says, this is a prophecy of Jeremiah. Okay? So this is Haggadah. Right? Something happened in Jeremiah with 30 pieces of silver. And the typology of that is Judas Iscariot. However, this story is not found in Jeremiah. It's found in Zechariah, chapter 11. <coughs> so Matthew is misquoting something. And interestingly, over 1,900 years, 1,800 years, whatever, the scribes haven't caught this and corrected it. Everything says Jeremiah. Why do you think that is? Why wasn't it corrected? Why didn't the scribe cross it out and write Zechariah? Yeah, go against the point of why it was written in the first place. What was the point? I mean, to prove the Christology. I mean, to uh, prove that Jesus was the Messiah. It would kind of just, it kind of discredit it because it's wrong. Mm, no, no. Was it something in Jeremiah that that also uh, kind of? There's something similar mentioned in Jeremiah about a field, but there's, the thirty pieces of silver are, are not mentioned. The reason why scribes didn't change it is because they found it embarrassing. And changing it would admit that there's a very clear error in Matthew's Gospel. So they said, no, he's referring to something else in Jeremiah. But we don't really see it yet. But there's something there. Okay. But most scholars think he made an error. Also, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 42. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you guys have to start reading. Matthew chapter 42, he says the chosen one of God is Jesus. He misquotes the section and doesn't give any evidence as to why this is Jesus. But probably the most interesting one is in Matthew 2.23. Matthew 2.23 is when Jesus settles in Nazareth. And he says, he lived in Nazareth so that it might be fulfilled what was said by the prophets. What is he talking about, prophets? He's talking about these guys. These ends. Nebim. These are called, called the prophets. Anything with an end next to it is a prophet. So he says, it might be fulfilled what was written by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So he's quoting something from the prophets that says the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene. There is nowhere in all of these, not just the end, anywhere in the whole of the Old Testament, and forget about the Old Testament, even books outside the Old Testament, what's known as the Pseudepigrapha, or the Apocrypha, there's nothing in the whole of Jewish literature that mentions the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene. Where is he getting this from? This is a big question. What is Nazarene? Uh, a person from Nazareth. Yeah, a person from Nazareth. There's actually a scholarly debate going on that Nazareth didn't even exist at the time of Jesus. That it was actually it's a later development. I'm not really in tune with that debate that is going on in academia. 
I'm going to get these verses down a bit deeper next time. Uh, yeah, and we're going to go through the gospel. Uh, and uh, so you're, we're going to end now. So the assignment for next time is to read Matthew's gospel. Have it read. And uh, if there's any questions that you have, go over them in class. Well, again, like we did with Mark, I'll give you some highlights of the key verses I think are important. And then we'll, we'll discuss them in the problem. The five major discourses of the last one was warning uh, Messiah in the Gospel of Matthew. There's something good here. What is the difference between Halakha and Hagada? So Halakha comes from Halak, and Hagada comes from Nagad. So this means to walk, means to speak. So what is the difference? What is Halakha? Halakha is also what Jews call their sacred law, so the equivalent of Sharia would be Halakha. But with respect to the text, what is Halakha? With respect to Midrash. Exegesis. Good. Exegesis, right? Exegesis. So commentary upon the text. What type of commentary? Is it exoteric or esoteric? Esoteric. So. Exoteric. Exoteric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, Halakha. <laughs> Halakha deals with uh, interpretation of ahkam. What is ahkam? Legal rulings, legal injunctions in the Torah and in the Prophet, mostly in the Torah. That's called halakha. Haggadah is something that Matthew does quite often, esoteric interpretation of sacred law, uh, foreshadowings of Christ. These are called Christological typology. We talked about some of this last week. Uh, for example, um, the Pharaoh is a typology of King Herod, right? Moses leaving Egypt during the Exodus, forecasts or foreshadows Jesus and Mary and Joseph leaving Egypt as well and settling back into Nazareth. <clears throat> so, Matthew's Gospel then, oh, I don't have any erasers again. There's some in that. <laughs> so the sources of Matthew remember we said there's three sources what are those sources that he uses like Pauline M, Q, and good so there's M what is M? Matthew yeah, special Matthean material what does that mean, special Matthew material? Because he came up with yep. or yeah. Yeah. So it's either stuff that he came up with or he has another source that no one else has access to. And when we talk about no one else, we're talking about Luke, John, and Mark don't have access to it. So this is material only found in his gospel. And then we said also <clears throat> there's Q. What is Q? It's common between Matthew and Mark. Mark and Luke. Common between Matthew and Mark, Mark and, Luke. and Luke and Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke. Okay. So Q is found in Luke and Matthew, but not in Mark. Okay. So Matthew is like sitting at his desk. He has a Q source document in front of him. Mark did not have access to this. He also has what? Special Matthean material, whether oral tradition in his head, or he has some sort of document we don't know. What's his third source? X. 80% of Mark? No, 80% of Mark. 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 Oh, okay. Which is Mark, yeah. So about 80 to 90% verbatim agreement. Of course, Matthew does redact Mark in some places. Redact uh, meaning? Revise. Okay. For his theology to work better. <clears throat> so these are the three sources Mark's gospel, or Matthew's gospel. Have a look at the actual text, some of the pericopes of Matthew's Gospel. I don't know how many people brought their Bibles, but everyone should have a Bible by now. I think it's the fourth or fifth week. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 1 begins, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
So this is a genealogy. So what's the importance of a genealogy for Matthew? Why, why doesn't Mark have a genealogy? Why did, let me rephrase the question. Why did Mark believe, why did Matthew believe that it's important to have a genealogy? Because he was appealing to the Jews and, you know, right. he wanted to say he's a Abra is related to uh, Abraham. Abraham and yeah. Isaac. No. David. David. Yeah, so remember, it's really important <coughs> to talk about Matthew, yeah, to link <laughs> Jesus to David, right? Because there's apparently Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah coming from the line of David. <clears throat> so that's what he begins with. He actually goes from Abraham. He begins at Abraham, and he ends at Joseph. And he says, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, and Judah begot Phares and Zara through Thamar. <clears throat> this is an interesting story. It's in Genesis chapter 38, the story of Judah. Judah is the namesake of the Jews. Right? So Judah has three sons. You can read about this in Genesis 38. Er, Onan, Shela. Remember, Matthew will make very frequent reference to the Old Testament. This is found in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Torah. Right? What are the books of the Torah? The of the Bible. Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers, um, I think you're... Is it? What's the first book called? Genesis. Genesis. Exodus. 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 Numbers. Numbers. Deuteronomy. Here. Genesis. Exodus. Leviticus. Leviticus. Numbers. Deuteronomy. So basically, Genesis begins in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Creation story, right? And then you have the creation of Adam and the ancient patriarchs. It ends with the death of Joseph in Egypt. So Judah falls before that. Right? Judah is one of the sons of who? Israel. Yes, he's one of the sons of Jacob, or Israel. Right? So Matthew is including Judah in his genealogy because David is a descendant of Judah. When he mentions these names, uh, he says Perez and... Uh, Zara and Tamar. So here's what happened. Judah has three sons, Genesis chapter 38. He has three sons, okay? His first son's name is Er. So I'm looking at some of the content here. And unless they're really like, the baby is okay, if I can understand it. Oh, it's not going to understand. Okay, kids, uh, yeah, maybe his age is probably not good. Honey, you got to go. I'm going to look at Old Testament things and sometimes a little great seat. <laughs> Twenty-three twenty. Okay. So, so Matthew here is giving the genealogy because again he wants to resemble the Old Testament with the Genesis. There's a lot of genealogy. Actually, you can calculate if you want to. If people have actually done this. You can calculate the age of the earth by counting up the years of the, the ages of the patriarchs that are mentioned in the Torah. So, some people take this quite literally, Orthodox Jews, for example, and they say the age of the earth is about 6,000 years old. Uh, and some Christians believe that as well. The dinosaur fossils were discovered some time ago. Um, it actually caused a lot of faith issues for a lot of Christians. Many Christians today actually believe that dinosaurs and man once lived in peace and harmony together. There's actually a, uh, uh, what's, what's it called? 
a dinosaur museum, what is it, evolution museum or something? What is it called? Creation museum. The creation museum in Ohio, where you can go and there's animatronic children playing on yeah. velociraptors and sitting on brontosauruses. And, uh, initially, the church said that this is a plot of Satan, because, you know, scientists, they dated the bones with radiocarbon-14 dating. You know, they said these bones are like 100 million years old. They said, well, that's it's a trick of Satan, which is really interesting because some of the early church fathers, like Justin Martyr, uh, when they were confronted by pagans about the similarities between Christianity and paganism, uh, Justin Martyr's initial response was, that's how Satan engineered it to fool people. Right? That's why they're similar. Why do you celebrate certain you know, holidays on the same days as pagan holidays? Why do you have beliefs that kind of mirror ancient pagan belief, like this idea of a uh, dying and, and rising savior's uh, sun god, right? Called the Soto. This is something that was very prevalent uh, amongst pagan communities living around the Mediterranean. Anyway, so in Matthew's genealogy, he makes reference to this story of Judah, again, the namesake of the Jews, right? The so Jews. Date that you hear of 4,000 BC, some specific date. Did that come from this? Yeah, yeah, it's like 5,700 something. They give an actual date. But well, that's calculated using this method. It is, yeah, by by adding up because the ages of the patriarchs are given in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah and then the genealogy of Matthew actually takes from that as well. Goes back to that. Goes all the way to Joseph the Carpenter, which is about 2,000 years ago. So they can add up the dates. Um, now, so what happened here is, so remember now, uh, in uh, 721, before the Common Era, the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay. Ten of the twelve tribes were living there. These tribes were either killed off or taken into captivity. Some of them might have gone to different countries. There's a lot of theories about Afghanistan and things like that. Allah Adam, I don't know. So Father was trying to con convince me that the Patans are funny as Allah Adam. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. so <laughs> ten of the twelve tribes were taken out. Uh, the only tribes that were left, uh, I mean there are remnants of the ten tribes as well. Not all of them were taken out completely, those remnants. But the tr the two major tribes that were left were in the south of Judah, and they were Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin. And Judah is the older brother, and they were more numerous, so the Jews began calling themselves Jews. Before that time, we don't know what they refer to themselves as. So Jew is an invented term with respect to a spiritual distinction. I'll give you an example that I use all the time. <clears throat> if I could ask Musa, salam, are you a Jew? He would say, no, I'm a Levite. What would he think I was asking him? Yeah, he would think I'm asking him about his tribe, his Kabila, right? Because his tribe goes back to Levi. I said, no, 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 are you a practitioner of Judaism? He said, what is that? You don't know what I'm talking about. The word Judaism, as a, as a spiritual religious distinction, was not coined until after this period, and this is more than 700 years after the death of Musa a.s. What did the Jews actually refer to themselves with respect to a spiritual distinction? We don't know. Probably something like Muslim. Allahu alam. Okay? So, Judah then is the namesake of the Jews. Genesis 38 says he has three sons. Er, Onan, and Shema. It says that uh, there's this girl, Tamar, that Judah promises to give to his son, Er. So she marries Er initially, and then Genesis simply says that Er was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord killed him. We don't know exactly what he did, but Er erred, <laughs> apparently. Okay, so this is actually Jewish Sharia, Halakha, that is, <clears throat> uh, if you're married to a man, if you're a woman and you're married to a man, and your husband dies, you have to marry his brother. You have to marry his brother. 
So Er is gone. Now she marries Onan, right, according to Jewish law. And Onan, he cohabits with Tamar, but he practices coitus interruptus. He doesn't impregnate her. Uh, this angered the Lord. The Lord killed him. So he's dead. So now Shelah is his only son left. Shelah is the only son of Judah. Now Judah has a lot of misgivings about this girl Tamar. She keeps killing my sons, right? She might be a witch or something. So he tells Tamar that Shelah is too young now. Just wait. You'll, you'll get married later. So years go by, and Tamar discovers that Shelah married somebody else. So she gets really mad at Judah. This is found in Genesis 38. There's a story in the Torah. So what does she do? She wants revenge. So she dresses up like a harlot. You know what that is, right? Like a prostitute. Covers her face as well. Stands on the roadside. Sees her father-in-law walking down. And solicits herself. Uh, and Judah says, great. Uh, but then Tamar says, what are you going to give me? And he says, I'll give you a goat, a kid. Not a, a kid, human kid, but a, a small goat is called a kid. And then she says, uh, what guarantee can you give me that you'll give me that kid? So he takes off his ring, his bracelet, and his staff. He says, take this as a, I don't know, security to box it. So then they cohabit by the roadside. She is impregnated with twins. These twins are called Perez and Zara. Okay? And then what happens is Judah finds out about nine months later that Tamar has committed adultery with somebody. She's holding a baby. So he says, let her be burned. That's a quote. Let her be burned. And then she produces what? The ring and the bracelet and the staff of Judah. So he says, let's pardon her. <laughs> now when it comes to uh, when it comes to the women, burn them. When it comes to the men, eh, it's okay, relax. So then these two twins were the product of incest and adultery are included in the genealogy of Isaiah and Sada, according to Matthew. Very interesting. Dominant opinion about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is there is there's no idolatry in his ancestry. This is a dominant opinion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, Alladi Yaraka Hina Taqum to Kalubaka Tishajidin. It is he who sees you when you stand forth and your intiqal and your turning about in those who make sajda. Ibn Abbas, who is Mufassid al Quran, one of the greatest founder of Quranic exegesis. And you have to be careful sometimes when we quote Ibn Abbas because a lot of what's attributed to him is not actually strong. But this is strong, quoted by Imam al-Haddad, that what this verse means in Surah Ash-Shu'ara is that the, the Prophet Wasallam ancestry does not have any idolatry in it. And there's no zina in his ancestry. <coughs> says in the Hadith, I was transmitted from pure loins to radiant wombs, all the way back to Adam. Pure loins to radiant wombs, the light of the prophets of the Nur, of the prophets of the Lord, there's no shirk, there's no idolatry, there's no zina in his ancestry all the way back. There's a dominant opinion. Somebody might say, well, what about in the Quran, when the father of Ibrahim, very clearly is an idolater, and the Prophet ﷺ is a descendant of Ibrahim ﷺ. Everybody knows that. In the Surah Maryam, at least three or four times, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, Ya Abati. Right? So remember one time I mentioned this in a halakha. I said there's no idolatry in the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ and his ancestry. And somebody stood up and said, Are you calling Allah a liar? I'm not calling him a liar. How come in the Quran, Ibrahim ﷺ, says to his father, Ya Abati, why do you worship shaitan, and so on and so forth? His father, Azar. Does anyone know what the answer is? 
Yeah. His uncle. I think there's two things. One is that his father would be called his uncle. Mm -hmm. and, there's that. and then the other thing is that as far as uh, the idolatry aspect is concerned, the aspect of there being nobody in his lineage who has committed uh, zina, meaning they were all noble people, but not necessarily uh, not committed shit. So they may have violated the laws of Allah, but they were still the, the, the descent was noble. Uh, their lineage was noble. Uh, there were people in the Arabs who, like, uh, they would never commit idol, uh, fornication. Uh, fornication and zina, even though they were mushrikeen. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a difference between uh, the Prophet ﷺ during this time. Allah describes him as dhalan, right? Fahada. So some of the exegetes of the Quran say, what does this mean? Does it mean that he's, you know, is, is wandering or misguided? Some say it means he was enamored. That's what it means. What does enamored mean? It means he was so in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another opinion is that he just didn't have the sharia. Right? So he doesn't have sharia. But yeah, I mean, he's, he was given to that. He was given that later. But the other thing about you're right about uh, the uncle of someone can also be called. You can call your uncle Abi. And this is a proof in the Quran that when Yaqub salam was on his deathbed, he says to his sons, "Ma ta'buduna min ba'di, na'budu ilahaka wa ila abaika." We worship. Who are you going to worship after me? We're going to worship your God and the God of your fathers. Abaika, Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq. Right? Ibrahim, Ismail is not their father, that's his uncle. But he means your forefather. So it's permissible to call your uncle your father. A walid is a biological father. Right? The walid is a biological father. It's usually the distinction that's, that's made. But it's interesting that Matthew has no issues over this, including these children of idolatry and incest. In the genealogy of a man who really doesn't have a genealogy to begin with, Isa alayhi salam doesn't have a father. We acknowledge that. Christians acknowledge that as well. But, again, there has to be some sort of connection with David. And if you look at verse 5, so David begot Solomon. David begot Solomon from the, from the wife of Horiah. Very interesting. David begets a son from the wife of another person. So what is, what's going on here with David? Of course we don't confirm this story. Judah is not a prophet as far as we know. But Dawood is a prophet. Right? So what happened here, if you look at the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11, David is on his roof. He looks over to his neighbor's roof. He sees a woman taking a bath. He falls in love with her. Uh, he has his guards go and bring her this is, yeah, this is what it says about Dawood <laughs> This is what Matthew says here. In Matthew? This is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. But in the genealogy of Matthew, Matthew says David begot Solomon from the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So this is the story, and this is what Matthew's talking about. David, he, he falls in love with his neighbor's wife. He kidnaps her, basically rapes her, impregnates her, has his, her husband killed. Uh, the first child dies, they uh, cohabit again, and she's impregnated with Solomon, Suleiman, alayhi salam. That's the story in the book of Second Samuel. And then at the end of the genealogy, verse 16, says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, from whom Jesus was begotten, who is called Christ. So this is not even the genealogy of Isa, alayhi salam. This is the genealogy of Joseph, who's not even the father of the east side. So this is Matthew, what chapter and verse? Matthew okay. 1 through 16. That's the entire genealogy. Yeah, chapter 1, 1 through 16. Okay. If you look on, uh, now we have a Nativity narrative, the birth of Isa alayhi salam, starting on verse 18. So this, um, this genealogy is the genealogy of Joseph. Of Joseph the carpenter. Yeah. So what, and was he married to Mary according to this before? He was. So, the, so at the end of the genealogy, verse 16 says, Jacob begot Joseph, 
Joseph the carpenter. It says, Ton Andro Marias, which means the husband of Mary. What? Before or after? Before. Before. Yes. Uh, and then from Joseph and from her, Jesus was born, who was called Christ. So they were engaged, they were married. He did not consummate the marriage because she was too young. Um, and then we are told that she's impregnated here. It says here in verse 18 that before they came together, Sun Elfain, which is a sexual reference, uh, she was found, it was found in her womb uh, from the Holy Spirit. The language is explicitly sexual, right? although Christians will all deny this today and say there's nothing sexual going on here. My question is, what does a virgin birth have to do with the sonship of Christ then? Why can't he be the son of God and she not be a virgin? Why are these two things inseparable? What are you truly really trying to tell us? If you read the, uh, the creed, the most authentic creed of the Christians, it's called the Nicio Constantinopolitan Creed. Nicio Constantino. Kind of a long word. So this was ratified 381 Common Era. It's a revision of the Nicene Creed. Revision of the 325. Nicene Creed, and it says in this creed, I have a copy of it here in Greek and Latin. It was written originally in Latin, I mean, I'm sorry, in Greek. It says about Jesus, Kaisa uh, Kothenta, he was made flesh, ek penumatas hagio, from the Holy Spirit, Kai Marias, teis parthenu, and Mary the Virgin. These are his parents apparently. I mean, that's what it sounds like it's saying. He was made flesh by the Holy Spirit and by Mary the Virgin. <clears throat> Which verse is this? This is in the Creed. No, it's, a creed. it's a very short creed. This is in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. We're actually going to study this creed in, in depth. It's only a few lines long, actually. What's a creed? Sorry. Creed means aqida. <clears throat> Or beliefs that are binding upon every Muslim or Christian, whatever you are. The word aqidah comes from aqdun, aqdun, wahdun, uqdatan min lisani. So a knot, an uqdatan, which is the prayer of Musa in the Quran, remove the knot from my tongue, right? something that binds his tongue. Aqidah is probably from the Hebrew aqida, which is what Genesis chapter 22 is called in the Torah. That chapter is called Aqeda, the binding. Does anyone know why? Why is it called the binding? This is a chapter in which Abraham takes Isaac, according to the Torah, to sacrifice him, and he has to bind him in order to cut his throat. So that, cha that chapter is called Aqeda, the binding. So Aqeda means creed or beliefs. So this Nicio Constantinopolitan creed is the most orthodox Christian creed. <clears throat> basically is uh, something we need to study to understand Orthodox Christianity. It's very concise. Now interesting, if you keep reading here, verse 20, uh, an angel comes to Joseph and says, Son of David, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Take Mary as your wife for the thing which she has given birth to or it has conceived was from the Holy Spirit. Again, the message, the language is, in my view, uh, explicitly sexual. Well, what does it mean? To be? How would you say? Because it's saying that they came before they came together, <coughs> Joseph and Mary came together to do what? Yeah, that's, I got that too. I read it. <laughs> what does it mean come together? It means before they had sex. She was found impregnated by the Holy Ghost. He beat her. The Holy Ghost beat him to the punch, so to speak. I, I thought he was married, but then he didn't touch her. As well. the They're married. Had, they have to be yeah. married to live together. But, but she, she's not of age yet. Mm -hmm. Which verse is this? Mm -hmm. 
18 through 20. 19, 20, 20 yeah. Luke says that the angel says to Mary, the power of the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the Spirit of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the child born shall be called the Son of God. This is the reason why. Not because he shares a pre-eternal essence with God, which is a Christian thing today. That's not what Luke says. What reason? Because the Holy Ghost will come upon and overshadow you. So if I said that Jack and Jill went up a hill, and Jack came upon and overshadowed Jill, and for this reason, Jill is pregnant with the son of Jack, what am I saying? They went up there and did what? They played Yahtzee? The language is explicitly sexual. It's very obvious. But this didn't really sit well with the masses, so we need to come up with something else. What should we come up with? What does it mean, begotten, not made? It means Jesus has a pre-eternal nature with God. And that, that was actually voted on 325, the common era. Is that part of the Creed, too, Nicene? The Nicene Creed, yeah. There was the Nicene Creed, which is a lot shorter than the Niceo-Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, but the thing about the Nicene Creed is it didn't really deal with the Holy Spirit at all. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> and there were some language issues with it they needed to fix as well. So it seems like the English version is, the translation is not as sexualized as from the original. Yeah, that's the thing is, I, I ask Christians all the time, is Jesus is the son of God, they say yes, begotten of, of God, they say yes. So why does Mary have to be a virgin? What does that have to do with anything? Why can't you just be the son of God and she not be a virgin? Well, they have to go together. Why? The answer. Why do you have to always link those two things together? What does it mean, son of God? What are you trying to say? Right? So, uh, are they implying that the purity is what makes uh, has a piece of share essence with God, or I mean, what is what is the point? I mean, from their point of view, they they want to the point of what? The point of her linking the fact that the immaculate conception is from a virgin. Mm -hmm. What is the point of that? Of the linking of the two together? Is it that she's pure and that increases? The validity of his essence sharing with God and being the Son of God, or uh, I don't know. Point? I haven't I haven't gotten a clear answer on this. I don't, I don't know. But no, I mean, she, she was accused of you know of improper behavior and so forth. Right? So I think that's that's part of what it is. Right? Well, the Mormons believe that God actually did have relations with her. Mm -hmm. Of course, the um, Catholics and the Orthodox, the Catholics and the Protestants and the Orthodox don't like that opinion, uh, but. My question is, again, what does the virgin birth have to do with Jesus being the Son of God? Why does she have to be a virgin? Why is it before they came together? Why? If it's nothing physical, what, why does all of that matter? Yeah. So, you know, it's, I mean, the Greek is a lot more explicit than but for us in Islam. It's a mahan, right? It's, it's, it's a period. It's, 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 oh, for us? I'm not talking about Islam. I'm talking right. about Christianity. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind commenting <clears throat> in, in the reference to Islam, that we know a little bit uh, in Quran it mentioned, but in Hadith or so how the scholars explain the virgin birth and the Yeah, so <clears throat> the reason why Maryam uh, was, given, was, was given Isa was, was a simple miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it, it was just a murjiza, it was a sign that Isa is the true prophet of God undeniable sign. It has nothing to do with him being the begotten Son of God. We don't even believe that about Isa. You can call him the Son of God in the sense that it's metaphorical. You know, if you read the Old Testament again, God has a lot of sons. It's simply a, a term of, a term that uh, entails takrim uh, and tashrif, like honor, uh, and um, someone who's pious is called the Son of God. So in that sense, it's fine. I mean, Adam in the Gospel of Luke is called the Son of God in that sense. But when Christians say Jesus is begotten, not made, that's different than Adam. They say, oh, Adam's the Son of God. Luke says Adam's the Son of God. They say, yes. So Jesus is also the Son of God. They say, yes, but Adam is made, Jesus is begotten. There's a, there's a difference. So you press further. What does that mean? What do you mean is begotten? Uh, it means that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. That's what it says in Matthew. What does that mean? It means that Jesus 
is the Son of God. No, what are you, what are you trying to say? What are you really trying to say? No, one's, no one wants to say it. That's what it means. So then they say, no, 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 it means he has a pre-eternal essence. That was developed later. That comes out of the 4th century. Mm-hmm. But what the scripture is saying is something different. <clears throat> yeah? I heard that the word that's, I guess there's a line in the Bible that says, uh, in the New Testament, that says that Jesus is like the only begotten Son of God. And, and I've heard the same word that's, the same Greek word that's used in there is also used, I guess, in the Septuagint uh, to describe Isaac, which would mean that if that was the case, then that means it doesn't mean only begotten because Isaac was never the only begotten Son. Is that true? or you know? Yeah, I mean, the word monogenes, which is translated as <clears throat> begotten in English translations, uh, also... Uh, I, mean, I mean, the translation there is unique. Monogenes means unique. But if you read like Romans, where Paul writes, he says anyone who has the Spirit of God is called the Son of God. Right? And John actually says that um, anyone who loves Jesus is begotten of God. He actually uses that word begotten as well. But then again, the Christians will always say, well, Jesus is special. He's a, he's a special begotten Son of God. How, what type of speciality is it? Today they'll say because he shares an essence with the Father, but that was ratified around the 4th century. But did Matthew actually believe that when he wrote his Gospel? Or did Luke or the first few centuries of Christians <coughs> believe that? What I'm trying to say is this belief that God is half mortal, half man, is very prevalent in the Greco-Roman world. Take one example, Dionysus. His father is Zeus, his mother is Semele. Uh, he's half God, he's half man, he comes down to earth, uh, he invents wine, you know, Jesus in the Gospels, he sanctifies wine, makes it part of the Eucharist, Dionysus has 12 disciples, uh, he's rejected by the legal authorities of his day, there's a couple of traditions as to what actually happened to him, one say that he was killed by the Titans, and then Zeus ate a part of his son, was impregnated, Zeus, a male deity, was impregnated, and gave birth to Dionysus, so he's born twice or born again. Another tradition says that he was killed uh, by his enemies as an act of suicide for the sins of humanity. <coughs> Went to Hades for three days, <coughs> resurrected in glory, and is sitting at the right hand of Zeus. <coughs> this is the passion narrative that was eventually taken by the Christians. There's a book by uh, Kersey Graves, which is called The World's 16 Crucified Saviors in which he proves that this whole passion narrative in the New Testament is borrowed from pre-existing pagan myths about dying and rising Savior man God, and he names 15 of them, Horus Osiris, and Orpheus and Attis, and Dionysus, uh, and a few more. Who is the author? Cursey Graves. It's very, so, so um, really, what, what you're saying, I mean, underlying theme is that, uh, that the Greek, uh, the Roman Greek, uh, kind of corrupted the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what, what would have been the Semitic, uh, the, the, the exactly. early Christian story? Yeah. So, yeah, there was definitely two interpretations of the gospel. Paul admits in Galatians that there's another gospel. Right, that people are preaching. Who are these other people? According to F.C. Bauer, who is the foremost authority on Galatians, this other gospel is the Semitic gospel that is coming out of Jerusalem uh, as being uh, advocated by the likes of James and Peter, who are disciples of Jesus. Fundamental differences between Paul and James. Uh, the theology of the New Testament, uh, the theology of Christianity, I should say, does not fly with the theology of the Old Testament. Very clearly, at least three times it says God is not a man. You have Numbers 23, 19. Uh, you have Hosea 11, 9. <clears throat> and 1 Samuel 15, 29. All of them say very clearly, I'll give you one example. This one says, like this. Lo ish el, lo ish el, man is not God. 
drawing a very clear distinction, saying that these two things are mutually exclusive. God cannot be man. So, ish el. This one says, Anoki el velo ish. And there's emphasis. Ki in Hebrew is the equivalent of inna, haf tokid. So, indeed, I am God and not man. And this one here, it says that Adam, meaning man generically, can never be him, meaning God. You can look these up if you like. But the theology is very clear. God is not a man. So, so, so if God's not a man, then he couldn't have a relationship with a woman to create a child. Right. Yes. God cannot be a man. So um, <clears throat> sometimes when we get into discussions with Christians, I get, I get the issue or the question, so don't you believe that God is omnipotent? I say, yes, God is omnipotent. Well, how can, how can you say that he cannot become a man? You're putting a limitation on God. Right? Sometimes we get this issue. Am I really putting a limitation on God, though? That's, that's the question. Or is he putting a limitation on God? So, God is omnipotent. He has put the mutlaq. He is al-qadir. But his omnipotence only relates to things that are mumkin uh, or conceivable to do. Not to give you an example. <clears throat> I think I might have used this example in the past. That if, you know, Stephen Hawking came into this classroom He's probably the smartest man in the world. And I said to him, I mean, book smart. And I said to him, uh, <laughs> got him twice, buddy. I said, do you think you're the smartest man? He says, yes. And I said, can you draw a four-sided triangle for me? And he would look at me and say, no. I said, oh, you're not the smartest man in the world then. Why? Because he would say it's impossible. It's impossible to make a four-sided triangle. So God, for God to become a man would mean that he is dependent on things, and that's impossible for God, because we're all dependent on something right now. We're dependent on gravity, or else we'd be dead. No gravity, we're dead. We're dependent, even though you might think I'm not dependent on anything. I make my own rules, and so on and so forth. Do what you will, right? Alistair Crowley. Mm. Do what thou wilt. Thank you. Do what thou wilt. Uh, we need oxygen, we need water, we need food. We need the sun and the moon and all of these types of things. We need temperature, stabilization, or else we'd be dead. Therefore, making God man puts a limitation on God, not the other way around. <clears throat> and then it's really interesting here. He says, um, She'll give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, Iesun, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew here is puzzling for me. I don't know what he's doing here. This name, Jesus, <clears throat> this is what the name of Jesus looks like in the New Testament. It's pronounced E A Oops. Jesus. What's the first one, I guess? Huh? The first word that he written on top? E? No. The, the word, yeah, on top. This is the name of Jesus. It's in Greek. Oh, okay. In Greek. This is Greek. Okay. I think uh, Spanish people, they still say Jesus as Jesus. 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 They say Jesus with a J. Like this. Looks like Jesus, but it's pronounced Jesus. Right. So the Catholics don't have issues naming their children Jesus, but the Protestants, they find it problematic. Um, Jesus. Now, the actual Aramaic name of Jesus looks like this, and this is pronounced Ye Shu Ah Yod Shin Shurek and Ayin. The root letters are Yasha, which means to save. So, you know, every Semitic word has basically a triliteral root, right? It's called ishtiqaq. This is an etymology. There are some words that don't have any root meaning. Including the name Allah. This is dominant opinion. But most of them do. Yashak, who saved. 
So Matthew says his name is Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. But Matthew is implying that the name of Jesus is an active participle, meaning Savior, but it's not active, it's passive. So this becomes a problem. Is Matthew just ignorant of what the name Jesus means? Or is he trying to pull a fast one on you? Jesus, very clearly, Yeshua, this U in the middle, means it's an ism maf'ul. You guys understand passive participle? Mm-hmm. <coughs> so, for example, the name of the Prophet Sallallahu is Muhammad. What are the root letters? Hamida, right? Hamida. <coughs> right? Try the troll. What is the active participle? Of, of the first form would be Hamid. So the Hamid, but the Adif after the Ha, is the one who is praising, the one who is actively doing the action. But the passive Mahmud, you see that U in there? That's the same in Aramaic. Yeshua. The U means that it's passive. The Mahmud is being praised. Hamid is praiser. Mahmud is being praised. But the name of the Prophet Sallallahu is a second form, intensive form. The active participle would be Muhammad, the Kasra. Muhammad is the one praising intensively, and the Muhammad is the one receiving the praise. The active participle of this looks like this. Yoshea. This you can translate as Savior. You can say this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yoshea. But Yeshua, it's not Savior, it's being saved. The one who is saved. What does that mean? Why is that significant for Muslims? Because we don't believe really die on the cross. Yes, you Muslims will categorically reject the uh, crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam. Okay. Yes. So what does Masih mean? Is that the same as Jesus? No, Masih is different. Masih is different. So, uh, Masih comes from Masah, Masaha. So, this means to anoint or to rub, to oil down. <laughs> It has all of these <laughs> meanings. So, so Mashiach is also a passive participle. It's the same as Masah. Yeah. Yeah. So when we make wudu, we make Masha. This is related. We anoint our head with a rub over something. So Masha in Arabic, right? Masiyah is related to that. So the word Christos in Greek or Christ, is a exact cognate of Mashiach. But here's the thing. In the Greco-Roman world, the word Christos sounds really ridiculous. It's like saying the oily one, the greasy one. So this is sort of strange title, because unless you live in a Jewish worldview, you don't understand what that means. Right? But that's that's the title. So it's really Jesus Ha Christos. But sometimes the definite article is dropped and you just say Jesus Christ as if Christ is his last name. But it's really Jesus the Christ. The Christ. Al Masih. Al Masih. The Christ. Jesus. Right? <clears throat> so Christ is in the anointed. That's what it means, the anointed one. The anointed one. You can say the anointed one, the oiled one, the greasy one. Of course, that doesn't. Those aren't good translations. But anointed in the same, in the sense that he's chosen. Right? So in the Old Testament, uh, uh, priests would anoint prophets by pouring water over their heads or oil over their heads. So you look at the hadith of the, of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The descriptions of Isa alayhi salam. There's one constant in all of the hadith, is that the, the Prophet Isa's hair is always wet or is damp. It's probably because it's oiled. 
which is a sign, an outward sign that he's the Messiah. So prophets have these outward signs, the white hand of Musa, the chaf in between the, on the, on the ketif, on the, on the shoulder blade of the prophet, says, and the hair of the Esai, they said, um, they have these, sometimes they have these outward signs. <coughs> is this Messiah a Aramaic word? word or? Yeah, it's also Aramaic. Is this, is, this, is this origin from Aramaic or? Probably, it's Semitic, definitely. Now, Psalm 20 is interesting. Psalm 26, 20 verse 6. This is my Hebrew Bible. So, you know, this idea that Isai Salam wasn't crucified used to be believed that kind of Islam invented this idea, because the Quran says it, and the Christians used to think, well, that's the only religion that's really making that claim. Uh, but based on recent discoveries, we know that there were many Christian denominations in the first three centuries that actually denied the crucifixion of the Isa alayhi salam. And Matthew actually does something in his gospel, which is extremely revealing, makes one slight omission for one of these reasons. <clears throat> but Psalm 26 actually gives us some sort of scriptural precedent for our belief about the Messiah, that he was not to be killed or crucified. Deuteronomy chapter 21, first of all, says anyone who's hanged on a tree is mal'un, is accursed by God. That's what it says. So Paul says, yes, Jesus became a curse. Jesus is mal'un. He says very clearly, this is what Paul says, he became a curse for us. That's, that's his Christology. So the Quran says the exact opposite. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ That I am blessed wheresoever I am. Mal'un and Mubarak are exact opposites. Quran says exactly the opposite of what Paul is saying. <clears throat> anyway, Psalm 20, verse 6, if you want to look it up. Does anyone want to read it? Yeah. Go for it. Now know that I, the Lord, all caps, saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Good, that's a good translation. His is not uh, capitalized, but Lord is. Mm -hmm. That's good. So this is uh, anointed here is Mashiach in Hebrew. This is a prophecy of the Messiah. Now think about the garden scene. Matthew, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them, all of the four books of the New Testament tell us that Esau, 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 he goes to the Mount of Olives and he basically asks for his life, right? The Father, remove this cup away from me, yet not as I will, but as thou will. And Luke says that he's in so much stress that he starts sweating blood. It's probably a later addition to the text. I wrote a whole paper on this. Most scholars believe it's an addition. But anyway, it's dramatic enough. It's a very dramatic scene that he asks to be saved by God, right? Psalm 20, verse 6 says, David says, I know that God saves his Messiah. He will hear him from his holy heaven, the saving power of his right hand. Hoshia, <clears throat> this is a participle. It's, it's causative. God is causing his Messiah to be saved. That's one proof text that Muslims will go to. To prove uh, what the Quran actually says about the uh, supposed crucifixion. Can they also say that this applies to like him bringing from the dead? He saved him from death or something? Can the Christians... They will say that, that but Yasha, in every single place, this verb, to save, in every single place in the Old Testament refers to a uh, a saving of the body, a physical rescue, not some sort of saving from, you know, killing someone and then flogging them and torturing them and sending them to hell and I saved you finally. Yes? 
Um, so we are waiting for the Messiah, and we believe that he's going to come with the Messiah for the Christians. Do you all have the same definition of the Messiah? No, very different definition. Yeah. The Christian definition of Messiah is God in the flesh. Messiah is God. It's a divine incarnation. Okay? Nowhere in any gospel does Jesus say, I am God or worship me. You should write that down. Because people try to convince you that Jesus is clearly, people are taught from a very early age, Jesus is God. You just don't question it. They actually ask the Christian, does he say I'm God? Of course, he must. What do you mean? Show me where. And you'll see them flipping through the Bible. And it's in here somewhere. I think it's in John somewhere. I'll have to check it out later. There's not a single verse in any gospel in the New Testament that Jesus says clearly, unambiguously, without any doubt, I am God and worship me. Sometimes he'll say something like, the Father and I are one, in John 10.30. What does he mean by that? What is the nature of this oneness? A oneness of essence? That would make him a kafir, a self put Allah. A prophet can never claim to be God. That's not his context. He's in a very Semitic Jewish context. What does he mean by the nature of this unity? What, what does it mean? I mean, it's found in the Quran also. Whoever obeys the messenger is obeying God. Why? Because the messenger is essentially the same as God. Association ambassadorship. Very good. Nice. Association ambassadorship. Obedience to the messenger is the same as obedience to God. They're united in, it, in their obedience. You cannot obey Allah and disobey the prophets, I said. It's impossible. Whatever the prophet does is guided by God. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا Allah says in the Quran, when you threw those stones, you didn't throw, Allah threw. What does that mean? Allah came down and it's called Allah. No, what, do you, what does that mean? That means all the prophet's actions are guided. This is the meaning of the hadith Qudsi, according to Imam al Junaid. My servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved than his fara'id. And he continues to draw close with his nawafil until I love him. Then I become the eye by which he sees, the hand by which he strikes, and the foot by which he walks. If he were to ask anything from me, I will give it to him. This sound hadith. What does that mean? God becomes your eye? Are we talking about incarnation, hulul, right? Tajassud? Is that what we're talking about? No. Because we know because we have a very clear teaching. We have sharia. We know how to discern. But the thing is, when the divine light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would shine off the purified heart of Isa alayhi salam and would reflect from his heart, this is what Imam Ghazali says. This is called mirror Christology. Mirror Christology. When it would shine from his heart, those who did not have a foundational system of law by which to understand these spiritual things, like God is not a man, they would call the reflection by the source and say Jesus is God. It's like a man going to a lake and the water is still and he sees the moon in the lake, so he jumps to grab it and then he's drowning to death. Right? There certainly is a difference between the reflection of the moon in the lake and the moon itself. It's a big difference. Even wider is the gap of Allah and man. But the divine light will shine off, reflect from a purified heart <clears throat> of the human being. Those people who have a system of sharia will know how to discern what is happening here. <clears throat> so another example is in the Quran. I think we quoted this one time. 962. <clears throat> Right? Can we quote that? Allah and His Messenger have more right that you should please Him. Allah and His Messenger are two entities. Have more right that you should please Him, not Uma, not them too. There's only a singular pronoun used in describing Allah and His Messenger. Does this mean that Allah is the Messenger? No, we wouldn't make that mistake because we have a very clear sense of our aqidah and our sharia. But the, the pagans who inherited Paul's version of the gospel, they didn't have that. They don't have the Torah. They don't have traditions of the Hebrew prophets. They have traditions of Mithras and Dionysus and the emperor cult. So it's very easy to say, ah, oh, God and his messenger are the same entity because there's a singular pronoun. The Father and I are one. Yes, one, essentially. Great. 
There's a trinity. Right? But those people have to remember that Jesus, alayhi salam, is speaking to a Jewish audience in a very Jewish or Semitic context. We cannot remove the context. <clears throat> There's also a commentary about the fact that the Jesus gave birth date and the Easter, the, the rising up, and also the movement of the star aligns to pagan astrological traditions. Yeah, and there's you know there's there's a December, there's December 25th happens to be a um, I think there's a maximum where the shadow goes, and then that uh, yeah. the vertical equinox is around the Easter time, and then yeah. the, the star that the, the three kings follow would have to have to do with an uh, astrological event at the time. Where is that? Yeah, tie yeah. into this pagan god which yeah. thing where they tied it all together. Yeah, yeah. December 21st. The winter solstice was called Yule. It was a big pagan holiday. People would get drunk and have parties. That signified the death of the sun god. And then three days later, on the 24th or 25th, he would be resurrected. Also in springtime, Addis, on the day of blood, March 22nd, would be killed. And on the 25th, he would be resurrected. There's a lot of traditions about these two times that's related to paganism. Uh, that made, is those points made in that book? Um, probably, yeah. I would imagine so. There's another book that is probably easier to read that kind of summarizes all of the things that we've been talking about as far as uh, pagan influence on Christianity. It's called The Pagan Christ. It's a really good book, actually. I highly recommend it. Um, it's Tom Harper, former Anglican priest. So, today's Christmas, by and large, the problem. Yeah, and then it also says in Matthew, like, when he's talking about Matthew 5 17. Hmm? Yeah, Matthew 5 17, Jesus says, Oh, that not a jot or a tittle shall pass by the law until all is fulfilled as long as heaven and earth endure. So that's the thing is, Matthew, Jesus is a law abiding Messiah who says that the law is good as long as heaven and earth endure. And for all time. So many scholars will conclude that certainly Matthew, Matthew, Jesus, and Paul have conflict. There was a man I debated one time, Michael Dona, uh, uh, on the uh, historicity of the crucifixion and resurrection. He actually wrote a book. It was called Paul versus Muhammad. And this book was basically a fictional debate that Paul has with the prophets of Saddam on the day of judgment. And the debate was Jesus crucified and resurrected. So I asked him in the course of the debate, I said, why didn't you call it Jesus versus Muhammad? This is why Paul versus Muhammad? And he didn't really give an answer. I said, I'll give you the answer. Because Jesus and Muhammad are a perfect agreement. Paul is the problem. I agree with you. Paul is the problem. Okay. Paul's, and we'll get to Paul's letters, but Paul is an interesting person. It seems like he doesn't like women very much. He doesn't like the law of God. At times he sort of says something and does something else. We'll get to him in China. But I wanted to share with you also some of the documents uh, that were found in 1945 at the Mon Hamadi Library. <coughs> Nineteen forty five discovery by a Muslim Bedouin, this huge corpus of literature, uh, lost the gospel. The gospel of Thomas was found, which according to the Jesus Seminar, have you guys heard of the Jesus Seminar? Jesus Seminar is a group of about hundred New Testament scholars. They meet once a year and they discuss the New Testament issues and things like that, they concluded from their scholarship that about 18% of what's recorded in the New Testament is historically accurate, about 18%. That's their opinion. I don't know how they arrived at it. But the Jesus Seminar, many of the scholars in the seminar believe that the Gospel of Thomas, so yeah, the Gospel of Thomas then, it doesn't have a passion narrative. <clears throat> And many scholars believe this is the reason why it wasn't included into the New Testament canon. 
we also found something called the second treatise of the uh, great chef. Which, of course, <coughs> begs the question, where is the first treatise of the great chef? This is a document that was found which actually endorses this idea that uh, another man was crucified instead of Christ and this man is identified as Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene is mentioned in the Synoptic Gospel. Okay. In, in the Quran, so um, what is the relationship with the crucifixion? Does it say someone else was? Well, like it should be her level, mm-hmm. which is anything translated it was near, it was made to appear so that they crucified him. Oh, some some something. will say some will say that, that means that someone was transfigured to look like him. Some will say that's not necessarily the case, that it was made so to appear. So what happened here is Simon of Cyrene is mentioned Matthew, Mark, and Luke as somebody who was just standing around watching what's happening. And Jesus, he collapses, he cannot hold the cross. The Romans pull him out of the audience of the crowd. They compel him to bear the cross. And so, somehow, Jesus escapes and this man is crucified. That's what this book endorses. The second treatise of the great Seth. And apparently this was a widespread belief. The Basilidians believe that. So it's like, this is in the Gospel of Thomas. No, this is not in the Gospel of Thomas. This is in the second treatise of the Great Set, found at Nag Hammadi. How old is this document, second treatise? It's probably dated to the second century. So would this be the old one or the old one? Yeah, the second century is quite ancient. This is the same Simon for Matthew, the one that Jesus found Is it what? Is it the same Simon? No, this is different. This is a different Simon. This Simon is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as someone watching the perspective of And he was pulled out randomly. He doesn't appear any other time before or after. John does not mention Simon at all for a good reason. John, written around 100, 110, his belief that Simon was crucified was so prevalent, apparently, that he eliminates him altogether. And that Jesus bore his own cross. And that's what he says. He emphasizes for his own cross. No one told her or tell her to stop. So the Basilidians, their teacher was Basilides. Basilides was a teacher in Egypt in the first half of the second century who did not believe that Jesus was crucified. Clement of Alexandria, who is one of the big church fathers of the first century, says that Basilides. Uh, instructed by Glaucia, Glaucia's teacher is Peter himself. So you have Senate here. The Sunni, taught by Glaucia, taught by Peter. What does that mean? It's very significant. That means that this belief that Christ was crucified actually has sent that back to an apostle of Christ. Because modern day Christians would try to tell you. Oh, these, these groups, they're Gnostics. And they were crazy. And, uh, they were always in the minority. They were always a nuisance. They were much crazy twirlers or something. Uh, but Clement, the Orthodox Church Father, very clearly states that Syllabes inherited messianic secrets, as he says, in Glokia and studied under Peter. There's actually a Gospel of Peter as well. The Gospel of Peter, right? Eh? Of the non This is not non This was no. This was uh, this was actually discovered in the 19th century. It's dated to the second century, though. This was discovered in a tomb of a saint. They opened his tomb and he had it sitting on his chest. And they opened it to the Gospel of Peter. Okay. These people go to their graves with their scriptures rather than burn them, because that was the edict of the imperial. Yeah. So when Peter is mentioned, is he the uh, is he the same Peter that's mentioned in like the first Pope kind of thing, or is that a different? Peter? Yeah, that's the same Peter. So it, I just thought that was kind of funny because it seems like this is like 
exactly against what Paul is saying today. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's following the test of that saint or that pope? No, no. That saint. That saint. In 1887. So the Gospel of Peter says, the Gospel of Peter, if you read it, you, you think, what's wrong with this? There's a passion narrative, everything seems to be okay. There's one problem. It says that when they were crucifying Christ, he was silent, as if he felt no pain. And that was enough for the proto Orthodox Church Fathers, the theologians, to say, this is heresy. Why? What does that have to do with anything? Suffer? Yeah, it doesn't, see, it doesn't seem like Jesus is suffering. It doesn't seem like Jesus is there. There's another group of Christians called the Docetae. Right? The Docetae. Who said that Jesus, so this is from the Greek dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. They said that Jesus only appeared to be a human being. He was really a phantasm. And people saw Jesus uh, according to their own spiritual station. They looked at him, either he was very handsome and young, or he was old and ugly, whatever that person's spiritual acuity was, that's how we would perceive Jesus. So, there's no way you can crucify a phantasm. It only seems to, they only seem to crucify him. There's another book called the Acts of John, which is actually dated to the second century, very old. I just want to quote one passage from John, Acts of John. Jesus is quoted as saying, You heard that I suffered, that, but I suffered not. That I was pierced and hanged, but I was not hanged. That blood flowed from me, yet it did not flow. Therefore I have suffered none of the things they will say of me. This is from the second century gospel of the Acts of John. John, the son of Zebedee, a disciple of Jesus, who apparently who wrote the gospel of John. So the Gospel of John and the Acts of John saying two completely different things. What does this all prove? This proves that the claim that Christ wasn't crucified is in no means an Islamic invention, a Quranic invention. Many, many Christians during this time. In fact, many patristic church fathers, Irenaeus, Justin, Tertullian, Ignatius, Polycarp, they all attacked Christians that rejected the crucifixion. All of them. Remember also, the key source document does not have a passion narrative. The key source document is the oldest and best source of the Synoptic Gospels. It predates Paul's letters. It's free from Pauline dogmatism. No passion narrative. No emphasis on the cross. Whereas Paul, everything is the cross. There's no biographical information about Jesus in any of Paul's letters. He never quotes Jesus. He has no name about the virgin birth of Jesus. It's all about the significance of a dead Jewish Messiah and how about the stumbling blocks of the Jews and utter foolishness for the Greeks, as he says. And there's other discoveries, too. There was something discovered called Papyrus Egerton Number 2. That's how it was cataloged. It's called the Unknown Gospel. It's some gospel. Nobody knows what it is. So it's called Papyrus Egerton Number 2, and there's no passion narrative in that gospel. So what, what exactly is the gospel? The gospel is a, a document that describes Jesus in some way. The life of Jesus. Any kind of description of Jesus. Yeah, some sort of attempt at a biography of Jesus is considered to be a gospel. <clears throat> Here's another thing. The Talmud mentions Jesus, but it says that he was stoned to death the Jewish Talmud, right? The Babylonian Talmud? Okay. Huh? Okay. okay, that's their explanation. That's their exegesis of, of the Torah, right? The Talmud, the Talmud yeah, is, is a commentary on the Torah, but also some Jewish history. The rabbis wrote about Jesus, the Nazarene, as they called him, and they said that he was actually stoned. He wasn't crucified. So even there's conflicting, you know, um, there's conflicting things outside of Islam between Jews and Christians as to what actually happened. So he was stoned to death on the eve of Passover <coughs> for witchcraft and idolatry. It's also mentioned in the Jerusalem Talmud as well as being stoned to death. This is why <coughs> Talmud was attacked by the Catholic Church when we talk about those, mm -hmm. those frequent exiles of Jews from European countries. What <coughs> happened when, uh, uh, when Matthew was spreading his 
What happened? His poor friend. What happened? The Jews uh, would bring up the Talmud. Like, they would convert to Christianity and they would go into the churches. And mm-hmm. the so, the, no, there was no Talmud at that time. So, there was, the Talmud came after the Talmud. Yeah. Um, the Talmud at that time was written. It, was, it wasn't written, it was oral. So, I guess we'll stop there, inshallah. The next time we'll go into more Matthew, yes? <laughs> the new pope is, has one lung and he's 76 years old, so he kind of defeats the purpose. Trying to be a younger guy, it will last longer. Probably going to be dead in like two or three years. Hello, I don't know, I don't know an old man with one lung. But he's a Jesuit, which is interesting because the Jesuit was uh, extremely intelligent people, really smart. I mean, really smart. It's the Catholic order of the Jesuits. There's never been a Jesuit pope. Um, and apparently he has, uh, what are you smart about? He's smart about theology, philosophy, academia, uh, he has a master's in chemistry, <coughs> and he's, just, he's well grounded in Renaissance math. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. Maybe he's going to speak some good dialogue with Muslims. It's not like the last guy who kind of said it and didn't really do anything and then said some stuff that's totally crap. And, <laughs> and inshallah, maybe he'll be good. I don't know. Next one. He chose an Francis after St. Francis of Assisi, who is an extraordinary human being. Today we're going to actually talk about the Gospel of Luke. Huh? Oh, what? Inshallah. Mm. Is that, is that, is that I thought we were catching our legend. Yeah, we have to get moving here because we're really behind. But if there's, I'll leave a good chunk at the end for questions if you still have things about Matthew that, or, or Mark um, or the sources. Things that are unclear, we can tackle those questions, inshallah, uh, a little bit later. But I want to start the uh, Kata Lugan. So the Kata Lugan is according to Luke. And this is a really um, fantastic gospel. It's um, really well crafted. Um, you know, Mark is sort of. You know, whatever. Matthew's a little bit better, but this gospel is really beautifully done. And Luke is actually the first part of two volumes. So this is called Luke Acts. The fifth book of the New Testament is called the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles. Acts meaning Afa'al. A'amal Rasul. A'amal Rasul. So that's the history of the early Christian church. Okay, that's the book of Acts. So we study Luke, we're going to have to also study Acts, but we're going to probably do John first, because I want to do the, all four Gospels. And then if we do all four Gospels and Acts, and that's the majority of the New Testament, we just have some epistles of Paul and the Apostles in the book of Revelation. Okay? Is that Katalukan or Lukal? Luk- oh, this is Greek. You don't have to write this book. Okay. And so you- this, would, this would be, uh, in English, it looks like this. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah. Luke, um, according to Luke. So in the book of Acts, we have to study that. Basically what happens in Acts, we have the history of the early church from Jerusalem until it reaches Rome, which is considered the grand stage of the world, um, ending with Paul in prison. But we'll talk about that when we get to it, inshallah. So the Gospel of Luke, written by Luke, Luke who's a traveling companion and student of Paul. Okay? Now, scholars believe that whoever wrote Luke didn't actually meet Paul because he never mentions any of Paul's letters. He doesn't seem to be familiar with them. And sometimes his accounts of Paul's biographical material is different than what Paul says himself. So this is someone who probably never met Paul. But again, it was pseudonymously ascribed to this man named Luke, who's actually identified, he's mentioned in the book of Acts. But scholars, by and large, will say that this book is anonymous. Nobody knows who wrote it. It was later ascribed to a pupil and traveling companion of Paul. Okay? <clears throat> Where was it written? Is unknown, possibly in Antioch. Some say Ephesus. But Antioch is probably the stronger opinion, which is in Syria. It was written around 85 to 90 of the Common Era. 
So this is after the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, General Titus. A time of great turmoil. The contemporary of Matthew, maybe a little bit after Matthew. Who was it written for? Gentile Christians dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. Written for Gentile Christians dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. I'm, I'm sorry, we wrote Acts. He's the author of this character, whoever wrote Luke. Yes, yeah, also, wrote, also Acts. wrote the Acts. Yes. Which is apostolic history. The early history of the early Christian church from Jerusalem into Rome. The book of Acts ends with Paul in prison in Rome. Now, uh, could you tell us what Gentile means? Gentile, non-Jew. Non-Jew. Gentile, non-Jew. So, in Greek, it's ethnos, where you get the word ethnic from. That's how you say Gentile. In Hebrew, it looks like this. Goy. Goy. I mean, Gentile. Goy. Yeah. So that would be then um, pagans in the Roman Empire. Yeah, if they were not Jews. Yeah. So the word the word goy can be used pejoratively, mm -hmm. but also positively. So when you're talking about the goyim, and you kind of make that face, mm -hmm. that means you're talking about the idolaters. But if you're saying yes, let's take the message to the goyim. Why not? Because there's actually prophecies of the goyim uh, becoming devout in the future of the Old Testament, especially the Book of Isaiah delight to the Gentiles, things like that. Um, so I think it depends on intonation of your voice. And people have translated Gentile in, in a myriad of different ways. <clears throat> As a Hellenist, a Greek, non-Jew, a, a polytheist, there's different translations according to your, who you want to go with. So these are non-Semitic non uh, Christians, right? Non-Jews. Non-Jews. Non-Jews, but uh, in... Can still be a Semite, not like oh, Arab or Semite, but okay. Arabs are Goyim. Okay. Yeah, you have to be Jewish. Those are the goys. Okay. <clears throat> Greek has the most. Uh, Luke has the most polished Greek. He has the largest vocabulary. His Greek is the best of all four Gospels, even better than John. Um, there are passages in Luke that I personally believe uh, that I personally believe to be uh, some of my favorite passages of, of, of the New Testament. Um, although John is my favorite Gospel. Why? Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> when I get to John. Why we're here. You'll see John. Why we're here. Get there. John. John is radically different. And that, that difference to me is really interesting. But really interestingly also is that Greek actually, uh, sorry, Luke actually gives sort of a preamble to his gospel, intro to his gospel, that the other evangelists don't give. He actually says here, he says, in so much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been filled, fulfilled amongst us. So he's actually given his intention. This is his preface. Why is he writing this gospel? Right? The other evangelists, they don't give this reason. They don't give anything comparable to this. He's saying many have undertaken. And the Greek here is poloi. Poloi, which is where you get the word poly from, like polytheism. So Luke is admitting here in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, that many people have written biographies of Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, what does he mean by many? How many do we know of for certain? Well, he had access to what? Mark, right? He didn't really know Matthew. That's a dominant opinion. He had Q. That's only two. Who is this many? This goes to show that, indeed, at the time of Luke, there were many, many Gospels that were written about Jesus. We only know a few of them. So that's very revealing. And then he says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses of the word delivered unto them, it seemed good to me also. He says, It seemed like a good idea to me. Right? So what is he saying here? He's admitting he's not an eyewitness. That's what he's admitting. Right? He's not an eyewitness. And his reason for writing the gospel is not because what? It's not because the Holy Spirit has come upon him and is inspiring him to write. He's saying it seems like a good idea to write an orderly account. And scholars believe when Luke says orderly here, he's not talking about an accurate sequential or chronological uh, sort of way of doing it, but he's talking about a more accurate way, period. Theologically, dogmatically, Christologically. 
is Christology is really interesting. And I think that the character of Christ in the Gospel of Luke is probably the most accurate, at least from a Muslim standpoint. His teaching and his actual character. The Luke in Jesus is probably the most accurate, even more so than Matthew's very Jewish Jesus. And we'll see, uh, we'll see that in a minute, inshallah. And then he says to you, <clears throat> So it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the first, to write to you an orderly account. O oh, most excellent Theophilus. So he's writing this as a letter to a man named Theophilus. Luke's gospel is a letter, just like Paul's letters. This is a letter to a man. And Christian scholars believe that Theophilus is probably a Greek or Roman official of some sort, who's probably his patron. Right? So there's some rich Roman guy, official, maybe a governor or something. And Luke is a physician by trade, according to tradition. He can do things very systematically. He's very brilliant. His Greek is beautiful. And the way he arranges his gospel is just really in ingenious. So he probably paid Luke and said, write a gospel of Jesus for me. <clears throat> You're the best one to do this. Because Mark and Matthew, they were whatever, fishermen, they're illiterate, they don't know how to read and write, whatever. Even though Mark and Matthew didn't actually write Mark and Matthew. And these other gospels, who knows who wrote them? These poloi, these many, many gospels written by eyewitnesses according to Luke but I want you to write me one as well so Luke what he does is he dedicates the gospel to his patron Theophilus that's one opinion of who Theophilus is a Roman official that is paying Luke to write a biography of Jesus okay that's one opinion another opinion is that Theophilus because Theophilus comes from the Greek Theos and Philos what does Theos mean? God, loving. God and philos means friend or, or love. One who loves God. So he's just addressing this to lovers of God. I'm writing this, this account to the lovers of God. Right? I mean, the reader. Right? And that's kind of a nice, I like that interpretation. Yeah. But probably the first one is more accurate, to be honest with you. And that's the dominant opinion amongst New Testament scholarship. But he's actually writing this as a letter. Because Paul's writings are all letters to different Christian congregations. So, Allah, God knows. Any questions about that? It's very unique, right? John doesn't do that. Mark doesn't do that. Matthew doesn't do that. New characters in the Gospel of Luke. Elizabeth and Zechariah, the parents of John the Baptist. They do not appear in Mark nor Matthew. Elizabeth and Zechariah, the priest. They are the parents of the Baptist. Zechariah is a Kohen. He's a priest in the temple, which means he's a Levite. His wife is a Levite. They cannot marry outside of their tribe. I, I, I'm sorry. I noticed that, that none of them speak about other prophets like Abraham and all these stories that we, we hear about. about I think too sometimes. Matthew, Matthew quotes and a lot of Old Testament. It's not like... It's, it's secondary. It's not important. Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the pivot by which history will turn. He's a photo. Yeah. So everyone else is sort of ancillary or peripheral. It's not really important. Everything sort of foreshadows Christ. Christ is the most important thing. So Matthew, Mark, and sometimes Luke will quote the Old Testament if it fulfills their purpose of showing how Jesus fulfills things in the Old Testament. The stories are there in the Old Testament. And of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke already uh, assume that the reader knows something about the Hebrew prophets. Maybe that's not a good assumption, but <clears throat> there is an assumption there. Um, so, Elizabeth and Zachariah are aged, they're childless, right? So, this, again, is hearkening back to something in the Old Testament, to Isaac, right? Abraham and Sarah, they're aged, they're childless, even though he has Ismail, he's not the covenant child, according to the Torah. So, then Isaac is born, uh, and he is Israel's link between its past and future blessings in Jacob. So Isaac is the pivot by which history will change for Bani Israel. Likewise, John is the pivot as well here. John is born to Elizabeth and Zachariah. He is the link between Israel's past and future blessings in Christ. Okay? So just as Jacob had 12 sons, Jesus will have 12 disciples representing the new tribes of Israel. So there's this air of supersessionism. Supersessionism 
Supersessionism means that one religion completely supersedes the other. Judaism is done. Now you have to be Christian. Okay? We have that as well in Islam. Obviously the opposite of supersessionism would be something like perennialism. Right. <clears throat> it's time. Also in Matthew's Gospel, Joseph is the one who has a dream of an angel speaking to him and saying that, don't be afraid, Mary was impregnated by the Holy Ghost, go to Egypt. The Annunciation in Luke is really interesting because it's not a dream. An angel actually comes to Mary and tells her of the Annunciation. Okay? And this angel is identified. This is Hafen Galas, Gabriel. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary in the Gospel of Luke. Not a dream. It's Mary in a waking state, visited by the angel, and tells her he's going to give birth to a son. <clears throat> So Gabriel is a new character. Also, this man Simeon, Simeon, who's called a just man. He's a he's a devout, devout Jew who's worshiping in the temple, and he meets a 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. Luke is the only gospel writer to mention anything about Jesus from ages zero to 30. The other gospel writers they start at 30, the first 30 years of God incarnate as it were for them, is completely unimportant, apparently. But Luke, recognizing this difficulty, right, he says, no, there was, a, there was an incident when Jesus was 12 years old. He snuck away from his parents, uh, and he was teaching Pharisees in the temple at 12 years old, and he meets this man, Simeon. And Simeon actually recognizes him as the Messiah and foretells the Messiah's uh, mission to the Gentiles. So there's a prophecy here. We'll come back to this idea of Gentiles and the universality. Major theme of Luke's gospel, universality of the gospel. Not just for Jews, beyond Israel, all the world. How does he recognize? He recognizes Jesus based on his teaching. Based on his teaching. Yeah. And he seems to have some sort of, some sort of inspiration from God because sure. he recites this uh, this praise, this eulogy of Christ that, that Luke records as well. It's very beautiful also. Yeah, Luke is, is really doing a good job with this gospel. Uh, also, sisters named Mary and Martha are, are uh, introduced by Luke. This is a different Mary. It's not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha. Mary and Martha are also the sisters of a man named Lazarus. And this is his first appearance. Lazarus is important because in John, when we get to John chapter 11, this is the man that Jesus raises from the dead. Lazarus. Lazarus' sisters are Mary Magdalene and Martha. The Mormons believe Mary and Martha are Jesus' wives. The Jews believe that. The Mormons believe that. The Mormons believe that Mary and Martha are Jesus' wives. The that Lazarus is his brother-in-law. Hence, explaining the passage in John chapter 11 that Jesus loved Lazarus, and when he had known he had died, he started to weep. The smallest, the shortest sentence in the entire Bible is two words, Jesus wept. That's in John chapter 11, because he heard the news of Lazarus dying. I don't know if the Mormons still believe that, but that was something that they certainly did believe. <clears throat> also, Herod Antipas is mentioned a new character in Luke, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, right? So Herod the Great was the, <clears throat> you know, the puppet leader of Judea when Jesus was born. This is now his son. Um, I think we're going to have another one. Possibly. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah. It was a champion of Ahlul Sunnah positions. So if we could just recite uh, Al Fatiha, inshallah, Ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the highest level of Jannah and Fatihah. You said that. Uh,
الفاتحه ان شاء الله تعالى. So, let's try it just for the third time. Herod Antipas. <laughs> so, the, the reason why Luke mentions him uh, is because one of the central themes of Luke's gospel, and we'll talk more about this, is a total exoneration of the Gentiles. They have nothing to do with Jesus' death. Okay? But Herod Antipas is a Jew himself. And in the Passion Narrative, he interviews Jesus. Jesus doesn't actually say anything to him. But he says, oh, this, I, have, I find no fault in him. Right? So what's the point of that? The point of that is that Herod Antipas is a Roman puppet. Right? So he's connected with Rome. He finds no fault in Christ. Pontius Pilate actually sends him to Herod because he wants nothing to do with Jesus. The whole message here is the Gentiles are innocent of the blood of Christ. Okay? And Jews that are in cohesion with Roman authorities, they're also innocent of the blood of Christ. And who is guilty? The Jewish, what? The scribes and the Pharisees, the scholastic community of the Jews that are condemning the Roman occupation. And the, and the aklas, the crowd, this is a very uh, common word used in Luke. Aklas means crowd. Akloi is the plural. There's crowds everywhere. It's very different than Mark, where everything's a secret, and no one knows who Jesus is, and it's kind of in Galilee, in the backwater town, what's going on, no one really knows. In Luke, there are crowds everywhere. Why do you think it, crowds are important for Luke? Because it's a mob, mob mentality. Or? Well, Luke is trying to universalize the gospel. He's trying to say this is a big deal. This is where it's all happening in the world. This is the event of the history of the world. So everywhere Jesus goes, there are crowds. Everyone knows what's going on. Everyone knows Jesus. This is a big, big deal. Right? He's aggrandizing Jesus. Right? Putting him on the world stage. Um, I have a question. Huh? Did Jesus uh, ever say that uh, he was sent for all the humanity or for just for the people of Israel? Um, he, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is in Matthew 15, 24. So that's Matthew's Christology. Um, but at the end of Matthew, he does send the disciples on what's known as a great mission into all nations. We could talk about that as well. But these are disciples. These are 11 men, because Judas had killed himself by then. 11 men that um, had trained with him for three years and were given permission to go into Gentile land, because now they have the, the Torah and they have the Injil together. Paul was not amongst them. <clears throat> why Paul is such a problem uh, for the Judaizers or the Jewish Christians. Um, <clears throat> but we'll talk more about that when we get to John's Gospel. That's interesting. So, major concepts of the Lucan Gospel. We talked about this. Extension of Israel's blessings to the world. An extension of Israel's blessings. The ni'am that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did for Bani Israel is extended to all of the world. Ala alameen. Okay? <clears throat> Uh, John's successor is Jesus. Jesus is the pivot on which history turns. So extension of Israel's blessings to all the world. Luke, a major Lucan theme is the universality of the gospel message. A second theme, Jerusalem as a sacred stage. Jerusalem is a major character in the gospel of Luke. Jerusalem. This is seen as where everything's happening. Okay? And the reason, again, is that Luke wants to aggrandize, aggrandize Jesus, alayhi salam, universalize Jesus. So he fixed the holiest city for the Bani Israel, Jerusalem. In fact, 10 of the chapters of the Gospel of Luke, from chapters 9 to 19, this is called the travel narrative. This is when Jesus is with his disciples, literally walking from Galilee into Judea, where Jerusalem is. And as they're walking, Jesus teaches them numerous parables that are very beautiful. Some of my favorite in the entire New Testament. This is Luke, book 1. Nine. This is Luke nine. 9, through nine, chapters 9 through 19. In book 1, or are there multiple books? or not? 
No, chapter, there's only one Luke. Oh, one Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapters 9 through 19. So about 10 chapters. It's called the travel narrative. Okay? On the way to uh, Jerusalem. It is also in Jerusalem where all of the post-resurrection appearances happen and his ascension into heaven. Okay? Whereas Matthew says, where does Jesus appear to his disciples in Matthew? Does anyone remember? Read the end of Matthew. Huh? Hmm? He's in Nazareth. Nazareth? Yeah, in Galilee. Galilee. He appears in Galilee. in Galilee. Okay, so in Matthew, he goes, appears north in Galilee once again. But in Luke, uh, he appears only in Jerusalem and actually ascends. He stays for 40 days makes numerous appearances to his disciples in or around Jerusalem, and then he ascends from Jerusalem. So there's a clear uh, contradiction here between Matthew and Luke. Uh, Luke doesn't care much about Galilee. Galilee rejected Jesus. Good riddance to Galilee. It's all about Jerusalem. The next major concept is a modified Markan eschatology. Remember Mark's eschatology? What is eschatology? End of, uh, end of the world. Yeah. Uh, end of time beliefs, right? And what was Mark's eschatology? That he's going to happen right now. Okay. Yeah, that it's imminent. It's going to happen at any time during the lifetime yeah, of the life Bible. Right? So Luke modified Mark in expectation of an immediate end to show that Jesus' work is continued by the believing community. Mm. Okay, we'll give examples of that. So he delays the parousia. Remember parousia? Parousia means second coming. Do you really repeat that part again? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what Luke modifies does, the expectation of an immediate end of times? Yeah, he modifies Mark, Mark's expectation of an immediate end to show that Jesus' work is to be continued by the believing community. So with Mark, it's the destruction of the temple and then any day now, there's going to be the eschaton, the end of time, and the second coming of Christ. Whereas Luke, he actually gives a parable in Luke chapter 19, that the master must go away for a long journey, and then he'll come back. Meaning he's delaying it, because obviously it didn't happen by the time Luke is writing around 90. It would have seemed a little strange to say that the present generation will live to see it. Even in Mark's day, it's kind of strange. 67, 70 of the common era. Disciples are around 70 years old, but they're still alive. Right? So Luke doesn't like this idea of an immediate second coming. He wants to delay it a little bit. And Mark, Matthew delays it a little bit as well. Okay. One, the fourth major concept, we talked about this, the exoneration of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are completely innocent uh, for the death of Jesus. So remember in Matthew and in Mark, when they had crucified Jesus, according to the text, of course we don't believe that, but according to Matthew and Mark, when he's on the cross, a Roman centurion says, this was what, Hayos Tetuyu, this is the Son of God, right? That's mentioned in Mark and in Matthew. However, the Roman centurion in Luke, the same scene, chapter 23, verse uh, 47, it is antos ha anthropos hutas di kaios ein. This man was innocent. That's what he says. He doesn't identify Jesus as the Son of God. He simply says, this man was totally innocent. Right? What's the point here? The point here is that Christianity is not a threat to the empire. At this point in history, Roman authorities are a little bit on edge. There's some xenophobia going around. Christianophobia going around, just like there's Islamophobia going around. Who are these Christians? What do they want to do? They don't want to take. They want to take over the government. Is that what they want? Are they saying Christ is like the emperor? They want to take over our. So this is the whole point: is that the Roman centurion says this man's innocent. He did nothing wrong. There's no threat here, right? They're perfectly peaceful and lawful, right? Which verse is this? Twenty-three forty-seven. Interesting, uh, interestingly, also, in the mid-2nd century, 
there was a Christian named Marcion. Did we talk about him? Marcion, so mid second century. Marcion, um, preaching in Rome, uh, he was uh, extremely influential in his teaching. And he was vehemently anti Jewish. He was anti Jewish. He was a bi theist. He was in two gods a god of good, a god of evil. He was also a docetist, which means that he believed Jesus didn't actually have a physical body. He was a phantasm. He had a major following in Rome. Okay, Marcion. Marcionism. You can do a uh, check on Sheikh Wiki. <laughs> but don't depend too much on it. Marcionism or Marcion? Why is he important for Luke? Because Luke, many times, Luke's gospel, I should say, uh, undergoes interpolation, additions, based on what Marcion, his movement, is doing. And I'll give you an example. Um, we're told in the Gospel of Luke, Again, and during the Passion narrative, that when Jesus is on the cross, uh, he says, uh, Pater, afes autois, Father, forgive them. Right? And all of the exegetes say, he's talking about the Jews. Jesus forgave them. And Marcin says this? No, this is what Luke says. Oh, Luke says. This is in the Passion narrative of Luke. How about Marcin? So don't get don't get ahead. don't get ahead of me right now. <laughs> so we we so lost the point where Marcin just, entered. The he's table. telling you that Marcin had an ideology that was spread at that time, and that who was this Luke. There's there's similarities here going on. No, no, that's that. right. So what happens is in the Gospel of Luke, so Jesus is on the cross in the Gospel of Luke, and he says, "Father, forgive them." Right. This is in the Gospel of Luke. Okay, forget about Marcin for now. All right, you'll find this in the Gospel of Luke. Okay. They know not what they do. Yeah, they, for they know not what they are doing. So Christian exegetes say that Jesus is talking about the Jews here. He's forgiving the Jews. Okay? Now, there are very early manuscripts of Luke's Gospel that do not contain that verse. <clears throat> they don't have that verse. Okay? The majority of New Testament scholars uh, believe that it's not authentically Lucan. It was put in later. Okay? Uh, if you want the exact reference to it, it is uh, Luke. Um, uh, 2334. Mark, uh, Luke 2334. Now the reason is, why was it added? This is a whole reason. This is called textual criticism. Textual criticism is a science and also an art because scholars of textual criticism, textual critics of the New Testament, they have to make a decision whether they're going to include a verse in a certain manuscript or not. So they have to look at certain evidences, external evidence or <coughs> internal evidence. So they've determined that the reason why that verse was fabricated, fabricated into Luke's gospel or interpolated into Luke's gospel is because Marcionism had grown so rapidly in the empire that was vehemently anti-Jewish, right? And some of the proto-Orthodox Christian scribes, they didn't like this idea that there's two gods. There's a God of the Old Testament who's full of wrath and anger and likes to kill children. And then you have the God of the New Testament, Jesus, who is saying, turn the other cheek and resist not evil. Marcion could not reconcile the two theologies. Okay, so he said there's two gods, right? So in order to sort of debunk Marcionism, Proto-Orthodox Christian scribes went back into the Gospel of Luke and said, look, see, look, Luke was not so anti-Jewish. He actually, Jesus actually forgave the Jews from the cross. You understand the reason for the interpolation? Mm -hmm. so, 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 in other words, the verse is a, uh, a polemical response to a, Christ to a Christological heresy. It's a proto-Orthodox fabrication to the scripture for polemical reasons. Right? Polemical or, meaning? Polemical, meaning for reasons of one, up, one upping another Christology. To show a proof text. 
Now look, you Marcians, you're wrong, right? Jesus forgave the Jews from the cross. He's not anti-Jewish. The, new, the, the Gospel of Luke is not anti-Jewish. So this means the Gospel of Luke also has, you know, undergone changes over a period of time. Mm-hmm. We don't know what is the origin. Do we, do we of know course, the whole New Testament is changing. It's changing right now. Okay. <laughs> it's constantly changing Dynamic. because new discoveries are being found. The Nestle Allen uh, 20, uh, critical Greek, Greek critical edition is in its 28th edition right now. 28 editions of Greek. But if you pick up a New Testament, King James, it's the same as your father had because the English isn't necessarily changing. But the critical Greek editions are always changing. And that's the actual New Testament. It's an eclectic text. It's taking the best from every manuscript and putting it into one. It means it's getting better? <laughs> it's getting sharper, yes. The more discoveries that, like when Codex Sinaiticus was found, there was major revision from a Christological standpoint. You might say it was only a few verses, but those were major. First John 5, 7, the longer ending of Mark, the first 12 verses of John chapter 8, Son of God in Mark 1, 1. This is, these are major concepts, even though altogether it's whatever, 100, 200 verses. Right? But the only verse that explicitly mentions the Trinity taken out of the text caused what book burnings in the streets of America by evangelical Christians. <clears throat> and is that the same reason why in the uh, King James Version 23-34 this particular verse is in a different form, like in red color? You know, the red color means that Jesus is speaking. Oh, okay. So all of the speech that, of Christ the apparent speech or reported speech of Christ is in red. The King James Version uh, is not a critical edition. It's kind of a traditional translation based on terrible Byzantine manuscripts. But if you get a Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version, which is based on the most up-to-date Greek manuscripts, you won't find that verse in there. The critical edition here puts it in double brackets, which means that this is not part of the New Testament, but Christians love the message of it, so we're going to include it. Right. So it's there by popular demand in the Greek edition. But scholars are telling you, we don't actually believe Jesus made this statement. It was a polemical response to Marcionism. And there's more additions to Luke based on this fast-growing cult called Marcionism. <clears throat> what percentage of Christians actually read the critical Greek version? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody knows Greek. Mm-hmm. You'll find pastors that don't know Greek. How did you become a pastor? Is there an English <laughs> translation of the Trinity? People? No, there's no English translation. Yet. <clears throat> yeah, but you lose so much in the translation. Um, the next major concept is our Christological revisions. Luke revising Mark's Christology. Number one, in terms of soteriology. The big words here. Soteriology means the study of salvation. Soto, soter in Greek, means savior. So, hence, soteriology. And here we're talking about in terms of vicarious atonement. So, for example, in Mark 10.45, it says that Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. This is Pauline dogma. Paul believes that Jesus is a Pascal lamb who took on the sins of humanity, literally, and he committed an act of self-immolation, suicide, quite literally, to atone for the sins of humanity. His death is atonement, it's redemption. That's Mark's Christology. Okay? Luke, however, does not include any of these verses. For Luke, Luke makes Jesus an example of service for his disciples. Luke makes Jesus an example of service for his disciples. In other words, in Luke, Jesus does not die for your sins. There's no mystical atonement. He dies to set an example of service and sacrifice. That's the meaning of his death, that I'm willing to give my life for my cause, and you should be willing to do that also. The message isn't, I'm going to die for your sins. That is not indicated anywhere in Luke Acts. 
which is, comprises a quarter of the New Testament. And this is very interesting, because that's the crux of Paul's Christology. So how can Luke be a student of Paul when they have this major difference? Therefore, Luke never knew Paul. That's just something that scholars tried to link in order to show some continuity in the New Testament. And isn't this belief more pervasive among Christians? I mean, the majority of Christians that he died for, yeah. for the sake of humanity. That is what the majority of them believe, right? Yeah, the majority believe that. That's true. Eastern Orthodox, that's Eastern Orthodoxy, that's Catholicism, and that's Protestantism. Jesus died for your sins. In some regard, he is the Savior in that sense, that he took your sin. Uh, and um, just like they use the story of um, Passover, when the high priest, or Yom Kippur, when the high priest would sacrifice a goat or a lamb um, and release one into the wilderness, sacrificing meaning that he's slaughtering the goat, representing your sins and the community is forgiven. Of course, the Jews don't actually believe that their sins are literally forgiven by the blood of a goat or a lamb. That's just symbolical of what's supposed to happen on the inside, which is Toba. So we'll talk about that also. Inshallah. <clears throat> um, so again, in Luke, Jesus does not die for your sin. There's no redemption in his death. There's no atonement. Jesus simply sets an example of service and sacrifice. And this is carried into the book of Acts with Peter and Stephen and Paul. Many of these people are martyred for their faith, right? following the example of Jesus. So I'll quote to you. Did somebody take a kid's take a book off the I didn't bring my Hebrew Bible, but I wanted to quote to you from Ezekiel eighteen twenty. You want to read it? Um, oh, I have it here. So that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Mm. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Right? Again, this is verse number? Ezekiel 18, 20. Chapter 18, verse 20. This is Old Testament. And then verse 21, yes. But if a wicked man turns from his sins, which he has committed, keeps my statutes, and does that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Die in a spiritual sense. And the word here for turn in Hebrew is literally turn, which is Yeshu. Yashuv, Shuv Yashuv, is the exact equivalent of Taba Yatubu, which also means to turn or to reorient. To turn to who? To turn to God. Right? So Toba is how repentance is done in the Hebrew Bible, and Luke does not tamper with that. That's how it's done so in the Gospel. Quotes, so Luke quotes Ezekiel? No, this is what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel 18.20. Meaning this is what God already established as the how to get rid of your sin is through Toba, not through vicarious atonement, which has nothing to do with the Old Testament. If some Christians will say, no, you're, you're not reading the Old Testament correctly. On Yom Kippur, the priest will slaughter a lamb for the sins of the community. No Jew believes that their sin is literally transferred unto a lamb. It's symbolic action. That's supposed to be uh, um, manifested internally by every Jew with Toba. 
with Tova. Okay? So Jews also sacrifice lamb? They do. They sacrifice, just like we sacrifice on Eid. They have the same type of concept. We don't say I'm going to sacrifice this whatever on Eid as a uh, as a uh, vicarious atonement for my sins. We don't, we don't yeah. believe that. The Jews don't believe that either. So 21 says uh, that uh, if the wicked turn from sins, mm -hmm. then uh, he shall survive, he shall not die. Right. His soul. So right. That's the yes, it's talking about spiritual death. Yeah. Spiritual death. Everyone's going to die, but spiritual death. Okay. Worried about my. You oh. Have a lot of notes in the jar. Oh yeah. Somebody has taken it. Why don't you ask um, <laughs> a friend over here? I'm trying to think if I took it out. Do you know what it is? What the guy is? Huh? Oh, I know what I did. Ah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. next to the. There wasn't room in my back, so I, I held it. Is it Starbucks? I put it somewhere else. No, it's in the house. Uh, <laughs> oh, That's alright. You went back. Now you're, you're, now you're back on your game. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel much better. Well, trust me. When I lose, when I lose books, I'm, I'm inconsolable for like two weeks. <laughs> How often do you lose books? Once in a blue moon. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing. The Luke in Jesus is, Airman calls him, imperturbable. Well, Imperturbable meaning that he's impossible to get angry. He won't lose it ever. He never becomes overly emotional. He's cool, calm, he's collected, he's always in control. He's like a Stoic philosopher. Right? So again, Luke is writing for a Gentile Christian community. He's trying to appeal to, you know, Greco Romans living in the Mediterranean, a very prevalent philosophy is called Stoicism which was founded by Zeno in the 4th century before the Common Era. And Stoicism is basically self-disbelief in God and to have self-discipline, not to become overly emotional. You ever heard it like one time, you know, some doctor, he gave me a shot and I didn't make a sound and he said, oh, you're quite stoic, right? Not to lose it. The Luke in Jesus is always cool, calm and collected, level-headed, right? even keel. He's always in control. So Luke eliminates marking descriptions of Jesus that make him too emotional. Right? He tones it down a little bit. Okay? For example, the cry of dereliction on the cross, which is mentioned in Mark and in Matthew. Matthew had no issues with it. He took it from Mark verbatim. Luke does not mention, Ilahi, Ilahi, Lama Sabachthani, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because Jesus lost it for a minute. Right? And this is beneath the Lucan Christ, who is imperturbable, always in control. So what are the last words of the Lucan Jesus on the cross? Always in control. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He actually hands over his ruach to God. He's always in control. Never loses it. And remember that. Okay? Because Luke is trying to, uh, he's trying to, um, you know, he's trying to offer Jesus in such a way that it's um, pleasing to Stoics who believe <clears throat> in this Stoic, Stoic philosophy. Yes? What was this call on, on the cross called again? The, the cry of dereliction. Cry of dereliction. I forget how to write English. <clears throat> dereliction. Yeah. <laughs> also, Luke 22, this is also in the Passion narrative. This is in the garden scene, right? So he goes to the garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives just before he's arre arrested. There are two verses here that are controversial. I actually did a paper on this, and so that's going to be published soon, where I argue that these two verses are a fabrication to Luke's gospel. And once again, a polemical response to Marcionism, a Christological heresy. Because what does it mention in those verses? It says Jesus suddenly lost it and was sweating blood. Right? So it's interesting. You have to look at 
like we said, textual criticism. Textual criticism, you look at external evidence and internal evidence. What is the external evidence is you have to look at the other manuscripts of this gospel and see how well attested it is in other manuscripts. Okay? That's the first thing you have to do. If you see a verse that just seems weird, and a good exegete can pick these things up, because also included in here is this word agonia in Greek. Agonia means agony. And this is a hapax legomenon, which means that this is the only occurrence of the word in all of Luke. So someone who knows the Greek well, an exegete, who has a keen eye, will read that and say, I've never seen this word before in Luke. Maybe this is a different author. Maybe this is a later scribe who's interpolating, who's adding something to Luke for some theological reason. Right? Sometimes the Habax Lagamanoi are authentic. Sometimes it happens as well. Right? Like Samad in the Quran, Allahu Samad, that's a Habax Lagamanon. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the Quran. Kawthar is Hapax Lagamana. It only appears in Surah Al Kawthar. Nowhere else in the Quran. That doesn't mean that a different writer wrote that Surah, right? But that's something that an exegete will notice. So, external evidence. Hadith 01 and B, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, do not contain the verses that Jesus suddenly lost it. He was in agony and he started sweating like blood, right? It's not mentioned in the best and oldest complete Greek New Testament codices. Internal evidence is two aspects. Uh, the first is called <clears throat> intrinsic probability. And you don't have to write this down if you don't want to, but this is really interesting. And then the other one is called transcriptional probability. There's external evidence looking at other manuscripts. And then there's internal evidence, which consists of intrinsic probabilities, which means, which focuses on Luke, the actual author, the autograph author. So what, what you have to do here is you have to analyze Luke's theology and you have to ask yourself, would Luke actually write this based on Luke's writing style, his vocabulary, his theology? Would he actually write this, the original author? Right? So that focuses on Luke. Transcriptional probability focuses on the scribe. On the scribe. Like why would a scribe include these verses. If they were originally in Luke, why would he take them out? These are things you have to consider. So the dominant opinion here is that these two verses are a fabrication. And Ehrman points out something really interesting. Bart Ehrman, whom you should know well, watch videos of him on YouTube. You won't stop watching. I can guarantee it. Please be hooked on him. Bart Ehrman. Anyway, okay. So what happens here? Is this all misquoting Jesus? Facebook? This part is, I don't think so. I don't think this is misquoting Jesus. But he does mention this. I don't know if he mentions this in that book, though. He wrote an article on this passage. But Ehrman says that quite often in Luke you have what's known as a chiasm. A chiasm. What is a chiasm? A chiasm is basically a pericope. Remember the word pericope? Well, that's even better than chiasm. <laughs> uh, a uh, section of literature, like a story in the Gospels. It's called any story is called a pericope. You have a pericope that has a has a focal point that the reader has to focus on. So I'll give you an example with this passage. So Luke, chapter 22, verses 40 to 46, whatever this passage is, you have Jesus 
tell his disciples to watch and pray. And you have Jesus kneels to pray. And notice, Luke changes Matthew's version of this. Matthew says he fell upon his face. He just collapsed on his face. But Luke says, no, he knelt. He's in control. Right? See, you have Jesus prays. And this is focus. Then you have here, Jesus stands from prayer. Jesus tells his disciples to watch and pray. So take a look at this here. This is called a chiasm uh, or chiastic concord. It's also called a chiasmus. These are Greek words. What does that mean? There's a focus to this pericope. So this cor A corresponds with this A, right? Because they're the same thing. Jesus tells his disciples to watch and pray. That's what he does initially. That's what he does last. The second thing he does, and the second to last thing he does, he kneels to pray, and then he stands up for prayer. So now what is the focus? It's the prayer of Jesus. So here, in, the, in Luke, pray, prayer is a major theme. Prayer. Prayer is everywhere in Luke. But the thing is this. When you add those two verses of Jesus losing it and sweating like blood, the chiasm is completely destroyed. You see how it suddenly will stick out. This is foreign. And he was doing his best to imitate Luke's style. But if you read that in Greek, familiar with this chiastic concord, immediately it will come out. It will stick out to you. These are things that contextual critics look for. Chiasm is found in Semitic pericopes, even in the Quran. So you have Surah al kalfa Surah 108, which is three verses long. Right? Inna al-Kalfa. Kalfa. So what is the context of this Surah? A man named Af ibn Wa'il. Some say when Qasim died, some say when Abdullah died, the Prophet's son. Mm -hmm. This man, uh, uh, Af ibn Wa'il, he was speaking with the Prophet in the Haram, and then the Prophet left him, and his friends came to Af and said, Who are you talking to? He said, I was talking to Hala Abtar. I was talking to this man who is cut off. He's been amputated. What, is, what do they mean by that? That he doesn't have lineage, right? right? And then he would mock the Prophet Sallallahu and say, there's no one to remember you after you're gone. Right? So you have Kalta, and here you have Abta. And these two correspond because they're opposites. Kalta was a river. Yeah. Kalta is a river. Nahrun fil Jannah. But then they say Nabuwa. They say Shafa'a. They say Waghayr Adharik. Ahlil Bayt. I think the Shia have something right here, to be honest with you. The Sunni exegetes, they don't mention Ahlil Bayt. But that's the answer to Abta, that you're cut off from your lineage. No, you have Kautha, you have Fatima, which is great. Right? But I don't know, I don't think all of the Sunnis don't mention that, but some of them might actually do that. But these are seen as opposites. This is called Tibaq. Tibaq means a juxtaposition of opposite um, uh, entities or like a, images. Like a framing? What Shamsi will do, haha, this type of thing. Okay. Right? You have this, this Extremes opposite. of the spectrum. Duality. It's called, yeah, it's called duality or antithesis. Remember the antithesis of Jesus with the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah. The law says this, but verily I tell you this. You have heard this, but I tell you this. It's called tibak in Arabic. This is a rhetoric in balada. The Kothar up top, so then what is the focus? Salah and Naha. So prayer and sacrifice. This is where your focus is drawn to. 
so you're saying that the chiasm it is so that that those phrases forty three to forty seven or whatever are in Luke. Uh-huh. But Ehrman's point is that the the blood takes away the focus so it yes. it's put in later? Precisely, yes. Okay. Yes. That's just from a uh, linguistic standpoint. Yes. He's saying just from a li- linguistic standpoint, looking at the language, it's the chiasm doesn't work with those verses. And then secondly, he'll say, the personality of Jesus throughout the entire gospel is imperturbable. He's never overly emotional. He's always in control, even when he's dying on the cross. So suddenly here in the garden, he breaks down and sweats blood. So it's out of character. Right? So why would they... Why would somebody put that in the gospel? That's the whole question. Because remember, Marcion, what did he say about Jesus? That Jesus wasn't a real human being. He was a phantasm. Right? Mm. He was a phantasm. So Luke wants to show you that he's a real human being. He does have his moments. He can bleed. It's real. Right? This type of thing. So that's, that's the answer, I guess, from New Testament critics. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not to go here on the Nova. I mean, where has any of the ulama ever talked about any kind of, you know, the linguistic ulama ever talked about any kind of. They talk about this in, in, in. They talk about it all the time. So, Fakhreddin al Razi has something called Al Munasabat uh-huh. in his tafsir, where he says if you look at, for example, Surah Ma'un, and the Surah comes after Kautha, you have these four opposite ideas. Uh-huh. They, so they, they, they correspond. Even within surahs, like Michael Kuypers, who actually won an award in Iran. He's a Jesuit, actually. He did this whole breakdown. There's actually a book on this. He broke down Surah Ma'idah. And he said the entire surah is a, is a chiasm, which is 100 and something, 16 verses. It's a really phenomenal work. Just something to think about. Right? He's not even Muslim. Um, so, uh, in other, like al Qariya. And then at the end, so the end and the beginning sort of match, so the focus is in the middle. Surah Yusuf, like the story steps. Yeah, Allahu Allah. This is kind of like cutting edge. Yeah, I don't really like it. He's a Jesuit, yeah. Is it Jesuit? Yeah. I studied Arabic for four years. Uh, after Al and, and nobody, I mean, this isn't, this is probably more of a, a mental thing. It has nothing to do with Doga itself because I, I've never seen a truth in Doga, you know, and, and you know, if there's something like this, if you want to write better, you know, do, do you have to do, you know, make sure you have your, you know, this, and this is more of a, you know what I'm saying, form and, yeah. It has, I, I don't know, I haven't seen it in Doga, just, you know, if you want to make your Doga better, or in poems, or, you know, because everything is based on, on Arabic poetry from, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's rhetoric, it's balaha, uh, which goes to show that if this is true, someone, someone would have to actually sit down and work these things out with paper. It's hard yeah. to look at the process I'm yeah. going to write. So how was he able to say this, you know, without writing it down and have this chiastic structure? Yeah. It's very difficult to do, very, very difficult. I mean, I think it's also important to study these linguistic uh, tech. Uh, linguistic uh, techniques because there, when you have like this symmetry you might not realize it but it makes it more appealing and maybe that's what makes the Quran for those who understand yeah, it of it's appealing they might not realize it but subconsciously that symmetry or these mm-hmm. well Shakespeare they have a pentameter so yeah right. I understand. mean the reason why people appreciate Shakespeare more is you know those people that understand the yeah. you know the rhythmic pattern and everything. Like Surah Duha, for example. The ulama point this out. Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa, wa wajadaka dhalan fa'ada, wa wajadaka a'ilan fa'agna. Fa'amma al-yatima fa'la ta'qar. So this yatim goes back to the first yatim. Fa'amma al-sa'ila fa'la ta'nhar. And the sa'il is the opposite of dhalan. So that corresponds. Wa wajadaka a'ilan fa'agna. Corresponds to wa amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahaddis that we made you free for the revelation, mm. so proclaim it. So you have that. Also helps doing hits because you 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 notice these things, you know, like if you're memorizing um, a surah, there's this verse, and like, hey, this surah is very similar yeah. in terms of 
you, you know, what it's talking about, it's repeating or the concept, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's, it's very helpful in his as well, and I think maybe right. that's another reason why people find... I mean, remember, remember, remember yeah, that, that's what a lot of the things, if you go the worst, but that's we made it easy for you to remember, remember it or memorize it. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 thing with you, the thing that I just, because we're dealing with Allah's revelation, and if there's a chasm somewhere and something's off, you can't just say that, you know what I'm saying? It opens the door for, for fitness to or this way, if Allah didn't, you know what I'm saying? So if there's, you're saying that there's, there's connections that, that you go by this rule and that rule has to be present everywhere. It has no, to be consistent. Not we're not saying that. that. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying has to be consistent. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention the mafur bihi. Sometimes he does. Is there an inconsistency there? The, the, the Orientalist says yes. He says, look, the Quran is not consistent in its grammar. But Balagha has a different standard. Yeah. You can't judge Quranic Arabic by modern standard Arabic. You can't judge it. By you can't judge it. That's my whole point. That's, that's what I'm saying as well. That sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the chiasm. Maybe. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he let he leaves off the mafur bihi, right? Like when he says, "Kathabat samuda bitawaha," right? Kathabat is a fi'l muta'addi, which means that it's a, a verb that needs a mafur bihi. But there's no there's no object here. Well, so it's, he made a mistake. That's what the Orientalist mm-hmm. does. Mm-hmm. No, the point is, Quraysh, think about what are you kathabat? What did samud kathabat? Rasulahum, rasuluha. If we use it in the feminine, because we're talking about samud. Mm-hmm. So the Quran is trying to make you think about the mafur bihi, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just give it to you on a platter. Think about what it's saying. This is a rhetorical device, mm. right? That the modern standard Arabic scholar is like, what's going on here? It, two and two doesn't add up because mm. everything is so mathematical for the Mashallah. for the grammarian, right? Mm. But the Quran is different. There's balagha, and that's an ocean in and of itself. So it may have this, it may not. Michael Kuyper's Jesuit priest won an award from, of course there were Shia, but whatever you want to say for the Shia. <laughs> I think they actually have a point about Kautha. Because yeah. Aqsa means cut off, and Kautha must mean a progeny of some sort. Yeah. But I haven't come across a Sunni exegetist that mentions Ahlul Bayt or Fatima or Ali or something like that. They say it's Nahrud fil Jannah. And that's probably true as well. That's what they mentioned. But what does that have to do with Aqsa? That's the whole question. Again. One who's cut off from a progeny. Oh, okay. No lineage. Mm-hmm. Um, Luke's sources then. Yeah. Luke. What does he have? He has Mark, right? Mark. Mark. He picks up Mark a lot. Q, Q and L. What are you doing? Special Luke and material. Luke. So I want to talk about the special Lucan material for a minute, because this is where some of the most beautiful pericopes, in my opinion, actually happen in the New Testament. Yes? You were saying something about Bart Ehrman. Yeah. So why did you complete that? I, I yeah, Bart Ehrman is the one that came up with the, the chiasm oh, of okay. Luke 22 on the garden. Got it. Blood. And he says the, the blood verse, when it's interpolated, it screws up the chiasm. And the blood verse is mentioned in two of the other Gospels. No, it's only Luke. No, no, only Luke. It's only in Luke. There are versions, however, uh, there are some manuscripts in Greek where that occurs in Matthew, uh, and, and only Matthew. So this indication of a verse that is mobile indicates strongly that it's a fabrication as well. Oh, wow. yeah, verses that are he, moving around the New Testament. It says he prayed earnestly while he bled. means he's still cool and calm and collected. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, some say it is part of Luke. There's a minority opinion that they know Luke. Luke wrote it. He lost it for a minute. It's okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> actually, I wanted to go to. I want to uh, before we get into L here. Let's do some Lucan themes. Some more Lucan themes. Okay. So this is extremely important. The first theme is the Holy Spirit. He is the main actor of the book of Acts. He's also a major actor in the book of Luke. In Luke, the Christian community is charismatic. This is where we get the word karama from. Charismatic, being they're spirit-led. They're spirit-empowered. They can work miracles. Okay. Um, what is Acts? <clears throat> Sorry, what is Book of Acts? Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. 
it's Luke's uh, second volume. So you have Luke Acts. It's called Luke Acts. Luke is the Gospel. Acts is the apostolic history that comes after the Gospel of John, the history of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost. This is about 50 days after the crucifixion. The disciples are in the upper room where they have the Last Supper. It says the Holy Spirit descended, and they start speaking in tongues. They start speaking in the tongues of the world. How many uh, disciples were there at the time? 120 of them. The Holy Spirit descends, and these 120 disciples or apostles, they start speaking in tongues, and this is supposed to be a turning point in the early church history, that they've been divinely empowered to work these uh, charismatic exploits, these karama. <clears throat> Why is the number 120 um, significant? A group of men, 120 meeting in private. Who does that? It just happened. Oh, no. um, the cardinals, right? Cardinals. Okay. In the conclave, oh, yeah. 120 cardinals. They meet and they discuss, and the Holy Spirit is supposed to guide their decision making. Who is going to be the next pope? The vicar of Christ is a big deal. The successor of Jesus. So it comes from Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were in the upper room. The Holy Spirit descended like fire. They start speaking. They mentioned Arabic, too. They spoke in Arabic. One time this lady, she's an evangelical Christian. Uh, she thought I was possessed by demon and things like that. Anyway, she's like, Lord, give, give me a language you'll understand. So she starts speaking like, in, I don't know, it's Russian. It sounded like Russian or something. So she said, do you understand this? I said, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. <laughs> you, were, you were there. <laughs> His brother was actually there. That was a nice, interesting day. <laughs> also, we talk about prayer, a, a Lucan theme prayer. Jesus prays a lot. The disciples pray a lot. Everyone's praying all the time in the Gospel of Luke. We also talk about crowds, right? There's large crowds everywhere because Luke is trying to aggrandize Jesus, put him on the world stage trying to make him very, very important. There's also this concern for women in the God of the love. Right? This is why I think many of these things are very close to the character of the Prophet Sayyid Salaam, imperturbable. Right? He's compassionate, he's merciful. He has concern for women. So, <clears throat> uh, Mary, we talked about Mary. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, we'll talk more about her. But Mary and Martha are mentioned Elizabeth is mentioned, and of course women were present at the crucifixion and resurrection according to Luke as well. The first witnesses to the resurrection. So other Gospels do not mention any women? Who? Other Gospels do not mention any women? No, they mention women, but Luke has focus, focus on women. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So as per Islamic belief, uh, was Isa Islam married? No. Uh, the no, the right. strong opinion is no, no right. but there's Scholars who say there's nothing wrong with believing that. It's not an error in your aqidah to believe that. Because there's nothing, there's no dalil in the Quran or strong hadith that mentions he was a bachelor. <laughs> huh? You can, you can believe that if you want. <clears throat> and it seems likely that he was married. Because a 30-year-old man at that time not married is very, very unusual. Very unusual. Is Jesus considered a Levite? No, he's not a Levite because his father is not a Levite. Oh, because there's no father. So he doesn't have a tribal distinction. So that comes from the father. Right? In the tribe of Levi at that okay. so Mary was a Levite? She was a yeah. Levite, but that's uh, not his father. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, he wasn't married, though, right? He was older than Yahya, wasn't he? Yeah, actually, comes at one time, he said, yeah, I don't know where he got his information, but he said that Yahya was engaged to be married, but, or was married, but he didn't consummate. He didn't get a chance to do it. He was arrested and beheaded. And he was around 30 at the time, too. So it was very, very old to be a bachelor at that time. Uh, the Jews' uh, lineage goes from mother, right? It does, yeah. So if uh, uh, Jesus was Jew at the time, mm. so his tribe should come from the mother, right? That's true in every tribe except for Levi. Oh, okay. So Mary is a Levite. It's, it's from the father. It's, it's uh, patriarchal mm. or pa patrilineal for the Le Levitical tribe. So his tribal distinction is whatever his father is. But he doesn't have a father. So he's not from Bani Israel. 
So he cannot say, Ya Qawmi, and this is by the Quran. You read the Quran, quoting Isa alayhi salam, he never says, Ya Qawmi. He says, Ya Bani Israel. Because his father is not from Bani Israel. A subtlety that sometimes people don't notice. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is called by this word, Soter, which means Savior. Now, we have to investigate further because I thought Jesus did not die for your sin. And he comes to the other. Um, so Luke calls him Savior. <coughs> what does he mean by this? Not in the sense that he died for your sins, but rather as one who teaches you how to deal with sin uh, and its consequences. A means of salvation. That's why the New English Bible translates Soter as deliverer. He's the deliverer, just like Moses is called the deliverer. Moses didn't die for your sins. He taught you how to avoid sin or to deal with sin, a means of your, transla- of your salvation. You see the difference? Mm-hmm. His death makes people realize their guilt before God, so they turn to God in repentance, and he, God, forgives their sin. This is the meaning of Savior in the Gospel of Luke, not in the sense of um, this idea of a Greco-Roman man-god incarnating into human flesh, killing himself for the sins of humanity. That's not consistent with Luke's Christology. That's Mark's Christology and Paul's Christology. And maybe Matthew. So again, when Luke uses the word soka or savior, he means a means of salvation. A deliverer in the sense of Moses is one who delivers you from sin. Not by killing himself or taking on your sin, but teaching you how to deal with sin. Do you see the difference? Mm-hmm. Good. So, Jesus is not a sacrifice for sin. He's an example of compassion for all to emulate. He is a pattern of conduct, of sacrifice and service for all to emulate. Also, in Luke, he and his followers are completely innocent of any crime against Rome. Christians have nothing to do with any type of political sedition, or any type of crime uh, against Rome. Neither do Jews that are, as they say, in the back pocket of the Roman Empire. It's only these Jews that want to uh, fight for their freedom, these zealous Jews, or these Pharisees that are against Roman occupation. These are the enemies. The Pharisees are uh, the religious establishment of the day. These are Jewish scribes and scholars that are consistently butting heads with Jesus, especially in Matthew chapter 23, the seven woes. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They're the enemies of Jesus. Not all of them are evil. Some of them are good. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea. And these two guys are mentioned in John's Gospel. Um, They're Pharisees as well. But they actually help Jesus. Uh, after the so-called crucifixion. Matthew 7. Matthew 23. The seven woes. Yeah. Okay. What time is that issue? Uh, 8.45. Next five minutes. Okay. So let's talk, uh, let's actually take some questions now. The messianic title. Huh? The messianic title. Mm-hmm. It's very, look, I read this thing, okay, I'm not, I don't know from my head, but you know, it says here that you know all these things, the themes and stuff. That um, there's a lot about the messianic title, son of man. What's the significance of that? The themes of the son of man. The why the son of man so significant? <clears throat> in that? Son of God. God of the man. No, well, it says messianic title, right? The son of man, right? Son of man um, probably is not a messianic title, but can be interpreted God. like that. So the Old Testament talks about two types of sons of men. Talks about Ben Adam and Bar Enash in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Son of man in the book of Ezekiel it simply means prophet. Son of man means prophet. Okay? So Jesus in <clears throat> the Gospels refers to himself consistently as the Son of Man. Right? It's his preferred title over anything else. However, he also talks about someone to come in the future who is called Son of Man. Right? He says, for example, in the synoptic tradition, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the son of man, son of man be ashamed, 
when he shall come in his glory. Okay. So this is the prophecy of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Somebody, possibly. I mean, that's something that I think there's strong evidence for. Because again, in the Old Testament, there's Ben Adam, which means prophet, and then there's Daniel's son of man. In Hebrew, the, the word is Bar Inash, which is different. We'll talk more about these two titles, inshallah. But Ehrman says, and Schweitzer agrees with him, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, the quest for the historical Jesus, that the only historical, the only reliable things in the New Testament that we can say are historical are that Jesus was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet who prophesied someone to come after him called the Son of Man. They say that's the gospel, that's Jesus in a nutshell from a uh, historical standpoint. You see, if we separate the dogma, the wheat from the chaff, what is actually historical is that Jesus was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet. Apocalyptic in the sense that he's the last prophet sent to Israel who prophesied an enigmatic a mysterious figure called the Bar Inash is going to come in the future and lay to waste idolatry. That's they say the basic message of Jesus. Uh, who's the story of Isaiah twenty nine twelve? It says the book is given to one who knows no letters. And it says it's going to be said that in the Hebrew cut off and says, No you have to say that. And the Christian Orientalist says, well, the prophet knew this story. Oh, really? Did he know this story? He knew this little detail in the book of Isaiah. Who taught him this? But there must have been a Jewish rabbi somewhere in Mecca at the time. Well, there's Wadaq of the Nosal, but, you know, there's no, there's no Christian or Jewish tribe. I mean, it's possible that the prophet of the Lali should have known this story. But how does he have knowledge of these stories of the, of the Bible? Because many of these stories are specialized that only scholars knew them. And the majority of people, the vast majority, were illiterate, so they can't just go to someone, pick up a Torah, and start reading it, even if it's in Arabic, and you're an Arab. Right? You have to actually sit down with learned rabbis to get the details of the exodus and the flood and these types of things. Who did he sit down with in Mecca? Which rabbis did he contact with that were able to translate these stories to him in Arabic that he could understand? You know, so um, it's just unlikely. Right? But that's what the Jew used to do with Esau and Esau. This is the primary reason why they reject him. Yes? I heard of like, I don't know if it was like a prophecy or whatever in the Bible where people saw like, uh, I don't know if it was like a, a bunch of people and I was supposed to like Esau and Esau and then there's also mention of like a bunch of camels in right, the area as well, but they yeah. never listened to that. Yeah, that's found in, uh, also in Isaiah. Um, I'd have to look at the exact reference. I believe it's Isaiah chapter 28. It's describing a, a war and a certain rider upon a donkey, and then following him as a man on a camel. So the Muslim theologians have, uh, they uh, have, they practice what's known as tatwee, right? Remember tatwee, which is finding a typology, the esoteric interpretation of the scripture. In Hebrew, it's called Haggadah. So they would say this is an indication of Isa de Sana, who is followed by the Prophet of But I'll find the exact reference for you. Uh, yeah. But Isaiah 29, 12 is much stronger. I mean, it's almost... It, it describes the event on Laylat al Qadr like a glove. It's really amazing, 29 12, Isaiah. Um, so then, Palm Sunday, that was last Sunday. And then, Isaiah is Now, remember, this is according to uh, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Isaiah is he spent the majority of his life in Galilee in the north. Okay? The majority of his ministry. The ministry of Isaiah is according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is only a year long. One year. Started when he was 30 and ended at 31. The last week of his life, according to the synoptic tradition, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Okay? And they welcome him, right? And they, they, they shout, Hosanna, which is Hoshi'ana, Hoshi'ana, which means save us, save us. Save us in the sense that deliver us from the Romans because the Messiah is no doubt uh, there's, a, there's a militaristic aspect to the mission of the Messiah. And this is further exemplified when Esau is around sometime during the week. Now this whole week in Jerusalem, which is packed with thousands of Jews, there's Romans on guard, uh, the whole week is butting heads with the 
religious establishment of Beni Israel. So you read, for example, we talked about this Matthew 23. It's called the seven woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, who overlook the way your demands of the law. He's always debating the Pharisees during this week in Jerusalem. So the Pharisees don't like him very much at all. And then he seizes the temple at one point. And this is probably on Wednesday, which would have been yesterday. They actually go to the Temple Mount, and he turns over the money changers, and he makes a whip, and he starts whipping people to get out of the temple. Right? So, and, and the question is, if he has 12 disciples, and they're unarmed because they're pacifists, how do you see the Temple of Solomon on Passover week? Obviously, they're armed. This is obvious. This is a military insurrection. They had seized the Temple Mount back from the Pharisees at the time. And according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the main reason why they wanted to kill him, is because he'd taken the Temple Mount. This is the main reason why they wanted to kill him. Why? Because it was claimed to be the Messiah, but also because he had affected what? Their business. He says, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. Right? So again, people worship money. The prophet said when he goes into Medina, you know, the Jews, they sign mutual treaties of peace with them. We, have, we actually have the treaties. We, we can actually quote those. He says, the Jews shall maintain their own religion, but if we're under attack, they'll come to our aid. If they're under attack, we'll come to their aid. Right? It's a contract. It's a Medina constitution. But in the Souk, the Jews were, ch- were charging riba on the Arabs, but not on the Jews. And that's based on the Torah. You can rip off your brother, uh, your, the foreigner, the boy, but your brother a Jew, you can't. So the Prophet said, he said, we need to build our own souk where there's no riba. And now what happens? You have khiyana. Hauka khiyana. You have treachery upon treachery upon treachery. Because why? The bottom line is affected. Same thing with Isa He chases out the money changers, and now that's their source of income. They don't like him anymore at all. They want to kill him now. Um, and John, actually, we'll get to the Gospel of John. It's my favorite Gospel, by the way. Um, and John's ministry is three years long, not one year. And this seems to be more historically accurate, actually, which is very strange because John's Gospel is theologically out of whack completely. <laughs> uh, but he seems to have gotten the timing right because he has hindsight, right? If he has hindsight, you can sort of avoid the mistakes of your predecessors. Right? So that's actually what most Muslims will say about Isa de Islam, that he ascended at 33, not at 31. So the ministry was three years long. Also in the Gospel of John, right at the outset. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, uh, ministry in Yeah, his, yeah, his Nabuwa, the time of his um, prophecy. So the prophet says, the prophecy is 23 years. Isa de Islam, according to the Synoptic Gospels, one year. Uh, but John says three years. And in the Gospel of John, he actually cleanses the temple initially. He's going back and forth from Galilee to Jerusalem. There's three Passovers mentioned in John, one Passover mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So then what happens on, uh, on Thursday night, which is tonight, right, during this week, he has what's known as the Last Supper. All right, so this is in the upper room. That's some serious stuff. What's that? This should be some serious stuff for them to take care of. Yeah, this is a... So the ministry is one year. It is. But Palm Sunday is the final week. It's yeah. until Easter. Yeah. So, so what was he doing the other 51 weeks? Just he was in Galilee. Galilee. No, but I thought he was in Jerusalem. The ministry is... In no, 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 no. He's in Galilee. So he's only in Jerusalem for one week. He's only in Jerusalem for one week. Okay. I thought the ministry was no. one year in Jerusalem. No, no, no. The ministry is... 51 weeks in Galilee. He's 51 weeks in Galilee, approximately. And one week, his final week, he's in Jerusalem. That's what I'm and Matthew, Mark, and Luke all. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, yeah. All agree on that. All week. agree, yeah. Well, what day is it? What's the first time you watch that? Fourth? Um, Which day? Eight? Yeah, I have to look up the map. So then, on Thursday night, they have the Last Supper. According to Mark and Matthew, Jesus institutes the new covenant. Luke does not include that. Remember Luke's Christology? What's so unique about Luke's Christology when it comes to soteriology, when it comes to salvation? 
how is Luke different than Matthew and Mark? Remember Mark 10.45? Oh yeah, Mark was, uh, Jesus did not die for your sins. Right. right. So Mark 10.45, and Mark is taking cue from Pauline dogma. Remember Paul wrote all of his letters before the Gospels. An aspect of Paul's Christology has been adopted by all four Gospel writers. So Mark here says that the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to uh, did, not, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew had Mark in front of him. That's one of his sources. He copied that verbatim. Luke completely ignored it. Okay. In Luke, Jesus does not die for your sins. In Luke, Jesus is the martyr prophet. He is the martyr prophet who teaches you how to deal with sin, how to recognize sin, and how to turn away from sin through repentance. Right. Jesus is an example. He's uswatun hasana in the Gospel of Luke. He's a beautiful example of conduct by which the apostles should follow. He's willing to give his life for his cause. His death does not mean anything for you as far as atonement, vicarious atonement. That's Mark's Christology. That's also in Matthew. That's definitely in John and definitely in Paul. But Luke Acts does not have that aspect of Christology, which again is very strange because Luke is supposed to be a student of Paul. And this is central to Paul's Christology. Jesus died for your sins. He says it just like that. Jesus died for your sins in the book of Romans. But Luke, who's supposed to be a student, completely rejects that Christology. And at the Last Supper, Jesus does not say, this is wine, which is the blood of the new covenant, co covenant shed for many, things like that. He doesn't say that. There is a statement in Luke where he does say that, but many scholars believe that's a later uh, fabrication of the Gospel of Luke. According to Ehrman, if he says you look at the intrinsic probability, if you look at the transcriptional probabilities, it doesn't fit with this Gospel. So somebody later came and tried to harmonize Paul's Christology with Luke by adding one or two verses to, Luke, uh, to Luke's Last Supper narrative where Jesus says, this is the cup of the new covenant which is shed for many or something like that. But Luke doesn't say that. The autograph author doesn't say that. A later scribe went back and said that about Luke. Okay? So, the bottom line is, when Luke calls Jesus Soto, Savior, he doesn't mean it in the sense that Jesus will die for your sins. He means it in the sense that he's going to deliver you from sin as Moses did. How did Moses deliver you? Did he die for your sins? No, he taught you the law. He taught you wisdom. He taught you how to make toba. He purified you, just like the Quran said. In that sense, the prophet says, son is a savior. Not in the sense that he died for your sins. Of course not. There's a kufu. Right? But he teaches you and purifies you, as the Quran says. He teaches you the book of wisdom. That's Luke's Christology. And then that's Thursday night, right? After the meal, Jesus and the disciples, they go to the Mount of Olives, Jebel of Zaytun, which is, quote, a stone's throw away from the upper room where they have supper. So this could be al maidah right? Surah al maidah There's a scene at the end of the surah where Jesus, Isa uh, alayhi salam, uh, he's with his disciples, and they bring down a, a table set, a maidah. A maidah means a table with food on it. And he says, don't you believe? And they say, yes, we believe. We want, we want to be certain. And then, and then he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, I'll send it down. But if any of you disbelieve after this, then terrible punishment. Because this is an outward sign. The Lord Jesus said, that's clear. Right. right? Uh, so that could be. So Michael Kuypers, remember I talked about Michael Kuypers? He actually is the Jesuit and won an award on the Surah al maidah because he says it's a, it's a chiastic structure. There's a, remember we talked about chiasm last time? Chiasmus. The beginning of the surah resembles the end, and the second to last resembles the second part, and then there's a focal of the surah. So he actually, won, he actually has phenomenal work. The Jesuits are really smart. The current book is the Jesuits. I don't know. <coughs> uh, but Allah Alam, I don't know. He's not Muslim, but you know, it's worth taking a look at. I think he called his book the, the, the Last Supper of Christ, according to the Quran. So you're saying the meal was delivered? 
my own. By, yeah, by Jibril Ali Sada, brought down the meal specially for them. And then what happens here, according to the Gospels, Synoptic Gospels, is that <clears throat> he goes to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples are armed. Okay, they're armed. There's no, how do we know they're armed? Because Peter, when they come to arrest Jesus, he pulls out a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the temple guards. Right? The question is, why does he have a sword? What are swords used for in those days? For cutting fruit? Clipping your toenails? Yeah, to defend yourself. Plunging into human flesh, that's what swords are used for. Right? So this is a story that's really interesting because it sort of cuts against the grain of what early Christians want to say about Jesus. So this is one of the one of the criteria of modern historiography. If there's a story in the Gospels that kind of goes against the tendency of early Christians, that story is probably accurate. <laughs> that story is probably accurate. So this story here, right, where there's disciples, what early Christians would like to say, Jesus was a complete pacifist. He did not open his mouth to defend himself. He was a lamb led to the slaughter, right? Uh, he turned the other cheek, love your enemies, this type of thing, right? But you have disciples on the Mount of Olives at night with swords. That's insurrection. And if the Romans catch you, all of you are dead. Everyone's crucified. That's insurrection. So this story cuts against the grain. This is called dissimilarity, according to modern historiography. If something is dissimilar to what the author wants to say about Jesus, it probably means it's accurate. It's accurate historically. That's how they, this is modern historiography. That's, how they, that's one of their criteria. I'll give you another example of this. Um, there's a historian, I put it on my Facebook, but he's a Yale historian that is really a uh, great scholar. His name is Dale Martin at Yale. He says, Mark 10, 18 is probably the most historical verse in the entire New Testament. He says this verse here, because it completely cuts against the grain of what early Hellenistic Christians believed about Jesus. And Matthew and Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, looking at Mark, did not like this. And so they rearranged the whole story. So what happens here? A scribe comes to Jesus and says, good master, how do I get to heaven? And then Jesus says, according to the Greek, and he brings the mafrul muqaddam. So this is something we do in rhetoric in Arabic. When you bring the direct object forward to stress it, so why me are you calling good? Right? For example, Sa'ila uh, is mansub, it's mafrul bihi, but the verb is at the end because the stress is on the sa'il. As for the petitioner, do not scold him. Exactly. So here is why me are you calling good? No one good is one. No one good. No one is good but one. That is God. That's Mark ten eighteen. So Martin says that verse is historical according to modern historians. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, in the last class, you said about the new twenty two forty three forty four. Uh huh. That those two verses are different <clears throat> from the total story from what you right. Yeah. So, but that those two verses you said looks like fabricated because they're against the story. Yeah. And now you're saying if it is against the story, then it's kind of true. No, those 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 two verses do not fit the personality of the, uh, the author of uh, the, the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> uh, they don't fit Jesus's um, his his character. Uh, and it doesn't fit with the story linguistically. There's vocabulary wow. in, the, in the story that doesn't work. So it, it also, kind of works. yeah. So it also, uh, you know, messes up this whole chiastic structure of the parable itself, where the focus is taken off the. He's talking about the verse where he sweats uh, blood. blood, right? Yeah, I mean, a historian could make that point. It was about prayer. He could actually make that point and say, look, this cuts against the grain. This is probably historical. But most scholars say no. It was probably added because we have manuscripts of Luke that don't contain the verses. And then the whole chiastic structure is compromised when you add those verses. And it's probably a response to Marcionism. Remember Marcionism? Jesus did not have a physical body. He didn't really feel pain. So for him to sweat like blood, that really shows his humanity. 
Marcion believed Jesus was pure God. He wasn't even have a body. Because for him, God becoming man was a big problem. And that's true. It is a big problem. So he said he was just a phantasm. He didn't really exist. He can't be flesh and blood. So they have some dissimilarity. Dissimilarity. Um, so what happens is, this is the anti-God proof of the Bible. Uh-huh. Right. I mean, essentially. I mean, Christians have... I'm not, I'm not the one. Yeah, I, I, I debated Mike Lacona. I've actually debated Martin and Bart Ehrman. And Christians have these nuanced ways of translating the verse, or interpreting the verse. But the most natural, most obvious right, translation of the verse is very clear that Jesus is denying being God very clearly. Christians will say he's asking the rhetorical question. Like, do you realize that if you're calling me, me good, you're calling me God? Is that what you need to say? Or something like that. Right? But this is very clear. Well, they're saying he's... he's you know, play on words. Yeah. He's, he's asking this from the Greek. Think about what he's calling him. Oh, that's how that's Christian stuff. What most the original Greek, uh, Greek like, what is it? Timele, why me are you calling good? There is no one good but one that is God. The stress is on me. Yeah. Uh, so most historians will say this is a clear denial of his God. Allah, what about Allah, what about Allah, what about anything about the Father's Day Dinner. But the way we read scripture, the way that historians or theologians have read the Old Testament is that some of these verses have another context that points to the future of them. And that could be one of them. Allah, I don't know. So verse 11 right before that one. It's, uh, uh, it's another, uh, another reference to a reading. Yeah, and uh, I grieve this, I pray thee, and he says, I cannot pray it is sealed. Mm-hmm. And the he again is the Prophet of Allah. Is it following the same he in both verses? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. So the way we do Haggadah or Tatwil is that context, the immediate context is always secondary. It's always secondary to the typology of the future. So there's immediate context there that might have nothing to do with anything. It might be a historical event that happened in the past. But there might be one verse in the entire story that actually might be a foreshadowing of future events. That's the opinion of that of origin or Matthew or Christian theologian. I mean, I mean reading the Bible is, is, is it's a it's very weak in general because the he and her it's just it's difficult to insert it in every phrase. So is it like that in Greek or in Greek? Yeah, I mean when you read the Greek scriptures, is it is it full of this he and her and um, rallies? You don't know if they're coming from different he's and yeah. two different verses. It's, it's difficult. I mean, the original Greek manuscripts, they're all in caps with no spaces. Yeah. And there's never quotes, there's no periods, there's nothing. It's just it's called script, scriptua continua. Majuscule. And again, all caps, it's going across like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, uh, for instance, in the English Bible, like, it's just the, uh, the translator probably made it kind of biased and capitalized, but. Yeah. So there's like one part, for instance, where uh, where Jesus responds, of course, the Bible does something miraculous, and then Jesus says, like, you are truly the son of uh, the son of God. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, I was kind of curious, and I thought, like, well, if that could be just kind of like you know, truly biased, then it does make sense if he didn't capitalize it. Right. And so I was wondering, so are these letters in the Greek are they capitalized in the Greek? Everything is capitalized in the original Greek manuscript. Mm-hmm. Everything is capitalized. Okay, so there, so that would be a conscious decision when it's written. Oh yeah, it's totally. Written. The, the translator is, a, is treacherous. It's an Italian maxim. The translator is treacherous. So when a translator chooses to put a word in capital letters, obviously he's making a theological statement. The original Greek is all in caps. What's interesting is that the phrase son of God, right? When you say the son of God, it's an immediate Christian signifier, right? But the phrase son of God is actually uh, Jewish in its origin. But people don't know that, right? So, for example, you read, remember Mark 1, 1, Arche tu Evangelio Iesu Christu Heiusei, beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, even though Son of God here is an insertion, right? When you hear the phrase Son of God, you immediately think of Christianity. But if you read, for example, Psalm 82, 6, what does it say? 
It talks about the Bane Elyon. Bane Elyon, which means the sons of the Most High God. What is it talking about? It's talking about honored servants of God. Okay. Prophets of God. Jesus says in John chapter 10, those who receive the messages of God are called gods. So the Old Testament. Right? This is an honorific title. Like the Quran says, Ibadun Bukramun. Allah says this in the Quran. They say Allah has begotten a son. No, they're, they're servants raised to honor. Right? So the Old Testament talks about sons of God. When you say God the Father, so when the Old Testament talks about God, what is the uh, specific word it uses? For what? No, so, so when it mentions that the Son of God? Yes, Son of God is uh, God, right? Uh -huh. the, the word that's used is Elohim, God. Oh. The same word for God. For example, in Numbers, I believe it's Numbers 7, no, Exodus. 7 1, God tells Moses, I will send you as a God unto Pharaoh and Aaron as your prophet. And the word for God here is Elohim, which is the same word for God. So what does that mean? Moses is God? Is, is a God? It means he's a divine. Divine with a lowercase d. What does that mean? It means someone who's holy, someone who's sanctified. That's the meaning of it. These things are extremely. Uh, uh, subtle, and they're meant to be metaphorical in the Old Testament. The sons of the Most High God mean those who receive the messages of God and act upon it in the Old Testament. The Christian literalized it and said Jesus is the Son of God. But Jesus himself, when he teaches people how to pray in, in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, what do we call that when something is in Matthew and Luke but not in Mark? Where's the origin of this? Q, Q source. Good. This is from Q. Remember, Q is written before the Gospels and is concurrent with Paul. So this is very strong. Jesus says here, Avunda Vashmeo, our Father who art in heaven. He's not teaching this to Christians. Who is he speaking to? The Jews. Everyone's Jewish. Right? And this is language that they can understand. Calling God Father in his context, nothing wrong with it. Because nobody says this is literal. It's only when Paul comes around and the Hellenistic Christian who starts saying Jesus is begotten, not made, the literal Son of God, God from God, life from life, this type of thing, the Nicene Creed. That was developed later. But, for example, the phrase God the Father, when you say God the Father, immediately you think of Christianity. Yeah. An immediate Christian signifier. When you read the Old Testament, <coughs> Isaiah 64, 16. There's a prayer in Isaiah 64, 16. And uh, the book of Isaiah is the most monotheistic book in the entire Bible. If you read the book of Isaiah, especially Deutero Isaiah, the middle <laughs> chunk of Isaiah, it basically says that God is unlike anything you can possibly imagine. And the minute you bring God down into the temporal world, you make an idol out of God. Whether it's wood or stone or flesh and blood, that's the definition of idolatry. When you say God dwells in his creation, that's an idol. You've constructed an idol because God is outside of his creation. Sure. Outside transcends his creation. Right? That's the message of Isaiah. Yet in 64, 16, Isaiah prays. He says, Atta Adonai Avinu. You are the Lord, our Father. You are the Lord, our Father. Right? This is Jewish liturgical language. Right? But the Christians have monopolized this type of language <laughs> and claim that this is what Christianity brought, this relationship you have, son, father type of thing. All they did was borrow these terms from the Old Testament and literalize them that God is literally the father of Isa, they said, whatever. Is the father in camp out there and the father is also in camp? Um, what, here I'm trying to look it up. It only goes to 12. Uh, 64, 12. 64, 12? Is that what it says in 64, 12? Um, no, I, I, there's no 64, 16. Really? Yeah, you're getting the... Uh, you know what it is? Is Old Testament yeah. 23 Isaiah? This is what it's. This is the verse in my Hebrew Bible. Sometimes the numbering is off in the English translation. Yeah, it's right here. It's actually, 64 8 in the English translation. So the numbering is a little off in the Hebrew. 
Now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay. Yeah. And thou art our potter. Yeah, and we know all God and the word of thy father. We all are the word of thy His language is totally, it, it's just clear. It's very metaphorical, but right? it's not actually literal. God is a father in the sense that he's your loving cherisher. And that's how Jesus uses it as well. This is like the former, the, the fashion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even the word, but Christ, right? Mashiach, that's a Jewish concept. That's from Judaism. Right? So let's go back to this uh, Passion Week we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I want to point out here. Also, <clears throat> so what happens is Thursday night they have the Last Supper. In Mark and in Matthew, he institutes the New Covenant. This is my, this is my body, this is my blood, so on and so forth, which is shed as a ransom for many, this type of language, which is Pauline Christianity. But Luke Acts rejects it completely, which is very interesting. Um, and then what happens is, uh, so we went to the Temple Mount, we went to the Mount of Olives, right? But the Mount of Olives, and here comes Judas now, with a group of men, and there's a difference of opinion as to who he's bringing with him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics say that he brings temple guards. So the temple of, of the Sanhedrin, this is the high religious court of the Jews. This is the highest religious court of the Jews, called the Sanhedrin. Okay. <clears throat> so today it's also called the Sanhedrin? No, they have the, what's it called? They have the Congress, what's it called? The Knesset or something like that? The yeah. Sanhedrin's gone. This was before the destruction of the temple. Yeah, so what happens is, John says, however, he brings a cohort. And some say that that means he has Roman soldiers with him. <laughs> so we don't know exactly. There are discrepancies in this entire narrative, by the way. All four Gospels say different things. Sometimes it's irreconcilable, especially when we get to the so-called resurrection. It's very different. Right? So historians will look at all these differences and say, none of this is historical. It just, it, all of this would be thrown out of court. Okay. Um, so what happens is Judas says, the one that I kissed, he is Jesus. Right? Which is, again, sort of strange. Because why does he kiss Jesus? What is he trying to do? What is the point of the kiss? He's going to identify him. But he's been in Jerusalem for a week, arguing with people. Right? Why does he need to identify Why does he need to identify him? Exactly. Why does he need to identify him? That's the whole well, that's the Because part. the other, other guy that they ship, yeah, yeah. 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 So Thomas is a disciple, and Thomas in Arabic and in Hebrew means twin. Oh. Okay. <coughs> Why is Thomas called the twin? Maybe he looks exactly like Jesus. That could be it. They wrote a gospel, yeah. But did he really write it? Probably not. It's probably also pseudonymous, but representing Thomas's viewpoint. Yeah. Is that Peter that you said cut off the goose ear? Is that the Peter? Yeah. Saint Peter. Saint Peter. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <coughs> so he kisses him to identify him. They take Jesus. They take him to the Sanhedrin. He, there's a trial. There's a lot of contradiction now between these gospels. What actually happened? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, in Mark, in Mark's gospel, he almost says nothing. He says basically, "Are you the Messiah?" I am, and you shall see the Son of Man seated on the cloud, uh, quoting Daniel chapter 7, and that's basically all he says until the cry of dereliction on the cross. Very, very catchy turn in speech. In John, however, he's giving these theological, philosophical discourses, I mean, taking back with Pontius Pilate and talking about what is the nature of truth and defending himself instead of they, they strike them to get something he says. While you're striking me, if I said evil, then bear witness of the evil. I caught openly in the synagogue. What's going? What are you guys doing? He's really coming to his own aid, right? Mm -hmm. um, in John, yeah. And this narrative here sort of cuts against the grain of what early Christians wanted to say about him. So some of the historians might say this is probably more accurate mm -hmm. that he's defending himself here, yes, because because yeah, because the Christian at this time will say no. Jesus was a lamb led to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth, is what Isaiah says. Mm -hmm. We'll see prophecy. He willingly went his death. Right. So it seems like John has a few things right. He probably did. Whoever this person is, might be a side of them defending himself, or it could be a sort of uh, look-alike, uh, a transfigured Christ. And there's different opinions from Muslim theologians as to what actually happened. Nobody knows for certain. But it seems like the most popular is that the, the 
the, uh, the disciple who betrayed him was transfigured to look like Isa de Salaam. Right? And then Isa de Salaam was uh, carried into heaven by Jibreel Ali Salaam. So they take this man Judas. That's one theory we don't know for certain. There actually is a theory that he was put on the cross but did not die. And that's actually, based on what's happened in the Gospels, that seems like it's likely that's actually what happened if you read the four Gospels, that he just didn't die on the cross. Because sadabuhu means to kill on a cross. <coughs> some, some Muslims will say, how can you say Jesus was put on a cross? Because the Quran says, وَمَا sadabuhu, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا sadabuhu." They did not kill him, nor crucify him. So how can you say that? Well, it depends on your definition of salaba. To crucify someone means that you kill him on a cross. That's what it means. To kill someone on a cross. There's no verb in Arabic to describe someone who's put on a cross and have survived the cross. There's no way to say it in English. Ahmadiyya, he suggested, crucifixed instead of crucified. That's like fiction. Right? He was crucifixed. This is called the swoon theory. He was put on a cross, but he didn't die. And it's actually Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, actually describes an incident when he was passing through a city called Tekoa, where there was a man on the cross who was taken down and he survived. And Jesus was only on the cross, uh, supposedly, for six hours, which is nothing. It takes days to expire on the cross. And there's no way you can check his pulse because, you know, his legs are up here. His feet are probably where your head is. How do you check the pulse? He's not moving. Okay, he's dead. But he might be in a comatose. Or he's just exhausted. You don't know. All right? Anyway, that doesn't seem to be the popular theory. So then... Theologians, Muslim exegetes would say, well, then why does Allah repeat himself here? It's redundant. They didn't kill him in any, uh, in any, in any way, and they didn't kill him on the cross. Why did you just say, well, Some theologians would say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying they didn't kill him at all, by any means, including the crucifixion. They didn't even touch him. Right? That, could be, that could be one interpretation. Or, that they put him on the cross, but he didn't die on the cross. In other words, he's, he's, he's singling out this method of death, crucifixion, especially, because that's what they're saying happened to him. And then the, the Talmud says they stoned him to death. That's what the Talmud says about Isa. They stoned him to death. So he's saying, They didn't kill him in any way. Nor did they crucify him to death. And this is also found in another verse in the Quran regarding the Muharrabeen. What do you do to people who uh, uh, are warmongers? Again, qatala and salaba. Kill them or crucify them. Right? And to kill them on the cross. A especially gruesome punishment. And this is for the Qadi to judge what kind of degenerate person this is. Glad the impaler probably deserves to be crucified. Right? This type of person. <clears throat> anyway, uh, of course they try to blame Vlad, Vlad, Vladi and Taylor on Islam. Oh, he was kidnapped by the Ottomans and he was raped and things like that. And that's why he became crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's crazy. Um, so at this point, uh, and again, there's a lot of discrepancy in the Gospels. But basically, there's a trial at the Sanhedrin. They can't find any witnesses to agree on anything. Okay, so the religious high court failed. The Christian will say, they crucified Christ for blasphemy. He claimed to be God. Why don't they enter it as evidence then? Matthew 14, uh, Mark 14 says, they tried to find evidence that would merit a death sentence, but failed to find any. There's no evidence of blasphemy, of kufur. They couldn't get two witnesses to agree. That's what it says. So what do they do? Where do they take him? Anyone know? What do they do now? I thought this was insurrection. Huh? Not blasphemy, but insurrection. Right, so what do they do at this point? They take him to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and they say to him, this person broke our laws. And he says, so what? What does it have to do with me? Judge him according to the Torah. Then we tried that. He says, I don't want anything to do with you. Says, oh, no, no, he's telling us, don't pay taxes to Caesar. Right? This is what they say to him. And now Pilate says, what are you, what are you saying? Don't pay taxes to Caesar. And of course, Esau and Islam, according to the Gospels, never said that. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Because they tried to trap him at one point. Yes? 
Isn't there a part where he tries to tell Peter to, uh, to go fishing and take the fish and then take the point out of the top and then get paid for that? Right, exactly. Exactly. <coughs> yeah, so this is a, an out and out lie, what they're saying about Esau. Esau. But they want to get rid of him some way. The best way to do it with the Romans is this person is making sedition. He's a king, and they say Caesar is our king. That's what the rabbis, the Pharisees, tell Pilate. He's claiming to be the king of Israel. So Pilate, uh, Pilate interrogates him. He says, I don't find any fault in this man at all. So he finds no fault. And then what happens here is, uh, according to Luke, they take him to who? Herod Antipas. And this is the only gospel that mentions Herod. And Herod and, uh, in, interrogates him. Right? Herod Antipas. Because Luke is trying to aggrandize Jesus, right? He's trying to make it a very big deal. And he's also trying to show that Roman puppets are innocent. If they're Jews and they're puppets of Rome, those are innocent. It's these Pharisees, these religious Jews that are rebel rousers. Um, but then again, there's a lot of difference of opinion, actually, what happens to the four Gospels. Anyway, they find him guilty of treason because the crowd is shouting, crucify him, crucify him. He spends the night in jail, and then Friday is the crucifixion. <coughs> It's called Good Friday, which is tomorrow. Good Friday. And according to <clears throat> Mark, he's <clears throat> put on a cross at 3, uh, 9 a.m. on Good Friday. And by 3, he's dead, apparently. So how many hours is that? Six hours. Okay? So when this news was brought to Pilate, it says, Pilate marveled. What's so marveling about this? What's so surprising about this? Is Pilate made a career out of crucifying Jews. He's crucified literally thousands of Jews. And he knew what happened, and there's a lot of embellishment. He watched like a movie like The Passion of the Christ. Right? You have these Roman soldiers who are like these drunk Neanderthals. They're completely historically inaccurate. Right? Flogging someone was done as chastisement. Right? To punish someone, not to kill someone. They don't flog someone until their bowels are hanging out of his back, as according to Josh McDowell, a Christian apologist. That's not what they did. Right? You give them a few lashes and you release them. If that even happens. Right? So Pilate, he marvels. How can this man be dead already? Right? It, was, it was something that was very surprising, surprising to him. So then what happens is, at 3 p.m., uh, According to Matthew, yes? How did he know this? That's what Mark says. Well, he says, uh, so like 9 a.m. would be the ninth hour. Because so the ninth hour, um, I, think he, I think he reckons the day from, from 12. And yeah, he says something like that, but this is the translation. He translates the nine to the Yeah, he mentions the hour, definitely, yeah. Yeah. So then, according to Matthew, at this point, there's a earthquake, there's an eclipse, there's a thunderstorm, the sky's darkened. So what happens now? What Saturday? What day is that? For the Jews, every Saturday is Sabbath. You almost sucked. It's a Sabbath. And you can't have a man hanging on a cross on the Sabbath because that's a defilement to the land, and it's already Mumbada time at 3 o'clock. Right? So this is seen as a Mordiza. So what they do is they have to take them quickly off the cross. And then in John, it actually says that the other two crossmates are still alive. It's only been six hours. They're still alive. So what they have to do is they have to take a, uh, a club and break their legs while they're on the cross. So they have to break, why do they have to break their legs? The, veneer, the, the Romans, they uh, perfected the art of crucifixion. So you're hanging on a cross, you're stuck in an inhale position. In order to get a breath out, you have to push up with your legs. You have to do like these calf raises. And you have to do this for days. You can imagine your legs are on fire. You can barely breathe, and that's how you die. It's either from exposure or ex asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. And while this is going on, people are throwing things at you. The birds have plucked out your eyes, right? Uh, your, your skin is on fire, right, because you're being exposed. Um, and you break the legs. You can't push. So you immediately suffocate. But then it says in John that they saw that Jesus was already dead, not by checking his pulse or anything. They just said he's dead. Okay. So we'll get to these passion narratives at a later time. But it's really interesting 
So then he's put into a tomb. Now at this point, there's a lot of contradictions in the gospel narrative. So on Sunday, okay, Mark says, so this is according to Mark, 16, that two Marys, Mary Magdalene, and possibly Mary the mother of Jesus, the two Marys, and a woman named Salome, they come to the tomb for what? what is, what's the purpose of going to Mark? And don't forget that Jesus was supposed, supposedly put into this huge chamber, and there's this huge boulder that they rolled in front of it. And apparently there's temple guards guarding the tomb as well. Okay? So these women come to the tomb to what? To anoint the body of Jesus. Which is very strange. How are these women planning on gaining access to the body of Jesus? Who's going to roll the stone away? Are they going to bribe the temple guard that's guarding? I mean, it's it, 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 incoherent. What's going on here? What do you mean they're going to anoint the body? Is this a Jewish custom? That three days later, you would anoint a dead body? No, it's actually haram to touch a dead body after three days, according to Jewish halakha law. Haram. It's haram for a man to touch a man's body, let alone these women touching a man's body. Totally haram. What are they doing? Why are they coming to this tomb? Nobody really knows. I saw a debate between Ehrman and William Lane Craig, who's a very good philosopher when it comes to the Kalam cosmological argument. When it comes to his Christianity, he sort of falters. He was pushed hard on this. And said, Why did the women come to the tomb? Said, I don't know. I have no idea. To anoint the body of Jesus, that doesn't make any sense. And Mark is the only one that says that. Matthew and Luke do not mention that they came to anoint the body of Jesus. They just say they came to see the tomb. What's the meaning of anoint? To, to put oil on his body. To give him a proper burial, apparently. To prepare the body. To prepare the body. Mm-hmm. Because they had to hurry, hurriedly take it down. The approaching Sabbath, you can't touch dead bodies on a Sabbath. Put it in the tomb, we'll do it later. This type of thing. But how are these women going to get to the body? Right? And why is one good find you and protect you? Because they die for your sins. No. It's a good day, apparently. You know, Pontius Pilate in the Ethiopian church is a saint. He's a saint, Pontius Pilate. Why? Because he was the means by which Jesus was killed. So he helped. He helped. The, he was a vital part of the salvation of humanity. By the same token, that Judas Iscariot, who was called Satan by Jesus, he should also be a saint. It wasn't for him to be done redemption of humanity. But I don't think any church has uh, given a sainthood to Judas Iscariot. Uh, do you guys believe that Jesus died for everybody's sin, all of humanity, or just Satan? All of humanity. Oh, it says when they get there, the stone is rolled away. There are no guards. Which gospel is that? Uh, Mark. Right. So Mark, in Mark, in Mark, the guards are not mentioned. The stone's already been rolled away. Right. Okay. And they see a young man sitting there on the right side, it says. And it says, Jesus is not here. He's in Galilee. Or go to Galilee. And then they run away. They tell, they don't say anything to anyone, and they run away afraid. And that's the real end of the gospel. According to the earliest canonical gospel, no one sees a resurrected Jesus. Verses 9 through 20 are a later edition. Okay. The last verse of the gospel of Mark is 16, 8. 8. No one sees a resurrected Jesus. Now here's something interesting. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about Jesus' resurrected body. And this is really interesting. This is what he says about a resurrected body. He says there is a <clears throat> he says there's a physical body and a spiritual body. Okay? And if you want more information on this, the same scholar, uh, Martin, Dale Martin, he wrote a book called The Corinthian Body, where he analyzes what is called pneumatology, what is called the concept of uh, the, the spirit or the soul. But what we can get from Mark 15. I'm sorry, from 1 Corinthians 15, is that Paul believes that resurrected bodies become spiritualized. Okay? Resurrected bodies become spiritualized. What does that mean? 
Is that no, means flesh and, flesh and blood. It's this world. Yeah. The flesh and blood body transforms into a spiritual body. It's the same body, but it becomes spiritualized. So you have a somatic body. Somatic body, which is a physical flesh and blood body. And the pneuma is the soul. And somehow the pneuma, which is matter, it's substance, it's creation. It's something physical, but it's very, it's very rarefied, right? It's very subtle. Somehow it's attached to the soma, the body. You have a body, there's a ruh in your body, right? It's in your body, but you can't pinpoint it somewhere. One of the scholars said it's like the rose water in the rose, right? That's the relationship between the ruh and the badan. Okay, so that's, that's fine. But then Paul says, when the body is resurrected, this somatic body becomes a pneumatic body. Which means the body becomes purely spiritualized, incorruptible. The somatic body needs food, drink, and is subject to death. The pneumatic body needs no food, no drink, and is spiritually oriented and cannot die again. Okay? This is Paul's pneumatology. So the somatic body is not left behind or is left behind? That's the whole question. To rot. Here's the question. No, the somatic body, yeah, it's left behind to rot, but then it's reassembled and made spiritual. Like, poof, now it's pneumatic. It's purely spiritual. Right? Made incorruptible. And this is called Paul's... Uh, this is, this is Paul's... Yeah, this is Paul's concept of a resurrected body. And 1 Corinthians 15, you can read about it here. Paul is the first author of the New Testament. Paul did not read any of the Gospels. They were written after his time. So here's my question, though. Why does a stone need to be ruled away? It needs a pneumatic body. Pass the stone. Exactly. What's the purpose of the stone being moved away? If he's in the tomb and he's a pneumatic body, he can just show up somewhere and say, beam into a room, and say, here I am. Right? I've been resurrected. So Paul doesn't know about the empty tomb. It's not important for him. This is a later development that the gospel writers wanted to write in order to kind of prove that Jesus was resurrected. Okay? Now, if you read Luke, Luke 24, what happens when Jesus comes to the upper room? What does he do? How does he prove who he is? Does he sort of disappear and reappear? How does he prove he's resurrected? He's resurrected. He takes a piece of fish and he eats it. Is this proof that you're resurrected? No, because then you're in a somatic body. So what happens? That means he's alive. He didn't die, apparently. That's what that proves, that he's still alive. Because Paul says you're in a nomadic body. Now, somebody might argue, but when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, is he a pneumatic body? No, he's in a somatic body still. Right? However, Paul says Jesus' resurrection is the same type of resurrection that we all have on the Yom, Yom Kiyama. This is a different resurrection. This is called a doomsday resurrection. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Jesus raised Lazarus back into his somatic body. And then Lazarus died again. He died twice. Which is a contradiction, by the way. Hebrews 9.27, which penned by Paul, says, Appointed unto every man is to taste death, taste death once. Period. Once. So there's an internal contradiction. We won't go there. Right? So there's a difference. But it doesn't say It doesn't say right? It's got every it will say But Paul mentions once. So you see what happened to Lazarus then? Was Lazarus resurrected into a pneumatic body? If the Christian says yes, then say then why does Paul why does Paul say Jesus is the first one to be resurrected like this? Again an internal contradiction. Let me start over. First Corinthians fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen. Paul says, Jesus was the first one to be raised, as all of us are going to be raised on the day of judgment. The first fruits of resurrection, he calls them. What does that mean? That his physical body will be healed and spiritualized and made incorruptible. 
It's like a poop, and then he's a spirit. It's the same body, but transformed into spiritual, a spiritualized body, where it cannot die, does not take food, does not take drink, right? Can be in and out of rooms, can appear in here and then in China, in the back here, right? This type of body. Okay? Um, but Luke 24 says that when Jesus comes to the upper room after the so-called crucifixion, he eats fish in a honeycomb to prove what? That he's a pneumatic body that's been resurrected according to like what Paul says? Yes? I mean, is that an alternative theory? The alternative theory is he was resurrected as a somatic body, but then that contradicts what Paul says about him as a body. So that's a contradiction in Christianity. And Christians that are clever won't say that because they know what Paul says. You might catch an unaware Christian and say, yeah, it was a somatic body. So you can say to that Christian then, if the Pharisees saw Jesus, they can kill him again? They don't. Why not? Well, yeah. If he's resurrected into a somatic body, and he's subject to death and pain and hunger, they can kill him again, which is very interesting. Because Luke 24 also says, what? That Jesus, he walks with two of his disciples, and they walk seven miles with two of his disciples, and they don't recognize him. Why not? How can you not recognize him? No. He's in disguise. In John chapter 20, we haven't gotten to John, Mary Magdalene is at the tomb, the empty tomb, and she looks behind her and she sees the gardener. You know who the gardener is? Jesus. Why did Jesus look like a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Why does he, why does he look like he's got a shawl around him like this, probably? And she can tell from his voice, this is Jesus. But she can't tell from appearance. Why? Because he's, he's, he's in disguise. He survived the crucifixion, and if Jewish legal authorities see him, or was spotted by Roman legionnaires, they're going to kill him on the spot. This is the only plausible, right? Uh, the only plausible explanation, or else he has internal contradictions everywhere. So you're saying the only plausible explanation is that he was so that he would be resurrected? That he never died. That he never died. He never died. He doesn't die twice. That, that he was put on a cross for a few hours. John actually says two secret disciples took him off the cross. John is the only one to mention that. And then, is that in John 20? I think it's in 19, yeah. The Passion Arrow of John. So here's, here's what happens in, in Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew 28, uh, it's the two Marys. No Salome for some reason. Two, two ladies. They go and they see an angel actually move the stone back. Okay? They move the stone back. They look in the tomb and it's empty. You see what happened here? What does that mean? That means Jesus did come out of the tomb with the stone was closed. Mm -hmm. So now Matthew is fixing a problem. You see what he's fixing? In Mark, it seems like the tomb has to be open for Jesus to exit, mm -hmm. or else he can't exit yeah. because apparently he's still in a somatic body. Oh, okay. But in Matthew, Matthew says, wait a minute. No, no. Paul said that resurrected bodies are spiritualized. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the women go, and there's an earthquake again, and then an angel descends and moves the stone, and it's empty. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and that kind of resolves this internal conflict. Yeah. Right. right. So then what, what happens here? Then these women are afraid, and they go and they see Jesus on the road, right? He's walking on the road. He's going to Galilee. Okay? He tells the two women, go tell my disciples I'll meet them in Galilee. Why? Why Galilee? Why didn't he meet us here? Because, because it's, it's, it's very dangerous. <laughs> I can't go back to the upper room. These people, Caiaphas and this guy, this high priest, and these Sadducees are going to see me. I'm dead. So he says, well, go back to Galilee. So they go back to Galilee. They spend some time with Jesus. And then that's it. There's no ascension in Matthew. It just ends. Then what happens? Then that's it. That's it. You believe what you want to believe now. Yeah. 
Uh, two Mary, one is the mother and two is the other. Lady. Mary Magdalene. What is her? Uh, Maybe his wife. Possibly his wife. But the disciple, the sister of Lazarus. What happened to Luke? Luke 24, five women at least go to the tomb. So, all four Gospels, who goes to the tomb, what they see, what they do, it's all different. All of this is we thrown out of court in the court of law. If you want to prove the resurrection, you take testimony, all of these contradictions, what are you talking about? What are people talking about? Get out of here, my courtroom. Five women go to the tomb in Luke. They go there, and again, they, what does it say? I think the, the stone has already been moved back. It's already been moved back. Right? And they see two people sitting in the tomb in shining garments. And they say, Jesus, is, he's alive. Right? Which, is, which is also interesting. Like it says in the Gospel of John, the angel tells Mary Magdalene, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? The living, he's alive. He's not dead. He's never died. So then, uh, in Luke, the women run away, they're afraid, and now Jesus comes to two of his disciples. They walk seven miles together. They don't recognize them. And then he takes them to Bethany, and then he ascends from Bethany. He never goes to Galilee. Again, contradiction. All of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and Luke appear in Jerusalem, or in the suburbs of Jerusalem. Because remember, Jerusalem is the, the, the great stage of the Gospel of Luke. That's one of its themes. Right? John 20, it says that Jesus was actually crucified uh, and actually they had uh, crucified on Thursday, not Friday. There's another contradiction. So the meal he had on Friday night was actually on Thursday night, so that wasn't even a Passover meal. All he did was wash his disciples' feet. That's what John says. Why is John saying this? Maybe because there is a tradition from Q. Matthew is a reference for you. Matthew and Luke both quote this statement of Christ, where he says, um, when the Jews come to him and they give us a sign, says, no sign will be given unto you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, this is from Q. So this is very early material. What does that mean? As Jonah was, so shall I be. What happened to Jonah? Jonah goes out, he goes to Nineveh, he leaves the city, he tries to take a boat from Tarshish to Joppa. He gets in the boat, there is a massive tempest, right? There's a storm in the ocean, and they draw lots, and it falls against him, and then he admits to the people that, I disobeyed my Lord, I was uh, impatient. However, it says it's actually, I'm quoting the, the biblical story, by the way, not with the Quran, but this is the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. So, they say, he says, throw me overboard. And say, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to keep rolling, don't worry about it. He says, throw me overboard or we're all going to die. So then he willingly is thrown over. He has no problem with it. So then it subsides. right? And then the men are rolling away from him. He doesn't have a life jacket. And he's a prophet, so he's probably strong. But, you know, it's still the ocean, the open water. So they see him swimming. They're like, oh, maybe, he, maybe he's cool. And then they see a whale coming over. Okay, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead, right? right? Would you doubt that? He says, oh, he's, he's, he's okay. He's dead. And they don't know he's a prophet. Right? This is some stranger in Israelite. The men are pagans, by the way. So do I have Eunice at this time? Yeah, Eunice. So then, let's say one of these men, three days later, he's walking around Nineveh on some business. He's like, yeah, how much are those days? What? <laughs> Here comes Eunice, right? <laughs> what are you going to say? He's a ghost. You're a ghost. Right? Mm -hmm. So in Luke 24... When Jesus enters the upper room, it says the disciples were afraid because they thought they had seen a spirit. Right? Mm. They thought they had seen what? This. A pneumatic body. That's what they thought. 
But Jesus corrects their understanding by doing what? By beaming in and out? No. What does he do? Does he, does he fly around the room? He eats a piece of fish to prove what? That he's in, the same, he's in the same body. Nothing happened to him, just like Jonah. Because he says, as Jonah was, how was Jonah, dead or alive? Alive. alive. So shall the Son of Man be. This is your sign, he tells them. This is your sign. That you're going to think you killed me. You're going to think you killed me and entombed me, but I'm not going to die. <coughs> That's in two. I think it's in Matthew 11 or 12 and Luke 11 or 12. We can check it ourselves. So the fish, eating of the fish, is, is probably from Q source? Because it's the two. The eating of the fish is actually from Luke and material, L. Okay. Yeah. The, the sign of Jonah is from Q. The sign of Jonah, when Jesus tells that to the Pharisees, that's from Q. So it's not in Mark, but it's very early. The question is, what is the sign of Jonah? That he simply, you know, goes into a cave for three days? No, it's oh, people days. expected Jonah to be dead, but then he's still alive. So I, I say there's three types of resurrections in the New Testament. Three types. There's a somatic resurrection, like Lazarus, and I've brought him to Iznilla, and he's back, he's in the same body, you can kill him again. There's a pneumatic resurrection, which is what Paul says Jesus is, what's going to happen to all of us on Yom al we believe that, that our physical body will be reconstructed. The Murtazilite actually says that our body is not re restored, the ruler is, is taken from our body, and that's what stands judgment. This is a deviant belief. This is what the Neoplatonist says. This is what the Muslim philosophers and Al Farabi and Ibn Sina said as well, and this is considered a deviant position. So the Mark says that. Okay? And then there's a third type of resurrection, which is called the Jonas resurrection. And it's not really a resurrection. It means that you believe someone to have died, and then you see them later thinking that they have died and have been resurrected, but in reality, they had never died in the first place. What we have with Jesus is a Jonas resurrection. What we have with Lazarus is a somatic resurrection. And what we have with everyone on the Day of Judgment is a pneumatic resurrection. Um, what is grounded in That's a Quranic belief is exactly exactly that. The Sorry. About who? Are you talking about? Yeah. The, the dominant opinion is that Isa al was never killed. Right. It's Jonah. It's Jonah. It's Jonah's resurrection. Okay. Yeah. So this is how we explain. Why did so a Christian will ask a Muslim, how do you explain Jesus appearing alive to so many people after the crucifixion? He never died. It's very simple. Occam's razor, right? You heard of Occam's razor? The simplest answer is you should throw. Why do you have to say, as a man God, he vicariously died for your sins, he entombed himself, and then he raised himself from the dead, and that, what are you talking about? Okay, that's possible, but why do you stop at the Muslim who says he wasn't crucified in the first place when you believe that a man God resurrected himself from the dead by commending his own spirit into his own hands and the forsaking himself? You, you can believe that if you want, but it's badly contrived. And it's full of internal contradictions. So you can actually, you can actually get a Christian in a paradox here. You can ask him, how was Jesus' body when he was resurrected? How was he? Right? He said he was resurrected, he had, a, he had a spiritual body. But that's what the disciples thought that he teach to disprove them. So uh, he had a physical body. So you can kill him again? No. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing. What would be the problem if they said, yeah, again? You can kill him again. Then Paul is wrong. Again, like, yes. Yeah, like, Paul is wrong. Then let's get rid of 1 Corinthians. If Paul made a mistake, are they going to get rid of Paul? Never. If they're Protestants or Catholics or Eastern Orthodox. What, what, what all does Paul write? Huh? What all does Paul write? He writes 14 of the 27 books. Of the New Testament. Of the New Testament. So everything besides the the, the Canonical Gospels? The so there's four Gospels in the book of Acts. Yeah, I'm writing also John and Acts, which is Luke. Mm -hmm. Then there's 14 letters of Paul. He writes the different Christian communities that he's founded. 
19. So 14 plus 5? Yeah, and then 19. 19, right? And then there's a book of Revelation at the end, which is an apocalypse. That's 20. John of Patmos, a different John on the island. Okay. And then there's seven epistles written by Peter and John, James and Jude. Same John? These are all different, and these are all pseudonymous. Peter didn't write these. James didn't write it. Not, not the Peter that this, the year Peter though. No. That's what they claim. But no scholar believes that. Because that book was like first Peter was written in one twenty five. So Peter's hundred and twenty five years old. And he's like, Okay, let's get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Traditionally Christians believe that, but no real scholar, no credible scholar believes that. But at the time they used to live longer, right? Not that time. No, that, 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 by forty years old in Galilee you're dead. 40 years old. By 30, 30 years old, your grandfather. So like Dale Martin, right, who's a Trinitarian Christian, they ask him, why are you Christian? Because he, he totally negates all of these, all, you know, Christian theology and whatnot. He says, it's a miracle, I just believe. I didn't believe it. I can't, I don't know why. I didn't believe it. He said, I consider it a gift from God. But I can't give you any evidence that's strong. So Luke, uh, as a teacher, I guess, out and he's watching the artist. In Luke, how does he pass away? In Luke, what happens? Uh, how does he he ascends in Bethany? In Bethany, Bethany is a few miles from Jerusalem. He and never goes to Galilee. So he's seven miles, and then he's he, yeah, he's, 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 right he's, he's going to place up in Mount, in Mount, seven miles from Jerusalem. He walks an entire distance with two of his disciples. Don't recognize. Don't recognize. Him. Don't recognize him. Then he breaks the bread, and they recognize him. By the way, he breaks bread. There's a certain way he used to break the bread. Of him. But he's in this guy like this. And then he leaves, right? And then later he comes and says, follow me. And he takes us to Bethany. And then he ascends from Bethany. He never goes to Galilee. So he's just never seen again. He's never seen again. Paul claims, however, and we'll read about Paul in the book of Galatians, that three years later, he, re he appeared to Paul. <coughs> As a pneumatic body. Yeah. And what he tells Paul is very interesting. And then who is Paul? And what is his relationship <coughs> with the true disciple? It's very bad. Very bad relationship. There are writings outside the New Testament that very clearly call Paul an apostate, the enemy of the apostles. This is someone who tried to destroy the early Christian movement, and I'm using Christian loosely, the early movement, the early Jesus movement. He tried to destroy it by killing Christians. It didn't work, so he decided to be a CIA agent. And infiltrate the group and sow corruption. And man, did it work. Oh, yeah. Be a honey. So he's the Roman informant. So, so if they, the second coming of these others, why don't they think that that resurrection was the second coming? Why do they have a third coming in? Or, or? No, the second coming is actually, you know, it, there's not a lot of evidence for the second coming. Remember, I talked about. Nobody takes this as a second coming. Nobody believes this as a second coming. Remember I thought about Jesus talked about the Son of Man to come in the future? Yeah. You know, historians actually put more weight on those verses because they cut against the grain. They swim against the tide of what early Christians wanted to say about Jesus. So they say those are actually more historically accurate. That Jesus actually predicts someone to come in the future, what he calls the Bach and Nash, who destroys idolatry and universalizes the kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth. And he mentions this over and over and over again in all the Gospels, the Son of Man, the apocalyptic Son of Man. And in Daniel chapter 7, it says the Son of Man will come to the temple and ascend unto the Atik Yomeya, a name for God. And then he'll be given Dean, which is the word used in Aramaic. And then he will come back to earth and he will destroy the idolatrous kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Probably the Bible says that. This Merat, who come to the temple, he'll ascend. So the given dean, right? The essential creed was given beyond the Sadullah to the The essence of the dean, the Khawatim al Bakara, was given uh, beyond the Sadullah to the So he had the low tree. And then when he came back, he goes to Medina, and these empires, Greco Roman Empire, the Persian, and these all fall. This is the Prophet is the apocalyptic son of man that Isa is prophesizing. What was this? One? This is all over the gospel. <laughs> Go to uh, blueletterbible.org, put in Son of Man into the database, and just read what it says about Son of Man. Blueletterbible.org. Son of Man. Son of Man. 
Son of man can either mean simply a prophet, okay, like Ezekiel in his book, he refers to himself as the son of man many, many times. It just means prophet. But the son of man that Jesus is talking about to come in the future, this is the son of man of the book of Daniel 7. The book of Daniel is also an apocalypse. It's Daniel has a vision of the future of someone called the son of man. And it's, it's different in the original language. Ezekiel, son of man, is called Ben Adam. Ben Adam, which means a prophet. But here, Bar Enash, Bar Enash, Ibn Nas, the son of humanity, which could mean that this person is a universal prophet. Bar Enash means the son of humanity. Right? This son of man is very different than Ezekiel, son of man. This son of man is exceedingly powerful on the earth. He ascends unto God. He descends. He destroys idolatry all over the earth. <coughs> okay? Jesus actually says somewhere in the Gospels, I have to get to the, uh, the, the citation. He says, Just as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He comes like lightning. What does that mean? So he comes to the temple. Uh, like light. Uh, uh, so he's on the Barak, which is from the root Barak, which means lightning. So suddenly to his temple. Okay. So just read these. these uh, well, are we going to give that? Just the yeah. prophecies of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Later on. I hope so. Where in the Bible does it say the Bible? Ahmad? Yeah. Uh, Ahmad would have been in the New Testament, but the New Testament is Greek. So it's not in the New Testament. Yeah, so it's uh, the the problem here is the language. Isa mm -hmm. did not say Ahmad in Greek. Now there is in John 16, 7, he talks about something called Paraclete. Yeah, so Paraclete is mentioned a few times in the Gospel of John. And this is the word in Greek. Para is a preposition which means to be next to. And kletos is from kaleo, which means to call. That's where the English word call comes from, kaleo. So this is someone you call to be next to you when you're in trouble. So like your advocate, your counselor, your lawyer. You can translate as a lawyer, right? Your intercessor. So there's a definite article, which means that this is a title. It's not even a name. We don't know the name of the paraclete that Isai Desiraf says that he's going to come after him and teach Humanity, all truth. And he's probably calling him Paraclete uh, because this is his Muqam in the afterlife. The Prophet says his name on the day of judgment is Ahmad. Right? His name in this world is Muhammad. So but on the day of judgment, he's referred to as Ahmad. He says, I'm going to the hadith. He says, Ithabu ila Ahmad. Go to Ahmad. To make Shafa'a. Shafa'a, right? So he's the Paraclete. He's the intercessor. That's the best we can do with Ahmad in the New Testament. Again, the fault of the test of the New Testament is that it's in Greek, it's not in Syriac. He's also going to see the Bible. That's in the Old Testament. That's in the Song of Psalms. The name of the Prophet Sallam as Muhammad appears in Psalm, Song of Songs 5.16 where there's an echo of his name and there's a description given of him there. We'll talk about that. Next time we follow. Let's go back to uh, the leaf cropped over. I think we're good. Okay. 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 So then what are the what are the sources of Luke's gospel? There's three sources, principal sources. Mm -hmm. Mark, Mark, you and the Timothy. Good. Luke, most of it Mark. We have Q and then we have L. Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar. Allah, Akbar, Allah. I shall know 
narrative in Q. That means whatever Luke and Matthew mention about the death of Jesus, they either took from Mark or it's from their own special source. It's nowhere in Q. Uh, Luke in material here is really interesting. You mean Matthew and John is here in Matthew? No, Matthew and Luke. John is in Q. Yeah. So here Luke is primarily chapters 9 through 19. This is called the travel narrative. And I think some of the beautiful teaching of Ifa and Isana is preserved in this travel narrative. And it really uh, is uh, uh, indicative of Luke's Christology as far as his rejection of Jesus as the Which book? 9 through 19? Chapters 9 through 19 of Luke. Why is it called the travel narrative? Because this is actually the, what Jesus is saying while they're walking from Galilee into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. This is what he's teaching his disciples while walking. Yeah. But one of the things he mentions is the Good Samaritan. Have you heard of this? Like if you, oops, if you're on the toll, um, 
if you're at the bridge and you pay for someone behind you, you tell that guy to get married to someone. Have you ever heard this before? Mm -hmm. So this is a parable. It's in, uh, it's in Luke chapter 10. It's a pericope in Luke chapter 10. So this is part of the travel narrative. What is the point of the Good Samaritan? The point of the Good Samaritan is to show the universality of the message of Esau de Islam, that there's a cosmopolitan aspect to it. So what happens? A man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Thieves fall upon him. They strip him, make him take everything, and they leave him on the side of the road, half naked. And then a Levite sees him and crosses the street. And then a priest sees him, who's also a Levite, but that's what it says, and crosses the street. And then a Samaritan. Why is Samaritan so scandalous for Jesus? He's not the Jews. Yeah. The Jews at the time of Jesus consider the Samaritans to be sort of these pseudo half mutt breeds that are not really Jewish. They're imposters. So when the Jews returned from Babylon in 515 before the Common Era, the Jews that were not taken into captivity, they had interbred with some of the pagans, and the fruits of their interbreeding are called the Samaritans. And they actually have their own version of the Torah. And they rejected the prophets and the writings. And they have their own sacred mountain called Mount Carmel. So they were seen as heretics, right? But Jesus is now giving you a parable of a good Samaritan. So when the disciples heard this initially, of course, they were shocked by it. We'll talk more about this in the John. They shouldn't have direct recourse like Sahih Bukhari or Muslim. It's dangerous for a lay Muslim to go to a hadith and derive legal rulings for himself. You can have them in your house with barakah, but don't use them to make, you know, to derive ahkam for yourself. It's very dangerous. There might be 40 or 50 hadith on one issue, and some of them contradict the other. Some of them might uh, abrogate the other ones. So when it comes to hadith, we have to be very, very careful. So this hadith is very commonly attacked. So one of my teachers from overseas, Habib Ali Jafri, when he was asked about this hadith, I've been ordered to fight the people. He said, well, you have to learn Arabic because the Prophet said them. He uses a third verbal form, which is is different than and nas. So we have to learn Arabic, and I highly, highly encourage people. First, we just started Arabic class on Tuesday night, if you're interested. We just had one class, and it was really introduction. So if you're interested, here at 6.30 on Tuesday, intro to Arabic. 6.30 right here, Tuesday nights. That was my plug for my Arabic class, inshallah. But the first level of tafsir of Quran and hadith is looking at Arabic. And the third form is what? What's the, uh, what's the wisdom of the third form? What's the difference between fa'ala and fa'ala? Everybody know? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Associative form. Right. So it's two sides engaging in something. Right? Like the word for uh, murder is qatlun. That's the first form. But qital, the third form, must have means a battle between two sides. Right? So the Prophet says, is basically saying, according to the Muhaddithin, that have been ordered to defend the community. Right? And there's nothing wrong with self-defense. Now, above and beyond that, umirtu an uqatila nas, an nas, there's a definite article here. Right? He didn't say, umirtu an uqatila nasan, or something like that. It's definite. So the definite article is alif lam, right? So there's ta'rif of nas, and nas. What does a definite article mean in Arabic? It could mean all of humanity. Specific, right? I've been ordered to fight all of humanity, but no one takes it like that, except less than 1% of 1% of grammarians. The vast, vast dominant opinion is that it's Tafsis, it's specific, it's mu'ayyan, a group of people that's already known at the time. Interestingly, this hadith in Nasa'i says, Umirtu al uqatil al mushrikeen. You see? Al-Nas has been replaced by al mushrikeen. What is the context of the hadith? 
Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, al-Hafid Ibn Hajar, who's memorized over 100,000 hadith, says this statement was made by the Prophet Sallallahu during the Battle of Khandaq and only applies to the Mushrikeen who are attacking Medina at the time. So the meaning greatly changes when you know the siyaq, when you know the context of the hadith. So we'll get into some of these issues as well. Biblical criticism. Establishing the actual text of the New Testament. What was written by the autograph author? Autograph means the original author. Right? So you have the Gospel of John, for example, which is the fourth gospel. We'll talk about John's gospel. Very interesting Gnostic gospel. I would consider it a Gnostic gospel. A gospel about Ma'rifa of Isa alayhi salam. You know, there's there's things written in John's gospel that many scholars don't believe are authentic at all. You ever, maybe you've seen some Jesus movies in the past, but almost every Jesus movie has this scene. There's a woman who's caught in adultery, and she's being chased by a bunch of bearded men with poofies on, right? and they're throwing stones at her. She's running, she's running, oh, she sees Jesus, she falls down at his feet, right? And then Jesus, he gets down on the ground, it says, and he writes something in the sand. And nobody knows what he wrote. It doesn't say. But then he stands up and he says, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Right? You've heard this before. Mm-hmm. It's in almost every Jesus movie. What is the implication of that statement? The implication here is very Pauline. Pauline means inspired by Paul's gospel. Paul is someone extraordinary that we're going to learn about. Really amazing human being. Really, really amazing. Probably a big shape on him. <laughs> really, I mean, the power of one person, I mean, he epitomizes that. Someone who has high himma for bottom can do a lot of damage. Right? So Paul's whole idea is antinomian. You ever heard this term? Antinomian. Anti-nomos. This is a Greek word, nomos, namus in Arabic, which means sharia, anti-sharia. He's against the sharia. There's no sharia. This is Paul's stance. You can eat what you want, you can drink whatever you want. Nothing's compulsory upon you. It's a good idea to follow the Ten Commandments. There's nothing compelling you to do that. You have a guarantee of paradise. When you have a guarantee of paradise, Muslims have a guarantee of paradise. A Muslim, not a specific Muslim, Right? The Prophet says, man, man qala la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah bisiq, bisiqin dakhala jannah. Whoever says la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah with sincerity will enter paradise. A Muslim, does it say, Ali bin San Ramon, sayyakulu la ilaha illallah, wa huwa yakulu jannah. I don't have a personal guarantee. My name is not in the hadith. In other words, your name is not in the hadith. But a Muslim who falls under that category will go to Jannah, inshallah. But the Christian believes, the vast majority of Christians believe, and they're inspired by Paul, that they have a guarantee to Jannah, which of course leads to irresponsible action. Anyway, this story, right? Whoever is with sin cast the first stone. Every single scholar of the New Testament says this story is a fabrication. It never happened. It never happened. <clears throat> it's called the Pericope, Pericope Adulterae. And we'll learn about this one, the Gospel of John. But it was added much later. And if you look at critical editions of the Greek New Testament, right, this is the actual New Testament. This here is what they feed to the laity. This is the English trans- New King James Version, right? This is very different than this. This is cutting-edge scholarship. It keeps getting updated because they keep finding new manuscripts. This happens every year. There's 27 editions of the Nestle Allen Critical Greek Edition. 27 editions because they keep finding new manuscripts and they keep changing their mind. They actually give a letter grade to changes that they make. Um, So the Greek New Testament, the original New Testament, original language of the New Testament, 
is an eclectic text. You know what this means, eclectic? It means, yeah, it means that it's an amalgamation of several thousand different manuscripts that are brought under one text. Because textual critics of the New Testament, they have to make a decision when they find a hundred different versions of the same story. Which one is the most authentic? They pick that. And then they read another story, and there's 200 different versions of it. Which one of these is the most authentic? So they, they extract that story. So this is supposed to be the most authentic of the most authentic. And if you read John chapter 8, where that story is supposed to be, it's in double brackets. Right? The, the, the story is there, but it's in double brackets. And if you read the introduction, what do the double brackets actually mean? It says, brackets enclose passages which are regarded by the editors as later additions to the text, but which are quite evident, but which are of evident antiquity and importance. What you're really trying to say is, this is what people believe, and it's popular. So we're going to go ahead and include the story, but to let you know that we don't really believe it's authentic, we're going to put it in brackets. But it really shouldn't be there. You find hundreds of examples like this. Some are extremely interesting. One question get into one right now. Maybe we'll save one for later. <clears throat> We're also going to be looking at and Allahu Alam, prophecies of the Prophet, sallallahu translated as big, wide eyed maidens of paradise. Right? He says if you put the dots in different places, and Irshad Manji actually mentions this in an interview, right? And she said it's actually from a hadith, but it's actually in the Quran. And then she quoted the Quran and said it's a hadith. So these are these are people that are speaking for us. Anyway, um, so this guy Luxembourg, he said, if you put if you change the dots around, of course there's no manuscript of the Quran that has these dots that are changed. This is just conjecture. But if he says you change the dots around, it says big grapes, right? And this is the meaning. But Muslims have, they don't know what they're talking about. Right? So I said, wow, let me look at... So I looked at a few places in the Quran where that phrase occurs. And in one place it says, وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورِ نَعِيمٍ So, we're going to marry them, the people of paradise, to big grapes. <laughs> Beautiful. This is a pseudo-scholarship that people are doing these days. Attacking hadith. So, uh, also a major part of this class deals with FAQs. You know, big, you know, type of issues that we get. Uh, what happened to Isa alayhi salam if he wasn't crucified? Why don't you believe Isa alayhi salam is God when he says in John 8 58, he says, Prin Abraham thy ego in me. Before Abraham was, I am. He's claiming to have pre eternality. <coughs> So why don't you believe that he's God? Why did the Prophet say have so many wives? Why did he fight in battles? <clears throat> so the Quran is difficult for them to attack. Right? It's difficult. So they spend most of their energy on hadith. So they attack uh, the hadith, and there's a few hadith that they attack. I'll give you an example. There's a hadith that's in Imam Nawawi's Riyad al-Salihin. I'm sorry, in the Arba'in of Imam Nawawi. But it's in Bukhari and Muslim, and there's different versions of it, like in Tirmidhi and an Nasa'i, in which the Prophet وسلم, he says, Umirtu an uqatil al nasa hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah anna Muhammad Rasulullah. <clears throat> I have been ordered to fight the people until they witness in the oneness of God and that Muhammad وسلم, is a messenger of God. Right? So, Daniel Pipes has a commentary on this hadith. And he says, look, Muslims believe in unmitigated perpetual warfare against unbelievers, and if they're nice to you, it's taqiyya, they really want to kill you, your Muslim neighbor really wants to kill you. 
Their prophet is always ordering them. He's been ordered to fight the people. So, in Hadith, we have to look at Siyah. Siyah means what? Context. Context is very important. Every verse of the Quran has a context. It's called Asbabun Nuzul. All 